Hello and a very special good morning. Welcome to the classic here at Silverstone. What a way to wake up. Listen to that noise, the rev of the engines. The uh, historic Formula Junior cars are gonna be out on track any minute now. We have a jam-packed weekend of racing. Yesterday, we saw all the cars qualify, but today and tomorrow, we are back to back with racing. So, so exciting. We've also got lots of other activities going in and around the track. Um, actually, last night, we were, we were rocking it out. It was scouting for girls who were performing on the festival stage, and tonight, we can look forward to brand new heavy, so do join us for that. Um, a little bit later this morning, we're also going to be catching up with Mike Brewer. He's here at the Car Wheeler Dealers presenter. He's going to be here doing some restoration projects. And I believe he's got a 1961 Jaguar E-Type that he's going to be working on. Um, also, a little bit later this morning, we're going to be going sideways. We're going to be looking out for Terry Grant and seeing what stunts he can show us today. Anyway, we are so excited to be here. And uh, hello to everyone that's watching on the live stream all around the world. It's wonderful. Um, that we can now bring the show to you wherever you are in the world. Anyway, racing is about to get underway, so I'm now going to pass over to Ed Foster. Ed, over to you. Thank you, Nikki. And I'm down in the assembly area again, surrounded by Formula Juniors, ready to go out on track. And what I cannot wait for is the racing. All the qualifying yesterday is brilliant, but it was really wet. So we're going to see a lot of cars that are out of position. We'll see lots of fighting on track. These cars are starting up. And watch out for these juniors, because they could well be one of the best races of the day. So we are getting all set for the first race of the Classic at Silverstone. A very warm welcome to everybody. Ben Edwards and Alistair Douglas up in the commentary box, looking out of the window. And at the moment, although it's a bit of a damp track, it's certainly not as wet as it was in qualifying yesterday. We have a very full programme for the day ahead and I hope our voices will keep us running throughout the day. We're starting off with the historic Formula Juniors in a moment's time. Then the MRL pre-war BRDC 500, followed by the historic Formula 2 cars and then the RAC historic tourist trophy at 11.20. That's just the beginning of the first four races on the timetable. It starts to get full and busy as we continue through the day with a vast variety of wonderful classic machinery coming through. And we are looking forward to seeing some fantastic racing. We'll see how the weather works out as well. We might be getting the odd shower, especially going into this afternoon. But hopefully we can get some good, consistent motorsport and see some great action on track. Let's just take a look back some of the highlights from yesterday with the variety of cars that we will be enjoying racing today. So those are some of the cars we've seen. We've got the Formula Juniors ready to go. Let's go back to Ed Foster. So the Formula Juniors, it's going to be an absolutely fantastic race. I'm not sure if you can hear me. So all getting ready to go out. We've got Cameron Jackson on pole over here in the number 66 car. And next to him is Pierre Livingston. And it's only his second time in the car. If we go a little bit further back, it's been an absolutely fantastic effort in qualifying from Chris Drake here, the first front engine car. It's going to be a really, really exciting race. We've got Sam Wilson here in the number 52, 53 car. He's quick in everything, but in these Formula Juniors, watch out for him. 
because I would have expected him to be up there fighting with both Pierre and old hand Cameron Jackson. So here we are, getting ready for the start of the Formula Juniors. And as we see, uh, a wonderful mix of mid-engined and front-engined machinery from the late 50s and early 60s. When Formula Junior was the category that you tried to do well in if you were going to make it to Formula 1. There was no Formula 2 and Formula 3 in those days. Formula Junior was the entry level, if you like. Uh, it started out in Italy using production-based engines, uh, either 1,000cc or 1,100cc. Front engine machine there, that's uh, well up on the grid. That's Chris Drake in the number 33 car. And what an immaculate machine. And so many of these are beautifully presented, of course. And heading out now down the pit lane, and we're going to be seeing them out on track, building up a bit of pace before coming around onto the grid. But a, a wonderful mixture of machinery. We've got Lotuses, Lolas, Alexis, Mallocks, Coopers, uh, the Kiefta, all sorts of machinery and there were masses of manufacturers by 1961 there were 100 manufacturers in formula junior weren't there alistair so at the time it was massively diverse uh, sport if you like formula junior and a really key category absolutely key yes there wasn't a, such a thing as formula three or formula two or even formula ford then which uh, we saw later on being the the route to grand prix racing for drivers but uh, then it was just formula junior and formula one and a lot of the cars that we're seeing, actually the same type of car, the same chassis and bodywork, was used in Formula One as well, with a different engine, but the very same car, particularly later on when the Lotuses and the Coopers started to come in. But yes, over 100 manufacturers, some of them were one-offs, backstreet garages, a uh, couple of people building a car, but many of them, certainly later on when you've got the likes of Lotus and Cooper involved, really big manufacturers. Lotus joined with the 18, uh, fitted with the 997cc Ford Anglia engine and Cooper and Lotus would go on to dominate the category you're absolutely right uh, but let's have a look now at how they line up on the grid for this one and Cam Jackson who won the championship in 2020 and is doing a brilliant job this year in various categories on pole with Pierre Livingston alongside then Richard Bradley and Sam Wilson on the second row Alex Ames and Chris Drake on row three Behind them, we've got Adrian Russell and Tim Child. Ray Malak in the uh, Malak that his father created. Uh, Clive Richards next to him. Then Greg Thornton and Simon Diffie lines up in 12th place. Will Mitchum and Westy Mitchell next up. The De Tommaso, the Italian brand, lovely to see. Nicholas Fennell in a Lotus 27, that's a rare one. Nick Carlton Smith is a front runner. Andrew Hibbert and Lucas Halusa uh, lining up 17th and 18th. Get used to these being big grids because we've got a lot of cars here today. Andrew Taylor and Michael Hibbert are next up with Peter Anstis and Lee Mole. Charlie Besley and Timothy De Silva line up on the 12th row of the grid. James Hicks and Richard Smeaton are next with Simon Goodliffe and Jonathan Fider, Mark Woodhouse and Martin Walford. And as we go down towards the lower end of the grid, the likes of George Diffie and Nick Taylor, you see a real mix of cars, the Elvers, the Lolas, Mark Haynes there in 36th position and running down towards the back of the grid. Maybe we'll see some action from the back as they try to move forward. So we're getting ready to see those cars. They're doing a lap and a half, so you will see them continue around behind the uh, safety car, and the pace car in effect in this particular role. As they head around, they'll do another lap, get a feel for the track. Now, also, as we look out of the window um, at the first corner our view is over the first corner i'm glad to see we've got some spectators in the grandstands already great to see you everybody and i do hope you enjoy uh, today's action at silverstone very special to have you all back at an event like this and if you're watching online great to have you with us as well um, we're, we're looking forward to providing plenty of action throughout the course of the day um, the noise uh, is rattling around our commentary box of these little 1,000 or 1,100 or 1, cc engines and uh, they're heading around the rest of the lap. But the track is looking pretty good, isn't it? It, it is, yes. We can see a few damp patches, particularly uh, near the start line on the Hamilton Strait, newly named uh, earlier this year. Uh, uh, but the corner in front of us, which is Abbey and then Farm, looks pretty dry. Uh, certainly very different to what we saw yesterday, where it was torrential rain and uh, completely flooded track at one point. Yeah, it was very, very wet. I was worried. Um, we saw some aquaplaning and all sorts, didn't we? Thankfully, not too many uh, accidents. Uh, there is plenty of runoff 
here. Um, I was chatting to Ed Foster earlier about that, and he was saying, well, I'm relieved I didn't see too many cars actually hitting the wall, and he's quite right. Um, and Ed will be talking us through a lot of those cars down in the paddock area, building up to each race, of course. But what a wonderful view, seeing them just going around um, behind the pace car initially before we get ready for the start. And the pole man, Cam Jackson, is a real superstar youngster. Um, he is the, as I say, the 2020 champion. He won the title in the Brabham BT2 in 2020. He's, he's currently the uh, national drive, leading the points in the national driver competition, which is something that uh, Watersport do, um, because he's been winning in Formula Ford, in classic Formula Ford, in historic Formula Ford. He runs the same car in both categories. I saw him race at Snetterton earlier this year, and uh, very, very impressive, dominating those categories. And so we'll see how he gets on. Starting on pole position, he did a 2 minute 41.2 in qualifying yesterday. Pierre Livingston alongside in the blue machine, uh, also going very well. Pierre, uh, another champion in Formula Ford, historic Formula Ford in, the, uh, in 2020. So another real superstar driver. We've got Richard Bradley and Sam Wilson on the second row of the grid. Alex Ames and Chris Drake on row three. And then you can see this real mix of machinery as they head around. And lovely to see, uh, you mentioned uh, the Malak as it came out of the paddock, uh, lovely to see Ray Malak, uh, 70 years old now, uh, one of the, uh, the Malak, Malak dynasty that uh, designed and developed these cars over many, many years. We can just see Ray Malak there going through Beckett's in the front engine green car. Ray, a very experienced driver, raced at Le Mans in the past and runs the Ray Malak Limited uh, engineering company that develops cars and suspension setups for many many racing cars there we see him going through the right hander there at uh, Beckett's yeah so it's still building up a, a little bit of pace and um, getting a bit of a feel for the track which is looking actually pretty good I have to say at the moment looks like we're on for a semi-dry race it's perfect for uh, getting the first race underway as Formula Juniors because they run a treaded tyre anyway uh, it's not as if they run either slicks or wets there they run a treaded tyre so it is perfect and you can see how they're weaving around just to build up a little bit of tyre temperature in those cars and just look at the different shapes and angles uh, some of them are higher than others the front engine cars of course the driver sitting a long way back in the car looks quite different mid-engine machine like that uh, Brabham of Cam Jackson the BT2 uh, lovely car really sits very low to the ground so very low center of gravity light little machines as well and uh, only around 400 kilograms uh, for the weight of these cars so now they are beginning to line up in their grid formation as they come through the dip at the Vale and heading down towards Club, the left and right, that will bring them around to the start line. And we are getting ready. Rolling starts is the name of the day. Uh, so that's what we're looking forward to uh, as the first race of the Classic at Silverson is about to get underway. Historic Formula Junior, the first race of the Classic at Silverson in 2021 is about to get underway. The grid comes around the final turn as we wait for it all to go green. And it is going to be Cam Jackson who leads away from Pierre Livingston. And it's a good start from Cam Jackson. He's able to take the line pretty much into Abbey Corner. And the rest of the field now comes shooting through There's some side-by-side -side action as they come through Abbey, but all clean so far. And this full, full grid of 27 rows of cars are now well on their way. Good battle going on for second, but Cam Jackson has definitely taken the advantage there. Pierre Livingston has dropped down to third place under a bit of attack. So Cam Jackson taking full advantage. And a tremendous start there from Cam Jackson. Pierre Livingston had a little look round the outside, but uh, wasn't able to get ahead, and now he's lost that place. To, uh, oh, we've got a spinner in the background. Uh, I think it was the number 55 car that had the spin. Is that Lucas Alusa? Uh, so he's uh, lost it. Meanwhile, Pierre's trying to come back into second place. I'm not sure it's going to work for him just yet. Coming through into Luffield corner now. And still Cam Jackson pulling out quite a big advantage here. Look at the way he runs it right over the curb to make sure that he gets a good draft. Looking at... Uh, Wilson also doing a good job. He, yes, he's in fourth place. It's Richard Bradley who's got up to second ahead of Pierre Livingston. And uh, and Sam, I think actually Sam is in fifth place now as they come through Cops Corner. Company was getting very sideways. That's Adrian Russell going well in the number 122 car. Uh, Russell currently running in seventh uh, position. But it is Cam Jackson who is leading this race so far. And now coming under, yeah, a little bit more pressure, there's no doubt. So 
Richard Bradley doing well, having moved up from third place on the grid in the number 81 car, and he is chasing him down very, very effectively in another of the Brabham BT2. So you've got pretty much identical cars as off goes Roger Dexter. Oh, that's a shame. Whether the he went off or whether there was a problem with the car. He had a problem yesterday, actually, with that car. So whether it's repeated, I'm not too sure. Pierre Livingston coming under increasing pressure once again from Alex Ames now in the number 88 car. Doesn't quite work out. And it's still Cam Jackson who has the advantage right now from Bradley in second place, who moved up well at the start. Pierre Livingston just getting going a bit more now. Looks as though he's feeling a bit more confident but Jackson has the lead as they they come across the line so the data coming up on the screen not right at the moment for some reason the uh, order that you're seeing on the screen uh, is not actually correct yeah Cam Jackson's transponder isn't working so uh, he will get slotted in shortly yeah so we'll keep an eye on the order up front Cam Jackson has the advantage the man who took that pole position there we are Bradley the order being shown up a little bit more accurately now Bradley in second place Livingston in third Alex Ames in fourth place and putting Livingston under some pressure there for that third position well it's a uh, weekend of course of Olympics going on so we're not just thinking about the winners and the gold we're thinking about silver and bronze as well and the battle for bronze is definitely going on here a good attack from Alex Ames trying to go around the outside into Brooklands but I don't think that's going to come off no, that's a very difficult place to overtake, but uh, often works if you can get wide round Brooklands and then get a tight line for Luffield where they are now and then uh, take the inside for the exit into Woodcut and then the long run down to Cops. But that didn't work for the fourth placed car. He didn't quite get through, but uh, still Cam Jackson leading from Richard Bradley. Pierre Livingston, very experienced in Formula Ford, but this is one of his very early races in Formula Junior, if not his first. I think something you've noticed uh, here, Alistair, is that the mid-engine cars, now it's dried up, it was, it was wetter yesterday, now it's dried up, it's the mid-engine cars have got a bit more of an advantage, the front-engine cars have dropped back a little bit, haven't they? Uh, Chris Drake is back down to his, uh, 11th place, we've got uh, Ray Malik's dropped down to 17th position, uh, he had qualified in 9th. Yes, the, uh, the grip in the wet yesterday, very different indeed to what we're seeing today, it wasn't totally wet when they qualified, it was uh, but very damp, nothing like today. So now it's much drier and Cam Jackson is taking full advantage of that. He did a, a 2 minute 22 on that uh, opening lap. Let's see how the lap times come together. The car weaves a little bit under braking as he goes into stow. You can see the action on the steering wheel as he gently feeds it into the corner and then uh, gets on the power nice and early. Let's watch him into the left and right. This is a slightly different setup here to the Formula One cars. It's a more open left, right. They don't have to brake quite so hard into the left-hander. And the four cars holding good, close uh, competition. And actually, that was a little mistake there. And there's a battle for the lead. Bradley now has got a chance to come up the inside. And Bradley has taken the lead from Cam Jackson, who made a little error out of club quarter, but he might well come back. He's got a decent run as they come through farm up towards the tight right at Village. They're absolutely side by side. Wonderful racing. Jackson just nips back in front. Cam Jackson gets ahead once more, but Richard uh, Bradley is still trying to fight his way back. Wonderful, wonderful racing. And, and Bradley got a little bit sideways there in the loop as he came out. Now they're going through Aintree. Long run now down to Brooklands, down the Wellington Straight. Bradley oh, very, oh. very wide. Uh, yeah. So he'll be looking for a good slipstream now down the Wellington Strait. But look at Pierre Livingston as well. Don't count him out. No, that was good. He held that well. That's a little look down the inside into Brooklands. We left that a bit too late. That was probably uh, an error. He will lose a length or two to Cam Jackson, who drove that beautifully there into Luffield Corner. This is a close battle, isn't it? And what a great start to the classic here at Silverstone, as we all enjoy seeing some older racing cars going absolutely flat out and enjoying these Formula Junior cars from the late 50s and early 1960s. Uh, beautifully presented, immaculately prepared, Cam Jackson, the youngster, son of Simon Jackson. We'll see Simon Jackson, his father and his brother, Dominic Jackson, racing a little bit later on in a sports car. But for now, they'll be watching Cam to see whether he can stay out in front. Richard Bradley still holding on to that second place. Pierre Livingston, third, and Alex Ames in fourth. Very close top four, and then a bit of a, a gap back to fifth place. Uh, at the moment, in fifth place, we've got uh, Wilson in fifth. Uh, he's under a bit of pressure, but let's keep an eye on the battle for the lead. Absolutely fabulous battle for the lead, and because the two leaders are fighting so hard, it's allowing the third and fourth place cars to keep with them as they come down 
the long straight once again and look at the way that they're trying to keep in the slipstream until the last possible moment and Bradley dives out but uh, doesn't get through at Stoke Corner. No, but it was down at Club Corner. That it, oh, it went a little bit wide there, but he has got a bit too quick in there, Cam Jackson. Oh, can he get it back? Not quite, let's see. And now he's got the line into Club Corner, but Richard Bradley, very, very smooth. Now let's see on the exit. This was where Cam Jackson got it a little bit wrong last time. Very good exit once again from Richard Bradley. He's using a slightly tighter line, but this time Jackson doesn't make the error. In the background, you've still got a battle for third place as well. So it is Cam Jackson just in front. We've got 12 and three quarter minutes still to go in this Formula Junior race, which is proving to be a wonderful battle up front. Alex Ames has just taken fastest lap. He's running in fourth, chasing after Pierre Livingston. It's a Brabham 1-2 at the moment into Village and then up to the very tight left-hander at the loop. Uh, Richard Bradley thinks about a tight line through on the inside of Cameron Jackson, but no room to get through there. Cam Jackson gets a good drive out through the left-hander at Aintree, which leads on to the Wellington straight. Bradley goes a little wide again. They all weave around as they come down the long Wellington straight. Uh, Cam Jackson feels secure enough to take the racing line, not defending as he goes into Brooklands. Lotus 27 in third place and then another Brabham in fourth place. Oh, it's a spin for Pierre Livingston. What a shame, the Lotus of Pierre. He just got the back end out of shape as he went down into Brooklyn's breaking maybe a little bit too late. Oh, and he's thrown away a potential podium finish and that's given Alex Ames third place. And now Ames was the pace setter on that last lap. So I think Alex could well get on terms with these uh, two others of Cam Jackson and Richard Bradley and Livingston gets going again, there's a little shake of the head, how frustrating for him. It looked like he just lost it on the brakes there, didn't it? As he was braking for Brooklands, the back end stepped out, wasn't able to control it. That just shows you how hard these drivers are trying as they went uh, down into that tight right-hander. Now we're up at Beckett's corner, the sweepers at Beckett's reckon to be the greatest sequence of corners in the whole of the world for Grand Prix racing at the moment. And uh, they're just lapping a slower car. There's Cam Jackson, he passes the slower car on the right-hand side of the hangar straight. And Richard Bradley follows him through right in the slipstream there. I wonder whether Bradley will have another go into Stowe Corner. We'll have a look. Uh, Alex Ames has dropped back a little bit actually on this lap. That's funny because I thought he was going to catch up. He's made a mistake somewhere. Uh, so really now it's down to these two to battle for the lead. And Alex is going to have to get his focus back because he has lost a bit of time. As we know, Livingston has dropped well down the order. When they come over the line next time, we'll see just how far he's dropped back. Um, not right out of it, but he's, I think he's definitely not going to... He's going to struggle to get anywhere near a podium finish now. So it is still Jackson who leads with Richard Bradley chasing hard. Alex Ames having set the fastest lap on the previous lap. This time, it, the fastest lap now goes to Cam Jackson, our race leader. And it means that Ames is now up into third. We've got Sam Wilson that has moved up into fourth after the uh, spin for Livingston and uh, also moving up the order as a result of that, the number four car of Andrew Hibbard and Livingston dropping down the order as, uh, of course, cars overtook. Bit sideways there from Cam Jackson as he came through the loop and uh, now through entry corner. And again, this is where we know the exit is absolutely crucial. Glances in his mirrors. He knows he's got a car length or so over Richard Bradley. I don't think Bradley's close enough to attack on the approach to Brooklands this time. So no, he follows him through. Yes, uh, feels confident to stay on the racing line, the, the wide entry into the corner. Now he's going through Luffield. He's got some slower cars to deal with, and this is going to be the whole of, uh, whole of the, uh, the weekend. We're going to see a lot of lapping of cars with such huge grids. So uh, already they're into the slower tail enders, uh, passing through there on the inside of Woodcut on the way up to Cops Corner now. And you can see Bradley right in the wheel tracks of Cameron Jackson as they turn in to that fast right-hander at Cops Corner. Now the rise up towards Maggots. A, a wonderful shot here as they go over the crest and into Maggots. Yeah, but the pressure is still on Cam Jackson. He cannot afford to make any mistakes because the gap is pretty tiny. Lovely slide into that first part of the sequence of left and right-handers. This S sequence, famous at Silverstone, one of, the most, one of the most wonderful parts of the track. And actually, I think that it's a good exit from Bradley there. He's got a bit of a toe as they head down the hangar straight. And you can see that Cam is checking his mirrors. Which way is Bradley going to go? He covers the inside, so Bradley forced to try the outside, but then he tries the old 
Mansell PK trick of going back to the inside doesn't quite work for him, especially when they've got a car to lap as well. Although, no, nearly sideways through the stove corner, it doesn't quite happen there either. What a, a great move from Richard Bradley, a, a, an absolute copy of uh, Mansell's effort on PK all those years ago. Now they're in club corner and they've got a slower car. Oh, this this is, is split them. Yes, a chance for Bradley. Side by side are two race contenders here. Cam Jackson on the outside, on the right as you look at it here. And on the inside now, Richard Bradley into Abbey Corner. They're coming up towards us. Bradley turns in. Cam Jackson stays with him. And Bradley's got in front. Richard Bradley in front. Can he hold on to the lead now? Cam Jackson is the one who's going to go on the attack. Absolutely classic move there from Richard Bradley. Both such experienced drivers, total respect for each other as well. Both watching where the other is. Now they're coming up to the tight left-hander at the loop. Bradley leads from Jackson. Jackson looking for a slightly tighter line to, in, in the hope that he can get a good run down the Wellington Strait. See how he's going wider through Aintree. That's a faster line, and that might give him a little bit more speed as they come up behind slower cars. So they've got to lap two cars before they get down to Brooklyn. Bradley decides to go to the inside, and Jackson follows in three. Yeah, lapping the slower cars will give opportunities, as you say, there's no doubt about it. There's a wonderful shot of Cam Jackson working away at the steering wheel, trying to get back on turns. These are pretty much identical cars. They're both the Brabham DT2, one of the later uh, cars of Formula Junior, 1962 cars with their uh, 1100cc engines. They are charging along at the moment, doing a fantastic job. Last lap was a 2 minute 21. I believe that that's a, a new lap record, actually, in the past. I think uh, 2, 2 25 has been a, a quick time around here. We'll have to see later. But great uh, battle going on between the top two. Ains has dropped back a little bit in third now. He's some three seconds behind these two. Sam Wilson up into fourth position. And uh, then the rest of them coming through. Clive Richards has made up a little bit of progress in the number 194 car. He's up to sixth place now. Uh, he qualified reasonably well. Well, he was in tenth place, so Clive has made some progress. But here we are then, a bit of weaving around. <laughs> it's looked like a bit like Max Verstappen uh, recently doing. A bit of weaving down the straight just to avoid. And Cam Jackson has to think about going for the inside line into Stowe. He gets back out of it, but tries to get an exit out of the corner. But Bradley dealt with that well, actually. Very neat through Stowe down into the dip at the veil vale. now we've got the left hander at club corner and it's the uh, what we call the the historic uh, club because it's not quite as tight as the grand prix club corner absolutely perfect through there jackson takes a wide oh jackson loses a little bit of control there slides out onto the curbing and that's actually lost him probably as much as about half a second on richard bradley and in this particular race half a second is a lot uh, they've been so close and we can see them now coming through up towards Village, the tight right-hander, and now Richard Bradley has a relatively commanding lead. Yeah, that was another mistake at the same corner as he made a little error earlier, so uh, I don't know if he's hitting some damp sections. Uh, Richard Bradley seems to be getting through club, finding the grip just a little bit more than Cam Jackson through that area, but don't, um, don't count him out because Cam Jackson does have the fastest lap. He is mega quick and he just needs to string it all together and again as they deal with traffic that may well give him an opportunity although this bit of traffic Bradley dealt with perfectly because he's done it before they go into Brooklyn and actually I think Cam Jackson may lose out a little bit through the left-hander here trying to get past those slower cars at the same time uh, yeah he's definitely that he just cost him again a little bit more time and Bradley has been able to open up the advantage a touch more it's Bradley in command with four and three quarter minutes to go in the Formula Junior race here at Silverstone. Start of an amazing weekend of motor racing at the Classic. And we are going to enjoy more of this kind of action, I am sure, with some very different kinds of cars. But right now, it's these beautiful, delicate little single-seater cars from the late 1950s and early 1960s, which are immaculately prepared by their owners and then driven flat out as we have seen up front with certainly Richard Bradley and Cam Jackson putting on a tremendous display of car control and late braking and racing side by side. But it's Bradley who has just taken the advantage over this last lap and has pulled out a decent lead. And I noticed there Cam Jackson uh, got uh, a, a slower car to overtake just in the middle of Beckett's corner, which wasn't ideal for him, whereas Bradley managed to get through before. So another few tenths lost there, but uh, hopefully Cameron Jackson can gradually ease up onto the back of Richard Bradley in the last three and a half minutes of the race and maybe make a challenge as they come into club corner and uh, come round to complete another lap. 
Yeah, another lap to go. And if you want to get in touch, uh, do please. If you've got any information, if you're here at Silverson, you see something that we haven't seen, uh, use my Twitter, at Ben Edwards TV, and uh, send me a little message. I'll try and keep an eye on what's going on. You can tell me if you see something I haven't seen or you're enjoying something. Christian Rose has said, if you're not watching the opening race of the Classic at Silverstone, you're missing out. Incredible battle for the lead in the Formula Junior race. You're absolutely right, Christian. Uh, it is, has been a great battle, although it has eased off just a little bit now with Richard Bradley having taken that advantage from Cam Jackson. Um, the gap, 2.4 seconds as they went over the line. Alex Ames is in third place. Then Sam Wilson in fourth position with uh, number four car of Andrew Hibbard up there in fifth place. Clive Richards up into sixth position. Behind him, we've got the number 62 car of Simon Diffie. Uh, Richard Bradley deals with a bit more traffic. You can see he's coping with that very, very well indeed. This huge grid of cars. And what's so wonderful about historic and classic racing, you've got some very talented drivers up front, and you've got some real enthusiasts who just love their cars. They may not be the fastest drivers in the world, but they just love to get that car out on track and have a little play with it. And that's what we're seeing all throughout this weekend. Oh, we're seeing Richard Bradley there go into Cox Corner and you can see Cam Jackson in the background and it doesn't look as though he's lost any ground but uh, whether he can make up the difference, there he is there, we can see the orange uh, paint on the, no on the tail of uh, Cam Jackson's car as they turn into Beckett's, what a lovely shot there with Richard Bradley just drifting the car through, just slightly sliding all the way through on the power and on the steering and coming through Beckett's corner now up towards Chapel, onto the long hangar straight again. There's Cam Jackson right behind him. I think he's a little closer, Ben. Yeah, I think he may be just a little closer. This is a good battle going on. Just had a message from uh, Ben Meludi saying, what's with the traffic getting in today? It's, I've been stationary for a while. Uh, I think, Ben, it's because there's so many people coming in. It's going to be a big crowd today. Uh, not much I can do about that, I'm afraid, as I talk to you about the motor racing. Um, but I'm glad that we are going to be seeing plenty of you here today. And obviously, everyone's arriving at the same time. But don't worry, there's... We've got 12 hours of racing here today. Uh, you'll be in time for some great action yourself. Bradley, how's he getting on? Good lap there. A very good lap, yeah. And uh, we're going on to the last Although lap now. Oh, Jackson. Yeah, Jackson's just taken yeah. the fastest lap again. The gaps, can, you're right, the gaps come down to 1.4 seconds. And one lap to go. So uh, we've got uh, uh, around uh, two minutes and 20 seconds to go in the race uh, for one lap of the race for... Richard Bradley and Cam Jackson as they come up to the right-hander at Village, then the short run to the loop, and you can see there the two cars in the shot, and uh, Cam Jackson definitely getting closer. He's really got his head down and uh, focusing entirely on trying to catch Richard Bradley ahead of him as they go through Aintree onto the long Wellington Straight. I'm, I'm not sure Jackson's close enough to be getting much of an aerodynamic toe there, but he'll be doing everything he can, and he can also see that Bradley's got to deal with some traffic down here. Yeah. Traffic. Sometimes that is good, sometimes bad. He's definitely getting a little closer, as you say. I think he's doing a, a great job there. We've got a good battle going on uh, it, uh, down the order between some of these slower cars as well, but it's about the race lead because the time is ticking away. The clock is about to go to zero, and the checker flag will be coming out at the end of this lap. So, Cam Jackson, can he close up the gap any further as they try and get past these uh, other cars? In the middle of it there, the uh, number 114 car getting it out of the way, doing a good job, but it's the leaders who are still battling hard. The triple one, that's Nick Taylor in the Alpha that they're overtaking now, another of the front engine machines. But it's not helping Cam Jackson, is it? Because he's lost again a little bit of performance. A bit sideways there from Richard Bradley, but he's balancing it beautifully. I think uh, the slower cars there through Cops really did for Cam Jackson's effort on this last lap because he just got caught behind another car the other car couldn't just jump out of the way so uh, there's not, nothing he could do about it but we can see now the gap hasn't uh, gone down anymore as they come down the hangar straight towards Stoke Corner for the last time. Yeah what a great drive this has been from Richard Bradley he qualified third on the grid in the damp session that we saw yesterday but he has had tremendous pace and performance in the dry today after a wheel-to-wheel -wheel battle going on with Cam Jackson throughout He's just got to deal with the final corner, and out of club corner he comes, lapping another machine. Richard Bradley takes the first win of the Classic of 2021, and look at what that means to him, punching the air with delight, as he has come home after a tremendous race with Cam Jackson. 
big thumbs up and Cam congratulating him. Wonderful to see. That is just the sort of motorsport we love. And uh, the gap at the end, 1.7 seconds with Cam Jackson having set the fastest lap of the race. Just a couple of tiny minimal errors, but it was enough for Richard Bradley to take the victory in the end. And Alex Ames finished in third place, having qualified fifth. That's a good effort from Alex to come home in third position. Uh, Clive Richards did move up to sixth, as we mentioned, so that was a, a good effort. Some of the front engine cars dropped back a little bit. Uh, Chris Drake, who was sixth on the grid, he ended up down in 15th place, so rather further down. And Ray Malik, he ended up down in 25th. So the front engine cars, not quite so competitive in the dry conditions. But boy, what a great start, Alistair. Absolutely brilliant. And if you haven't got your ticket for tomorrow and you're not here today, you might want to just go online and buy one, because <laughs> that's the first race tomorrow as well. It is indeed. Tremendous. Um, yeah. You can see all the drivers now just celebrating, having a little wave to the marshals and the fans and enjoying seeing some fans back. And it's great for us to see you guys all here at Silverstone as well. There's been so much motorsport without fans. And I know it's taking a little while to get in this morning. I do understand that can be frustrating, but it's because many of you are coming and uh, it's going to be such a great day of motorsport. So the winner of race one of the weekend is Richard Bradley after a tremendous tussle with Cam Jackson. Cars heading back into the pits. Uh, two different pit areas used over the course of this weekend. We've got the national pits up at the top end and then the international uh, area with the, the wing um, where Formula Ones are based. So the results of that first race, Richard Bradley taking the victory in the Brabham. And it was a Brabham 1-2-3 with Cameron Jackson. Alex Ames finished in third. Sam Wilson in fourth place out of Andrew Hibbert. Clive Richards in sixth. Pierre Livingston, uh, he missed out, poor chap, because he was on for a podium but had the spin. Simon Diffie eighth, Westy Mitchell ninth, and Greg Thornton completing the top ten. Lucas Alusa was 11th ahead of Michael Hibbert and Nicholas Fennell. Then Lee Mole, uh, Chris Drake was 15th in the Terrier T4 ahead of Adrian Russell. Richard Smeaton was 18th and the top 20 completed by Martin Walford. So a wonderful battle there. And cars heading back into the pits. And uh, well, Richard Bradley be absolutely delighted with that performance. Cam Jackson really did have a, a, an advantage at the initial stage of the race, started from pole position, had the early lead. Then we got that battle going on between the two of them and then just a little error or two and then side-by-side -side action into Abbey Corner. It was wonderful to see. Let's take a little look back at some of the highlights from the first race of the weekend, the Formula Juniors. Well, this was the start.
So here we go. We've got uh, four car there just being recovered. That's uh, Crispian Besley's uh, car, the Cooper T56. Um, thankfully, we didn't see too many cars uh, pulling off to the side of the road in that first race of the day. But it was a fantastic performance by Richard Bradley to take that first victory. We've got loads more action coming up. Adrian Flux are proud to be the Classics' official insurance partner for another year. Why not visit our stand in Purple 10 next to the Village Green today to find out how we could save you money on your insurance. We've also got all sorts of things to keep you entertained, including a Forever Cars display, Ian Cook's Hot Bang Colour masterpieces, and the chance to win a passenger lap around the track in the course car. So what are you waiting for? Adrian Flux, insurance for the individual. The road to freedom. Japan quality. Yokohama. Our brains are responsible for every thought, every memory, every word, in fact, everything we ever experience. Dementia can take all that away. But looking after our brain health can reduce the risk of this happening. It's time we started to think brain health, and we can show you how. Welcome back to the Classic. It is the Classic at Silverstone, and we've uh, started off with a pretty classic first race with the historic Formula Juniors. Uh, some wonderful side-by-side -side battling. Uh, track in pretty good shape at the moment, but they were the old little damp patches. I'm not sure if that's what caught Cam Jackson out. It was a bit tricky if you ran a wheel just a bit too wide onto a curb and hit a bit of dampness, I think. Um, but nonetheless, it was a wonderful, wonderful race. Uh, let's go down for the trophy ceremony. Let's join Ed Foster. Okay, okay, so, so at so the end of the Formula the Junior race, race, we have the, the podium, podium here. here. Guys, guys, if we want to, want to head, on head on up onto the podium, the podium. We've, got we've got Nick Wigley, Wigley here, here to here present the trophies. trophies. In first place, first place, we've got Richard Bradley, an absolutely fantastic race from him, and, and Cam Jackson, Jackson in second, and Alex Ames, Ames in third. To drop to back drop a bit, we are ready to go. Yeah, so first, Cam. Cam and Cam Richards, and Richards. Alex, on we go, we first, go first place. place. We've got Nick Wigley here as well to present the trophies. Second place, Cam Jackson, and third place, Alex Ames. Nick Wigley from the event team presenting the trophies. I have to say, Richards trophy, you can have a bath in after this. Right, well, squeeze in. Richard Bradley, Richard Bradley, what a fantastic, what a fantastic race. race. Cam certainly kept you honest, though, didn't he? We were battled with Cameron before, but I could tell pretty quickly that I could trust him. And then, um, you know, I, I was pushing as hard as I dared to push, I promise you. And that, it, it was excellent. I think it was tricky conditions, obviously, with some of the track being damp. Um, I think my car came very strong at the end. It was a, a little bit off at the beginning, but no, that was just awesome. Really, really good fun. Yeah, great race. On to Cam Jackson. And Cam, 
you seem to be gaining a bit at the end. Are you hoping for a few more laps, maybe? Yeah, yeah, one lap would have been nice. But uh, yeah, I, I, I was catching a little bit and then caught a back mark going to Beckett on the last lap. So uh, I, uh, yeah, sort of scuffed any chance of getting in um, in the tow. But it was a really good race. It was really good fun. It was awesome. Right, on to Alex. Alex, a fantastic race for you. I think you had a bit of a moment which made you drop back. Yeah, I had, a, had a bit of a, I hit a massive dam patch for each church and uh, completely off the track on the grass. And it's like I lost a massive amount of time and uh, couldn't really pull it back. Then Cameron started dropping back a bit. But we had, I caught some back markers really badly, and unfortunately, which Mitchell dropped back. But really happy with third. Uh, it was great race in tricky conditions. Congratulations to all Thank of you, you and well done. Our first podium of the day is complete. Richard Bradley, the Singaporean 29-year-old who's done a lot of GT work over the years. Great effort by him. We're getting ready for the second race of the day, and it is the MRL pre-war BRDC 500 with some <laughs> ancient machinery, but great to see. On the front row, we've got the Fraser Nash TT replica of Blakeney Edwards and Wakeman. Uh, Clive Morley in the Bentley on the front row as well. Sue Derbyshire in her brilliant little three-wheeled Morgan Super Aero. This is going to be great to watch. Very rapid in the wet yesterday. We've got the Lee Francis in fourth place of uh, Grant Peterkin and Blakeney Edwards, and then another Bentley lining up in fifth place with the Talbot Largo in sixth position. They've got the Alta Sports uh, number seven up there in seventh place. Michael Birch is in eighth place ahead of Martin Halusa. And then we've got uh, Richard Pilkington, who is going to be starting from 10th position. Alexander Hewitson in the Riley 11th. And James Morley, he'll be starting 12th in his Bentley. Cars will be coming out onto track any moment. And of course, these are uh, the historic cars indeed. The oldest cars we're going to see over the course of the weekend. Cars that would have raced at Brooklands and other places like that. Cars basically from the 1920s and 1930s. On the pole position there, it is Fred Wakeman in the silver number 11 car. Uh, that is the Fraser Nash. Alongside him is the Bentley of Clive Morley. And then watch out on the second row, the tiny little three-wheeled Morgan of Sue Derbyshire. And next to her is Mike Grant Peterkin. He's starting this race in car number seven. That is uh, the Lee Francis. So we'll see how they get on as we get ready for the start. About to go lights out. And we have got the start of the pre-war BRDC 500. Away we go. And it's a good start from the pole man, Fred Wakeman. This is a two-driver race. It's a longer distance race than we have seen so far. The Bentley up into second position. And it looks as though Sue Derbyshire and the Morgan is missing out a bit with that initial straight line speed, Alistair. That's pretty much what you've got to expect. Quick car in the wet. She might struggle a bit more in the dry. Very much so, yes. Her top speed is only about 105 miles an hour, which is enough for a three-wheel car, but uh, not as much as some of the bigger Bentleys and uh, the, the larger engine cars. So she will lose out. But uh, Fred Wakeman is not losing out. He's the owner of this car. He'll hand over to Patrick Blakeney Edwards for the second part of the race. What we're going to see in this race, Ben, is the, the drivers are sitting on top of the cars almost. They sit on them, not in them. And we get a great view of them uh, wrestling with the wheel as they go through the corners. Yeah, well, it is a good start by Fred Wakeman, who heads down in towards Brooklyn's corner. Great uh, difference in cars and sizes and power. Uh, we can see the little Morgan coming through in the middle there, uh, the three-wheeler. You can see that it has lost a, a few places but it's still well up the head of a huge number of cars. Again, it's another big, big grid of cars. We're around 35, oh, it is 35 car entry this year in the BRDC 500, the pre-war machinery. And there is the Fraser Nash heading around in the lead of the race for now with an advantage over Clive Morley. Clive's not sharing his car with anybody, but he will have to make a pit stop and they'll have a pause. Under a bit of a, a pressure here right now for that second place as uh, we've got the, the cars going on behind them. It's quite close. Uh, Gareth Burnett. Gareth, Gareth Burnett is in third place, actually. He's doing well and is chasing after that second position. Yes, that's a good battle for second, isn't it? But Fred Wakeman has opened up a little bit of a gap, but not much as they come through Beckett's. And uh, you can see Fred Wakeman is really sitting out in the breeze there, and you can see him working away at the wheel, just coaxing the car through the corner, a little bit of understeer, then oversteer, but it's all under control. Fred Wakeman, the UK dominant styled American, and uh, down onto the hangar straight they go, and a good run from Burnett. 
Yeah, Gareth Burnett is really going well in the Alta here. The Alta was a British uh, sports car made in the 1930s. And in fact, it was kind of the predecessor to many great British sports cars that came along later post-war. He's really on the attack and uh, he's closing up to Fred Waitman. So we could have a bit of a battle going on for the lead now. A very pretty little machine, that Alta, as it heads on around and chased by the Bentley of Clive Morley, who's just dropped back a fraction on this lap. And guess who Gareth Burnett's handing over to? A certain Richard Bradley. So uh, <laughs> Rich, Richard might, uh, certainly at the moment, he's in a podium position for the first two races of the weekend. Yeah. And uh, there we see the big Bentley, number 22 for, of Clive Morley, who, as you say, is driving solo. The other two will sh uh, hand the car over at the pit stop. Down they come, and uh, Fred Wakeman just turning in there uh, into Abbey up towards Farm and then the tight right hander at Village. Is this where Gareth Burnett will be able to close up? Yeah, that's a good question. We'll wait to see, but at the moment it's still the Fraser Nash car number 11 that is leading all oh, slightly deep into the corner. Gareth went a little bit too deep, in fact. He's had some good success here at Silverstone in the past, though, and he is a very rapid racer. Fred getting a bit sideways as he comes through the loop and now through entry, but dealing with it well, reaching that right arm over the side of the cockpit to change gear. Uh, he's glancing down a bit there. Um, I don't know whether he's just tucking. He may just be tucking his head down down the straight. They do do that, of course, because you want a little less drag. I think that's all he's doing. Down the long straights, tucking his head down, reduce the amount of drag. Nice little battle going on further back as well. One of the uh, Talbot Largos in there. Group battle there as well as they head down towards Brooklyn. Some very pretty machinery. Another of the big Bentleys. The Bentleys that dominated at Le Mans in the 1920s and uh, doing a pretty good job here today as well. And the, uh, coming through side by side on our side here, the blue car, that's the number five car of Richard Pilkington, who is sharing with his daughter, Tanya, in the Talbot T26 SS, and uh, comes through Luffield and gets ahead of that little group as they go out towards Woodcut Corner. A very pretty car, and we mentioned yesterday almost some aerodynamics on that car pre-war with the fared-in wheel arches. There you can see the Morgan of Sudovich, she's uh, still in the mix as well, currently in sixth position and battling well in that group. Car number 40 is leading that next little uh, group, that's until Bechtel Scheiber in his uh, Talbot Largo, but he's coming under pressure from the other one, isn't he? So a bit of side-by-side -side action between two very similar cars. And behind them is one of the uh, Aston Martin speed models, uh, the Alan Middleton car as they come through Beckett's. Nice to see the two Talbots together and uh, almost side by side there. Quite big cars uh, compared to some of the others in this race, but they do go side by side uh, absolutely with uh, Till Bechtelsheimer on the outside, Richard Tilkington on the inside as they go down there. And we're back with Fred Wakeman, the leader. Yeah, back with Fred Waitman. Remember, if you want to make any comments or uh, have anything to tell me about what's going on that you're seeing from elsewhere around the track, at Ben Edwards TV is my Twitter. Uh, so give us uh, a buzz and we'll uh, try and pass on any information that we can to you as our race leader opening up a useful advantage here. Let's just see what the gap is now. 4.2 seconds. This is a really good opening stint from Fred. And in fact, Pat Blakeney Edwards just as quick, if not quicker, to be honest, when he takes over that car, they've got a real chance of opening up a, a healthy lead. Mind you, Alistair, these are old cars. <laughs> Reliability uh, could be a factor. Of course, they're all beautifully prepared nowadays, but it's something you've got to think about. Yes, absolutely. And th there was a, a similar length race for these cars earlier in the year, and uh, they uh, all but one finished. It was amazing to see. There's Sue Derbyshire now. She's uh, driving her Morgan three-wheeler Super Aero, which has a top speed, as I mentioned earlier, of 105 miles an hour. Just two gears, and like the leading car, it's chain-driven. So uh, two chains on the car, two cogs, you move the chain from one cog to the other to change gear, and uh, a little twin-cylinder V-shaped uh, engine at the front, hanging out at the front between the front wheels, and uh, she's making her way through towards uh, Aintree now, and uh, she's not lost as many places as perhaps she might have expected on this very fast open circuit with this little car. Yeah, I think she's doing a fabulous job, and you take three wheels, and yet you've got that grip, uh, you've got this little tiny engine really, uh, but it's working beautifully. Sue Derbyshire, here she is, 
throwing the Morgan around, quick down change, flicks it into the left hand of Brooklyn. Look at the size of that steering wheel. The, the steering wheel looks bigger than anything else in the car, doesn't it? She leans into the corner. It's a bit like riding a motorbike. Her body weight, it's important to help the car balance through the corner. And lifting a front wheel there as she turned in and a little bit of sideways there. It's the rear wheel that's driven, just the single rear wheel that's driven. And steers with the front wheels, obviously. Uh, but uh, actually lifting that inside front wheel as she leaned over, as you said, to keep the weight on the inside. She's chased by Alexander Hewitson in a rather beautiful Riley. Uh, it's the Riley 12.4 TT uh, Sprite replica built in 1937. Uh, Sue's car, the Morgan, uh, that uh, is dated from 1929. There it is. And uh, so you've got cars from a very different era racing here today. We're, we're, we're seeing cars today that go back this far. So to the 1920s, we've got uh, these older cars. And we'll be seeing cars later on today, as recent as 2015. Some amazing LMP sports prototype cars that we'll also be watching racing today. So it's a massive cross-section of machinery. That uh, That's what the Classic is all about, providing us with all sorts of different cars to enjoy and different types of racing as well and these beautiful classic free war cars no roll cages no seat belts just sitting up high in the cockpit uh, often with a passenger seat in the old days they would often race with a mechanic alongside wouldn't they yes that's right and uh, uh, some of the cars were converted from two-seat road cars into sort of semi single seaters Talbot did that with their Grand Prix car they took a uh, what was effectively a, a road car but uh, we see uh, the car we saw there at the, at the front the light blue car running in the colors of France because at this time the uh, teams were obliged to run in their country's colors uh, so although that Bentley is blue and that's Duncan Wiltshire's Bentley uh, most of the Bentleys were green because the racing color for Britain was green Duncan Wiltshire is the man behind Motor Racing Legends, MRL, which is uh, organising this particular race, and he's owned this Bentley for many, many years. And uh, actually, a few years ago, Ben, before Duncan got hold of it, it was used on a farm to tow a plough. Uh, it wasn't valued. Wow. It was just a machine on a, on a farm, and oh, it'll tow the plough around. Uh, but Duncan had it fully rebuilt, and it's a beautiful car now, as he makes his way around through uh, the Vale into Club Corner. Yeah, no, it's, it's lovely to see that. An amazing story that it was used as a, as a tractor, effectively. And he's being chased by the Riley Brooklands, isn't he? That's uh, another very pretty little car right behind. Car number 12, that's uh, Nigel Dowding. This was a very successful car back in the 1930s in the sort of lower uh, categories. Um, it was a modification of the Riley 9, a beautiful car in its day. The Riley Brooklands, a sort of lowered uh, version. Reed Railton, one of the great designers of the 1930s, had a, an input, in fact, in the design of the Riley Brooklands, and it's uh, chasing after the Bentley at this stage. Up front, uh, no doubt about our race leader, though, it is uh, still Fred Wakeman, who's built up an advantage of some uh, 12 seconds, a big, big advantage, also setting fastest laps out there. So it looks as though the Fraser Nash is definitely the car. Now, we're looking a bit further down the field, car number eight, that's an Alvis, Alvis Firefly, with Rudiger Friedrichs, who is at the wheel, beautiful machine again, 4.3 litre engine, that's a that's a big power horse, isn't it? Oh, sorry, am I looking at the wrong, wrong one? Tell me what it is, Alison. That, that's the, the Jaguar with the twin wheels. Sorry, sorry, yes, sorry. yes the twin wheels. Very easy to, to uh, mistake, actually, they're both dark coloured cars. That's John Burton's ah, Jaguar yes, SS100. Sorry, yes. Uh, prior to being called Jaguar, the name of the company was SS, SS Cars. But obviously, after the Second War, the connotations of the SS, they changed it to Jaguar. Um, but uh, it's entered, actually, as a Jaguar SS. Uh, great to see it out there. Lovely, yeah. yeah uh, with, of with course, SS becoming Jaguar. And we are going to see a lot of Jaguars as we go through today, aren't we? We've got this E-Type race um, as well coming up later today, celebrating 60 years of the Jaguar E-Type. But as you say, it all kind of started off with the SS. And we've got one out there today, which is lovely. There's our race leader. Uh, the gap he's built up, look, 17 seconds now uh, up to Clive Morley. So Clive Morley into second place. What's happened to Gareth Burnett? He seems to have dropped away, doesn't he? Because um, we saw him up there doing a, a, a fine job earlier. And I don't know whether yes, he's had a problem. Unfortunately, he retired. Ah, yes, he's okay. uh, pulled off. That's a great shame. Um, so he was really pushing on well, Gareth Burnett. He was due to hand the car over to Richard Bradley, who won the opening race of the day in the Formula Junior. So that's a great shame. They've obviously had a, a reliability problem on that car. 
and it looks as though we're not going to see any more of that beautiful Alta Sports, which is a great shame. I have to say that's one of my uh, favourite cars that's out there, but they're all lovely, um, so difficult to choose. So our race leader now has a, a bigger advantage than uh, earlier on, nearly 20 seconds. There will be a pit stop that uh, when the pit window opens up, it is a 40 minute um, race in total. So halfway through, uh, we're expecting the pit stops to be made. And Fred charges around, you can see how he's using the steering. I have to say the Fraser Nash, it really sits the driver up high, doesn't it? Look at the work going on at the steering wheel. Yes, and that's a, another chain-driven car, so the, uh, the external gear change is moving the chain, the the chain on the cogs, and uh, he getting up towards Cop's corner, and he'll be handing over, and a little uh, acknowledgement there of his pit board, so I think we'll see Fred come in next time around. I think that was him acknowledging that they're saying pit in, and he'll be handing over to Patrick Blakeney-Edwards. Yeah, so we'll see how that goes in a little while. Meanwhile, there's some, uh, still some good racing going on further back, some quite close battles. Sue Derbyshire is still only just a, a tiny fraction ahead of Alan Middleton. He's in the Aston Martin Speed Red Dragon. Um, but Sue is holding on to seventh in the, in the three-wheeler Morgan. Um, and there's quite a group of cars that are all together there as our race leader comes around. So we've got a little gaggle here going on as well as uh, they head round the tight section of the loop and through Aintree Bend and back out onto the Wellington Strait. So there we are, we can see there is Sue Derbyshire in that number 35 Morgan. Now she's just opened maybe up a little bit more of a gap over Middleton, but not by much. And Middleton oh, actually is just yeah, ahead. Sorry, he's just yeah, gone ahead. Ju yeah, yeah. Just gone through, yes. And uh, Alan Middleton, the 21 car, is a black Aston Martin speed model, unusually, because most of them were red. The reason it's black is it, in its original uh, production from the factory it was uh, produced for Richard Seaman the later the Grand Prix driver for the Mercedes team pre-war uh, who raced this in Northern Ireland at the Ards TT circuit and it was entered for him in his normal color of black later on it was owned by a private owner called Dudley Folland who was a Welshman so he put the Red Dragon on the side for Wales well, it looks wonderful, doesn't it? But he, Alan Middleton has got ahead of uh, Sue Dovish. So actually, there's, yeah, there you are. The graphic has confirmed that. Middleton now in seventh. Sue has dropped down to eighth, but she's still fighting hard up there in the top ten. And you can see the way she leads into the corner through Stowe Corner. It's a long, long right-hander. So she keeps the weight on the inside of the car as much as possible. And then flicking it into the left and right at club. And demonstrating lovely technique really good line perfect onto the apex not letting it run too wide and out of club corner coming around to complete another lap we've still got 25 minutes to go but the pit stops will be coming up soon nice little race going on further back there number 25 is Jonathan Turner in the Triumph Dolomite uh, he'll be handing over to Ben Cussons when they do make their pit stop but uh, yeah, they're all uh, having a good little tussle in that group, aren't they? They are, yeah. That's a great shot, isn't it? Five cars uh, coming down the hangar straight into Stowe Corner and uh, a change of position there with the number four, uh, Edward Bradley, that's Richard's father, in the Aston Martin Ulster, just making up a place as he goes through Stowe Corner. Yeah. So let's see how they can uh, go. Are we going to see people starting to make those pit stops soon? I think it won't be too long before we see that. Uh, but for now, everyone's staying out there, putting in some strong performances. Still fastest lap belonging to our race leader. And Fred is maintaining an advantage. Fred Wakeman out in front right now. Uh, Sue Derbyshire, ah, it looks like she's got herself back into seventh, according to the uh, classification there. So we'll have another look at that in a moment. The Invicta up on the inside. That is the Invicta S-Type, lovely car to see. And uh, Invicta actually won the Monte Carlo Rally back in 1931. And in the days when cars did rallying and racing, there wasn't such a big difference, really. It, you know, they, they competed whether it was off-road or on-road. It was tarmac uh, Monte Carlo Rally anyway. So, uh, yeah, all good stuff. Yes, the rallying at the time wasn't like the rallying we see these days over the, uh, the rough forest tracks. Uh, it was on the tarmac wasn't the same sort of competition as we see these days but uh, it was still very hard indeed because they would run for many days whereas most rallies these days are somewhat shorter uh, the pit window is open and uh, we 
should see we've got the first pit caller there perhaps the number 99 car of yeah. uh, Robin Tolui has come in to hand over to Ewan Getley they're running in fourth place uh, now I was wrong Fred Wakeman didn't come into the pits the next time around uh, he was just acknowledging his pit crew holding out his uh, board for him but uh, he will come in at some point over the next 10 minutes and because he and Patrick Blakeney Edwards are so equally matched in terms of their speed they, they generally split the race about halfway or a little bit in favour of Fred, who is the owner of the car. Still a great battle going on here between uh, Jonathan Turner and Phil Champion. Jonathan uh, Turner racing in the Triumph Dolomite and Phil Champion in the Fraser Nash Supersports, the uh, smaller red machine there, number 10. So that is Philip Champion and he's doing a, a fine job. He was due to share the car originally, but I think there's been a change of plan. I think Phil will be doing them whole race himself and we are as I say beginning to see a few more cars heading into the pits but even if you're doing it as a solo race you must do your pit stop for the allotted time uh, so that obviously don't gain any advantage over those who are sharing their cars we're going to see this in quite a few races as we go through the day uh, races of around 45 50 minutes with driver changes throughout and some drivers deciding to stick with their car for the entire duration uh, there we are looking at uh, number 75 and that is uh, Steve Skip uh, sorry it's James Dean at the moment he will be handing over to Steve Skipworth later on another of the Aston Martins this is the Monoposto speed model uh, from uh, 1939 and holding on to pretty good performance at the moment notice that uh, yeah course you'll see some changes on that classification as people come into the pits you'll see uh, cars dropping down picking back up so it will take a few laps now before we kind of get back into the full normal order and we've got some good battles going on some good wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing here and some wonderful noises from these uh, from these old engines as well you know, the Bugatti's in there as well yes yeah, so th we haven't actually seen that on camera yet let's uh, focus on that that's uh, a t type 35b Bugatti the type of car with a supercharger on the type 35b type of car that won the very first Monaco Grand Prix in 1929 driven by uh, an Englishman named William Grover Williams who uh, disappeared during the Second War. He was part of the, uh, uh, the underground in uh, Paris working out of a Bugatti dealership uh, secretly under the noses of the, uh, the Germans who were in Paris and uh, he uh, sadly disappeared. But uh, he was the winner of the very first Monaco Grand Prix in a car very similar to that. Yeah, Martin Hulusa making up some good progress. He, so he... Uh, Gradually coming up, he's in 17th position. I don't know whether he had a problem on the opening lap or something because um, he did start in ninth place originally, but uh, I wonder if something went wrong. But it, the Bugatti seems to be running very well now. There's our race leader, back with number 11, our race leader. There he is, uh, not into the pits as yet, to hand over to Pat Blakeney Edwards and still opening up a very, very useful advantage. He's got nearly 30 second gap now over the others. And the Fraser Nash is enjoying this Silverstone circuit extremely well, I think, as uh, comes up behind car number nine. That's Chris Lunn in the Talbot 105. Funnily enough, I saw that car in Bury St Edmunds last week. It was on display at a, an event that was uh, put on by the West Suffolk Motor Club, and it was sitting uh, in the market square at Bury St Edmunds, and now it's nice to see it out there racing. Uh, lovely, yes, yes. Uh, most of the owners of these cars uh, will uh, put them out in their local areas for displays because they are just so beautiful and we don't see them generally on the road uh, anymore and uh, we should see I think the leader come into the pits this time around the pit window is still open but uh, it will be closing in the next couple of laps so he may well choose to come in the danger if you leave your pit stop till the very end of the pit window is that if there's then a safety car and it's a very slow lap you might actually miss the window to come in so most of the drivers will try and get their pit stops done uh, early on in the in the window yeah let's uh, see how that goes Still, as you say a little bit of time to go they've got to keep to speed limits as well when they come into the pits otherwise they will pick up penalties so that's all uh, pretty important for them as well uh, the speed lane uh, the pit lane speed limit is 60 kilometers an hour and of course uh, you don't always have speedos for some of these older cars so they will have to be a, a little bit wary that they don't go too quickly um, they're the pre-war sports cars uh, they've got until 30 minutes uh, into the race before they have to have made uh, that pit stop and they must rest for at least uh, 15 seconds during the uh, pit stop 
regardless of whether there's a driver change or not. Hope, Sue Derbyshire's again in that little gaggle of cars battling against the Riley <laughs> and just about staying in front. And there are those four overtaking a slower car as they make their way around and uh, into oh we have a spinner there that's the number 25 car which has had a quick spin that's jonathan turner's uh, sharing with ben cousins that's the triumph dolomite that you uh, briefly mentioned earlier on having a quick spin but leading that group of cars is the aston martin speed model the red dragon as it's been been called and sue's caught it back up because uh, alan got past her a little while ago um, but now it looks as though if anything sue's got a little bit more pace with the morgan she's actually picked up a bit of a toe is going to have a little think about attacking into brooklyn's corner let's have a look is she going to go for it down the inside not quite gear change and just loses out a little bit on uh, speed on entry so alan stays in position for the moment that's in seventh place sue is in eighth position and then they're being chased uh, by the number 37 car still of Alexander Hewitson, the Riley, which has been a part of this battle. Again, Sue's got a chance here. Running side by side. The Morgan versus the Aston Martin. How wonderful to see this. Sue is not giving up. She is throwing everything into this race. Really wonderful to see. Absolutely great to, uh, to see. It's so uh, great to see the drivers working so hard. And Sue Derbyshire goes through on the inside at Cops Corner. Uh, so you can overtake the Cops Ben. Uh, <laughs> <Indeed>. <laughs> Sue Derbyshire Without makes going off, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sue Derbyshire makes her way around the inside of Alan Middleton and takes that seventh place. Uh, uh, so that will update uh, on your screens next time around when they cross the timing line. But uh, we can see on track that Sue has made up that place. Yeah, beautifully done. Look at those little skinny tyres. Look how much uh, grip there isn't with those little tiny skinny tyres, the car drifting around, and yet there she is pushing it flat out all the time. Really wonderful images. Uh, this front and the engine sitting right at the front, but driving the rear wheel through a chain drive. And she's sitting over the top of that area where the chain runs through the car. And then she's leaning in one way and then the other, heading down the hangar straight into Stoke Corner. Wonderful display here. And, uh, well, yeah, Middleton and Hewitson not quite keeping up right now. Uh, also following him, another of the big Bentleys, that's James Morley in his uh, 1925 car. That's one of the what's called Bentley 3, 4.5. Uh, originally, it would have had a 3-litre engine, but the uh, Bentleys then went to the 4.5-litre uh, motor. And there you can see it is at the back of that little group, sliding around a little bit. Much, much heavier car, of course, puts more strain on the tyres. And actually, the Aston Martin coming under pressure from the Riley. Back with our race leader. There he is. And it looks like Fred's doing a good number of laps before yeah. he's handing over today. I, I think based on the fact they've got a good lead and they're very evenly matched, as I mentioned earlier, and Fred is the owner of the car, he's just taking uh, the chance to have a, a longer race than he'll hand over to his co-driver, Patrick Blakeney Edwards. He's looking is he over... Is right? He's slowing down a little bit is there. Is he? Yes, he... Or is he OK? I know he's lapping another car. I'm just wondering... No, uh, it looks OK. I think okay. he was just having a chat. OK. Yeah, they, they, do, they do that. They talk to each other because they can see each yeah. other out of the... But it did very much look like he it was slowing, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I yeah. think he's OK. The car's yeah. still sliding nicely through Stoke Corner. Uh, so yeah, looks all right here. Looks as though he's still pushing on pretty hard. There's massive respect between drivers in this, uh, in this kind of class of racing. There has to be because it's not, it, not the safest form of motorsport. If you have an accident, one of these things, you're thrown out of the car. That's how it used to be. And, and in fact, drivers at one time felt more like motorbike riders. They felt safer by being thrown out of the car than being in the car and squashed by it. Uh, of course, that then changed post-war when it became safer to be strapped into the car and let the chassis protect you from damage. But in the old days, people were thrown out. And, and often they would survive uh, a horrible incident being thrown out, but of course, often they they uh, suffered some very grievous in injuries. Uh, so to see people in this modern era racing cars like this, still pushing hard, you know, still sliding around. Silverstone is a great place for this because you've got lots of runoff area, you've got very safe curves as well, generally, that are not going to suddenly flick the car um, over. So it is a great place, and they feel good confidence here, I think. I, I think they do, and there's plenty of space for them. They don't need to go out over the, uh, the, the bigger curves. 
and I think we'll see Wakeman come in this time because we've only got three minutes till the end of the pit window and uh, the lap is taking nearly that so he I don't think he'll want to risk another lap Clive Morley we're watching now the number 22 Bentley running in third place he's also uh, uh, hasn't been in the pits yet he's driving solo okay so I think we're about to see a a rush of pit stops. Yeah, and they're all leaving it to quite the last moment, which is interesting. Yeah. I thought they would uh, do it a little bit earlier, but they're leaving it till the last moment before making their, their pit stops in this race. We've still got uh, just under 13 minutes remaining in what is race two here at the Classic at Silverstone. Ben Edwards and Alistair Douglas talking you through the race. And we've got Ed Foster who will be picking up the winners at the end of the race as well. Get in touch using uh, my Twitter feed at Ben Edwards TV. Give us some comments on what you're seeing if you are watching on the live stream or perhaps you are in the grandstands. The race leader has come into the pits and we've got a driver change going on now as Fred Wakeman has handed the car over to Pat Blakeney Edwards. Pat picks up the power and off he goes and Pat is a very rapid driver. We're going to see a lot of these guys uh, throughout the course of the weekend. They're driving in different machinery in different classes. Yes, pa Patrick uh, prepares the cars uh, through his company for Fred and then shares the driving with him as well. Patrick's also out in another car, a different owner that he prepares a car for, but uh, I think Fred and Patrick are probably the most uh, busy drivers this weekend with all the different cars that Fred owns. <laughs> well, yes, we've got, uh, don't forget, we've also got uh, uh, Callum Lockie uh, doing a yeah, lot of races, isn't he? Julian Thomas the yeah, same, he owns yeah. a huge number of cars and uh, Callum Lockie is his professional driver that he always uh, has along with him. Uh, and they're certainly uh, almost the same number and uh, a number of other drivers we'll see out on multiple occasions throughout the weekend. So another little battle going on here as our race leader has come back out and still uh, got a good advantage. Of course, all the gaps will sort of settle down once we've seen everybody has made their pit stop. I think most people actually have now done their pit stop. Looking at our timing screen, I think the majority are either in the pits or have made their pit stop now. And Pat Blakeney Edwards picking up the pace. I wonder if he's going to set a new fastest lap. The, it was his uh, his man, Fred, who set the fastest lap in the first stint at a 2 minute 48.4. Uh, we'll see. He's on his out lap now, so it'll be the next lap where we get a bit of a better indication of whether he's going to set a new fastest lap here. And I see the team in the pits actually fixed that flapping bonnet strap uh, at the stop as well, because it uh, when we had shots of... Oh, it's, it's flapping the other side now. <laughs> it was the left-hand side, or the driver's side of the car the right hand side that was originally flapping it's now the left but uh, Patrick and Fred when you speak to them about driving this car they just have such a big smile they absolutely love driving it but it is quite scary because you are you do feel very exposed you're sat out in the breeze and uh, they actually do hold on with their uh, with their legs to, to make sure they don't slide around in the car I'm sure yes it's not like being strapped in a harness in a modern racing no. car um, so you physically it's pretty tough you're hanging on to the steering wheel you're hanging on with your with your feet as well there is that uh, car we saw earlier on the Talbot um, that uh, is out there the 105 Brooklands green 1933 car three and a half meter engine and running pretty strongly at the moment I have to say and that was the English Talbot as opposed to the French Talbot which we saw earlier the, the blue car of Richard Pilkington the Talbot uh, but this one was a team car uh, racing in period so it has a huge amount of history and uh, Michael Birch a, a very quick driver another driver we'll see out in multiple cars over the weekend yeah and it's actually up into second place now so he has taken second place so he's gradually moved up the order hasn't he It looks a big car, but actually it drives very, very well. Uh, when uh, Michael is often interviewed after a race, he'll say it's a very easy car to drive. We're back now with Sue Derbyshire, and interesting to contrast her car with that great big, uh, Aston, well, relatively big Aston Martin, uh, the Red Dragon Speed model, uh, which has got back past again. So uh, Alan Middleton, who's also driving solo, um, has managed to catch and pass Sue Derbyshire again. We've had these two together the whole race, haven't we, Ben? Yeah, it's been a great battle between them, and uh, it must be pretty tiring by this stage of the race. About eight and a half minutes to go, you've been fighting all the way through the, the race, and yet they're still at it. And Sue's not given up. She's tucked into the slipstream yet again with Alan, and 
they have been enjoying a, a wonderful battle throughout. Let's see who's going to come out on top. Uh, Alan is now into seventh place. Sue is back down into eighth position. And uh, we've just seen Andrew Hudson move up one position once again. He's been a part of this battle pretty much throughout. Sorry, Alexander Hewitson in the Riley it is. Alex uh, has been a part of this battle as well. Uh, he's a little further back, I think, after the pit stops than he was. I'm trying to see him in the background. Yeah, just see him coming out of Luffield now. But Alex may be able to, to join in with this race once again. And they are coming up to lap one of the... What are they Tilkington car, isn't it? Yes, no, that is the car up ahead. So there's not a big gap between. Uh, it's now Tanya who is in the uh, Talbo, which is running up there in sixth place. Richard started the race, but Tanya has now taken it over, and they are actually yeah, catching that car. Yeah, it's coming, coming under pressure towards the end of the race after the pit stops, and it looks like maybe Alan Middleton and possibly Sue Derbyshire will go through, uh, and that will move them both up a place to sixth and seventh and then ahead of them is the uh, Steve Skipworth now uh, Jim Dean started Steve Skipworth taken over in the Aston Martin in fifth place we've got the Bentley of James Morley putting a bit more pressure on Alex in the Riley there you can see as they head down the hangar straight the big Bentley versus the much smaller Riley but actually in terms of straight line pace you can see it's not a huge difference the Bentley now is gaining a bit of an advantage and has got past so the number 85 car, James Morley, has gained a position. That's put him into ninth place now. But the Riley's quick through the corners, as you can see. So the Bentley has, Bentley has that little bit more straight line speed, but the Riley is very effective through the turns. Up front, Pat Blakeney Edwards uh, still leading this race in the car that uh, Fred Wakeman started out in, and uh, they have a useful advantage of some 25 seconds. No new fastest lappers yet, still fastest lappers from earlier. The Riley coming back at the Bentley. We're now coming up to a more twisty section where the Riley probably has a bit more of an advantage. So they're almost side by side into Abbey Curve. And then as they come out of that corner, the Riley's got a bit more speed and will perhaps have a chance through farm and then up towards village. This is where you can break pretty late. The Bentley may have to break a bit earlier but he does hold the inside line, fair enough. And uh, the Riley is forced to go in wide. Good stuff. And the Riley goes through on the switch back up towards the left-hander at the loop, but the Bentley's got the inside line. But uh, I think the Riley driver will try to cut tight through Aintree, but uh, it looks like uh, Morley has held that line through the left-hander. But no, they're absolutely side by side as they go out onto the Wellington Strait. Once again, uh, a great example of the respect between these drivers. They gave, give each other plenty of room, and uh, it's actually the Bentley of uh, Stuart Morley that remains just ahead of the Riley of Alexander Hewitson as they come down into Brooklands. The Riley has another little nibble on the inside, but no way through there. No, but it is still good racing, as you say. Um, and meanwhile, the uh, the Pilkington car is still under pressure from Middleton and Derbyshire up ahead, so we could see a few little changes. Uh, we haven't seen too much of uh, the Steve Skipworth Aston Martin just recently. That's currently running in fifth place. Um, they are a little bit on their own, I think, at this stage. So there is Sue Darvish's. Where is she? Yeah, they're still in the mix, I think. Maybe uh, just drop back a little bit from Middleton over the last time. I don't think it's a huge gap, though, so we'll see if there are any changes. Four and a half minutes to go in the pre-war BRDC 500 at Silverstone, the second race of the day with some glorious machinery, the oldest cars that we're going to see on track racing over the course of this weekend. Um, but some glorious machinery and uh, being driven, some of them to their absolute limit and others just on a rather lovely cruise around the 3.6 miles Silverstone circuit. What a wonderful place to drive your favourite car. And James Morley managing to get through on the inside of a slower car there to keep ahead of Alexander Hewitts and this battle still goes on. Bentley versus Riley. And now we're back with the leader again, Patrick Blakeney Edwards, PBE as he's known and is on his helmet as you'll see when he comes through the left-hander. Uh, in the Fraser Nash yep. holding on to that great big steering wheel similar to Sue Derbyshire big steering wheel no power steering of course in these cars so you have to really haul them round and uh, making his way through Luffield yeah lovely to watch 
Pat sits a little lower in the car, gives him an advantage over his teammate Fred, doesn't it? Because Fred's quite tall. Yes. And of course, he, we saw Fred ducking down down the straights to try and reduce the drag. Uh, Pat's got a bit of an advantage in that uh, yes. sense. Yes, slightly behind the aero screen as he comes up to Cop's corner, flings the car in and uh, leans over. He's a very demonstrative driver, uh, Patrick is. Uh, he loves to move around in the car and uh, get the car moving around under him as well as he goes over the rise into Maggot's Curve. Doing a fantastic job. So let's see if uh, that uh, he's going to get another lap, I think, out of this. Uh, so we're on probably what will be the penultimate lap of this race. And they look on, they're looking on for a, a very comfortable victory, but he's still sliding it around, still balancing the car. He's just enjoying himself. It's so lovely to drive a car like this that has wonderful balance and you can get into a four-wheel drift through some of these long fast corners at Silverstone there's plenty of space and the wonderful thing is there's good runoff as well so you can be confident you can try hard if you go a little bit wide you're not going to be in too much trouble uh, now there's the car that's running in second place the number 20 Michael Birch Talbot uh, that's going very strongly at this stage as well beautiful green livery and uh, Michael's helmet there really shining in the... We've got a little bit of sunshine now. Not, we've still got quite a lot of grey cloud above us, but thankfully we haven't got the rain that we suffered uh, through a lot of the qualifying day. The track is now bone dry, pretty much, I would say, and they're able to enjoy that and have some fun. Oh, so here we go, over the line. Uh, 1 minute 50, so it may well actually be the last lap yes. now. I think he's just acknowledged the, uh, the start line marshal who's held out the last lap board and he just lifted his, uh, his left hand there to acknowledge that. Very courteous drivers, both Fred and Patrick. Uh, we're back now with this midfield battle with Sue Derbyshire still working hard. As you said earlier, it's hard work and it's a long yeah. race, isn't it? And they, they must be quite fit to, uh, to keep these cars right on the limit. It's quite Sorry. a big fuel tank here as well in, in, in the Little Morgan because, you know, you're doing a quite a long race. It's flat out uh, the whole time. I bet the fuel, uh, the fuel economy isn't that fantastic on cars of this age. Yeah, it's uh, only, only a twin cylinder, but uh, yeah. yes, it, uh, it, it will use a fair bit of fuel over the, the time. Um, but it's a very basic car, just a wooden frame with a, a body slung over the top of it. Fuel tank bolted in. Really no thought given to the driver uh, comforts <laughs> in these cars as we come back to Patrick Blakeney Edwards who's driving the leading car on the last lap of the race. You can see the clock ticking down. The flag will go out when he comes round to the international pit straight. Yeah, lovely slide out of Luffield corner, the back end of the car under wonderful control through steering and throttle. But the right foot on the throttle is just as important as the steering control in cars like this. And he's been putting on a great display, as was his teammate Fred Wakeman earlier on, who led from the start of the race from pole position. And they have taken full advantage with this car. Their uh, lead up to over 30 seconds over the number 20 machine of Michael Birch, who's hanging on there in second place. Birch has got quite a comfortable advantage himself over the number 22 car of Clive Morley, who's going to be the first of the Bentleys, I think, to come home. It looks like he's going to get the podium finish. Fourth place is heading the way of the number 99 car of Ewan Getley and Robin Tamui. It's Ewan in the car now, another of the Bentleys. That's running in fourth position. And then in fifth place is the 75 Aston Martin monoposto of James Dean with Steve Skipworth in the car now. James started the race, but Steve Skipworth actually running that car that's in fifth place. I don't think uh, we're seeing any particularly close battles, although actually the Pilkingtons versus Middleton is still pretty close. Yes, it was last time around, just 0.7 between them, but uh, haven't spotted them out on track. So we'll have to wait and perhaps till they come over the line to see how close that one is. But I, I get the feeling Middleton was going to get that place as we watch uh, Patrick Blakeney Edwards coming through the last sequence of corners into club corner through the long right-hander. He's probably going to not pass that car ahead of him. There's no need for him to do so. Uh, and there's a point as well that that car will get an extra lap. The checker flag is out and victory in the pre-war BRDC 500 goes to Fred, Fred Wakeman and Pat Blakeney Edwards. Uh, great performance by both drivers. Fred took it off the line to lead from pole position. Uh, they swapped pretty late in the race. Pat Blakeney Edwards has done a great job as well. And it's thumbs up to all the marshals and to the fans as well who are enjoying seeing these pre-war cars out there once again. A dominant victory. Uh, their win advantage 
well over 30 seconds in the end. Uh, the others only just coming through now, actually, in second and third. Uh, so, yeah, 33 seconds the advantage uh, over the car that finished in second position. That was a, a good run, though, in the end for Michael Birch, who finished in second. Clive Morley finished in third position. So our top three drivers performing well. And uh, let's just see Sue Derbyshire. What has happened to Sue on that last lap? She has suddenly dropped several places. I do hope there wasn't a problem with the car because I'm just looking at the, oh, there she is. Um, she has dropped back a few places according to the timing screen. Let's just see as it, yeah, they, I don't know quite what has happened there. Um, but for some reason, she is somewhat further down than we saw earlier on, I believe. Well, let's just wait and see as they as they come down uh, across the line in a moment. Still battling away with a few other cars. I wonder if it's lost a bit of performance at this stage for some reason. Yeah, she doesn't look to be going quite as quickly as earlier on. Not uh, not slow, but perhaps not right up to full speed. But you're right. Yeah, she's she's lost uh, quite a few places. She was battling with Middleton, yeah, who Middleton. didn't get past uh, Pilkington in the end. Oh, that's all a bit close with the Bentley. <laughs> but uh, she's just stayed in front. A little puff of smoke. I do wonder if there's not something not running quite right on the Morgan. But Sue's about to come across the line. The Bentley chasing her. Over the line they come. She finishes in 11th in the end. But what a wonderful show she put on for us today. And uh, I think there must have been a slight problem with the car. Maybe it was running out of fuel. We did, we did wonder. Um, but something went slightly wrong towards the end because she was on for a, a solid top 10 finish there. And it didn't quite happen in the end. But she got to the end. Uh, well done. And another fabulous race this time provided by the pre-war machinery so second race of the day is uh, complete the mrl pre-war brdc 500 which has been a victory for fred wakeman and pat blakeney edwards with quite a comfortable win in the end uh, they'll be very happy with that michael birch though a solid finish in second place in car number 20 and that was uh, good progress for him, uh, having made, uh, having had a few problems in qualifying yesterday, but he, he made the most of the race. He qualified in eighth, but has ended up in second position in the race. And the number 22 car, Clive Morley, which did qualify second, ended up finishing in third. Plenty to enjoy here at Silverstone today. Let's take a look at the result of the pre-war BRDC 500. Wakeney and Blakeney Edwards took the win from Michael Birch in the uh, Talbot, then the two Bentleys of Clive Morley, and to get the Tului twins, uh, Skipworth and Dean pairing. Next up in the Aston Martin, the Pilkingtons in the Talbot, and Alan Middleton took that seventh place in the end. Um, Alexander Hewitson finished in 10th position. The one that lost out a little bit just towards the end, Sue Derbyshire. She finished 11th in the Morgan, but she had a wonderful race throughout. Martin Halusen, that beautiful Bugatti. 35B was 14th ahead of John Burton in the Jaguar SS100. The top 20 completed by Edward Bradley in the Aston Martin Ulster. So a bit of a breeze blowing across the track here at Silverstone, but we've been enjoying some more great action. Uh, let's take a little look back at some of the highlights of race two at the pre-war cars.
the starting grid for what is set to be an incredible day. It's lights out, and away we go. He's taken an early lead. There's never been a better crew. Behind every great driver, there are brilliant engineers. It's going to be hard to pick a winner here. They're on the final lap. A day they'll never forget. Now the podium ceremony for the motor racing legends pre-war BRDC 500. In first place, almost unchallenged, Frederick Wakeman, Patrick Blakeney Edwards. Second place, a wonderful drive from Michael Birch. We seem to have lost Michael. Oh no, here we are, he's great. And in third place, Clive Morley. And presenting the trophies is Ian Titchmarsh, representing the BRDC. And finally, we're going to come back for the BRDC trophy, which has not been seen for over a decade. It's lovely to see it out, loaned by the BRDC. Right, so I'm going to jump in. Frederick and Patrick, I gather you had a few gearbox problems, but you made that look easy. Yeah, we, uh, we I was greeted with bad news this morning that we only had the first, well, really three gears. So we had to make a decision whether we were going to go with fourth gear or third. Uh, and uh, we chose third, that was the right choice. We were really ringing the heck out of that engine, but uh, really happy with the win. We got pole and fastest lap, so couldn't be better. Well done to you. Next to Michael Birch from eighth to second. You must be happy with that. I'm very happy on a great race with Clive for much of the race. That was a lot of fun. Trying to catch these guys, but yeah, not this year, but maybe next year. So yeah, it was great, thanks. And finally to third place, Clive Morley. Let's just move along. Clive. What a wonderful way to start the day, piloting that Bentley at yeah. Silverstone. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it, but I couldn't have gone on for much longer. My arms are killing me, so, uh, but it was a wonderful, uh, very hard third, I must admit. No, it was fabulous, thank you. Well done to all of you. So we have had two races here at Silverstone and plenty of entertainment already and we're looking forward to the next one coming up on track in just a little bit. Uh, but what a wonderful uh, podium there for the pre-war cars. Next up we've got the HSCC historic Formula 2 race. Uh, we're going to see some pretty rapid single seaters from the 1970s competing against each other. Very much a sprint race coming up for that. And then we've got the RAC Historic Tourist Trophy for the pre-63 GT cars. That'll be another uh, slightly longer race, 50 minute, with pit stops and pairs of drivers. Let's go down now to Nicky Shields in the paddock. So we're here down at the shift and drift zone, and I was really hoping to catch up with stunt driver Terry Grant, although I don't know where he's gone which, if I'm honest, makes me a little bit nervous because knowing Terry Grant, he's got something naughty up his sleeve and I can hear him coming. <laughs> now, bearing in mind, Terry Grant has not won. Oh, my God, he just went right here. Sorry, 
barely shrieking there. That was embarrassing. But that car literally just touched the heels of my shoes. <laughs> um, Terry Grant has not one, not two. No, he has 27 world records to his name, um, including one for doing a loop the loop seven stories high. He's a complete nutter. He is an absolute machine behind the car and spends more time on two wheels than he does in four. Let's go catch up with him. So Terry Grant, what a pleasure it is to see you here at the Classic, keeping everybody entertained. Um, but let's talk about you for a bit, because yeah, we mentioned that you've got 27 world records, but there is one in particular that probably stands out in my eyes, and that is a seven story high loop the loop. Talk to me about how that idea even begun. Yeah, it's kind of quite scary. That was uh, Jaguar Land Rover, the PR director of Jaguar Land Rover wanted to launch the F-Pace, and they wanted to do it in a really cool way. <laughs> and they phoned me up and said, how do you fancy doing the loop the loop? So it's like, yeah, of course. So that was it. We and, then, kind of, and then they said, and it's going to be this high. <laughs> yeah, well, it kind of it started off a lot smaller and then it just naturally took progression. And then actually it's like, well, let's go for the world record and go for the biggest one. So we put a few more noughts on the contract and yeah, done that. It was brilliant. Well, well done. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do things by half. Um, how did the preparation for that go? And what was it like actually doing it for the first time? Yeah, the preparation, I had a, a much smaller loop that I practiced on that, that I used back in the Top Gear live days. We, we took it on a traveling show, but it's still the size of a house. So I used that. I was practicing two or three times a week until I got to the, to the big one. And then that was it. Big one was a breeze. There we go. That's what a true professional. <laughs> um, and what are you going to be doing here at the Classic? Entertaining everyone? You know, you're already up on two wheels. What else can we expect? Yeah, sure. I've got the, the lovely little legend car, which I always bring here. So, you know, doing the crazy donuts, jumping on the roof, going into the crowd um, on the bridge complex. So, you know, if you're around, come over, come and see us, come and see the show, get involved. Definitely my favourite part of the Classic. That is for sure. Make sure you come and say hello to Terry Grant. Terry, always a pleasure. Have thanks, fun. Nikki. And thanks for, for not running me over. So much going on here at Silverstone today. Uh, ben Edwards with you here with Alistair Douglas in the commentary box as we are preparing for the next race to head out on track, and that is the historic Formula 2 series. Uh, so if you're here at Silverstone with us, uh, enjoying the day, well, it's lovely that it's not raining quite as much as it was yesterday. I do hope you're going to get around all the different areas of the circuit today to enjoy both the on-track action and the off-track action, as we saw Nikki enjoying just a moment ago and if you are with us online for the live on st online streaming surface uh, wherever you are in the world thank you for joining us and I hope you can also have some fun enjoying seeing some classic cars going in to some great racing so we just got uh, the cars lining up uh, in the assembly area now before they head out onto the track and these are the historic Formula 2 cars so these cars are from the 1970s fundamentally from early to late 1970s, uh, uh, the 90, early 1970s, we saw Ronnie Peterson racing a March 701. The title was won back then by Clay Regazzoni in a techno. And then right through the 1970s, the likes of Mark Sura winning a title again for March in 1979. Looking forward to seeing the Formula 2 cars on track very soon. The road to freedom. Japan quality, Yokohama. Check the oil and the water and the tyre pressures regularly. Give it a polish, make sure it's all shiny. I service the car once a year and I always do it myself. I enjoy the, the mixture of exercise. I think some of the things I eat help to keep myself healthy and my brain healthy. Or even just meeting up with a friend and having a chat.
It's the Classic at Silverstone. We've had two races so far this morning. We've got plenty more to come. Uh, we'll be racing all the way through to 9 p.m. this evening uh, with such a vast variety of cars. You're seeing some of the sports cars there that we'll see. Lovely to see so many people here today. Um, car clubs galore all around the inside areas of the track. Wherever you go, there's a, a different car club gathering uh, cars, which is great to see, I have to say, if you're a car fan. Um, every variety almost of car that you can imagine has uh, a collection here. Uh, meanwhile, though, we are getting ready for the Formula 2 cars to come out and race. And there you can see one of them, number 19, that's Mark Richardson in his uh, March 752. The March uh, Formula 2 cars were absolutely critical in their era. Norman Hurd was a key part of the March team, setting it up in the first place and designing uh, many of their very successful cars. They're heading out onto the circuit now to do a formation lap before getting ready for the start of the race itself. And uh, we should be in some more great racing. It's Matthew Wrigley who took pole position in yesterday's qualifying session ahead of Miles Griffiths. And we'll see them lining up at the front end of the grid in just a few moments time. We've got cars here that were driven in their day by the likes of Alan Jones, Mark Sura, Giancarlo Ginzani, uh, some real superstars of Formula 2 over the years. Sometimes it was March that was at the top of the tree, sometimes it was Chevron uh, at the top, and later on it became Rolt, and there are a few of Rolt's RT1 cars, the Rolt Toronac designed machinery that is also uh, going well. So we'll have a little look at them as they come out on track. Track conditions are pretty good, uh, pretty much bone dry now across the circuit, which is good. We've got uh, low cloud around, as you can see, but thankfully no showers as yet. Maybe we'll get some showers a little bit later on today. We'll have to wait and uh, see how that works out. But uh, for now, the Formula 2 cars just beginning to uh, build up and get ready for this race. The grid for the historic Formula 2 race sees a very competitive field with Matthew Wrigley on pole position in the march and Miles Griffiths alongside of the front row separated by under a tenth of a second. Andrew Smith and Tim De Silva are next up on the second row. Martin Don and his Chevron is on the third row with Matthew Watts lining up alongside in one of the later cars, the March 782. Rob Weldon and Martin Stretton next up. Keep an eye on Martin. He is in an older car, but it does have the two-litre engine. David Tomlin, ninth. Callum Grant, very rapid. He's in a Formula Atlantic car, which are allowed to compete in this. And then on the sixth row of the grid, we have Mark Charteris and Mark Dwyer. And the cars are on their uh, formation lap at the moment, so weaving around, getting those slicks up to temperature. So now we are into a category, Alistair, uh, they'll be doing another full lap here, where the slick racing tyres are coming into play on a dry track. Absolutely, yes, and, and the drivers will get a good chance with a one and a half lap uh, run to the rolling start to uh, find out whether there are any damp patches in places they're not expecting. But uh, to, to us here, it looks as though it's completely dry now, and uh, we should have, uh, hopefully around the rest of the track, uh, a completely dry line. And uh, yes, slick tyres on a relatively cold day for late July, uh, to <laughs> say the least. Yes. Uh, they are having to just move the cars around a little to get some heat into those tyres. Yeah. On a huge grid, still streaming past us here at uh, Abbey Corner. Wonderful to see. There are 43 Formula 2 cars about to go into action. Uh, if you want to get in touch, get in touch on Twitter at Ben Edwards TV. Uh, happy to see your comments if it's about uh, the racing that we're seeing out on track or any comments about the cars that you might know well. Uh, happy to have a look and see what you're enjoying, whether you're at Silverstone yourselves or whether you're watching online. And uh, there are so many different categories of racing going on here today. And it is uh, a vast contrast. I mean, we started the day with Formula Junior with the uh, fairly basic but wonderful to watch little single seaters from the late 50s and early 60s. Formula 2 really kind of, Formula 3 and Formula 2 replaced Formula Junior during the 1960s, becoming a, a, a closer ladder, if you like, to getting to Formula 1 and a more graduated ladder. Um, different categories building up and then of course Formula Ford coming in in the late 1960s but Formula 2 always very critical to try and prove your worth uh, to try and prove to Formula 1 teams that you were a driver that was going to have the ability to step right up and uh, some great drivers of course did extremely well in Formula 2 before going on to race in Formula 
one. And in period, uh, many of the Grand Prix drivers would actually have raced concurrently in Formula 2 yeah. and in Formula 1. Very good you, point. you mentioned some drivers there who won the Formula 2 championship. They were actually racing in Formula 1 at the same time. The likes of Ronnie Peterson, for example, did both series. And uh, the uh, uh, Clay Regazzoni, another one that you mentioned earlier on. Yeah, that's right. And it was uh, different in those days. Uh, title was won by uh, Mike Hayward, for example, back in 1972. Uh, biker who switched to cars he won it in a 30s from Jean-Pierre Jusso in a Brabham uh, Crosby made a, a Formula 2 car back in the early 70s as well uh, despite their focus on Formula Ford uh, being perhaps that little bit stronger and we've got a, a Votel Rondel out in this race as well car created by Ron Dennis and Neil Trundle before Ron set up uh, or took over the McLaren team they run the, uh, the Motel Rondel and we've got one of those in this race so everybody getting warmed up beautifully as they come down the hangar straight. Little way to go yet before we see the race getting underway. Number 34 in the middle there, that is the Martin Stretton car. Some older car, so perhaps not as really fast to some of the more recent machines, but we know Martin is a very talented driver in anything that he drives. So we'll be keeping an eye on him to see how he gets on. Callum Grant, I mentioned in the Formula Atlantic car, he's 10th and he's gone well. The historic Formula 2 Series race is about to get underway here at Silverstone. This is going to be a close battle. Matthew Wrigley on the left as you look at it. Miles Griffiths on the right, sharing the front row. Andrew Smith and Tim De Silva on the second row. The race gets underway and straight away it's Matthew Wrigley trying to take full advantage from that pole position. He's able to do so. Moves out to the outside as they head up into Abbey Corner and the whole field trying to get through safely. Looks as though they are, but Miles Griffiths is battling to hold on to second place. And it's uh, Andrew Smith who's come through. Yes, Andrew Smith gets second place in the uh, village corner and into the left-hander at the loot. Andrew Smith and is now chasing after Matt Wrigley, but I don't think Miles Griffiths has given up because he's now following Andrew Smith through onto the Wellington Strait. And a car has gone off at Abbey Corner on the outside into the gravel trap. Um, hopefully all OK. That was the car further down the field. So a great start by Matthew Wrigley. But as you say, Andrew Smith's done well to move up into second place. Griffiths in third, De Silva in fourth. And then what? Callum Grant's made a couple of places already. Callum's up into eighth position, having started down in 10th. Martin Stretton not gaining. He's actually lost out a little bit. He's gone from 8th down to 11th. And coming through to uh, the old pit straight into Cops Corner, it's still Matt Wrigley leading from Andrew Smith in second place in the lovely yellow liveried car in original liveries, these cars, as they raced in period, and up over the rise to Maggot's Curve into the very fast Beckett Sweepers. And uh, it's still Matt Wrigley leading in the, uh, the march from Andrew Smith in the slightly older march as they go down onto the hangar straight once again and this will be to come round to complete the first lap and uh, four cars it is in the lead battle and the loser really in that one uh, Ben is Tim De Silva because he was fourth on the grid he's dropped down to about ah, seven safety car and I think it's because of the car that's gone off at Abbey um, so they will have to slow down and they will be guided around by the safety car um, Martin Stretton's just gained a couple of places on the lap hand up just from the race leaders say yep yeah, I see safety car uh, it's quite a good indicator to do that. Uh, I don't think everyone's seen it yet, though suddenly now they realise. And it, it, sometimes it's good to notify everybody that you've seen the message so that you all back off. Um, the driver is out of the car that's gone off at Abbey. Um, uh, I can just see him from our commentary box actually walking across with the marshals. So he's perfectly safe. I'm not sure who it is, I'm afraid, because we couldn't see the car and I can't see it now from our angle. It's hidden behind a barrier. So I'm afraid I can't tell you who it is that went off but um, hopefully we'll find out in a moment or two who it was, and they're perfectly OK, they're out of the car. It's just a disappointing start to the day for them, uh, so we shall see. It's probably whoever's right down at the back of the field, isn't it, Alistair? So we might be able to work it out in a moment or two. We yeah, it looks see. like we've got three cars that haven't uh, completed the first lap. OK. And I think it was, uh, I saw two go off here. At ah, look, we've got a, a picture there of one of the cars. Oh, it's a bit of damage into the gravel trap. Looks like there was actually contact, not just a running yes. wide business. Um, so that's a bit of a shame. 
So uh, it looks like it could be uh, the number 94 car, could be one of those involved, uh, Martin the, Wood. The one that was in the gravel there looked like Daniel Clayfield's okay, car right. with uh, two wheels at uh, funny angles, wasn't it? And uh, I just caught it out of the corner of my eye and it looked like two of them just interlocked wheels, one of those things that happens. Safety car then leading the field around in what is a sprint race, as you can see, there's only 16 and a half minutes to go, so hopefully they can get these cars moved out fairly quickly so that we can get back into some racing action. Um, you mentioned that both the two leading cars are marches with a bit of a time difference and a year gap difference, four years gap in fact, between them. One was built in 1978, that's the lead car, and that is a car that has uh, a bit of ground effect, a big side pods. By the way, there's a big JCB just going past us now, which is going to pick up the car in the gravel trap, so hopefully they'll get that sorted out very quickly. Um, yeah, four-year gap between the two leaders here. The first car with ground effect uh, technology that was coming in at that stage, only just beginning to, to sort of come in in Formula 2. Formula 1, it was very, very key at that point in, with Lotus, of course. Um, but aero, aerodynamically, definitely more grip from the later cars. And the 1974, the yellow car, 1974 car, the aerodynamic side perhaps a little less uh, strong. Didn't win the championship march in 1974. It was actually an Alpine BMW, Jean-Pierre Jabouy, who won the title in that year. Um, so it wasn't the best year for March, but I have to say the yellow one here is going pretty effectively, isn't it, uh, in the hands of Andrew Smith. Let's just take a little look back at that start. I'm not sure we're going to see what happened at the back, but it was a good battle up front, particularly good start from Andrew Smith in third place initially, but he went side by side into Abbey Corner and just about managed to hang on. Now, I don't know if we've got anything in the background that will show us no, we're focused on the leader, understandably, so we didn't quite see who it was or what the clash was into that first corner, into Abbey, that has taken out at least one, maybe a couple of cars, um, and they are recovering the car right now. Hopefully, if we get a chance, we'll tell you. Uh, they are heading back in our direction near the commentary box, so we should be able to tell you uh, which car it is that has definitely ended up in the gravel trap there. Leader still weaving around, keeping a bit of tyre temperature on the leading group as they come up the Hamilton Strait, this area of track named now after Sir Lewis Hamilton, who uh, you know, he's working hard himself this weekend, of course, in Hungary as he tries to continue the challenge. So it is car number 23 that went off, I gather. Uh, yep, that's uh, Korberg in the March 733. That, uh, and we're just seeing a confirmation of that. So a great shame. Uh, have lost him from the race early on. He's perfectly OK, though. We saw him step away, uh, but there is definitely some damage to the car. We can see the lower left rear wishbone is uh, actually hanging off, I can see, from our angle. Alistair? Yes, uh, it, it, it's a tangle of wheels, isn't it? It's one of those unfortunate things that can happen in open-wheel racing, and uh, one driver just slightly wider than perhaps the other one expected, and that uh, they interlock and uh, spun off. There's a, another car around the corner that we can't see uh, yet that has, has to be recovered as well. We saw that in the pictures, I think, in the gravel trap. But, uh, the driver walking rather disconsolately towards his car being recovered. OK, well, the safety car still controlling the machinery at the moment. And uh, we've got some fantastic cars out here today. And... Uh, Thanks to Alan, the secretary of HSCC, who has been in touch using my uh, Twitter tag, at Ben Edwards TV. Don't know if you know what he says, but uh, near the back, the number 37 orange car uh, is uh, Lincoln Small driving it, but it's an ex Derek Bell car, which is fun to hear, isn't it? The Brabham BT30, so Derek Bell raced that car back in the day. And the number 50, March 712, which is being driven by Paul uh, Basin. March 712, that is an ex-James Hunt car. So, you know, you've got cars with some tremendous history amongst the field here, and it's great to see them. Basin, uh, quite a long way down the order, he's down in 33rd place, but it's great to see a car that was raced by James Hunt back in the day, uh, running around in this race. And uh, he says, watch out for Matthew Watts as well, because he could be putting in a good display in car number nine. Well, Matthew's moved up to third, he qualified, in sixth place so 
Alan's absolutely right there, Alistair, because Matthew Watts has moved up into third position. And the safety car lights are out, so uh, we've got a little bit of uh, debris there in one of the gravel traps, but uh, that looks like, oh, that's actually on a, a runoff area, isn't it? There's just a piece of fiberglass come off one of the cars, so that presumably will be left where it is. It's actually right in front of us, Ben. Yeah, on and the, the gravel trap, yes. Exit of Abbey. Hopefully that will be OK. But we are getting ready for a restart now for this historic Formula 2 race. The guy is just weaving around, getting a bit of tyre temperature back. The safety car has come back in and we're getting ready to go racing again and absolutely launching it. Matthew Wrigley uh, almost catching everybody else out. Andy Smith in second place, losing at a few car legs and actually he's going to be under some pressure from Miles Griffiths. Well, no, in fact, Matthew it's Watts. Matthew Watts, yep. isn't it? Yep. Matthew Watts who's in third place. So Matthew really is on a charge and trying to chase down second place. Great restart, clever restart by Matthew Wrigley up to Formula One levels. I think Max Verstappen would have uh, been happy with a restart like that, pulling away several car legs there in these very rapid Formula Two cars from the 1970s. And second place could become a very close battle between Smith, Watts and Griffiths because uh, Miles Griffiths is still in the hunt there. He qualified on the front row, has dropped back into fourth place for the moment but he's not going to give up. Here we go, battle for second. Race leader into Brooklands, bit of a gap, but oh, it's close behind. It is indeed, and uh, some great slipstreaming going on down the Brooklyn, uh, down the Wellington Strait into Brooklands, and a, a challenge there from Miles Griffiths on the inside of Matthew Watts as they go through Luffield, out onto the old Woodcut corner and the old pit straight there, and Andrew Smith not losing touch. In fact, I think he's closing in on the leader, Matt Wrigley, as they come down towards Cops Corner, the blindingly fast right-hander. The top four are pulling away a little bit, but Martin Stretton's had a good restart. He's made up several places. He's gone up to seventh place after what was originally a bit of a disappointing first lap. The green flag just indicating to everybody, get out there and race, which is exactly what they're doing, and racing very hard indeed, with Matthew Wrigley still in control, the man who started from pole. And for now, Andrew Smith has managed to hold on to second place with Matthew Watts in third place. But this foursome are very, very close indeed, and it could go anyway. Rob Weldon is next up. He's in fifth place, but there's a bit of a gap back to Weldon, then De Silva and Martin Stretton. Actually, Tim, Tim De Silva's got ahead of Weldon and gone into fifth place. Right. So a uh, good move from him after what was a, a fairly poor start. But the leader's now coming into club corner through the fast left, the historic club corner, much faster than the Grand Prix club corner, and through the right-hander and out onto the Hamilton straight once again. These four cars absolutely in the battle for the lead, aren't they? They are, and in fact, now that uh, he lost a bit of time, didn't he, on the restart, did to Andrew Smith, but now he's really picked up the pace again and he's chasing down. And look, he set fastest lap to so the, the, the yellow car, second place. That has, oh, he's ever so quick. That was a bit too quick into Village almost. Lost a bit of time, but very, very brave on the late breaks there. Andrew Smith chasing down Matt Wrigley. Matt Wrigley is still our race leader uh, from Smith in second place. Matt Watts, Matthew Watts in third position. And he's being chased all the time by Miles Griffiths, the front row car, car number 19 there, still putting the pressure on, the Rolt RT1. So we've got a Rolt in amongst the marches at the moment. And then uh, De Silva up there, he's moved up well, currently in fifth place in car number three. Weldon, Dwyer and Stretton, Don and Charter is completing the top ten for now. Callum Grant down in 12th place, Mark Hazel in 13th. And it looks to me as though uh, Andrew Smith has a little bit more speed in the corners than the leader, Matt Wrigley. That's where he seems to be able to break later and close up a little bit on the leader. We get into the fast sweeps and uh, Matt Wrigley seems to have a slight advantage. Now into Beckett's. This must be really focusing the mind of these four drivers, the fabulous Beckett sweepers as they come through. The last element, the right-hander, which leads out towards Chapel Curve and onto the hangar straight. Miles Griffiths there bringing up the tail end of this group of four for the lead, and uh, Matt Wrigley now feels he needs to move around a little bit on the track there, trying to break the toe of Andrew Smith behind into Stoke Corner. It is great the way they run these cars in their original livery. It's absolutely beautifully done. And uh, there's the Rolt, white, uh, that one, but uh, some great colour schemes going on. But it's good racing too, as Wrigley continues to control the lead. Um, just learnt that uh, Court Berg, who we saw cars, uh, ended up in the gravel trap. Great disappointment. Uh, he's made his way from Denmark to join the series. He spent a number of years restoring that car, so very bit disappointing that he's ended up out of the race. But he's OK, that's the main thing. I'm sure he'll be back. Martin Stretton is the back of this little group. He's attacking hard. 
Yes, absolutely, Martin Stretton after that rather poor start for Martin and uh, he's managed to make his way up onto the back of the group battling for fifth place, led, led at the moment by Tim De Silva with uh, Rob Weldon, then Martin Stretton at the back here, you can see in the much older car, but as you said earlier, this has had the two-litre engine fitted, so it's got the same sort of engine as the car ahead, but much, much earlier aerodynamics, and Martin Stretton makes a move down the Wellington Strait and gets through. Martin Stretton moves up into sixth place. Yeah, a very experienced racer, He's done a lot of historic Formula One racing over the years, always incredibly rapid. Uh, can get into anything and be fast. You can see how twitchy the car is, how much it's moving around, how little downforce it has compared to some. There's a yellow flag there. Somebody has gone off. I don't know uh, who has gone off. Could be from further down the grid. We didn't actually see it. But Martin Stretton is now putting pressure on Rob Weldon as well, isn't he? Absolutely. Uh, on oh, Tim sorry, De Silva. Tim, yeah, 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 yeah. Tim, Tim De Silva, Silva. Yeah. Past Rob Weldon. Tim De Silva next up, the number three car. So he's putting pressure on that as Matt Wrigley sets a new fastest lap, 157 now, point two, the race leader trying to open up the advantage, but this is a really close battle between Tim and Martin Stretton, let's see how this goes, and then it's still close between the top two, look at that, Smith getting even closer to Matt Wrigley as they head down towards Stowe Corner, and right in the slipstream, not able to get a toe to draw alongside, right following closely and how the tyres continue. We've only got five and a half minutes, so there's not a lot of time. He's got to go for it. Absolutely, he has, yes, as they go into club corner. And this is where I think he's much quicker than the leader. He just seems to be able to take the car through the tighter sections of the circuit a little bit quicker, out onto the Hamilton straight now, up towards Abbey and Farm, the fast right and left and they go through, but uh, Andrew Smith not in a position to challenge here, but watch now as he's much later on the break. Right up towards the leader, Matt Wrigley, comes almost under the rear wing, then the short run up to the left-hander at the loop, closes up again, and now out through Aintree. And Martin has moved up in a fifth, he's got past to Silver, so Martin Stretton, but it's a bit of a gap between fourth and fifth. Whether Martin's going to, I don't think he's really going to be able to close that gap, but he's got to the head of the next group. We are still back with the leaders here, though, who is going to win this race. It's, it's a a feisty battle between these two. The 1978 car, suitably enough, with number 78 on the uh, rear wing end plate, and then the number 77 car, that's actually from 1974. Both the March Formula 2 cars of their particular era, and uh, in 1978, it was Bruno Giacomelli who dominated the European Formula 2 championship. He had eight wins that year, so it was a, a stunning title win. He won by 30 points from Mark Sura, who also raced in uh, March that year, and Derek Daly was a Formula 2 front runner in a Chevron. But we've got our own battle on our hands here. And a fabulous battle it is too, as they go through the Beckett sweepers, and it's still Matt Wrigley leading from Andrew Smith in second place. Andrew Smith, this section of the circuit, perhaps not the best for him, the fast hangar straight, as they, it's the fastest part of the Silverstone circuit, and has been for many years as they come down towards Stowe Corner, and Andrew Smith not able to challenge there. But now we're coming through Stowe, and then dip down into the, the Vale and then into club, and that's where Andrew Smith closes up again. Meantime, behind, it's still a great battle for third place, isn't it, between Miles Griffiths and uh, Matt Watts. Yeah, in fact, Griffiths hit back into that third place, so that is going well. Watts has just dropped back a little bit again after a really strong push earlier on. The leader's lapping a back marker, and still with three and a half minutes to go, so the next time they come around, they'll start their final lap, but uh, a little bit of time still left for Smith keep the pressure on, he is keeping the pressure on, he goes really late on the brakes and they come into Village Corner side by side, oh he's going to get the inside line, into the left hander of the loop, he's taking the lead, Andrew Smith has taken the lead, Bart Wrigley's coming back, Matt Wrigley's got the inside line as they come through Aintree and he retakes it once more, what a fight. Absolutely brilliant and they both give each other plenty of racing room and they come down towards the left hander at Brooklands but look who's caught them, Miles Griffiths is now right on the lead battle so we've got three cars for the lead, it's Matt Wrigley, it's Andrew Smith, and then it's Miles Griffiths. Miles Griffiths going for the inside on Andrew Smith through Luffield. Wow, yeah, he's taken that inside line. I thought they might touch. Oh, into the gravel trap. What a shame. Oh, I don't want to see that. Uh, Smith gets run wide there. Just give each other space, guys, because it's such a good race. We want to see this go all the way. Race leader still Matt Wrigley, but I have to say Griffiths is really on the case at the moment. He seemed to struggle initially but he set fast his lap and he is now chasing our race leader. 
Absolutely brilliant drive from Miles Griffiths. Just such a shame for Andrew Smith to just get uh, pushed out into the gravel a little bit there. But the leader's coming through Beckett's. They're coming down to start the last lap. We've got a whole more lap of this, Ben. Absolutely fabulous race as Miles Griffiths. Uh, and we have a oh, red flag. Yeah, we have a red flag. We can see it from our, our commentary position. Uh, it's just come up on screen now. I don't know. Oh, number 31 car has gone off. What a shame. Uh, that's going to spoil the end of this race, I believe. That's Rob Wainwright's Crosley. Uh, it's ended up in the gravel on the exit of club. He's out of the car, but of course, it's in a very dangerous position. They've had to red flag it. You cannot leave a car there and continue the race. And I'm afraid that will be the end. And it, it means a, a well-earned victory by Matt Wrigley, but I'm just a little disappointed because we had such a battle. I'd love to have seen that go all the way to the chequered flag. That was an absolutely classic Formula 2 race, wasn't it? Fast, furious, well-driven. And uh, I feel sorry for Andrew Smith, actually, because he, uh, he really was... Uh, right there and here's our incident with Rob Wainwright just spun into the gravel lost it coming through the old woodcut corner uh, a scary place to lose the car actually very disappointing well, it's actually out of it's actually out of oh. uh, club corner isn't sorry it? yes yeah, yes uh, across the uh, yeah. just before apologies. the start finish line yeah. but sadly he's out and it has ended the race because that was such a great tussle going on up front uh, but it means that the winner of the Formula 2 race is Matt Wrigley he did enough to hold on, having earned pole position yesterday. He won the start, he won the restart even more effectively. And even though he was under massive pressure towards the end of the race, he ended up taking the victory. So well done to Matt Wrigley, who is the winner. There he is, car number 78 uh, from pole position to a race win. Uh, but he had to fight very, very hard for it indeed. And we saw a big battle behind. Now, uh, just checking the timings coming through at the moment. Because of the red flag, uh, so that, I think that's changed the top three order, hasn't it? Yes, it has. Uh, we go back a lap uh, to the previous uh, finish line positions, timing line positions, uh, before the red flag. So actually, uh, Andrew Smith will get pushed back up into second place so uh, uh, I, I do I still feel sorry for him because uh, he, he did try on that last lap but actually he doesn't lose the place but uh, we're gonna have an interesting podium conversation aren't we? let's take a look at the result of the historic Formula 2 race ending under a red flag but what a battle Matt Wrigley taking the win and because the red flag came out Andrew Smith actually ended up earning second place with Miles Griffiths having to settle for third Matt Watts drove well he was fourth Martin Stretton fought his way up the order into fifth place ahead of Tim De Silva and Rob Weldon Mark Dwyer Martin Don and Mark Charteris completed the top ten Fantastic mix of cars, the March, the Crosleys, Chevrons, uh, Mark Hazel taking that 11th place. Callum Grant in the former Atlantic March 79B was 13th. Clive Wood finished in 16th place and the top 20 completed by Graham Edelman in the March 732. Adrian Flux are proud to be the Classics' official insurance partner for another year. Why not visit our stand in Purple 10 next to the Village Green today to find out how we could save you money on your insurance. We've also got all sorts of things to keep you entertained, including a Forever Cars display, Ian Cook's Hot Bang Colour masterpieces, and the chance to win a passenger lap around the track in the course car. So what are you waiting for? Adrian Flux, insurance for the individual. What is time well spent? Well, that's your business. That's why Genesis is not just coming to Europe. We come to you. Discover how our Genesis personal assistants will always respect your time.
Well, we enjoyed a, a pretty exciting Formula 2 race, historic Formula 2 race. Sadly, it was brought to a slightly early end uh, as the Crosley spun off into the gravel trap and we had to have a red flag. But nonetheless, some great action. Let's take a little look back over uh, some of the highlights of the Formula 2 race. So we've got plenty more to look forward to today. The RAC Historic Trophy is coming up next for the pre-63 GT cars. Then the Murray Walker Memorial Trophy for Historic Formula One. Uh, that's going to be an exciting battle. Thunder Sports, Classic Minis, the HGPCA pre-66 Grand Prix cars coming up at 3.30 in the afternoon. And then more touring cars, the pre-66 touring cars, the Transatlantic Trophy at 10 past four. Endurance Legends, they're coming up later in the day. Then the Masters Historic Sports Cars and the big one at the end of the day is going to be wonderful to see. The RAC Woodcut, uh, Sterling Moth Trophies. They are coming up at the end of the day, racing until 9 p.m. tonight. Well, wherever you are, whether you're on track or here uh, at Silverstone or watching on the sidelines, we're looking forward to seeing our top three drivers from that Formula 2 race. Let's go down to Ed. In second place, an absolutely fantastic race, Miles Griffiths. And in third, Andrew Smith. <laughs> Matthew, I'm going to come to you first. What an absolutely fantastic race. They did not make that easy, did they? Um, no, definitely did not make that easy, and I uh, think I probably looked out slightly that red flag. When I saw Miles in the mirrors, I thought it was going to be bloody hard work for the last few laps, but it's, uh, it's how it goes, and I sort of uh, kept it clean. We didn't drive that tidily for the first couple of laps, but it is what it is, and it's great to be up here. Miles, I've got to ask, you suddenly seem to find a lot more pace at the end there. What, what happened? Just a bit of sleep at the start, really. Um, and then just following these guys, I didn't do any laps on Thursday, so first dry laps were today, so it took a while to get going. You probably wished you had another lap. Yeah, I would have definitely had a crack, but we'll see what happens tomorrow. And finally, Andrew, what a few corners for you. You went from first to third. What, what a gut-wrenching end. Uh, yeah, it was second to first, down to second, then back down to first. But um, yeah, it was a, that was an exciting last lap, definitely. Well done to all of you. Congratulations. Cheers, thank you. There we go. Oh, oh, so, so great celebration is completed for the historic Formula 2 cars and uh, 
three happy chaps having done a, a very exciting race for us all and we enjoyed ourselves there just a little bit of a shame that it ended under the red flag but that's part and parcel of racing that's how it goes sometimes you've got to be up front and it counts when you get across the line so matt wrigley taking the victory in the historic formula yeah, two race right. And we're looking forward to the uh, Royal Automobile Club Tourist Trophy for historic cars, the pre-63 GTs, which will be coming out in a few moments' time. Some great classics to look forward to. Things like Jaguar E-Types, Austin Healey 3000s. Uh, we've got Lotus Elites as well. Let's go back down to the paddock with Nikki Shields. Popular demand. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Mike Brewer with his car clinic here at the Classic. Mike, good to see you. Uh, it's lovely to see you, Nikki. It's not the Classic without you. A real it? person. You're not on Zoom. Hey, I know we it's a. I know. We can touch each no, other, we can hug. It's weird. legal. It is actually legal now. We can actually really touch each other. It is wonderful. It's wonderful to be in a physical space and see smiling people yeah. and uh, and touch it. Yeah. There are. It's lovely, isn't it? Isn't that nice? They're here to see you. <laughs> and I've missed that. You know, that's the one thing I think I've missed. And we missed it at Silvers and Classic last year. You know, it's a, uh, this is the highlight of the year, not only for me and for you, but for all of these people as well. And, and to miss it last year, you can see the determination in people's faces to really enjoy themselves this oh, year. Yeah. We were all here at 8 a.m. this morning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're here for the full day. Um, so tell us, what are you doing? What have you got going on behind you? We can see potentially is this a... It's oh, not. I'm, I'm not buying it. I'm, I'm, it, I'm not buying it. Who's sitting in the car. Yeah, no. This is uh, Mike Brewer's car clinics. This is uh, what we run all over the weekend. So in between the races, like now, when it gets a little bit quiet, it gives me a chance to jump on the microphone, talk about a car, talk about the history of the car, talk about the restoration of the car, any little facts about if you want to get into this world, uh, what you need to know before you dive into the classic car world. And hopefully, uh, some people out here might take some inspiration go and buy a car, they'll be in next year yeah. displaying their car. And I think that's a really interesting point there because there are a lot of people who are keen to enter into the classic car market but it's, there's so much to learn, there's so much to understand and no one wants to make a mistake so I guess doing all the research, speaking to people like you and, and finding out all the facts and the figures before you make that big purchasing decision uh, is crucial. It is very crucial. Buying a car is likely to be the second most expensive purchase you'll ever make after your house. Uh, and I say that you should fill your library before you fill your garage. Do as much research as possible. Even join a car club of the car that you want before you even buy the car. Because the chances are you're likely to find the car you want within the car club. And uh, it's an easier route to market. Plus, you're going to get a lot of people holding your hand, especially the classic car community. They're all, look at them. They're just wonderful people. <laughs> they are, look at them. They're all nodding in the background. Each other out. Um, have you, what's, I suppose, the best purchase you've made, the worst purchase oh, you've made. Oh, blimey. <laughs> uh, I've made some cracking uh, failures in my life. Yeah, a on, really good. On, share, uh, share one. <laughs> well, I, I, I can share a couple. I think one of the biggest failures, I bought an AMC Pacer in California. That's the car that was used in Wayne's World. And then my, awesome. uh, it was a great car. Yeah, I thought it had a lot of character. But my mechanic sort of, and he'd be the first to admit, he sort of ruined it. Uh, so we turned a good car into a, a good bad car into a good Terrible yeah, car. car, yeah, <laughs> terrible car. But one of my successes is right behind us, actually. It's on that on that little trailer there behind, yeah. that little Mini. That's a little Mark 1 Mini. I'm sure you can get that. Uh, that's it's not an, quite bottle green. What kind of green is uh, that? Well, it's called Almond Green Metallic. Uh, not metallic, sorry. Almond Green with a white top. Love now, that car is um, uh, belonged to John Cooper himself. So it was one really? of the cars that he used. 1967 in his advertising campaign for uh, the Metro Cooper. So that's a special car to bring here this weekend. Wow, amazing. Well, we're very excited. We won't interrupt because your car cleaning is about to get underway. Also, I know that if we go over the time, you're going to start charging me double. And you're very expensive, Trouble. Mike. Trouble. So. Trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Always a pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Brewer, get down to the car clinic. It's going to be taking place literally any minute, but you are here all weekend. All weekend, and so come and see us. Exactly. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Mike Brewer. Everyone. Adrian Flux are proud to be the Classic's official insurance partner for another year. Why not visit our stand in Purple 10 next to the Village Green today to find out how we could save you money on your insurance.
We've also got all sorts of things to keep you entertained, including a Forever Cars display, Ian Cook's Hot Bang Colour masterpieces, and the chance to win a passenger lap around the track in the course car. So what are you waiting for? Adrian Flux, insurance for the individual. The road. To freedom. Japan quality. Yokohama. Your tire. Our brains are responsible for every thought, every memory, every word, in fact, everything we ever experience. Dementia can take all that away. But looking after our brain health can reduce the risk of this happening. It's time we started to think brain health, and we can show you how. Classic at Silverstone, and we're getting ready for the next race race coming up. It is the Royal Automobile Club Tourist Trophy for Historic Cars, the MRL 363 GTs, and uh, you are looking at a very handsome E-Type Jaguar if you're looking at our screens right now. Um, wherever you are around the Silverstone circuit, I hope you're enjoying the day. Uh, dry weather, a little bit of cloud around, lots going on, not just on track uh, from this moment. Uh, just gone 11 o'clock, we've got live music from Bamboozle, the Sporting Bears Dream Rides have started, the Wall of Death, the show on the hour every hour. Uh, test drives with Genesis are going on, the Silverstone auctions are just beginning now as well. Masses going on, but we are focusing on the racing and the cars that are heading out onto the circuit right now, the pre-63 GT cars. I'm Ben Edwards, uh, joining me in the commentary box, Alistair Douglas. If you want to get in touch, then use the Twitter feed at Ben Edwards TV to uh, tell us any stories about the cars that you know, perhaps, or what you're enjoying watching out there. And uh, we are going to see some great stuff on circuit. We've enjoyed, enjoyed the races. We saw a fantastic Formula Junior race to start the day, then the pre-war BRDC 500. We've just watched a very closely fought historic Formula 2 race. And now we're getting ready for some 363 GT cars. We'll be seeing plenty of GT cars of different ages as we go through the course of this weekend. But these are some very beautiful machines. Uh, Aston Martin, just uh, seeing that go out at the moment. And uh, some great drivers as well to watch out for. The front row of this particular race is going to see uh, the cars uh, of Neil McFadden, shared with Sam Hancock, that's uh, a Jaguar E-Type that will be starting from pole position. Uh, and alongside them is going to be the uh, another E-Type of John and Jack Minshaw. It's going to be Jack Minshaw who actually starts the race here today. Uh, we're also going to see James Cottingham in an E-Type starting from third place. And then next up, it's going to be uh, an AC Cobra. So the first non-E-Type is the AC Cobra number 24 that is going to start from uh, fourth. Uh, sorry, number 24, yes, yeah, starting from fourth place. Let's take a look at the grid for the Tourist Trophy for Historic Cars. And it is uh, an E-Type 1-2-3 going into this race, which will be uh, an interesting battle between the likes of McFadden and Hancock sharing theirs, the Minshaws in their E-Type on the front row, Cossingham and Stanley, and Hunter Blakeney Edwards. We've got Blakeney Edwards back out again, this time in an AC Cobra. Nigel Greensalls in the E-Type that's starting in fifth position. And then another E-Type starting in sixth place as well. Lucas Alusa is back out in his Ferrari 250 GT bread van. Uh, that is a remarkable car. We've got Austin Healy's in the mix as well. 
And as you can see, car number, uh, also the car starting in 12th position. Car number eight is Martin Brundle, who's going to be racing. He's going to be starting the race. Cars are out, uh, coming out now and getting ready for the start. The RAC Tourist Trophy for Historic Cars is about to get underway. The cars are all lining up beautifully. Plenty of Jaguar E-types going into the race and the race gets underway. And Neil McFadden starting from pole position. He's on the left-hand side as you look at it. Looks as though Neil's making a pretty good start from the Minshaw car on the outside. Although that's going to have a little attack. And the, oh yeah, the, the Minshaw car goes ahead. It's the number 133 car. And it's a Minshaw who moves in front. Great start by them. And pushed back down to second place is Neil McFadden. And then it's all getting very, very close for third. I think Neil McFadden actually has gone back to about fifth place now. I think it's the Cottingham uh, E-Type that's come up into second. But bear in mind, the, there are two drivers in this race. And if the quicker driver qualified the car and the slower driver started, we'll see cars dropping back down through the order. And you can see McFadden now being challenged by the Ferrari bread van. And uh, also in there is Martin Hunt in the silver Cobra as well. Look at the battle for the lead. It's going side by side as they head down towards Brooklands. And it looks like a pretty good move coming down the inside. Nigel Greensall, uh, I think, has managed to squeeze through. He has. So Nigel Greensall in the number 179 car starting this race uh, that he's sharing with David Gooding has made a lovely manoeuvre to get past. The number 133, Jack Minshaw, in that car currently, but it's mighty, mighty close. It is indeed. Three E-types making their way through, and uh, the uh, car from pole position down to about fifth or sixth place. But here we come now. They spread out three abreast almost into Cops Corner, and turning in first is Nigel Greensall from Jack Minshaw, John Minshaw's son, the young, young Jack. He's, well, he's about 30 now, uh, and uh, he's being chased by James Cottingham. Yeah. in the 66 car. There's the bread van from the back, very strange shape. This is good battle for second, James Cottingham. Really pushing, putting the pressure on. Oh, look at that, over the curb, bouncing around a little bit. But yeah, Cottingham has got into second place, hasn't he? I think uh, the Minshaw car uh, has dropped back down into third position now. Yep, there you are, the 133. So Jack Minshaw's dropped down into third place. As you say, the Ferrari in fourth place, bit of a chance perhaps to, to close up that gap and get on terms with the E-types. But it's an E-type 1, 2, 3 for now. The Ferrari wasn't uh, done any favours by the wet qualifying session yesterday, a really tough qualifying session for that car. And it actually started in seventh place, Lucas Halusa. But now it's being able to stretch its legs as it goes around Stowe Corner, down into the Vale, and then into the left-hander at Club Corner. And it's still Nigel Greensall leading, drifting the car around. Lovely to see these cars moving around so much, isn't it, Ben? Yeah, it is. Martin Brundle, by the way, is in sixth place. Uh, yeah, it is the Martin Brundle uh, commentator, XF1 driver. He's in sixth place and he's made up a little bit of ground already on this opening lap. But Nigel Greensall is sailing away at the moment in front, not getting away too far from James Cottingham in second place. But these E-types being driven absolutely on the limit. We're going to see plenty of E-type action over the course of the weekend. We are celebrating 60 years of the Jaguar E-type being in existence. And the Ferrari is having a good close battle for third. Absolutely, yes. And I think we'll see the Ferrari up with the leaders fairly soon once he can get by. And he does. He goes through on the inside at the loop and up towards Aintree. And uh, Cottingham looking for the inside there. Both of them drifting on opposite lock through the left-hander at Aintree. Now onto the Wellington straight. They come down the long straight. They're looking now for their break breaking point for the left-hander at Brooklands. There go the brakes, the front dips, and they turn in now to the left-hander. Very defensive line from Nigel Greensall there. He knows Cottingham's looking for a way through. Yep, that was well held. Uh, Brundle uh, has just got into sixth place, uh, holding on to that sixth place. But it's the battle for the lead we are watching at the moment. Nigel Greensall still just about fending off James Cottingham. Greensall getting a bit, a bit too sideways over the kerb, but he held it together. But that has given Cottingham a good run, good exit. The pit boards are up there for this, these teams who are based up at the top end, the national pits. And there's an attack from Cottingham, and he's down the inside into Cops Corner. Lovely move on the brakes. Nigel Greensall finds himself back in second place. Very evenly matched cars. Absolutely, yeah, and they look very similar as well, don't they, with the, two, the soft tops as they come through in through Maggots and then into Beckett's they go, and it's now James Cottingham leading from Nigel Greensall in second place, and uh, then it's the Ferrari bread van in third place, but we can see a two E-types in uh, fourth <laughs> and fifth. <laughs> the way Greensall just uh, flings it over the curbs to, to 
shortcut the corner. Lovely. And uh, he is still on the attack. Cottingham is in front. Greensill is now having the, picking up the toe, moving to the outside down the hangar straight, down towards Stoke Corner. Will he go for the late lunge down the inside? I don't think he's quite going to go there. Look how close he runs. And when you're running a historic car like this, Alistair, worth a lot of money, yet you're prepared to sort of almost rub bumpers. It's incredible. Well, they trust each other, don't they? they know, he knows that James Cottingham's not going to do anything silly. He's not going to try and chop off the corner and uh, they go through now in club corner and James Cottingham just a little quicker on the entry to club but will Nigel Greensill now get a better run up the Hamilton straight and maybe challenge when they come past us and into village corner we can see the bread van now has got well ahead of the two e-types behind uh, in third place and then in fourth place we've got the Jack Minshaw car and then it's James Hansen in fifth place yeah, and then Martin Brundle is still in sixth place. And there is Martin Brundle, car number eight. It's a, a slightly more basic car than some. There, there are some differences between the E-types. And uh, so we'll see how he gets on. But Brundle going well. He's under a bit of pressure, isn't he, from the number 77 car. That's Ollie Webb at the moment. Another very uh, top driver, GT driver. He's, he's driving a few different cars. And Ollie oh, has a little bit of an inside line there. Doesn't quite get alongside. Probably has to give a little lift off the throttle as Brundle has the perfect right to take the line. But I think Ollie's going to have another go. I, I think he is. And I think if we could see Martin Brundle's face, you'd see he had a smile from ear to ear. I'm sure he's really enjoying this. He knows Silverstone very well and uh, comes down into Brooklyn's hold to tight line there. A little bit defensive. You can see Brundle's helmet there, the very famous red and uh, blue stripes, the flashes on his helmet that he always wore through his Grand Prix career. And then right behind him, Ollie Webb. Ollie Webb gets a bit sideways in Luffield there, loses a little bit of time and uh, Brundle just a little bit smoother. So going well for Brundle so far, but is he going to be able to hang on in there? We shall see. Um, further down the order, we've got uh, uh, the car of Michael Martin Hunt and Pat Blakeney Edwards. That's a bit further down. He's in the 11th place at the moment. That uh, is uh, Hunt in the car at the moment. Pat Blakeney Edwards, who we saw out earlier on, uh, doing a star drive in the pre-war cars. He will be taking over at the pit stop in, an AC, in the AC Cobra. Uh, may well be able to get that car up into the top 10. But there's the Ferrari bread van, as it's known, the 250. Oh, and, and that was Brundle, I think, going over, running wide there. Yeah, he ended up going across the escape route and uh, has rejoined once again as we're looking at the top five cars all heading down the hangar straight. And a bit of pressure now being applied as well on the Minshaw machine. And that's James Hansen in the 144 car, just challenging Jack Minshaw, who's starting the car, hand over to his father, John, later in the race as they come down into the Vale, into Club Corner. And uh, it's Jack Minshaw just ahead. It is for now, but it is close, as you say, and the E-types are putting on a, a tremendous display, but there are plenty of other cars out there in this race of all different types of machinery, the Austin Healy's. The Austin Healy's were running pretty well in the damp yesterday, not perhaps performing quite so well in the dry as they did yesterday, but we may well see a bit more action from them later in the race. But these E-types slithering and sliding around, but beautifully balanced. There's one of the Austin Healy's uh, running pretty strongly at the moment. That is car number 61. That's Doug Muirhead, the car he's sharing with Jeremy Welsh. And they're currently running in 14th place, a couple of Austin Healy's together, in fact. Yes, uh, the, the big Healy's they were known as, the ones with the three-litre engines. Very successful in racing and particularly in rallying. Not a car you'd imagine would do well in rallies, but uh, they certainly did. Yeah, no, wonderful machinery and another of the classic British GT cars. That's what this tourist trophy is all about. The pre-63 GT cars of the era. Uh, 1961, the Jaguar E-Type, a little bit earlier on the Austin Healy's and uh, a very exciting car to watch. Up front, the race is still being led, but look at the Ferrari of uh, Halusa now getting right into the game, I have to say. He's doing a good job, Lucas Halusa. Uh, he's challenging for second place. Nigel Greensall uh, struggling a bit now. Maybe the car sliding around a little too much. And the Ferrari is putting the pressure on. And that Ferrari is absolutely unique. Uh, it was built by uh, Count Giovanni Volpi, or he, he had it commissioned, and it's taken second place away from Nigel Greensall into Beckett's corner, just coming out of Maggots there, into Beckett's. And uh, Count Volpi wanted to buy a Ferrari 250 GTO, which was the race version of the car that Ferrari produced, but uh, Mr. Ferrari wouldn't sell him one, so he built his own from a, a 
a slightly less competitive Ferrari 250 GT and the bread van was the result. It just went past the rather beautiful Alfa Romeo Giulietta. Uh, Sean a Sharon Edelman is uh, driving that at the moment. Sharon sharing it with Andy Willis. Beautiful little car, not quite as competitive. It's only a 1300cc engine in the Alfa. Uh, the leaders, this leading group have blasted past it very early in the race, but nonetheless, that's what's so fun to see some of these other beautiful cars out there. Fastest lap for the race leader. And that car is working extremely well at the moment, I have to say, uh, James Cottingham. He will be handing over to Harvey Stanley uh, later on in this race when we see the pit stops. It's a 50 minute race in total. So we've only had 10 minutes so far, plenty more time to go. Could see a lot of changes after those pit stops. Uh, for now though, it is the number 66 Cottingham Stanley car, but the Ferrari, not far away, only a second and a half behind. So we'll see. And meanwhile, Martin Brundle is still coming under some increasing pressure from Molly Webb. Martin did run wide, as we saw, but uh, sort of got away with it and held his position. But Martin, you could see the work on the steering wheel as he slithers and slides his way around. Molly Webb, not quite as quick in this section, but I think in the, the sort of higher speed sections, perhaps the, the, the coupe version got a little bit more straight line speed. Possibly, yes, as they go out through Aintree. Uh, Martin Brundle not sparing the apex there, is he? He's uh, uh, very, very tight. And Ollie Webb actually not sparing the exit <laughs> because he's way across the kerbs, uh, bounces back onto the track again. That will have lost him time. Uh, and that's actually, uh, that was Jack Minshaw we were looking at then. So actually the car going wide was in fact James Hansen uh, coming out of Aintree. And now we're looking at uh, one of the American cars that's entered in the race. That's uh, Alan Letts in his Chevrolet Corvette which is chasing one of the, uh, the British-built Austin Healy's, uh, the Corvette uh, uh, still being produced, of course, in a uh, completely different shape to that now. And uh, in fact, their first mid-engine car is now on sale after being front-engined all the way through until very recently. Actually, I'm a little sad about that because the yeah. front-engine Corvette's <laughs> always been a classic to me. And, and those early Corvettes are wonderful machines. They've got so much character to the look of them. Uh, here we are with that battle. Uh, for actually now for the lead because the Ferrari has really caught up, hasn't it, to James Cottingham. Uh, Lucas Alusa absolutely flying. As you said, he struggled a bit in the dam yesterday with the Ferrari, but look at it, speed in the dry. Absolutely, yes. And both these cars have been raced from day one. The, the E-Type was sent over to America. It was one of the first E-Types sent to America in 1961 and was raced from day one. Its speedo still reads one mile because it's always been a racing car. The Ferrari, uh, as I say, Count Volpe uh, built, uh, had it built and that has been raced from day one. So these are proper historic racing cars. Yeah, and they are putting on a lovely show at the moment. This is the battle for the lead here with plenty more time to go. Uh, Lucas will be driving the car throughout this race. So when he makes his pit stop, he has to do a uh, a pause, of course, in the pits, the same as everybody who are changing drivers, but he will be back out in the car. So we see he's got good pace already, and it uh, means there's a good opportunity for him today into Abbey Corner, a corner that is flat out in a Formula One car, but you could see the braking. Uh, you could see the dip on the E-Type before it turned into Abbey Corner. Very different in a car without downforce. It's a real corner, fast, but you need to hit the brakes before you go in. And Cottingham is chucking this E-Type around. The Ferrari looks, well, just looks like it's on, on rails, pretty much, in comparison. Yeah, completely different sort of car, isn't it? The, in fact, the, uh, in the time, uh, it was E-Types versus the the Ferrari 250 GTO, which was the full race version that Ferrari produced. And it was that car that proved that uh, really the E-Type was never going to be competitive in international racing. Uh, and we're seeing here a derivation of the Ferrari 250 GT racing with the E-Type. So it's, it's almost like you're back in the early 60s. Yeah, the frustration for Jaguar, where the Ferrari 250 was just that much faster and a very, very effective car. Coming up to lap, some other interesting uh, back markers as well. So just going past the uh, number 177 car, that's uh, Ken Pritchard-Jones in the Turner. Um, we haven't got many Turners in this race, but it was a classic sports car, classic British sports car in its day, wasn't it? Yes, uh, low volume, like uh, a number of cars, and they used the basis of maybe an MGB or even a Mini to, to build cars that uh, were uh, uh, very low volume. And, and Turner, very successful little make, but we don't see it anymore.
No, and we haven't got many entered. I think it's only the one turner in this particular race. We've got uh, the odd Triumph as well as a Triumph TR4. Keep your eyes out for that one. Always fun to see. Uh, we've seen there is an Ast a couple of Aston Martins out in, in this race as well. And uh, there's also a Morgan Plus 4 Super Sports, uh, Kevin uh, Kivlocken, who's in that one. So, uh, yeah, some other cars to keep an eye out for as we go through this race. But we're watching the battle up front and uh, some other battles further down the order sam tordoff the touring car driver he's in the second of these two cars yes that's the little porsche 356 uh, not not competitive for the front of the field but in his class very competitive but uh, we're not seeing him battle for the lead of the race but nevertheless sam driving the wheels off his little porsche 356 which he absolutely loves driving he's had it for many years now we're back to the lead battle and still uh, Halusa cannot get past Cottingham. Remember, Cottingham will be handing over to Harvey Stanley, uh, but Lucas Halusa will continue after the pit stops to, the, to uh, drive the Ferrari. But uh, he just can't find a way by as they go through farm and up towards the tighter right-hander at Village. Yeah, uh, well, maybe he's just sort of taking his time. Oh, dear, we've got two cars off, an E-Type and an Austin Healy. What a shame. 661, that's Neil McFadden, and the 61 is Doug Muirhead. Oh, uh, what a shame. Maybe they had a bit of uh, an incident together, and that is disappointing to see uh, two classic British sports cars. Let's see, have a look, Alistair. Let's see if we can find out what happened. Oh, actually, they both ran wide. It looks like separate incident. I wonder if there was oil down or something, or, or did he break because he saw the incident? Yeah. See, people running wide, all running a bit wide there. Yeah. Um, but then the E-Type may have got off because he lifted mid-corner. And, of yeah. course, if you lift mid-corner, the back end swings around on you. Thankfully, thankfully, he didn't actually hit the Austin Healy. He went off into the same area. My goodness, they could have made contact. I, I think the marshals would have had the slippery surface flags out immediately if there was anything on the track. So I think you're right. It was just the E-Type lifted off. Look at this. They all, the marshals are almost helping get the car out. Yeah, they're Fantastic pushing. effort. <laughs> Big smile on the I don't think they're quite going to do it. He's too yeah. far into the gravel. Marshals, well done guys, having a, a great uh, weekend, helping as many drivers as possible to get back on the road. The British Motorsports Marshals Club, uh, if you want to become a marshal, by the way, they've got a, a centre up uh, between Cops Corner and Beckett's up on the inside. Uh, up there, you can go and have a chat with the guys and uh, find out what it is to become a marshal. A wonderful volunteer uh, opportunity to be at an event like this and totally involved in everything that's going on, making it happen. Absolutely, yes. Well, racing wouldn't run without the, uh, the marshals, that's for sure. As we watch the leaders, we've got a local yellow flag at that incident at the moment, which was at uh, Beckett's, wasn't it? Um, so they're not needing at the moment to put out a safety car, which is good news, as we see a triumph in the pits. Jonathan Turner's car. Yeah, looks like they're in trouble chatting okay. the bonnet off, so clearly some sort of engine malady. And we do have a safety car. That's uh, that's unfortunate. Hope, I was hoping they might be able to clear that incident. We'll bring the field but together again, though, won't it? It will. Yes. I wonder if uh, people will um, if you choose this time to make a pit stop. Uh, there's the 661 car with a driver getting a bit of power on, trying to drive it out the gravel. But there's no. You go. Oh dear! Careful, guys. You don't want to touch the wall. But it is driving out of the gravel. Look. Yeah. Well, yesterday, with all the rain, the gravel compacted and uh, the cars were driving out of it. So hopefully there's still a bit of compacting in there. But Sam Hancock's taking that car over, so I'm glad it's back on track because it'd be great to see Sam yeah. out racing. Yeah, it would be good to see him uh, driving that car. And that's but well beached, isn't it? Yeah, I don't think they're going to get that out. That's uh, why we've got the safety car out, because they're going to need to get a, a vehicle out there to tow it out of the gravel. Marshalls did a great job trying to push it, but I, it's just too deep into there so uh, they're going to have to rescue that car and you can't really let the racing continue when you've got a car in the gravel in a, a key area like that which would be so easy to hit as we saw the e-type nearly hit it when it went off uh, uh, so that's a tricky one there's that beautiful little alfa romeo uh, the sharon edelman andy willis car 1300 cc and uh yeah it's just a, a unique shape isn't it from that period and 1962 car uh, runs in class A in this pre-63 GT. Heading into the pits, one of the uh, Aston Martins, number 98 there we're looking at. That is the Nigel Winchester uh, Chas Mallard AC Cobra, an early Cobra from 1962. Of course, they went on to become pretty dominant. Oh, and there's an Austin Healy also running a little bit uh, off track. That's the uh, Theo Hunt Fred Waitman car. 
And there's a problem, I think, with uh, it. Yes, I think he's decided to pull well to the side of the track so that it didn't impede anyone else. But that looks like there's a mechanical failure for Theo Hunt. Oh. That's a shame. Fred Wakeman uh, was going to be sharing that car. Beautiful looking car, a nice, lovely livery, isn't it? There's another yeah. of the Austin Healy's, number 207. That's the Crispin Harris uh, driven car at the moment. He's sharing it with James Wilmoth. And that has the uh, classic three litre engine inside. And now we've got James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> we do. That's a very beautiful Aston Martin, isn't it? Yes, they're, they're very purposeful from the, uh, from the front, aren't they? The, uh, the 14 car that's driven by Les Gobel, that's a, a DB4. So uh, slightly earlier, I think it was DB5, wasn't it, that uh, James Bond had. But, uh, that's the slightly earlier car, but uh, very, very similar looking. Yeah, very beautiful car indeed. Some great classic British sports cars out in this race. We've got the odd little uh, Lotuses as well, uh, running down towards the tail end of the field. Uh, driver getting across the tyre barriers. Uh, that's always a bit of a challenge. You can easily fall down into the tyres, but... Uh, as we know, tyre barriers still work. They might not be modern technology, but as we saw here at Silverstone, that uh, rather nasty incident with uh, Max Verstappen hitting the wall, the tyre barriers still absorb a lot of energy. Um, so this was when he pulled off the track, but clearly something was already wrong with the car when he did this because he, he realised he was going to have to um, come off to the side of the track. But at least he's, he's put it in a place where they can rescue it quite quickly. Um, it is on the exit of Club Corner now. So it is mm. right opposite a pit lane. It's a shame. There's no way in, though. There's no gap no. across there that's very easy to get to. So this is causing a bit of a, a bit of a delay in the race, but it will bunch everybody back together. And the pit window is open. So in theory, they can do their pit stops, yes, under safety car conditions. So it's a good time to make your pit stop, to be honest. Might as well get everybody to come into the pits and do your pit stop while we're under safety car. Marshalls have uh, got to Theo Hunt's car now, but as you say, it's quite a long way to anywhere off the, to come off the track, so that may need a tow, unless they can pull it back to the outside of Club Corner. There is the safety car leading them around. A few cars now coming in. They're using the national pits, so that's car number 99. Uh, Kevin Kiflocken, who's staying in the car, so his, his guys have just uh, got a stopwatch running, and they'll tell him, OK, you've done your suitable time stop and back on your way but it's a very pretty Morgan isn't it yeah that, that's an example of the four-wheel Morgan we saw Sue Derbyshire's three-wheeler Morgan and uh, you you may recognize this shape of car for new cars because really the shape of the Morgan hasn't changed that much still built in Malvern and uh, although it's under Italian ownership now it's uh, still very very traditional in its build uh, processes and Kevin Kivlochen known uh, in the racing world as Keiki uh, is a multiple champion in historic racing in another Morgan that he owns and also a, an AC Cobra that he owns as well. A very experienced driver, Scotsman. Looks like he's about to be sent back out again. But this is a, a 1961 Morgan, so very original. I noticed um, the Morgan Club is actually, they've got a collection of cars just up behind where our commentary box is, one of the many uh, car clubs that are gathered here at Silverstone this weekend. Yes, ju just on your right as you come over the bridge, isn't That's it? Right. Yeah, nice to see. And uh, the car at uh, Club has been cleared, Theo Hunt's car. Yeah, they've moved it right to the outside, which is a pretty safe place for it, to be fair. Um, so it doesn't need to be towed all the way back in. So hopefully we will see the safety car heading into the pits relatively soon. Uh, we have seen quite a few pit stops made, but not by everybody. Uh, the Nigel Greensaw car has been in the car that was battling up front it's now going to be david gooding who drives that car but we haven't seen all the leaders come in yet i don't think they've been round to the pit lane yet oh uh, no they're, they're heading there now yeah, it's they, such a long way. lap that uh, they they've not yet got there so that i think we're going to see a huge line of cars coming into the pits now to do their mandatory stops yeah yeah it'll be a busy pit lane um, as they head on around let's see are we going to see plenty entering in Nice uh, streaking of cars. Um, that was the car that spun in sympathy, wasn't it? Yeah. Into the gravel. And James, I think that will be James Hansen at the wheel. There are a lot of cars heading in, and as yeah. you said, Alistair, they're not all of them, but uh, certainly there were quite a few heading down into the pit lane now. So we shall see how this all turns out. There you are, look, pit lane entry, busy place. <laughs> Austin Healy coming in, Jaguar E-types, 
all of them finding their way, being very sensible, keeping to the speed limit, otherwise they pick up a penalty. A couple of Lotus Elites there yeah. as well. Just, uh, we're now looking at the Minshaw family car. That's Jack Minshaw, uh, John's son. John climbing in. Uh, John, a hugely experienced racing driver in historics particularly, but he did many years in the British GT Championship, latterly in uh, a Lamborghini Huracan. Uh, and uh, never won the championship, but was always competitive, but now focuses on his historic racing. I gather uh, that John owns something like nine Jaguar E-types, apparently. I'm not surprised, <laughs> yes. It, it's always a question of which ones he brought today when he's entered. Amazing. What a collection of cars. And, uh, lovely to see um, racing as a family as well. Yeah. So they go through the time delay that they must sit in the pits before heading back out. A couple of cars haven't stopped yet, so that will change the order for a little while. That's uh, James Wilmoth being strapped into Crispin Harris's Ely, number 207. Change of driver there. And you can see there, the uh, these days, it's uh, a foam clock that yeah. they use. It used to be a nice silver stopwatch, didn't it, in the old days, but uh, no more. And it, when you're a driver and you've been battling around, it's, it's amazing how long it always feels sitting there. You're thinking, come on, guys, that must, surely it must be time to go by now. But you just have to sit and wait until the clock tells you you've done your allocated stop time. There's a lo lovely, pretty little MGA. And uh, just a very brief shot there of Sam Hancock going out in the 661 car. That was actually the car that spun, wasn't it, in sympathy? My apologies. I said it was 144. It wasn't. It was 661. Uh, but now it's Sam Hancock out in that car. So everybody catching back up. And then the safety car is back in. Uh, so we've got the green flag. So we are back to racing now. This has changed things a little bit because some cars have not yet come in. So actually what we now have is uh, Andrew Hibbard uh, is now leading this race. But due to make a pit stop, Andrew is driving a Jaguar, another Jaguar E-Type, car number four. Uh, but we're looking back at the car that was uh, doing so well earlier on, the James Cottingham car, now being driven by Harvey Stanley and still being chased by the Ferrari, of course. So this is likely still to be the battle for the lead, um, even though there are some cars ahead of them, uh, but it, it's sorting all out the pit stops over the next lap or so. That will all sort out again. Well, it looks to be, uh, if, if it... Uh it's confirmed as they come over the line. It looks that maybe the Pearson Brundle car uh, got ahead of these two on the pit stop as uh, the Ferrari goes for the outside at Village, but that's not going to work. He's run wide, Lucas Aluso run wide as Harvey Stanley takes the tight line, now cuts in for the apex of the loop. Ooh. And, but he goes wide there and the Ferrari gets alongside and I think this will be the, the change of position because the Ferrari has now got the inside line for Aintree and out onto the Wellington Strait. And we saw earlier in the race how quick that Ferrari is on the straight. So Harvey Stanley decides to just tuck in behind and uh, give best to the Ferrari at this point. So is this going to be a battle for the lead in the end? Or they seem to have lost out a bit on the pit stops. We'll see really when they come round next time. Everyone else is now making their pit stops. So we'll get a sort of clarification of this next time they come over the line as to exactly where they sit. But this is a key battle and the Ferrari has now moved past the E-Type that it was battling with for so long. When James was at the wheel, it's now Harvey Stanley at the wheel of that E-Type, and Lucas has uh, taken uh, full advantage of that. Indeed, yes, and uh, it, it can be a bit confusing immediately after the pit stops uh, because um, the timing line actually crosses the pit lane, and some of the cars, actually, their pit stop is before the timing line, so yeah. their last lap time into the pits is often very slow, but uh, we'll see when it shakes out at the end of this lap. Yeah, we will uh, try to get a picture then, so we shall see. Uh, the Nigel Green saw David Gooding car did come in a bit earlier uh, than the others, so whether that has gained an advantage as a result, we shall have to wait. See, this is the car that now Gary Pearson is driving. It was Martin Brundle, remember, in the early stages. It's now Gary Pearson who prepares these cars. He's a historic racer of uh, great talent, uh, but also works on the cars and makes them beautifully run well i think that's confirmation yeah. of what i mentioned earlier i think they did take the lead in the pit stop You're so right. uh, it, it looks as though uh, a great start from martin brundle now taken over by the hugely experienced gary pearson uh, to uh, which seems to have according to our timing screen a limit of some eight seconds so I'm quite sure where they made that up yes whether it was pure luck and timing in terms of when that safety yeah. because we Absolutely. see that in formula one sometimes don't we if, if you're just at the right point to come into the pits as the safety car comes out, yeah. you can sometimes gain 
Uh, quite a big thing. That's maybe yeah. what's happened here. I, I think you're right there, Ben. I think they were probably far enough back in the line of cars that, that the pit window had opened before they got there, so they were able to dive in under yeah. full safety car, whereas our leaders, uh, they missed the pit window opening and passed the pit entry. Yeah, it's, it's luck of the game, luck of the draw, but uh, it's all part of motorsport and it can uh, uh, give us some fun results. And certainly Gary Pearson will be tough to beat because he is remarkably rapid uh, in whatever he drives and it's looking good. Uh, is Martin Brundle uh, going to be race winner here? It could be the case along with Gary Pearson. Let's wait and find out. We still got 20 minutes to go, plenty of time for there to be some change in the action. And watching this is Lucas Lusa, who who was effectively fighting for the lead, but he's now some 48 seconds behind, isn't he? Yeah, it's, uh, we've got a, a, an Austin Healy pulling off, and that's trailing oil, oh. I'm afraid, and it's put oil all down the end of the Hamilton Strait, although, thankfully, it's not on the line into Abbey Corner, but it's certainly on the line on the run into Abbey, so we may have uh, slippery surface flags going out to warn the drivers so of that. That's something we're seeing from our commentary box. There it is, in fact, picked up on camera very quickly. Um, it is the Christian van Lanschot car, Austin Healy 3000. So this was just a moment ago that you saw, Alistair. Yes, that was uh, Van Lanschot pulling off to the left, uh, right in front of us here. Sorry, slipped back into the uh, circuit commentary there, and look, oh, well, looking out of the window at what fine. was going on. I uh, didn't realise you weren't seeing it on the screen, but that's what happened. Uh, that is a really famous car as well. That's an ex-works car that raced at Le Mans three times in the 60s, but uh, that's a very big blow-up of the engine. Painful, painful. Um, driver is out of the car, um, but uh, Marshall's uh, keeping an eye on it. So, let's go back to what's happening in the race. And it is very comfortable lead at the moment for the Gary Pearson Martin Brundle car with Gary at the wheel right now. A 16, 16 second lead. That's a good advantage, isn't it? Over the number 144 car, the machine of uh, Paul Tocchio and James Hansen. I'm not sure which is in the car now, but uh, the. The oil that's uh, on yeah. the track is, is causing some issues for drivers. They're not seeing it as they come up the Hamilton straight, but uh, the Ferrari actually pulls over uh, well away from it. They have, the marshals have put up the uh, the typical stripey flag yes, uh, have, on the yeah. approach to Abbey, but they, oh, yeah, I've just seen an E-type on the oil. Oh, there's an E-type in front of our commentary box has just got off at Abbey. There you are, picked up on screen. Oh, it's the 133 car that was doing so well. It's the Minshaw E-type. That was purely down to oil. He was on the oil as he braked and turned in, and we could see it from our commentary position, and it just went away completely. And before that, drivers had had some big wobbles. They didn't realize oil was down. It really needs maybe picking up that oil um, because it's causing problems. And that's John Minshaw, sadly. Let's have a, let's see, well, we see the end of it there. Yeah, John just got caught. We'd seen off camera, we'd seen out of our window, uh, and John is actually pointing at the oil, saying to the marshals, you need to, deal with that because that was a, a scary a scary incident for John but um, the we'd seen the marshals waving the flags but the drivers don't know where the oil is do they? Martin Brundle could end up winning this race he's standing on the sidelines at the moment but he his car or the car that he's sharing uh, with Gary Pearson I should say um, he is out in front and Gary has quite a big lead some 11 seconds uh, over the Hanson machine, the uh, David Gooding, Nigel Greensill car in third, and Lucas Alusa in the Ferrari, which has set the fastest lap, is lapping oh, five seconds a lap faster than the cars ahead of it. But the gap has really grown. Uh, that's Gary Pearson talking to Martin Randall. Oh, so who, so what's going on there then? Oh, they're in the pit. Yeah, the cars in the pit. They had a problem with it. We didn't see that. No, Safety we didn't. car is out. Safety car. There, oh yeah, the car's the in the car, pit. Yeah, I just uh, you said Martin Brundle standing there, and then the camera pans right. slightly to the right, and his co-driver standing there as well. We didn't see the car was there, but there it is, car eight in the pit. Oh, what a shame! And they're talking to James Hansen in the background there as well, one of the drivers from the other E-types. Oh, so it's all change again. What a pity. Uh, but Martin laughing anyway. He's been through plenty over his year, over the years. Well, did, did I say earlier he'll have a smile from ear to you ear when he was that. racing? And he just loves his racing, doesn't he? He's, uh, so safety car is yeah. being run because of the oil down. Uh, there's some more oil flags being shown by the marshals now, and I do understand that. I think very sensible. There are 16 minutes to go in this race, but that slippery area 
really quite dangerous, particularly if cars are running side by side up into Abbey Corner. Um, we can see it from our commentary position. There's still this long line of, mm -hmm. of slippery, oily surface, and it's right on the, it's the perfect there. You can see it on the right. You just see a slight sheen, and that is the braking and turning point. And you can see some of the tyre marks, and when John Minshaw came up there, he was absolutely on that line. And that's what we saw suddenly. He just hurtled off the road because there was no grip. So I'm afraid that's what oil does. You don't see it so much nowadays in modern motorsport because hopefully there's less uh, opportunities for leakages. But in older cars, it does happen quite often with engine blow-ups, etc. And uh, it really caught John out. But um, it has meant the safety cars back out again. And it also means we've got a different leader now because the Pearson Rundle car has uh, come back into the pits. It also means, of course, they will all be close together when the race restarts. So we could yep. be up for quite an exciting restart. And uh, Nigel Greensall actually uh, is back up into second. We did see that before, but we were so busy talking about everything else going on. But Nigel Greensall, who'd lost places early on, take it now handed over to uh, David Gooding, uh, had actually leapfrogged the Ferrari and the uh, leading E-Type, again, due to the when the pit stop uh, window opened and whether they were able to get into the pits or not. Yeah, so the drivers all know where the oil is now, so they're all sticking to the middle of the track. But yeah, but uh, I guess once the safety car has picked up the whole, it hasn't picked yeah. up the whole field yet. It's taking a while because it was so spread out. It's taking a while to get them all um, up to the safety car, uh, longer than you would think, really. Um, so the marshals can't get out there and actually put down any dust on the oil, which is what they will plan to do to soak up some of that oil and also putting the dust down shows the drivers exactly where that oil yeah. is which helps um, but they haven't been able to get out there yet I'm afraid because the cars are also spread out it's too dangerous for the marshals to get out until they've caught the safety car that, so that's quite a long slick as well isn't yeah, it it'll it take is. a little while uh, we've got the recovery vehicle ready to go and uh, tow John Minshaw out of the gravel this is the lead car now um, but of course it will be having to follow the safety car around um, but a, a big opportunity for them with the e-type yes uh, so it's uh, e-type leading e-type leading ferrari leading e-type at the <laughs> moment and then uh, austin healy next up right uh, so it's uh, certainly at the moment an e-type benefit but as you've just said they'll all close up and who's in third place the ferrari of lucas halusa who showed himself to be a very quick driver indeed yes so we'll see whether he's going to be able to uh, do anything there or not. Still mm. waiting to get them all gathered together, though, aren't we? There's that little pretty Alfa Romeo again, running uh, further down towards the back. And the MGs are, they are behind the safety car. So the safety car has basically picked up the leader. I wonder if they're going to let those two through, or they're going to. I think they'll just keep them behind. Oh no, he has the safety cars. Let those two through, so that the leader is now the car behind the safety car. It's going to take a little while for the, those two to go and catch up the back of the queue. Yeah, it's uh, such a long circuit. Uh, some very long circuits. They use more than one safety car. Le Mans, yeah. for example, where they can uh, control the field much more quickly. But uh, we only use one safety car at Silverstone. That safety car now will control it. But what it does mean, of course, is all those gaps that were pretty big, uh, certainly between first and second and third, it really opens the door for, again for Lucas Alusa in yeah. that Ferrari, doesn't it? Because um, we've seen the pace that yeah. he has. Yeah, and we can see in the shot now when they're coming through the, the twists that uh, you can see all of the leading cars now in a line. So it's the 144 uh, leading, which was started by James Hansen and uh, it's been taken over by owner Paul Potchgill. And uh, then in second place, we've got the David Gooding driven, started by Nigel Greensall, and then Lucas Alusa solo in the Ferrari. And then it's now Harvey Stanley, who is in fourth place, having taken over from James Cottingham. OK, yes, uh, good point. They're changed over. Um, so as you say, the E-Types are doing well, chased by Austin Healy 3000. The first of the uh, AC Cobras is now running in seventh place. Uh, and that is the uh, Pat Blakely Edwards, I think, is in the car now, isn't he? Yes, I think uh, normally Hunt will start that car. Yeah, he did do the first in. So, uh, Pat Blakely Edwards will be part of 24. So, he's going to be part yeah, of that Yeah, group. Yeah, he's definitely in with the shout, yeah. Keep uh, an eye on that. Um, so, I think we're on for a, quite an exciting restart when we get there, but we're, we're still a little way off. We still haven't seen the marshals getting out to deal with that oil strip yet. I do hope there's going to be time. They are recovering the John Minshaw car. There's a JCB out there 
uh, just in front of our commentary box at the moment, which is about to do the job of pick, well, sort of towing out the Jaguar E-Type, which so sadly ended up in the gravel. Um, that won't take so long, but I'm just worried that they haven't been able to start dusting down the oil strip yet. And uh, I'll just throw another couple of cars into the mix, Ben, for us to watch in the last section of the race. Chris Ward has now taken over Gregor Fiskin's car. Uh, that's number 60, so look out for that one as well. That's a cream-coloured E-type. Uh, Chris Ward, absolutely superb in anything, but particularly Jaguars. And then we've got Ollie Webb as well. Ollie Webb in the uh, E-type that's taken over from uh, Zeiser, number 77. And we know how good Ollie Webb is in anything he gets in as well. We had an interview with him yesterday, a very interesting yeah. chat with Ollie with Nicky Shields. I think we could be on for a remarkable restart as long as they get the... Ah, right, now they have started dusting down the oil strip, but they've only just started at one end, and it's a good oh, 150 metres, would you say? Yeah. Uh, of distance yeah. there that they've got to cover. That's not easy. Marshals who are in front of us are going down with their with their buckets of sand as well, uh, or special uh, <laughs> super absorbent super material. Super absorbent material, <laughs> we should say. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, but unfortunately, there you go. There they are, going out, rushing out to try and soak up some of the oil that's down on that area, which has caused a problem. And actually, the safety cars just coming past. You'll see the stream of cars on the left. If you're watching the screens now, that's. So there's the lead group of cars coming up past that area. And also, they're just about to go past the E-Type, which has been rescued from the gravel, I'm glad to say. Uh, no damage, I think, done to the E-Type. It looks fine. It just got stuck in the gravel track. And uh, the JCB is down there now and pulling it out of its way. So, so the, the, they're getting it cleared up. And the marshal's doing a fabulous job of trying to clean up that uh, long strip of oil. But two groups of marshals, it's going to take a little while to spread it all out there's the e-type and john's getting back in the car yeah I, I did think i saw him putting the belts on and i think that marshall is actually helping him because it's quite difficult to put the seat belts on in a tight confined space uh, and i do wonder whether john will actually go back in the race he's he's not going to get a finish in any decent position yes he is he's uh, taking the car he may come straight back into the pits but uh, john has driven the car away rather than it being towed away as the marshals continue to work very hard on the oil strip indeed yes uh, well i hope you're all enjoying the show no matter if we've got a safety car we could be up for a, a pretty exciting end to this race uh, one of the many races that we are enjoying here at the classic at silverstone if you're here at silverstone as we are well i hope you're enjoying the views around different parts of the circuit you can have a little wander around different grandstands give you different perspectives on the corners on the sound of those beautiful engines that are out there if you're watching with us online streaming online wherever you are in the world or have it on in the background glancing at uh, some of these beautiful cars well, it's great to have you with us thanks for your company and um, we're hoping for some more great racing as we go throughout the course of the day plenty more to look forward to and we'll be seeing racing all the way till nine o'clock tonight that's when the final race is going to occur and you can see many car clubs have gathered. Here's one of the one of them. This is a Porsche car club gathered. Look at that fantastic number of Porsches all gathered together. The Triumph Stags, uh, the Triumph Stags are going to celebrate the anniversary as well. Um, and the fairground, you can go and do that if you're if you've got if you're here. You've got a ticket to be at Silverson, and it's free entry to the whole fairground area, uh, which is great fun. Plenty of places to get something to eat or drink, and uh, special setups all around the circuit for people to enjoy and it's lovely to see so many fans here um, whether they're watching the racing out on track or enjoying some of the other aspects that are, are going on there's music uh, playing as well uh, throughout the day and into the evening and lots to enjoy here and uh, Silverstone putting on another great display um, the marshals are doing a fine job I have to say they've managed to get dust down through all the sand or the, the material there you are to soak up most of the oil most of that area is done now, isn't it? Very, very efficient. Uh, yeah, one at the front with a, uh, a shovel full of the absorbent material running along, letting it run out gradually, and then behind a couple with sweepers. It's a bit like uh, curling, isn't it? You know, when they, the two sweepers just ahead of the stone coming down the ice, uh, but the sweepers in this case run behind the person putting the material down. Yeah. And the, the marshals, there's a lot of marshals here this weekend on such a big circuit. You've got a 3.6 mile track, many corners, of course. And uh, so a lot of staff uh, working hard, they're volunteering 
uh, to make these events continue and uh, you can always go along to the website marshals.co.uk if you want to get involved as a marshal uh, I know many of you who wanted to take on marshalling over the shutdown periods it's been hard because the marshals training program had to be uh, put on uh, sidelines for a while but now that things are opening up it, there are more opportunities again to, to get involved so the uh, leaders are coming past I wonder how many more laps they're gonna have to do behind safety car I think they're they are getting there with this soak up and the great mm. thing is now that the whole field knows yeah, exactly. that the oil is yeah. there you can see what the area and they know they're not <laughs> don't drive on that bit so hopefully we might get this race underway shortly yeah it's also uh, uh, good preparation for the next race as well if they can get the job done now uh, then they can maybe go out uh, between the races just check that they've covered the whole area but the marshals now retreating uh, behind their posts just uh, moving back so the safety car lights will go out in nearly a lap's time because it, they're, they're only just coming through towards the loop but uh, it won't be too long I don't think that the marshals will clear the track it's going to be a very dramatic end to this race i just had a message uh, using my twitter feed at ben edwards tv from nick hunt who says uh, the racing so exciting formula two was epic loved brundle's battle in the e-type give us a shout out to rich and nick at woodcut please well hello to rich and nick at woodcut amongst the many fans here hope you're enjoying the day so far and uh, great to have your con connection uh, we're all looking forward to the end of this race uh, which is going to be a mighty battle in the closing stages. E-types, Ferraris, Austin Healy um, in and there the, as And well. the Cobra And as the well. Cobra, yeah, yeah which, which, as you said, <laughs> uh, could be a real, a real threat to them as well. So uh, Pat Blakeney Edwards in the Cobra, uh, he's going to be pushing hard to see where he can get to. Had a, a very useful victory earlier in the pre-war uh, race in the Fraser Nash. And now in the Cobra, you can just see it in the background there. The only slight disadvantage that those further back in the queue are is they've got a slower car in front of them. Right. And uh, these four that we see in picture now behind the safety car, they're the four leaders. And okay. I'm sure they'll be absolutely on it from the first moment they can. But then there's a, a slower Aston Martin. Uh, and that uh, naturally won't be quite as quick as these leaders. And nobody can overtake until they pass the green flag. So uh, that could, I'm afraid, affect the, the cars that I mentioned as being potential winners, the uh, Chris Ward, the Ollie Webb, and also Patrick Lady Edwards. Okay, that's a very good point, yes. It's always difficult when there's a, a, a back marker there, but that's part and parcel of, of all this. So, uh, three and um, just over three minutes to go in the race duration. Are we going to see the safety car coming in? I think we probably will, because the area where the marshals have been working is completely clear. Mind you, the lights are still on the safety car. Uh, no, it is going to be coming in. We've just seen up on our timing screens that the safety car is coming in on this lap. Uh, yeah, lights out on the safety car, and so now everybody knows we're about to go back to racing. And the Poshkol Hansen car, which is leading this race, is it going to stay in control? That's the interesting one. Well, certainly uh, there'll be three cars immediately behind it that will be trying to make that, uh, that move early, as early as possible. They can't overtake until they come across the timing line. We are all set for the restart here, and it's going to be a short race to the chequered flag in the Tourist Trophy for Historic Cars. A great start by the race leader, but it's all getting a bit exciting behind. They can't overtake until the line, but we're at the line now. And here comes Luca Salusa, trying to take second in the Ferrari. He's got a great sideways run. Can't keep off the oil. That's it. So everybody making sure they keep off that dusty section. The Halusa Ferrari is up into second place, being chased by Harvey Stanley in the E-Type. But James Hansen, I think it is, who's got control at the moment. I think James Hansen was in the pits okay. with Brundle, wasn't he? So I think this will be Paul Pochkiel in the E-Type. Uh, and the Ferrari right up behind it now. And then uh, the uh, Harvey Stanley car level with the Ferrari, the E-Type on the outside. And the oh. Ferrari takes the lead. Yeah, he's got in front, I think, Lucas, or has he? They're still side by side, battle for the lead. The Ferrari's there. And down to third place goes Pochkiel. So leading the race with a comfortable advantage before the safety car came out. And that's changed everything. The Ferrari is now leading the E-Types, defending mightily down to Brooklands. Absolutely, yes. Lucas 
Lawrence went to the inside line there. Harvey Stanley, a very quick driver, uh, actually works for uh, James Cottingham's company. So uh, they, they know each other very well and they often share and they, uh, this car very quick indeed as they come through Luffield. This, uh, I think, will be the last lap, won't it? We've only got a minute to go. So uh, as they come out through Woodcut Corner, it's still the Ferrari leading from the E-type of Harvey Stanley. It's Lucas Halusa who leads. Yeah, we've got a great race for third place in the background as well. I think Halusa's probably got the advantage here, but who's going to end up in third place? Could go anywhere, really, at the moment. The number 60 car is charging through. That's Chris Ward. That's one of the quick drivers that I mentioned, and he's managed to get through into a net third place now, I think, uh, having got past Potchkill. Yeah, Potchkill dropping back again, having had the advantage early on. And there, you can see in the background, the silver Cobra. That is Pat Blakeney Edwards, who could still have a chance. I'm not sure he's going to get a podium finish, but may well be able to take fourth place before the chequered flag comes out. Halusa has the advantage in the Ferrari. The lights are on, the E-type, but I'm not sure it's got quite enough pace. Uh, coming down the hangar straight, we've only got 15 seconds to go, so uh, they're turning into Stowe Corner now, oh. the Ferrari ahead, but look how close Harvey Stanley is. He's much later on the brakes as they turn into Stowe Corner. Yeah, Harvey Stanley late, as you say, on the brakes, the car weaving around, but it wasn't enough to close the gap up. Uh, the final, we are though on the final lap, the checker flag is being prepared, coming through the last couple of corners, a dramatic finish after a rather long safety car period. The victory goes to Luca Halusa. Ferrari beats Jaguar. The E-Types defeated in the end after a tremendous race throughout. Third place going to Chris Ward, who fought his way through there on the last stage of the race. Poshkill did hang on to uh, fourth with Pat Blakeney Edwards in the Cobra finishing in fifth position. Tremendous uh, racing, good fun to watch, and a whole gaggle of cars now coming over the line uh, to finish off this race. But, uh, oh, what a shame the red, the, the safety car lasted quite as long as it did. I would have loved to have seen just a couple more yeah. racing laps at the end there. Even one more yeah. with, uh, with, with such a long lap, it would have given us another three and a half plus miles. But, uh, yeah, it's a great shame, but uh, necessary. And uh, Halusa took the win. To be honest, all through the race, he was definitely threatening to win that race, wasn't he? But uh, uh, after a... a, a, a not a brilliant qualifying for him in terribly wet conditions, not really suited to the Ferrari. Not quite, but uh, the dry has suited the Ferrari. Absolutely, yes. Very, very well indeed. And the the Ferrari bread van, as it's known, because of that unique shape at the back of the uh, the, the Ferrari, uh, has taken the win. What a, a, a fascinating machine. So let's take a look at the result of the RAC Tourist Trophy for historic cars. And Lucas Alusa snatched the victory in the last stages of the race in his Ferrari, beating all those E-types that were fighting throughout the AC Cobra. Pat Blakely Edwards finished in fifth place. And then more E-types and Aston Martins in the mix as well. Ollie Webb finished in ninth position. Uh, top 10 completed by one of the Austin Healy's. Further down the order, uh, a real mix of cars. Uh, first of the Lotuses was John Davison in 15th place. Craig Tolby in 19th. But bad luck to Martin Brundle and Gary Pearson because they had the lead at an important stage of the race. In the end, they retired in the pits. So we have seen some fun and games, uh, a slightly longer safety car periods, two of them, in fact, in that race than we would have liked. But let's take a look at some of the highlights from the pre-63 GT race.
We're on the starting grid for what is set to be an incredible day. It's lights out, and away we go. He's taken an early lead. There's never been a better crew. Behind every great driver, there are brilliant engineers. It's going to be hard to pick a winner here. They're on the final lap. A day they'll never forget. We've had a very enjoyable morning of racing here at the Classic at Silverstone. And I hope that uh, you've been enjoying yourselves, whether you've been watching it with us online or whether you're here at Silverstone and be having a wonderful wander around. Uh, we are looking forward to some more action as we go through the course of the day. Uh, the Murray Walker Memorial Trophy coming up at uh, 10 past one. That's for the historic Formula One cars. Thunder Sports, uh, some great uh, racing sports cars at uh, coming up just before two o'clock. Classic Mini Challenge, all minis and all crazy. <laughs> That's just before three o'clock. Then the Pre-66 Grand Prix cars at half past three. The Pre-66 Touring cars, great mix there just after four o'clock. The Masters Endurance Legends is going to be at five to six. And then the evening continues with historic sports cars and the RSC Woodcoats and Sterling Moth trophies at the end of the day, leading us into the dusk. Uh, let's go down to Ed Foster. Now the podium for the Royal Automobile Club Historic Tourist Trophy for pre-1963 GT cars. The trophies are going to be presented by David Cottingham of series sponsors DK Engineering. And in first place, after a wonderful drive in the Ferrari bread van, Lucas Halusa. In second place, so close, James Cottingham and Harvey Stanley. And with a great drive through the grid, Gregor Fiskin and Chris Ward. <laughs> Lucas, I'm going to start with you. What a fantastic drive. The Ferrari looked quite difficult in the wet yesterday, but it hit its stride today. It did, yeah. Um, it's been a while since I've really driven it in the wet as well, so I felt a bit uncomfortable yesterday, but today I really I felt good and, and immediately and pushed hard the entire race. And, and I, I thought I was going to get done at some point by Harvey, but managed to stay ahead. It was fantastic to watch. Second place, James Cottingham, Harvey Stanley. You tried everything. Was there anything else you could have done? Not really. Have a Ferrari, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> Harvey, but difficult in the last stint behind the safety car and then just the one lap. Yeah, I knew that there was the four of us at the front, and I thought we were first and second, and then when I saw the pit boards, I realized that the other guys were in front. So I knew it was going to be a, a dash to get ahead of those guys, and then Chris Ward was in my mirrors as well, so I knew that was going to be a... If it was two laps, it might have been a bit, uh, a bit closer for, for, for second. Moving on to third place, Gregor and Chris. What a fantastic race, 13th to the podium. Well done. Well, they say 13th is an unlucky number, but it wasn't today, and we had a, we had a lot of fun, and it's, it's such a great grid, and thank you to the guys at DK for supporting this. Great cars, great racing. Chris was doing an awesome job. We would have loved just one more lap, but that's racing, and we're, we're, we look forward to the next one. I was going to ask Chris, you would have loved another couple of laps, wouldn't you? For sure. Um, the, the, the safety car was a little bit tiring, and I, I thought we might actually end under the end of the race under the safety car. But when we got that one lap, I thought, yeah, let's have a go. And I think I managed three on the last lap, which was, which was really good. And uh, Harvey and Lucas were in my sights, but just that little bit too far. Well, it was great to watch. Thank you very much. Japan quality. Yokohama. Your tire. Well, I checked the oil and the 
water and the tyre pressures regularly. Give it a polish, make sure it's all shiny. I service the car once a year and I always do it myself. I enjoy the, the mixture of exercise. I think some of the things I eat help to keep myself healthy and my brain healthy. Or even just meeting up with a friend and having a chat. Alpha Alvis, Clio's, uh, uh, Jaguars, Lamborghinis, Lancias, uh, Nissan Figaro's uh, as well. But uh, some of the cars that we should also be seeing out on track, I'm rather hoping Honda S2000s, the 21st anniversary of the Honda. Also, uh, uh, we will see this weekend the fabulous MX5s as well. I think they come tomorrow, to be honest, but uh, these Honda... Uh, S2000 is uh, about to uh, be coming out onto uh, the track fairly shortly and uh, we should see them. Uh, we've got quite a lot of stuff happening but uh, just to remind you of course uh, if you're here at Silverstone this weekend and uh, perhaps thinking let's do something a little bit different particularly if you're with the children don't forget that the Silverstone Museum is open uh, throughout the weekend uh, you can go in the back entrance, you don't have to walk all the way around to the front entrance, which means you get the opportunity to go in. And of course, you do get a 35% discount on the uh, Silverstone Museum this weekend if you want to go in 
and uh, and look around 60 exhibits in there at least and <laughs> all kinds of some great stuff that you can see at the uh, Silverstone Museum and uh, yesterday uh, we caught up with uh, Sally at the Silverstone Museum and uh, talking to her. It is an interactive museum, I should stress that. So there is plenty of things to do uh, in the museum that uh, will float your boat, whether you're adult or uh, a junior, so to speak. Uh, for example, of course, many people know that uh, Silverstone was an old wartime airfield. So you can actually go and fly a bomber in there which is pretty cool, uh, as well as firing uh, guns as if you were a rear gunner. So that's pretty cool as, uh, as well. So uh, that's uh, one of the things that you could possibly look at doing if you want to this weekend uh, whilst you're around and looking. So plenty of cars then uh, to come. And as I say, we'll be talking to the Silverstone Museum in just a minute, finding out a little bit more about them. Uh, the uh, Hondas that we've got on track. Uh, our reporter Tanya has been out uh, talking to them. So let's uh, see who she caught up with when she went to see the Honda guys. So I am joined by Sue, the secretary of the Honda S2000 Club. There's lots of cars here, Sue. Um, an absolutely brilliant turnout this year and uh, really good to see so many cars here. Lots of familiar members' faces and lots of new faces here as well today, which makes it even better for the club and the events and just generally everything that we're doing to promote the club. Now, you're celebrating the 21st anniversary of, of the car. Uh, tell me about its history. Well, it's, it, it, uh, do you know what? I think the car speaks for itself, to be honest. Anyone who knows the car knows just how brilliant they are. I've had mine since new, so she is 21. Uh, and uh, there's an awful lot of cars here that are, um, you know, they've had a few modifications and, you know, bits and bobs done to them. But, you know, there's a lot that are just stock and they are just the perfect driving car. We all love them and that's why we're all here today. And they're, they're sort of renowned because of where the engine sits, the engine placement. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, engine in the front, nice two litre engine with a VTEC to revs nicely at six seven thousand and and beyond um and they are just a brilliant car to drive you know they've they, it's been designed as a sports car and that's exactly what it is tested on the mountain roads in italy and as a club we've been back to italy twice if not three times now to actually celebrate anniversaries of the car um being 10 years old 15 years old obviously we couldn't do 20 because of covid but um yeah, so we've, we've taken it back to its, its proving ground, in, shall we say. So <laughs> it's a nice place to be. I'm sure. Now, how many of these cars are going to go out on track at lunchtime? Um, do you know what? I think probably most of them. I think there's one behind me that's got quite a few modifications on that it certainly won't be going out on the track. But um, I think most of us will be out there. We like the opportunity to go and do that. So why not? Uh, so what colour is yours so we can just we can spot you? Well, mine's just a Silverstone, so silver, Silverstone. Uh, it'll be in a myriad of most of other Silverstone ones that are here, but, you know, um, that's fine. My little number plate gives me away, but I'm not going to tell you what that is, so that's fine. <laughs> we, we could probably guess, maybe, perhaps. <laughs> um, famous owners, I think. Uh, Jensen Button's owned one? Yes, Jensen Button. Uh, quite Well, yeah, quite a few more people in there as well, actually. I can't remember them all, to be honest, but given half a chance I'm sure there'll be a lot of people that would like to own them in fact the guys from car crowd yesterday were here um, wandering around because they're after a low mileage s2000 so they clearly understand how how great the cars are and the fact that they're going up in value so they they obviously want hold of one so anyone who's not here who wants to sell a low mileage s2000 then the car crowd might be the people that they want to be talking to absolutely I've got here that Vicky Butler Hendon she owned 19 of them yeah, well, that's just too many, isn't it? You don't need to own that many, do you? No, you don't need to own that many. I mean, I know a few owners have got one or two, maybe three. I'm sure a couple of them have perhaps been mothballed, but, you know, the temptation to drive them is too great, so you've just got to be out there. And do you use it as your everyday car? Uh, mine isn't uh, an everyday car, um, but it's a very high days and holidays car, so it's, it's seen some very nice roads and very interesting um, holidays and trips around the UK and abroad so it, it's it's there and it's it, it likes to be driven they all do 
And have you driven around the uh, Grand Prix track here before? Yep, so we got invited to drive around ooh, two or three years ago. I don't know, with this COVID malarkey, it's all a bit, we've lost lost track. But yes, we we have been invited to do it uh, once before, twice before maybe. So yeah, we'll all be enjoying going out today. And I think the fact that the sun's hopefully going to shine, as opposed to yesterday, should be, should be quite a spectacle for everybody if we can join them. Perfect, lovely. Thanks, Sue. There we go. Sue talking to our reporter, uh, Tanya Baker there. Didn't you think that Sue sounded like Joe Brand? Very similar voice, I think. Anyway, her car is out there and uh, you can't miss it because it says Sue on it. Uh, the car, actually, the S2000 uh, from Honda was first revealed in Tokyo in 1995. Now, a friend of mine has got one, uh, but he's got one of the later cars and it's got a 3.2 litre engine in it and he is out there uh, somewhere and it's got a six speed gearbox. So it is one of the rarest models uh, on the UK roads and the early cars had three litre uh, five speed drivetrains. Uh, all of them, of course, have got that Honda VTEC uh, technology as well and the development of the car had the uh, benefit of design and handling advice from wait for this this is absolutely true because he was a honda driver at the time and they went to ayrton senna and said to him could you help us with uh, the design of the car so ayrton senna at senna did actually help with the design of the car now the last uk production honda uh, s2000 it's uh, 101 of a limited 100 edition uh, the uh, gt100 edition uh, and it's driven by ian who is the s2k uk club chairman he's out there somewhere so when the cars finally get out on track uh, have a little look see uh, takuma sato was another one of the uh, honda drivers who was given one of these cars and uh, has uh, uh, still got it to be honest uh, Susie Perry has got one and uh, Bob Dylan as well yeah as in Lay Lady Lay Bob Dylan he also owns one so does Danica Patrick and Chris Pine the guy out of Star Trek and uh, Jennifer Love Hewitt also owns one now whilst we're just looking at the paddock on our cameras uh, an opportunity to uh, uh, just kind of point you in the direction of the village green and lots of uh, people to go and see over there of course but it is our uh, the home, for want of a better word, the stand for our registered charity. So I went out and spoke to uh, Tim from uh, Alzheimer's UK. Well, first question, Tim, I have to say, um, I think we, people say cancer touches us all. I think Alzheimer's now touches us all, really. Almost everyone in the UK must know someone and is close to someone that has it or has had it. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Over half of us are connected to someone close who's, who's living with dementia or being affected by dementia. And um, yeah, it does seem to be that everyone has a story to tell about how it's affected their family. Certainly whenever I get in a taxi and I say I work for Alzheimer's Research UK, uh, taxi drivers invariably got a story about their mum or their nan. So yeah, I really do think it's touching more and more people in the country. So years ago, you just said, oh yeah, my auntie's a bit batty, she's just a bit senile. Same thing? Well, I, I mean, I think um, our understanding of, of dementia and how it's diagnosed has come on leaps and bounds in, in recent generations. Um, I think perhaps we haven't had a great attitude towards um, uh, elderly people and some of the issues they've had over the years. So I think we're growing up as a society and recognising that these are, these are medical problems that are deserving of attention and deserving of research funding, which is exactly what we do at Alzheimer's Research UK. But dementia, you know, I, th I think maybe thinking about, you know, a bit of battiness is, is an outmoded way of thinking about this yeah. condition. It's the biggest killer in this country. I know that COVID has complicated things over the last couple of years, but dementia is one of the biggest uh, killers in the, in the United Kingdom. Um, and I think many people underestimate it, but it's driven by diseases in the brain. Um, it's physical and as real as, as cancer or heart disease. And that means research can do something about them. It's exactly what we're trying to do at the charity. And, and as Alzheimer's research, it, it, obviously you're trying, I'm assuming, you're trying to research to try and, if you like, get rid of the effects, if that makes any sense, and to try and sort of, is there a pill that you can take type of thing. But at the same time, are you, is your research also looking at, at things you know that I do so so if I'm you know me watching the television 12 hours a day is going to give me Alzheimer's because you know that from your research that's an extreme example and that's probably not true at all because now people are going my god really but I don't mean that but is that is that the part of the research how can I sort of not get it 
Yeah, absolutely. We're coming at dementia from every angle, really. So obviously we're looking to find breakthrough treatments to help people who are living with different forms of dementia. Alzheimer's is the most common. Looking, looking at all that right now, we're looking at better ways to diagnose it. If we can diagnose it earlier, treatments will work better. So we're coming at it from that angle. But of course, prevention is better than cure, isn't it? We're all trying to understand what we can do to, to prevent illness in, in well, any time in life, particularly in later life. So and that's one of the key things we're doing at Silverstone Classic this weekend, really. We've got a, a new idea called Think Brain Health the idea that you can look after and protect your brain health throughout your life. Um, it's never too early or too late to start thinking about that. So we're trying to unpick through research all the different factors that might lead to dementia later in life uh, and work out what could be controllable for us for us throughout our lives. And we know there are things that are in our control that we can do to reduce our risk of dementia later on. So the most important thing I think is that you can look after your heart health. What's good for your heart is good for your head. So that's a really critical one for us. Staying socially connected. There's more and more evidence that, that is, uh, that's beneficial. So talking to people, staying connected with friends and family. Uh, it's been difficult over the last couple of years, but not impossible. And we need to focus back on that and also staying cognitively sharp staying sharp so challenging your brain learning a language learning an instrument staying in work longer if you want to do that you know so sitting on the, the on the sofa watching tv for 12 hours a day it's probably not good advice for anyone if you're watching something that challenges you there's something in that as long as you get up for a walk and go uh, get outside at the end of it as well so, so if so looking at cars then uh, on track, that was Tim incidentally from uh, Alzheimer's uh, UK. They are our registered charity for uh, this weekend here. They are in the Village Green if you want to go over and uh, talk to them, find out a little bit more about them. So some of the cars that we're seeing then uh, on track, uh, we've seen the Alfa Romeos, we've seen some of the Jaguars. We'll come back to those uh, in just a minute, of course. Uh, we've also got uh, Skimitters and, uh, or is it a Scimitar? Which one? Uh, Honda. Uh, S2000s as well. Uh, the TR Register uh, we're looking at now. It is the club's 50th anniversary of these fantastic little cars that are out there. Uh, formed in 1970, it had its 50th anniversary celebration plans curtailed, of course, like so many uh, because of COVID. But this year, with restrictions being eased, they are celebrating it in style. Uh, it was actually formed in, uh, in correspondence, so to speak, with uh, Motorsport magazine in late 1969 and uh, it was formed originally to secure the supply of parts for early TRs because the factory obviously were essentially stopping them. The club is uh, based in Didcot, 7,000 members nationally. Uh, so at the top of the alphabet, A for Alfa Romeo, it is the 110th anniversary of Alfa Romeo. Again, deferred uh, celebrations from the 2020 event and they are being celebrated in style here at the Silverstone Classic with the Alfa Romeo Owners Club. And we'll see plenty of them. And again, you can find them uh, out in amongst the 60 car clubs that are here uh, this weekend. There are so many there to see. Uh, the Lamborghini Countach, which you've just seen go by, it is the 50th anniversary of the Lamborghini Countach, uh, celebrated by the Lamborghini Club uh, UK. Bit of a poster car, of course, of the 1980s, the uh, Countach, 50 years old this year. Gracious me. Uh, a car that debuted uh, to the public for the very first time at the 1971 Geneva Motor Show and the car, as you probably know, evolved from the original 4 litre 375 uh, brake horsepower specification to uh, the Ferrari beating 5.2 litre V12 boasting 455 uh, brake horsepower. It was uh, a genius design to be honest by Horatio uh, Pagani himself. Contest remained at the top of the supercar tree until such limited edition cars as the Ferrari F40, which we saw incidentally in the Yokohama supercar display uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, now, finally, the Honda uh, S2000s have got to the track. They seem to be waiting around forever. I did wonder if perhaps uh, far too many of them had broken down, but no, they haven't. They are now back and out on track. These cars that first uh, were shown to the public in 1995 and the Clio V6s are coming round as well just behind them it is the 20th anniversary but we're back to some of the uh, Lamborghini Countaches at the moment uh, we can see some of those and just uh, some of the Hondas were coming into shot there uh, that we could have seen as well but we've uh, cut away from that uh, inexplicably
to uh, another car and uh, to them coming up the uh, Hamilton Strait. But just as we mentioned the Hamilton Strait, we cut away from that to some other cars. And uh, here we've got the S2000s again. So we're chopping around a little bit, but I'm sure it doesn't matter. It's beautiful to see these cars that are out there on track. And look out as well, and I bet our cameraman can't find it, but we have got Sue out there, who is the secretary uh, of the club as well. Uh, some of the cars that we go back to and some of the cars that you'll also see, uh, the Lancia or Lancia, should I say, uh, Lambda is out there as well. And look, it is must be the celebration of the transit van, ladies and gentlemen, or is that perhaps, no, no, that's the, that is in fact the Mercedes Sprinter minibus uh, celebration today. There we are, it is the goodness knows how many years of, of that our cameraman picking it up just for giggles methinks uh, so we go back to uh, some of the uh, Jaguars that are out there as well uh, loads of the Jaguars to be honest the, the, the whole bank down towards uh, cops full of uh, Jaguars there's plenty of them the ones that are out at the moment are the uh, XK8s which takes us back uh, all the way to the Geneva Motor Show in 1996 when Jaguar announced the launch of what would be their all-new sports car. And uh, they then uh, went to another launch, which I remember going to. Uh, it was a great place to do it. It was the Royal Society of Art. And uh, at the same time, they then also went to the New York Auto Show and uh, then on to uh, Vancouver. Do you know, these cars, the, uh, the Jaguar, uh, when they first came out, you could buy one, I know it was 1996, but you could buy one for £47,000, which at the time, of course, was quite a lot of money, but, uh, you know, it doesn't sound quite so much these days, does it? Uh, the Alphas that we can see coming down the Hamilton Strait there then, uh, as I say, uh, part of the uh, 110th anniversary of Alfa Romeo. Yes, they've been out that long, but we know that because, of course, Alfa Romeo has got such a rich history in Grand Prix motor racing as well, back uh, the last few years, and in fact has just re-signed uh, a naming rights, for want of a better word. It is uh, the Kimi Raikkonen team, of course, and uh, they've just uh, uh, re-signed a naming rights deal uh, with Alfa Romeo. So the Sauber Formula One team, as it used to be, uh, is now Alfa Romeo, and we can see some of the cars out there. Now, this morning, coming down the Dadford Road, I noticed a sad sight. It was one of the skimmeters had uh, managed to put himself into a hedge. I uh, don't quite know how he did that on a straight piece of road, but uh, he did. So the skimmeter uh, GTC, we've just seen some of them going past us there. Uh, 40th anniversary of those. And some of my all-time favorite cars just coming into shot now. There's a whole gaggle of these. These are the Nissan Figaro's. 30th anniversary of these. They're such a popular little car. Uh, first production actually came out. They're, they're a car that people have fallen in love with. So it's very appropriate that the Nissan Figaro was actually launched on February the 14th ladies and gentlemen, back in 1991. Uh, actually, only 20,000 of them were produced uh, by Nissan in four colours, that's all they did, uh, to represent the seasons of the year. So there was emerald green to represent the spring season, pale aqua was the summer, topaz mist, the autumn, and lapis grey was for the dull winters that we get here in the UK. And uh, just to provide a bit of indiv individuality, uh, many of the owners actually have uh, sprayed the car into uh, custom colours. And of course, pink is one of the popular colours. And you can see them. there's about two and a half thousand of them registered on UK roads. And you can see them uh, down in the uh, public areas where all of the car clubs are. And as I say, 60 car clubs are here uh, this weekend at the Silverstone Classic. It's a terribly popular uh, event to come to. And actually, the Silverstone Classic is now the biggest event in the United Kingdom where we see a gathering of car clubs. You don't see any event anywhere else in the UK be it Bewley or any of the others, where we see so many different car clubs that are coming to Silverstone. So it's really become, uh, literally, it has become a classic for them to attend. Some of the cars that uh, we'll see over the weekend include Marcos, they've got a stand here. Uh, MG, of course, have got a big stand here as well. 
and uh, we tend to be celebrating on track those that have got an anniversary. Uh, we just could not get 60 car clubs, as you can imagine, on track throughout uh, the weekend. Uh, some of the skimmers just going through our shot there, followed by those lovely, cute little Nissan Figaro's that we've got behind. And there is the pink, uh, two of the cars that you can see in the shot there. Uh, the pink that is not one of the original colors whereas the cars behind are the original colors and there you can see uh, a couple of the uh, lovely little colors that they've got the pale aqua for uh, summer and uh, as I say the pink cars were uh, very much a custom uh, color that were uh, painted by the owners of those cars. And all you'll find, all of the owners of all of the car clubs, uh, very much happy to talk to you. If you want any advice at all, I mentioned this yesterday, uh, a friend of mine was looking to buy a Frog Eye Sprite. Uh, he went over to the Triumph uh, stand a couple of years ago here at Silverstone. He got some amazing advice, ended up buying one, uh, a lovely, lovely example, a pale blue, um, a frog eye sprite he's now actually living in France and he's taken the beautiful car with him uh, so sadly he's not here this weekend to display it he'd love to be but he can't get over from France of course with all the Covid restrictions uh, but he got the advice from the uh, register and then uh, bought the car over here and, uh, and it's just you know it is a beautiful car so if you want any advice that kind of thing you want to buy a uh, a car perhaps you're looking for something or if you own one of the cars and maybe you're not a member of a car club but you'd like to be perhaps uh, if, for example you own a Marcos or a Triumph or something and you'd like to uh, then you can go and join uh, the car club go and get some advice etc Triumph incidentally who we're just talking about are uh, by the medical center here at Silverstone and I see that uh, there's a a number of different cars there including the Triumph Herald which was one of my first cars I think I paid a hundred pounds for my Triumph Herald to be honest uh, the Alfa Romeo's just being waved by uh, the marshal there that we can see on track a lot of Alfa Romeo's here this weekend as you can imagine because uh, it is their 110th anniversary deferred from uh, last year's event so plenty of people here to celebrate it in style. Some of the uh, newer Alfa Romeos, things like the uh, Brera is out there. Uh, we've just seen a couple of those go by and of course some of the uh, older Alfa Romeos as well. Plenty of them uh, on track and including some of their lovely little, as it's coming by now, one of the uh, lovely little open top sports cars to the, uh, the newer Alfa Romeos that are coming by. We've seen a couple of the uh, Julias uh, out there on track as well. The old Julia as well, The uh, I think it was the 132 Julia and uh, some of the newer uh, Julias as well. The Mito uh, is out there. I've seen a couple of those uh, Alfa Romeo Mitos uh, also out on track. So they're all gathering up towards the back uh, of the grid and uh, will then come down this, the uh, Wellington Strait. Silverstone course car just uh, keeping an eye there are the skimmers uh, just beginning to uh, come through now not so many of these skimmers here uh, this weekend but we did get the opportunity to go and uh, talk to uh, the skimmer people and uh, should be able to uh, hear from them I'm hoping a little bit uh, later on here at uh, Silverstone uh, we've also got Alvis's out there as well on track and uh, shortly we should be able to, I hope, see some of the uh, Clio V6s uh, coming along as well. And there they are again, those lovely little uh, Figaro's. I don't know why I say it like that, but uh, the, the, the Figaro's. Uh, followed by the TR Register guys that are just coming along uh, behind them as well. So things like uh, the TR6s, of course, are included in that and there we can see uh, some of them just uh, coming by and uh, into shot now yesterday they would not have got uh, an open top down for sure but uh, thankfully today the weather uh, vastly improved So just behind some of those, the uh, Lamborghinis, and uh, our reporter Tanya went out and spoke to the guys from Lamborghini.
But unfortunately, I don't think she turned the recorder on when she was talking to them. So I don't know why we haven't got that. But um, anyway, we'll try and get the Lamborghini guys back again in just a minute, see if we can. But uh, nothing coming from there at the moment, so I don't know quite what's happened to that. Um, let's try again. So we're now with Arsene from the Hello. Lancia Motor Club. Now, your centenary of Lancia, that's, that's forever. Centenary of the Lambda, not of Lancia. Lancia actually started in 1906, so the centenary of Lancia was in 2006. Um, but we're celebrating the centenary of the Lambda this year. Um, the prototype was driven in 1921. The production car wasn't until 1922. And unusually, we're celebrating, well, actually both years, because we've got a rally that was this year and is now put forward to next year because of COVID. Um, but the car was so revolutionary at its time that we celebrate the prototype, which is unusual in France. Most people celebrate the production car. Now, Lancia is synonymous with motorsport, with rallying. What, what makes Lancia, Lancia so, so beautiful, so well made, so... Actually, it's just so well, and it's synonymous with, with everything motoring, isn't it? Yeah. It's the engineering and the pioneering innovations that Lancia produced right from the Lambda. Was it, it's, well, even before the Lambda, the Theta was the first car that had um, proper electricity all the way around. But basically, it had a battery rather than a, a, anything else. So it was the first car, and that was in 1913. But um, most people remember Lancia for the rallying as much as anything else, certainly through the 80s and 90s. And we still hold the World Rally Championship record for the most consecutive rallies from 82 to uh, from 87 to 92 uh, and that was with the Stratos um, no it, Integrale. it was with the Integrale yes but obviously I mean we started with the Fulvia in 1972 where we were we, we won the what would have been the production uh, the manufacturers cup before the world rally championship even started um, and so Fulvias were the first rallying cars and then it went on through the, the um, well the Beaters the Monte Carlo Stratos 037 um, and then the Integrale. Um, so that's what people mostly remember it for, but the Lambda was actually, which is what we're celebrating this year, was the birth of modern motoring. Um, it was the first car to come out with four-wheel braking, um, monocoque body, independent front suspension, and the V4 engine. And the braking was so good that in 1922, when they came to the London Motor Show, the police actually allowed the cars to drive at more than 15 miles an hour, which was the speed limit because they knew that they would be able to stop. So, um, and then other people, Bentley, Jaguar, Rolls-Royce, followed suit a few years later when they... It was quite controversial when it first came out because it was so new. Um, and a lot of people said these things won't work. But once they realised it did, they all wanted to borrow the... They all copied. They all well, there we are talking to uh, the lady from Lazio. Now, the car that you're just seeing coming round now... Uh, and just about to go off track, of course, are the uh, classic uh, Clio V6s. Let's see if we can hear from them. Joined by Dulan from the um, Clio V6, club secretary. Um, 20th anniversary of the Clio. Tell me about the 20th anniversary. What's, what's been happening with Clios over the last 20 years? Yes, uh, Clio, uh, the V6 Clio was first built in 2001. Uh, uh, and the phase ones you see on the left here, are the silver ones so they were first built by Tom Walkinshaw racing and the Renault in DF designed it uh, Tom Walkinshaw racing built the first prototypes and the first phase one cars um, we have the phase twos which are predominantly um, uh, present today but they started building them in 2003 um, how many were how many of those were made 354 phase twos in the UK finished production in 2005 and that's the last that we had. They were very popular in their time weren't they? Yeah that's right and we've got um, either 20 arriving today on a parade lap. There we go that was the man talking about the uh, uh, the Silverstone uh, collection of uh, Clio V6s so the Alvis is just beginning to leave and the Alvis that you can see there the silver one exactly the same model as that is owned uh, by Stephen Fry so we caught up with uh, the Alvis car club so David from the Alvis owners club Alvis are celebrating their centenary is that correct that's right it was celebrated yes year last year actually but of course the event was cancelled so we're um, it's, it's now this year Alvis was first constructed in, in uh, Nine, um, 1920 and uh, they carried on production until 1967 and how many cars have you got on track today nine or ten hopefully 
And what cars of note? You had some very famous owners of Elvises over the past. Well, yes, a few. Um, some notorious. Um, <laughs> Uh, Nicholas Parsons uh, for one year. Uh, Prince Philip, of course, had an Elvis as well. Nicholas Parsons, now, sailor, was he Sailor of the Century? Sailor of the Century, yes. Um, We're showing our age. Yeah. Douglas Bader um, and George Formby, would you believe? So you, members, of, members of royalty owned, owned Elvises, yeah? That's right. Um, Prince Philip had a, a TD21 uh, drophead, which was quite interesting because he had it altered to suit him. He had, uh, you could do what you like in those days with, with coach built cars, and he had the screen built higher so you could wear a top hat inside. So, uh, so you could actually alter the car to your specific specification? Yeah, this is my car, this is a Silver Eagle. And it's the only car uh, of the Silver Eagle that had the spare wheel on the boot. All the rest were on the, on the wing, but the original owner wanted it on the boot. So he ordered it with the spare wheel to be on the boot lid. Why would someone have done that? Just because they wanted to? They got the money to do it and they did it. Yeah. <laughs> How much were they when they first came out? This was £595. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, but an Austin 8, I think, was £110. Uh, similar year, Ford, uh, Ford 8 as well. So they were um, just over £100 for the bread and butter cars, and this was £595. Amazing, you just can't comprehend it. They are very unique cars, and you don't see many like on the, on the road these days. How many members have you got? We've got 1,200 members in the club. Uh, a lot have got more than one car. We're not actually sure how many exist because obviously there are a lot worldwide that aren't in the club. But um, several thousand out of a production range of about 22,000 were built. And is that, so not UK members, worldwide members? Absolutely, yes. It's a worldwide club, yes. yes, yes. Lovely. OK, well, thank you for talking to us. Have a great time out on track later on. OK, thank you. There we are. That's uh, Tanya Baker who was uh, talking to... Uh, the guys from Alvis. Now, the museum we've mentioned uh, before, so uh, Sally Reynolds, who is in charge of the museum, we went to talk to yesterday. It is a place that you can go and visit this weekend. It is open all weekend from 8 until 8. So let's have a chat with Sally. So one of the things that you'll probably see as you come through the gate of Silverstone is the new interactive uh, museum, and it is a amazing place, loads and loads of things to do. And more importantly, Sally, who is the boss here, things to play with for want of a better word which is I won't say other museums but there are other museums that you go to and you kind of look at things and they're all very static you've got stuff here that is static but also that you can play with exactly we've got um, lots of interactives um, you can um, try your hand at flying a Wellington bomber um, obviously Silverstone is built on an airbase that's one of the interactives. You can have a go in the turret trainer at shooting things. Um, we also have lots of interactive based on motor racing. So we have our fantastic um, tech lab where you can press buttons and see how an engine works. You can see how gears work. There's even a brake interactive where you can see how much strength it actually takes to stop a Formula One car. And we've also got lots of touch screens where enthusiasts can delve into the history of Silverstone, look at race records from the past. So it really isn't a static museum. We do, of course, have some amazing cars which people must come and see. We also have shows, so it's not just going around looking at things in cases. Again, we have some brilliant things in cases like Lewis Hamilton's race overalls from last year, lots of brilliant helmets from people who've raced at Silverstone since um, racing first started here 70 years ago. But we also have a pre-show at the start where you stand on a grid and cars from the past will line up next to you and at the very end they all rev their engines. And actually those engine sounds were recorded at the Classic a couple of years ago so they're the genuine sounds we were out in the pit lane recording the sounds of the engines yeah. um, and then all those cars pull away lights change you hear Barry Walker's voice absolutely awesome and then once you've been through the museum at the end you get to take your seat and enjoy the ultimate lap of Silverstone alongside some of the greats that raced here it's one of those sort of like we say it is interactive it is an experience is it an experience that if I came back in a year's time, I'd see everything all over again? Some of the stuff will, will stay the same, but we have a temporary exhibition space where we currently have in Deera Flax um, photography exhibition on great British racing drivers, where she's photographed them in sort of in their, doing their day jobs. It's a brilliant exhibition. Um, includes one of my favourites, uh, Dario Franchetti, in there, and it, it's brilliant. Anyway, um, we also have. Um, areas where we can change the cars so the cars do change um, 
if anyone has a car they'd like to put in the museum that did something brilliant at Silverstone, do let us know. Um, but we have, um, currently we've got um, some Formula One cars that are in for a few weeks, they'll go back out again. So yeah, we change the exhibition on a regular basis. Sally Reynolds talking to us from uh, the museum and uh, we'll talk to her again in uh, just a minute of course. Uh, right that's about it from uh, track parades and things. Ben is poised after his fish paste sandwich to join you again of course uh, for all the afternoon of track action which transfers from the national paddocks over to the international paddock uh, over at the wing in other words so uh, we'll join him and talk to him in just a moment. Adrian Flux are proud to be the Classics' official insurance partner for another year. Why not visit our stand in Purple 10 next to the Village Green today to find out how we could save you money on your insurance. We've also got all sorts of things to keep you entertained, including a Forever Cars display, Ian Cook's Hot Bang Colour masterpieces, and the chance to win a passenger lap around the track in the course car. So what are you waiting for? Adrian Flux, insurance for the individual. What is time well spent? Well, that's your business. That's why Genesis is not just coming to Europe. We come to you. Discover how our Genesis personal assistants will always respect your time. Silverstone for the classic and we've got some Formula One cars on the track now as we prepare for the Murray Walker Memorial Trophy. Cars are just headed out of the pit lane building up a little bit of pace and warming up some tyres as we get ready to uh, watch a 20 minute sprint for these uh, Formula One cars uh, largely from the 1980s uh, some from the 1970s as well and a great mix of cars once more and very much a tribute this race to the great Murray Walker, a uh, fantastic commentator, a man I knew through commentating uh, in a, a booth next to him when I was commentating for Eurosport. He was commentating for BBC, a voice I'd listened to for so many years. And uh, a, a really, he set an example of motorsport commentary, um, set, the, uh, set the targets in many ways and did a fantastic job. So it's lovely to remember it in this way. Let's take a look at how the grid is going to line up for the Murray Walker Memorial Trophy. On pole position, Michael Lyons in the ensign, uh, ahead of Mike Cantillon. So then Steve Hartley in the McLaren MP4 and Jamie Constable in the Tyrrell. Lucas Alusa, who we saw earlier, doing so well in a Ferrari. Well, he's in a McLaren at this time in the Formula One car. And then Steve Brooks lines up in sixth place. Seventh, Mark Hazel ahead of Mark Harrison. Uh, Ken Tyrrell, no, it's not the Ken Tyrrell, despite it's a Tyrrell. Ken Tyrrell is an American with the same name who decided to buy a Tyrrell. He's starting ninth, Warren Briggs 10th, Neil Glover 11th, and Paul, Paul Tattersall starts 12th. Behind them, we've got Chris Perkins, Jonathan Holtzman, Ian Simmons, uh, Michel Baudouin, and Judy Lyons uh, at the back of the field in the 30s. So the cars are on their uh, formation lap at the moment. They're getting uh, two laps effectively uh, to warm these tyres up. And the car at the front of the field there, Alistair, Michael Lyons, 
uh, very rapid in qualifying yesterday, but the track conditions were somewhat different to what we're seeing today. They were indeed, yes, and I think Michael's uh, great experience of Silverstone, but also driving uh, the three-litre Formula One cars, which he has done many times, uh, has actually uh, came through in that qualifying session. He set an absolutely stunning time. The car that he's driving actually uh, was listed to be driven by Johnny Herbert, car number eight, but uh, changed to the programme to be uh, Michael Lyons. And it was driven in period by Mark Sura and Alessio Salazar. And I have to say, it wasn't brilliantly successful, uh, uh, but uh, Michael's managed to put it on pole position. He has, he's done a, a fantastic job. But is it going to be different in the dry? That's the question. Are we going to see some different pace from some of the other drivers out there? We're, we'll find out soon enough. Um, it's going to be very, very interesting to see how it all goes. Um, so the cars are warming up nicely. It is a 20 minute race. It really is a sprint race, this one. It's uh, no pit stops involved, unlike so many of the other races we're seeing here today. And we're gonna see how it all works out at the end. Thanks for joining us. Whether you're here at Silverstone enjoying a day, which is brightening up a little bit, I have to say. Sort of breeze, uh, but uh, we've got a little bit of blue sky above us now in the commentary box. Or if you're watching at home, wherever you are in the world on our live streaming, it's a joy to have you with us. Um, do contact me on at Ben Edwards TV if you've got some uh, something you want to say about the cars that you're watching, uh, some news about uh, anything that uh, is useful to us, that's great. Uh, or if you're watching from the sidelines here at Solverson and seeing some great action, let me know. So there's a beautiful Lotus um, that is lining up in sixth place on the grid. Steve Brooks is driving that car. Survived a rather spectacular spin in qualifying yesterday, and we are getting ready. The Murray Walker Memorial Trophy for Masters Historic Formula One is all set to go at Silverstone. Michael Lyons leads the field around as we come through into the final corner, preparing to stir up a lot of Ford Cosworth V8 engines as they will go racing for 20 minutes around the full Silverstone circuit. We are preparing and we are ready to go. Michael Lyons sets off from pole position yep here we go now up to speed and he gets away well with the Williams alongside him of Mike Cantillon Steve Hartley in third place in the other McLaren the MP4 but a good start there by Michael Lyons he's taken an advantage immediately through Abbey corner and look at the speed of him on the opening lap absolutely amazing uh, these Formula One cars after we've seen the other uh, more uh, slower uh, sports cars earlier on but Michael Lyons taking the lead in grid order actually Mike Cantillon then it was Steve Hartley Jamie Constable and Lucas Salusa in fifth position yeah Lucas Salusa who won in the uh, sports car in the Ferrari earlier on today uh, he is racing in the M23 the Austrian the 30-year-old uh, who certainly showed us some good pace in a sports car. We'll see how he gets on in a Formula One car. You're looking at Mike Cantillon in second place in the number seven Williams, the FW07. But he's coming under quite a lot of pressure from Steve Hartley in the MP41, a car from 1982. And uh, a very impressive machine for Nicky Lauda and John Watson as well. We've got a few McLarens out there, a couple of Williams, Lotus as well, Ensign, Shadows. And the Tyrrells, there's the number 99 car just going through as well. That's Jamie Constable. He was the first of the Tyrrells on the grid, lined up in fourth place. A bit of side-by-side -side action, uh, but Michael Lyons is definitely in control so far. Coming through the wonderful Beckett sweepers and uh, great to see full Grand Prix cars going through here. Uh, that's a sight. And look at the lap, uh, the lead that uh, Michael Lyons has already built over the second place Williams of Mike Cantillon. But Cantillon coming under great pressure from Steve Hartley in the uh, McLaren as they turn into the right-hander at Stowe Corner and make the short trip now downhill into the Vale and then turn left. And this is not as tight as the Grand Prix uh, cars use this one is the historic club corner so they turn into the left and then the right to complete the first lap indeed they do and uh, all over the over the dust over the oil that got laid down earlier makes the visibility really hard for everybody following i have to say when they run over the oh, and it's a spin for the mclaren oh that's steve hartley i believe has spun through abbey corner we could see it from our commentary position you haven't seen it on screen yet but i just caught a glimpse of it out of the window I don't know whether that was connected with going onto the sand or the, the, the dust. Oh, and that's another car that also... That's uh, Ken Tyrrell in, yeah. the, in the number 23. Tyrrell also had a spin. Oh, dear. Um, so a result of the oil that's down. I'm surprised at that because surely they... Well, maybe they weren't watching the race earlier, didn't realise, and surely on the outlap they would have seen all that dust still down. 
but that means that Jamie Constable's now moved up into uh, third place. Mike Cantillon is still in second. Michael Lyons is leading the race, comfortably there in car number eight. Constable lead at advantage at the moment over Cantillon in second place, Constable in third, and Steve Brooks now in fourth in the Lotus 91. And uh, that was a great shame to see the spins, particularly for Steve Hartley. He is up and running again and may be able to make up some of the lost ground. Yes, he spun uh, almost within the confines of the track, actually, uh, and he ended up back on the track, selected first gear and moved away. So that was uh, uh, very lucky that he kept the engine running, Steve Hartley, but he has lost a lot of places. be interesting to see him come through the, uh, the field during this race. But Michael Lyons it is who's dominating at the moment as he comes down the uh, hangar straight into Stowe Corner. That's a classic Grand Prix shot, isn't it, Ben? The long shot down <laughs> towards, uh, up the hill towards uh, Chapel Curve. Yeah, and then we've got that battle between the Tyrrell and the Lotus. This is for third place now, so a podium finish, although Steve Hartley's moving back up the order. He's got back up into fifth place. He's just moved ahead of Luca Halusa in the other McLaren, the M23 car in the background. But uh, for the moment, it's Jamie Constable here in third in the Tyrrell, chased by the Lotus number uh, 99 in uh, 19. Yeah, sorry, the, the, the Lotus is number 12. And through the dust they come. And this time, I think they're all being a bit more sensible about not running straight across it. Yes, uh, some of them are just catching the edge of it, but uh, most of them keeping off it. Uh, in fact, as I say that, one car drives all the way up the, uh, the dust. Mark Hazel in the pits, that's a shame. In the other Williams there, that's the FW08C. Um, lo another lovely car, a car that was run in 1982. Uh, had a great deal of success, part of uh, Rosberg's title-winning season. And it was actually the type of car that Ayrton Senna first drove in Formula, uh, not in a race, but in testing. He drove an FW08C. That was at Donington, wasn't it? At Donington Park, that's yeah. right, in 1983. Yeah, wonderful to see. And he was impressive from the start, of course. Now, there is Steve Hartley. So he had the spin. He's got himself back into fifth place. He's now actually chasing after Steve Brooks in the Lotus. So Steve's got some pace, even though he had that, uh, that mishap earlier on and we could see him fight his way back. Michael Lyons is opening up a good advantage. He set past his lap as well. Last time around, his gap was 3.8 seconds when they went over the line. Um, at, but now Hartley is trying to close the gap to Brooks in the Lotus. Jamie Constable's got a bit more of a gap now in third place in the Tyrrell, and holding on to second still, the FW07C Williams, 1979 uh, Williams car with ground effect. Uh, raced uh, back in Spain in that year, car put together by Patrick Head and Frank Durney was a very much key part of the Williams team in those days. They drew a lot of ground effect knowledge from the Lotus 79 which had come before it and the FW07 went on to win at Silverstone, taking its first win at Silverstone and uh, Clay Regatoni took the first win for Williams here back in 1979 and that FW07 is the car that's running in second but look We've got a good battle going on now. We, we have indeed, yes. Yeah. Steve Hartley, after that spin at Abbey on the first lap, uh, was it the first lap or the second lap? Can't remember now. Too much has gone on. But uh, anyway, he's recovered now to catch Steve Brooks as they come down into the right-hander at the village. They're just passing Judy Lyons there as they make their way into the tight right. Now the tight left. And Steve Hartley looking for a way through. Goes tight through the loop. Gets alongside Steve Brooks, but he might lose out again as they go through Aintree. Brooks gives him room, but then cuts across <laughs> in front. And Hartley ends up going way, way out onto the real estate on the outside of Aintree. And that's lost him some time. Don't do a Kimi Raikkonen. Kimi had a big uh, spin down there a few years ago. and wouldn't want to see that. Uh, thankfully, it didn't happen on this occasion occasion and Steve uh, is still chasing down and he's look he's got past his lap so he's clearly got pace yes absolutely and uh, this is a, a fabulous car the MP4 it was the first car from McLaren of the new era of Ron Dennis and uh, tremendously successful it was as they come down towards Cops Corner this blindingly quick right hander they tuck in through the right they might just and uh, they keep well off the curbs actually both being very good and not running wide and up over the crest into the left hander at maggots and through he goes that's a great run from steve hartley to pass to, to pass steve brooks yep so he's up in the fourth place so is he still got a chance of getting a podium i think that might still be an opportunity for him michael lyons is leaping out in front but uh, second third in particular he's got a chance of chasing down the Tyrrell, as you say, this was a, a wonderful car, and in fact, uh, the same type of car with which uh, John Watson won the 1981 British Grand Prix here in 1981. So, uh, some 40 years to celebrate. Watty winning, 
a man I've commentated with many, many times over the years. He's uh, he's actually busy this weekend commentating on elsewhere, um, but it's lovely to see the car that uh, the same style of car that he did so well at at Silverstone racing hard here. It might have had a spin down at this section earlier on, but it is definitely closing up on the Tyrrell up ahead. It's the uh, 011 Tyrrell, the 011. That's also a 1981 car, isn't it? Well, the, the car, uh, Steve Hartley's car, is actually the car that Watty drove in the right. period. He won the Caesars Palace, uh, sorry, the Detroit Grand Prix uh, from 17th on the grid. And here we're seeing the very unusual six-wheel Tyrrell. Uh, this is a recreation of the car. It's not an original. It's been built up for Jonathan Holtzman, but very much with the support of the Tyrrell family, who were uh, very much uh, happy to give him drawings and uh, all the specifications for this car, which uh, actually did win a race in Sweden. Yeah, 1-2. They got uh, a 1-2, didn't they? Yeah, that's right. But uh, wasn't massively successful. But the idea was aerodynamics get the front wheels much smaller by using a pair of them instead of one each side. Yeah, the problem being, though, that the tyre compounds and things didn't always work out quite so perfectly for them. But it's lovely to see a P34 out there. It's such a unique shape, that front end, with these four front wheels. Uh, so very, very good to see. Meanwhile, Steve Hartley still lapping quickly and trying to close that gap down to Jamie Constable. Not quite there in sight of uh, him. Well, it's certainly in sight, but in terms of getting alongside, he's not quite there. Ken Tyrrell, uh, yeah, that's his name, in ninth place, uh, up ahead of Warren Briggs at this stage. Uh, he is trying to find a bit more pace as well. Ken, the American, was also racing a Tyrrell but uh, not actually related to the Tyrrell family. It happens to have exactly the same name, which is fun to see. Now, Steve Hartley, can he find a bit more pace as he comes down through the last couple of corners? We're completing another lap. Still got just over 10 minutes to go in this Formula One Memorial Trophy race in memory of Murray Walker, and he's certainly got a good run going here. Don't get too much on the dusty stuff. That's where it went wrong for him earlier, but he's following that Tyrrell closely. He is indeed, yes, it's the uh, Tyrrell of Jamie Constable as they go up to Village. Now Hartley going for the inside, a little bit later on the brakes. Oh, a little bit squirrely there under braking, but uh, managed to get through the corner OK. But that's really compromised his line up to the loop. Now he'll try again, I'm sure, as they go out through Aintree onto the very fast Wellington Strait. Uh, not that much slower down here than the Hangar Strait uh, as they come down towards Brooklands. Still Constable. Uh, ahead in third place, Hartley in fourth. Yeah, the uh, number 99 car, the Tyrrell, the 011, it was a, a 1981 car. It was raced by Michele Alboreto and Eddie Cheever that year. It got better the following year, actually, 1982. Michele Alboreto had some good results, a fifth in Brazil, fourth at Long Beach, third at Imola, uh, and then had a victory at Las Vegas. And that, that was a, a very key victory for the Tyrrell team, for the drivers who had opportunities with Tyrrell at that time, included the likes of Slim Borger, uh, Brian Henton, uh, Danny Sullivan joined the team in 1983, but they were, weren't running with turbo engines, so it wasn't a particularly competitive team at the well, time. The Tyrrell 011 actually uh, saw the end of an era because it was one of these sorts of cars, and we're going to have a change of position, though. We're not, not room there it's pretty close, through. though, yeah, isn't it? I wonder. Really if we down. But the, the car leading here was the last type of car to win a Grand Prix with a DFB engine. So, uh, the, the huge and successful 186 wins. As Steve Hartley looks for the inside at Stowe Corner, but can't find the way through there. Jamie Constable managing to hold him back in the Tyrrell. It's the McLaren behind, which is uh, in the famous orange and white or red and white colours as they come through the right-hander at Club Corner. And actually, Jamie Constable a little bit quicker through there, and he's opened up a bit of a gap on Steve Hartley for third and fourth places as they come up the Hamilton Strait. Yep, so he still hasn't quite found a way through, and he's been very cautious into Abbey after his spin there, which is understandable. Uh, he would have lost a little bit of confidence in that section, whereas... Jamie looks pretty confident, but it's up here now. Uh, the McLaren seems to close in a little bit, and particularly after Beckett's. That's where it definitely seems to have a little bit more pace than the Tyrrell in the hands of Steve Hartley. Let's see how it goes here. This is a key area, as we know. You can get a decent toe on the run down towards Brooklands. So I'm not sure he's quite close enough, though, to have a go. Let's see whether he can close in on the Tyrrell up ahead. No, nope, not close enough to actually get alongside. Meanwhile, further back, we've still got Steve Brooks in the Lotus, not too far behind them, keeping a watchful eye in the Lotus 91. Then there is a bit of a gap back to Lucas Salusa, the uh, Austrian racing in the McLaren M23 on this one, as he stays ahead of Warren Briggs for now. Fastest lap 
actually to Stephen Hartley, as we know. Uh, but can he find a way through? Now, it's this next section where he does seem to have good pace. It is, yes. Out of Cops Corner, up the rise into the fast left-hander at Maggots, which leads into the sweepers at Beckett's. And it's uh, right and then left and then right again, which leads them out to the fast left. And Steve Hartley has another spin oh. in the middle of Beckett's. And again, he does a full 360. Oh, no. Oh, and unfortunately, clipped the, clipped the Lotus as it came by. And uh, that's really unfortunate there. Steve Brooks had nowhere else to go. He had to go around the outside. And I think that's damaged the front left wheel as it uh, looks to be at a strange angle, Ben. Well, you're usually more sensitive on the front wheel than the rear wheel with a bit of contact like that. Um, and that is a great shame. Um, Steve's been trying quite hard, but making a couple of mistakes. And that has meant that Jamie Constable is now uh, pretty comfortable in third place. Let's take a little look back. So Steve, on the attack, we knew he was quick here, but it just went wrong for him. He runs a tiny bit wide there, maybe carries a bit too much speed in. He's in the real slipstream. He lost a bit of downforce, could have been part of it as well, trying to take a lovely 360. But then, oh, the Lotus flicking around the outside, and I think you're right that it has damaged the left front suspension, the steering arm perhaps on the McLaren. Another look at it from a different angle. He's lost the back end as he went through the left-hand section. Didn't know quite where the Lotus was. The Lotus went around the outside, bosh, into the front wheel. He is picking up the pace, and so maybe it is still working OK. Yes, he, he could have got away with that. It was only a glancing blow, but uh, we've seen plenty of times uh, what seems like a very minor contact actually damages the steering, and uh, drivers aren't going to drive the cars flat out if the steering is damaged, so they tend to call into the pits as we look at our leader, Michael Lyons. We haven't seen much of Michael, have we? He's been uh, absolutely dominant so far in this race in the Ensign. Yeah, the Ensign, which in its day was not a particularly quick car. The likes of uh, Alicia Salazar, Roberto Guerrero. Mark Sura drove it in early 1981 as well, but it was a team that was a bit tight on budget and they struggled to make it run near the front, but it's certainly running at the front here. 4.3 seconds, the advantage over the Williams, uh, chasing him of Mike Cantillon, that beautiful FW07, a uh, very classic 1979 machine. Alan Jones, who uh, went on to win the, the title in 1980 and had some very strong performances. He won at Hockenheim in 1979. Um, so a car that we saw Alan Jones do a lot of fantastic racing with. Well, it, this particular car was driven by Carlos Reutemann in 1981 and it was the very car that he lost the 1981 World Championship to Nelson Piquet by one point uh, because Reutemann's drive at uh, Caesars Palace was what I've written in my notes, lacklustre and, and it's never been explained why he wasn't quick in that race but uh, he didn't get enough points to beat Piquet. Piquet finished fifth and got enough points to beat Reutemann uh, and uh, we uh, read recently we lost Carlos Reutemann only last week. Yeah. And indeed, in those, oh, that was a bit of a slide from Michael, but I think he's dealing well with the lead. Um, yeah, the FW07. In those days, we often uh, modified a car over a couple of years, so it would stay at the same number, uh, maybe have a slightly different term after it, the C, meaning it was the slightly later car uh, of the FW07. But it's slightly different nowadays, where every year there's a, a different car. In those days, the cars were slightly more modified from one year to another before perhaps they came up with a completely new design. And, and they were developed throughout the year as well, weren't they? Which tends not to happen these days because there's rules about what you can change and what you can't. Uh, but it was a constant development. Yeah, well, it is still constant development, even if the rules are limited. They're still doing a lot of work on uh, changing. That's Luca Salusa, who we saw winning earlier today in the Ferrari bread van. Uh, and now he's out in the McLaren, and he's running in sixth place on this occasion. And there's one of the Arrows, car number 49, Neil Glover. That's the Arrows A5. 1982 car, again Mark Sura would have been a driver for Arrows back in the day, Mauro Baldi, uh, it's an evolution of the Arrows A4, the team that uh, Jackie Oliver ran, former um, great racing driver and of course went on to become a great historic racing driver himself as well, and a very successful team. That's uh, Michael Lyons lapping the P34 Tyrrell and picking off uh, a few more as he comes around. Got a good, comfortable advantage, keeping it about the same. 4.8 seconds, the gap now to Cantillon in second place. And Jamie Constable holding on to uh, third. Uh, Steve Brooks is still going. Um, yeah, he's doing a fine in the Lotus. Just trying to see 
how the other McLaren is, is getting on. Um, still doing a good job, actually, isn't it? Hanging on in there, Steve Hartley, despite that incident earlier. Well, he is, yeah, he's back in fourth place. Yeah, it looks to be uh, neither of those cars suffered any significant damage. Uh, in fact, Brooks, I think, may have got a problem. He's not come through right. over the timing line. Okay. Oh, there was a little bit of a slide there, trying to get through the traffic. It didn't quite work for Matt Cantalon getting past the Tyrrell and he had to hit the brake a bit harder than he was expecting to. Uh, Brooks is there, he's come through, but quite okay. a long way behind. He lost a lot of time on that lap. Right, OK, I wonder if there's a problem on the car. They're chasing down Paul Tattersall, another ensign. That's the ensign 179. That was a difficult year for them. Uh, likes of uh, Patrick Gaillard, Derek Daly, Mark Sewer are racing the uh, ensign 179 back in the day. Um, on this occasion, it's Paul Tattersall. Hasn't quite got the pace of the front runners, but Cantillon goes through safely. And, yeah, as you say, Steve Brooks is definitely dropping back a little bit. Lucas Halusa is ahead of him now, isn't he? Yeah, he lost about 20 seconds on that last lap. So whether that was a quick spin uh, away from our cameras or whether he has a technical problem and has slowed, but he came came over the line, carried on on the next lap. So hopefully it was just a quick spin uh, and he can continue. Still ahead of Lucas Halusa, though. Uh, then Warren Briggs in seventh place. Under a minute to go, but it means that uh across the line he goes it's probably onto the final lap uh, the checker flag presumably will be coming out at the end of this as uh, Lyons has this useful advantage he's built it up a bit more actually over the last lap it's up to nearly seven seconds Jamie Constable still in third place in the Tyrrell and hanging on in there in fourth despite that uh, two spins that he's had now and a little bit of contact with the Lotus uh, Steve Hartley I believe is still in fourth position some way further back though i'm just waiting for him still to come over the line in the background yeah he has just crossed the line now but he is a long long way down yes he's uh, lost a lot of time with those two spins actually in the end wasn't it uh, he comes through okay yeah so this the field was rather spaced out during the the uh, duration of what is uh, a sprint race a 20 minute sprint race and michael lyons is looking very very comfortable on the final lap and it looks like he's on for a, a fairly easy victory, I have to say. And I'm sure he's delighted to get this opportunity. As we said, it was originally going to be Johnny Herbert driving this car, but uh, Johnny had to pull out in the end, and it is Michael Lyons who's dominated in the wet in qualifying, and he's dominated in the dry in similar fashion. And this car is obviously beautifully set up. Very straightforward ground effect car. You can see the way that the, uh, the side pods use the airflow beneath them to suck the car down onto the road. Funnily enough, next year in Formula One, we'll see ground effect coming back. It, it was banned for a long time. They created what they call flat bottom Formula One cars to reduce the amount of downforce. The next year, ground effect will be back because it's a way of creating downforce that doesn't create the same turbulence behind and hopefully will allow for closer racing. Michael Lyons comes out of the last corner in the Murray Walker Memorial Trophy to take victory. A very, very comfortable tr victory in the ensign. Well done to Michael Lyons dominating the event. He beats Mike Cantillon by a comfortable margin of 7.8 seconds as they cross the line. The Williams finishing in second place. But a beautiful car to see out there, but it's ensign versus Williams. And then a Tyrrell. We're waiting for Jamie Constable. He's just crossing the line. There he is. So. Another British manufactured Formula One car, and that one finished in third place in its original colour schemes, of course. Fourth place in the end, I believe, is going to be Steve Hartley, though he's quite a long way down, and he did have a couple of spins along the way. There he is in the background in the McLaren. Rather exciting race for Steve, um, entertaining in different ways, but it wasn't quite the perfect uh, drive for him today. He'll have to sort himself out for next time. But nonetheless, it was entertaining stuff, and Michael Lyons definitely showed his... Tremendous skills once again. A big wave to the fans. And it, it is fascinating seeing the speed of these uh, cars. You know, when we're, we're comparing speeds between such different types of cars here at the Classic. Uh, we saw the pre-war cars out a little bit earlier on today, chuntering down the long straight. And then you get a Formula One car from the 70s or 80s charging down there. It's through kind of straight and stow in a flash, isn't it? So wonderful to see. And we're going to see a big contrast coming up after this race with plenty of other categories that will be going at slightly different speeds. Michael Lyons, the winner of the Murray Walker Memorial Trophy race, and once again, doing a fantastic job.
on board the ensign. Give them a wave if you're out there watching from the sidelines. And if you're back home watching our live streaming, then you can still get clap and give them some praise because he did a fine job there, Michael. And uh, Carl running very reliably throughout as well, which is lovely to see. And the sound of so many Cosworth DFE engines as well is always very, very special before the turbo era cut into Formula One. Of course, the noise was still pretty impressive, <laughs> much louder than it is nowadays. But the, the Cosworth has a very particular sound and it's a delightful sound. So let's take a look at the result of the Murray Walker Memorial Trophy and it was Michael Lyons taking that comfortable win from Mike Cantillon. Jamie Constable was third and Steve Hartley after his two spins and a few incidents finished fourth. Lucas Alusa in the other McLaren was fifth. Warren Briggs in fact making it three McLarens in a row there in sixth place ahead of Mark Harrison, Neil Glover, Ken Tyrrell and Paul Tattersall completing the top ten. Outside the top ten, we saw the likes of Jonathan Holtzman and Michelle Baudouin. Steve Brooks, Judy Lyons, uh, finished 14th in her 30s. And then a couple of people who had some problems, Ian Simmons, Mark Hazel. Sadly, Chris Perkins was an early retirement. So, fun and games in the Formula One historic race. Let's look back at some of the highlights. Adrian Flux are proud to be the Classics official insurance partner for another year. Why not visit our stand in Purple 10 next to the Village Green today to find out how we could save you money on your insurance. We've also got all sorts of things to keep you entertained, including a Forever Cars display, Ian Cook's Pop Bang Colour masterpieces, and the chance to win a passenger lap around the track in the course car. So what are you waiting for? Adrian Flux, insurance for the individual. The road to freedom. Japan quality. Yokohama. Your tire.
Our brains are responsible for every thought, every memory, every word, in fact, everything we ever experience. Dementia can take all that away. But looking after our brain health can reduce the risk of this happening. It's time we started to think brain health, and we can show you how. So we're back at Silverton for the Classic and plenty more action still to come. Looking forward to some great racing. And in fact, the next one that we will be showing is the HSCC Thundersports race. And we're going to see uh, another lovely mix of cars like Chevrons, Lolas, Marches, uh, Corvettes, all, all sorts of mix. Then we've got the Classic Mini Challenge, followed by the pre-66 Grand Prix cars. They're due to start at 3.30 this afternoon. The Transatlantic Trophy for pre-66 touring cars at 10 past four. And then the Endurance Legends, some very rapid machinery in there at five to six. And then the Masters Historic Sports Cars race, like the older uh, sports cars at uh, five to seven. And then a really good mix, the Woodcut and Sterling Moss Trophy, starting at 10 past eight tonight. Um, that is a race with a fantastic grid. So many cars, so much variety. Looking forward to that one. So let's go and enjoy the podium from the Murray Walker Memorial Race, race first with Ed Foster. Mark from Gary O'Day, the same. Murray Walker Memorial Trophy for the Masters of Historic Formula One. Overall, for the head and louder classes, in first place, we have Michael Lyons. In second, Mike Cantillon. And third, Jamie Constable. Mike, Michael, I'm going to come to you first. I think that's the fastest I've seen an ensign go. Um, you seem to check out at the start and all good. Well, I can't complain on days like today, can I? I can't make any excuses. Um, no, it's a testament to what the guys, the students, and obviously the wise eyes as well guiding them over. We've done our homework. Obviously, it's the, not your first choice of Formula One winners, but the car's pretty good. We've, we've done a bit of work and we've got it working well and it's a testament to them because the level of competition here is really, really strong. I mean, you see the cars around us on the grid and the drivers as well, they've won these championships before so it's fantastic just to be able to be drafted in at the last minute and get to steal some glory. Well done. Mike, you seem to be closing in a little bit in the middle of the race. He's quite a hard man to catch, isn't he? Yeah, first of all, congratulations to Michael, your amazing drive. Uh, I, I just couldn't stay with him. I mean, we were putting in the quickest lap times that we've done around here. Um, I still couldn't, couldn't catch up with him, so fair play to him. Um, but as always, tomorrow. A great race. On to Jamie Constable. Jamie, you must be quite relieved when you saw Steve spin in your mirrors. Well, I, I didn't actually see him spin in my rears, but I got on the straight expecting him to be there and he wasn't, so I, I assumed something happened. But I, I mean, I feel sorry for Steve. He caught the oil on the first lap and it could have happened to any of us, so it's a lucky third, really, because he, he was driving well up until that point. Well done to all three of you. And we've got another podium. This is for the Stuart and Fittipaldi classes. In first place, Lucas Halusa. In second, Jonathan Holtzman. And in third, Michel Baudouin. Lucas, Jonathan, and Michel. Lucas, we'll come to you first. You're driving so many cars this weekend. You're driving so many cars this weekend. This must be one of your favorites, that McLaren. Yeah, without a doubt. It is just so much fun to drive. And of course, it's a shame if you're not battling against anyone. 
but still, on your own out there, it's still it's so much fun, so I can't complain. Jonathan, in that wonderful six-wheeled car, is it different to drive? You know, I think the front is narrow and the, and the rear is wide, so you have to be a little off, off your line a little bit in the front. But other than that, you really don't notice it. And it's, uh, it's a lot of fun when you go a little sideways. It seems to have a little bit more front grip. But I think it's such a wonderful car for me to drive and the fans to see. Right, on to third place, Michelle. Michelle, that Hesketh is just the perfect place for it. Silverstone Grand Prix circuit with a Hesketh. Yes, it's fantastic. And, uh, Last, last week, it's my birthday. <laughs> it was a fantastic race. How difficult is it behind the wheel for 20 minutes? I don't understand. OK, right, well, well, we'll wrap up there, but congratulations to all of you. We're looking forward to the start of the next race, the HSCC Thunder Sports race with a tremendous collection of sports racing and GT cars from the 1970s. A little bit of cloud overhead at the moment, but uh, I'm glad to say it's staying dry for now. We will keep an eye out for any showers that might be crossing over. These guys will be starting on slick tyres, so the last thing they really want is uh, for some rain to fall, but the track is fully dry at the moment. But I will be keeping my eye out. There's definitely the, a little bit of a threat of rain in the background, but you can see this wonderful collection of cars heading down the pit lane uh, from, dominantly from the 1970s. Uh, we've got a couple of cars from the late 1960s, a Chevrolet Corvette of Peter Halford from 1968, for example, a John Davidson's Chevron B6 from 1967. But then we go uh, forward to the early and mid-1970s. Um, John Cockerton, for example, driving a Porsche 934 from 1976. And it is a real mixture of machinery that we will get to see. And what is quite interesting as well, um, we've got a Pontiac Trans Am that delivered a great performance uh, qualifying. Now, it's quite Lyons, funnily enough, who uh, dominated the Formula One race earlier on, just recently, who dominated with that Pontiac, he managed to get to fourth with it. Whether it's him that started, we've been told it's him that started, but I wonder if it is, because if that's the case, he has to leap off the podium and straight into the car. So I'm not quite sure if he's in the car to start the race. What we will hopefully get to see for the, I don't know, to the pace of the early stages of this race. Meanwhile, the whole field is out there on circuit. Very different shapes of cars from big American beasts to the rather subtle little mid engine sports cars uh, running two meter engines, uh, which are very quick. So let's take a look at the grid for HSCC Thunder Sports. It's Callum Lockie who will be starting on pole position in a Can Am March 717. The battle's going to be with Dean Forward in a McLaren M8F. These two are in a different league to everything else, pretty much, as you can see in the lap times. Um, the Chevron B19 in, 30, uh, in third position. Edward Thurston's going to be starting the race in that. We think it's Michael Lyon starting in the Pontiac. He qualified it fourth yesterday, but we'll see whether it's him or Alistair Fazikas who starts. Tony Sinclair did a good job, uh, fifth on the grid. And then we've got the Royale of uh, Rob Wainwright, who's going to start the race from sixth. Jamie Thwaites starting in seventh place in the Chevron. We've got uh, a couple more Chevrons in the mix there. And a Lotus Esprit, uh, the 11th place car is Greg Caton. John Burton completing the top 12. So cars are heading around now uh, as we see uh, that little bit of cloud up above. Hopefully, as I say, things are going to stay dry for now, but there is that little bit more of a threat of rain. I'm actually just seeing some marshals down below me beginning to put their coats on. Oh, we have got rain. I'm just looking out the window. We have got some rain down at this end of the track. I think the weather is actually coming in from this area. So down at Club Corner, Alistair, 
it's actually going to be very slippery, which is where they are now. So this is going to be really quite tricky for these guys. We are ready for the start of the HSCC Thunder Sports. Across the line they come. It has just started raining. Oh, this is going to be really challenging for them. It is Callum Lockie on the left-hand side and deep forward on the outside into Abbey Corner. They are side by side. It's raining, it's wet, it's slippery, and they both just about get through. Well done, Callum Lockie. He's managed to get in front. Deep forward had a big, big wobble there, and they have just about got through. Then you've got the little Chevron moving up. Oh, spin for foot deep forward in the McLaren. So hard getting out there with this rain shower appearing out of nowhere. Absolutely, yes, and it was amazing that we hadn't had any spins earlier on than that because the rain has really come in heavily, but Dean forward it was, and you can see now the sheen on the track already and a little bit of spray coming up, uh, and this will give the smaller engine cars a chance, but it's the hugely experienced Callum Lockie who leads in the vast McLaren 717, and then in second place is Ed Thurston in the light blue uh, Chevron, and uh, tippy-toeing down, I think we've got a red flag, yes, we have. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I saw the marshals getting the red flag ready, uh, Ben, and I thought it was going to go out earlier, but they just uh, left it until they were absolutely sure that this rain was going to come in so heavily. I don't think Ed Thurston realised he was uh, still challenging for the lead just then, but I wonder if this is because these guys are out on slicks, basically, and uh, whether they just feel, well, this is too dangerous, and, yeah. uh, you know, they're going to be slipping and sliding around. The rain at this end is really falling down heavily now, and you can see the tyre tracks, it's raining everywhere. Um, the windscreen wipers are going on the on the closed uh, car, the, the Lotus Esprit there. There in the background is the Pontiac Trans Am that was fourth on the grid, but lost a lot of to ground. I think it probably is Alistair Fazek in the car, actually, for the start of this race, rather than Michael Myers. But we will uh, see, because the race has been stopped, no great surprise. Uh, well done to Callum Lockie and Dean Ford for getting through Abbey yeah. initially, but then, of course, there was a spin for Dean, uh, thankfully, without hitting anybody else. That was an amazing sight to see those two cars, each of which is about half the width of the circuit. They are amazing cars, but they went through side by side and uh, just a quick uh, moment for Dean Forward just going across the lines, but didn't spin and uh, down the hangar straight they come. And we can see now how heavy that rain is with uh, the cars just tippy-toeing their way down. Uh, unfortunately uh, for Dean Forward, he just spun on the uh, on the exit of Village, but uh, I, I suspect they'll be regridded, Ben, in uh, normal grid order. So once we get this race going, it'll be the McLaren and the March on the front row again. Yes, I, I think you're right. Uh, the, with the red flag coming out, it'll be taken back to zero effectively. Um, and let's hope they all make it back. There you can just see Dean Forward still heading down the order there. He's, he's a long way down the order but I think you're right, they'll end up uh, together on the front row. So they're coming straight back into the pits under the red flag conditions. And as you can see, the track has just <laughs> completely transformed. And I did see that sort of hefty uh, rain cloud uh, heading in. I didn't realize it was going to be quite that wet, I must admit. In a sudden moment, just at the start of the race, it was literally a dry formation lap, wasn't it, that they did? And then suddenly <laughs> it was a wet start. In, in some ways, it, it was good that the wet came in from that side and it was at the start because the drivers knew immediately that they were going into the rain before they'd started the race and had it continued they would have uh, carried on but uh, the uh, the worst scenario is when it's raining at the other side of the circuit and they appear without any knowledge of, of the wet track it's really given the track a soaking the, the good news is unlike yesterday where we just had vast clouds coming in and lots of rain for a long time it does look like this is just a passing shower uh, and already the sky is lightening uh, in the direction of the uh, of the travel of the clouds but uh, it's still raining at the moment i'm afraid there's going to be a lot of tyre changes to do, aren't there? Uh, as you can see, the uh, the slicks are being taken off all down the pit lane, and the wets are being fitted. That's a lovely shot, actually. Thanks, guys. Uh, giving us a, a lovely picture of the teams going to work. It's not quite like a, a Formula One team, where you've got a whole bunch of people everywhere to swap your tyres around. But it is going to be a busy time in the pit lane, as the wets need to be fitted. And that's a key car, because we saw how Michael went so quickly in it, in the damp yesterday, that he managed to qualify fourth. And that's not Michael's pressure. So uh, I think you're right, Ben. We, we did talk about this before we went on air, that uh, we'd be surprised if Michael hopped from one car to the other. Uh, and, uh, but the information we were given that he was starting, but we think now it's Alistair Fasikas. Yeah, that makes sense. He, I think he had a very cautious opening lap too, because he did drop a lot of places. But 
in a way they've got another chance because in theory it'll be uh, back to the normal grid and he'll be starting four. So, tyre changes, wheel changes going on all the way down the pit lane at the moment. Uh, everyone has to be organised, have that set of wets available. I think they will have been organised because we've all seen this weekend through, our, through Friday how quickly the weather has been changing. But look, not everybody's back in yet. There's still, there's still cars coming down the pit lane. Haven't even got them all in uh, right now. Number 33 just heading down the, the road. Mike Fry and his Lola. Then we've got that rather gorgeous uh, Corvette. That's the Neil Merry car and a very pretty Porsche as well. Number six, that's uh, John Cockerton in his Porsche 934. And that's the 1976 three-litre powered machine. So a real variety of, of road-going sports cars modified for racing and then purebred race cars that, that were not designed at all for road use. Let's just look back at the start, Alistair, because it was suddenly wet and then going into the first corner, very brave for both front row men. Yes, and Dean Forward got a better start, actually, and tried to muscle around the outside. And uh, Callum had a little bit of a, a moment there, didn't he? But uh, they're both such good drivers. But uh, Dean knew that what he had to do was just ease out. But now he's going to have that spin. Just watch now as he comes out of village, tight right-hander, puts the power on, round he goes. And then he has the presence of mind to keep the wheels spinning, to get himself off the track and out of the way of the following cars. Uh, absolutely uh, amazing driving there. He could have let the car roll back into the line of the other cars, but no, nope, he got it out of the way. So uh, great driving from Dean Forward, despite the fact he had a spin. Yeah, and the way he rejoined, as you say, was very sensible. Some people just kind of launch back into it, but he, he knows what he's doing. He just came carefully back on to an area where people could uh, stay clear of him. And that, that's the sort of driving that's lovely to see. But it's very busy down there in the pit lane, isn't it, right now? Everybody rushing around, trying to change tyres, trying to find a space in the pit lane to put your car, because there's not much there. There isn't. And uh, I wonder whether we'll get anybody stay on slicks. Uh, yeah, I wonder if anyone's going to be brave enough, or they simply haven't got enough wets with them. You're right, because that rain has eased off now, pretty much. And it is, um, you know, it's a longish race, this one, isn't it? It's a 40-minute race in total. Hmm. So that's a, that's a very interesting point. Well, wets aren't going to last for the duration of the race uh, if the track continues to dry, which it will once we get uh, some uh, brighter sky coming over. So uh, the it's confirmation the restart will be full distance. So they will yeah. do the full 40 minutes. Good. Um, so that, that yeah, that I wonder if there's going to be some cars that are switched on to wets, and then five minutes down the line, we're going to be seeing some switch back onto slicks. But it's a little bit risky because the track is definitely wet at the moment. Definitely, yeah. But it will partly depend on when they get the message as to how long yeah. the delay will be. Because if the clerk of the course decides to delay it until, uh, for say, five or ten minutes, then we could have a reasonably drying track by that point. It's almost one of those situations, uh, and, and certainly with professional teams over the years, I, I know, having spoken to them, you need one of your people out on the track <laughs> watching from somewhere, maybe a, a friend or a spectator or a family member who's out on the track. You give them a call and say, what's the track like over there? Because when you're, you're tucked in the pit lane here, the wing, particularly the international pits, you actually can't see much of the track. It's very hard to yeah. know how wet is it out there until you get out onto the circuit. Yeah. So it's actually quite useful sometimes having somebody sitting up on a bank or watching from a grandstand who can tell you just how much water is still around. Yeah, and I think there's also different parts of the track were soaked more than others. If you look uh, from our commentary position, we look straight down the Hamilton Strait and we can see that the exit of Club Corner looks from here to be uh, quite wet, but the section through Abbey and Farm, it's wet, yes, but there's no standing water, so that will dry very quickly if the uh, rain doesn't return and if the uh, cloud lifts and we get a little bit of warmth coming through, which it already is. It looks brighter already, doesn't it? Yes, it does. So let's wait and see. Um, but uh, very, it was as um, Secretary of the HSCC has just uh, tweeted me and said, uh, very fortunate Callum and Dean vastly experienced with these cars in the wet. Uh, Callum having a terrific win at the Alton Park Gold Cup a few years back in this monster of a car. Uh, so yeah, Callum dealing with it very, very well indeed. So we'll have to see. Um, do get in touch at Ben Edwards TV is my uh, Twitter name. So uh, if you've got some information for us that's useful, always be glad to share it with everybody else that's watching, whether you're watching from the track side here at Silverstone or whether you're watching us online. So a set of wets going on board the number 33 car there of Mike Fry. You can see a nice treaded pattern on the back there. 
this little mid-engine machine, a lovely Hewland gearbox hanging on the back end, and uh, then the engine cover area of the Lola T8690 heading back onto the car once again. So two-litre engine uh, from uh, 1986. It's one of the more recent cars, in fact, that is in on the grid. This one. That's the uh, the Sports 2000 type of car, isn't it? Which uh, is effectively a fully clothed Formula Ford 2000 with a two-litre Ford engine in the back, and uh, as you've described there, the tyres being changed. So we're on to the wet, and. Uh, We're just so we're down here ah. in the pits with Dean Ford in this wonderful McLaren. With Dean Ford. Dean, I'm sorry to jump in. I know you've got a lot going on at the moment. Um, that must have been a very, very difficult lap. Uh, yeah, the, we saw the rain coming down on the rolling lap. So we knew it was just about to start and then it came down heavy. That was that. What, so what happened? Just, just a bit too much power? For me, yeah, yeah, in the, um, whichever corner it was, yeah, just, just loaded up and that must have been the wet patch and this thing is horrendous. Just you, you've that. gone for wet, so they're going to last for the full race? Probably not, but what options have we got? We've got to be on the right tyres now um, and driving it on slicks, just forget it. So. I've heard that this car is obviously enormously powerful, but actually it's quite nice to drive. It's a, it's a good old beast, but it's just so big. It's like driving an oil tanker, but a good handling one. <laughs> a, a very quick oil tanker. Sometimes, sometimes. Depends on this weather, doesn't it? Well, Dean, best of luck. Thanks Thank for you. talking to us. Thank you. Well, thanks, Ed. It's uh, certainly been a challenging time. This was the spin once again that we're looking at for Dean. Just lost the back end. Round it goes, circling, and uh, but then finding a way to get himself pointing in the right direction again pretty quickly. So he did well to get through it. So tyres have been changed on uh, many of the cars so far. We don't have a, a restart time just yet. The race was red flagged and uh, we'll just have to see when it is due to get up and running once again. And hopefully we're in, be in for another good battle. But it is brightening up again, as I say. Um, so not a huge amount of water on the circuit. Nothing like we saw at times yesterday when the track was absolutely covered across the board in water and aqua playing was uh, commonly happening quick look at the number 52 car of andrew storer that's a chevron b52 having a look around the car himself this lovely variety of machinery and uh, andrew will be hoping to pick things up once the uh, race gets back underway once more starting down at the back of the grid, in fact. Let's go back to Ed Foster. So I'm now with Ed Thurston, who really was in the thick of it at the front end of that field. Ed, thank you so much for joining us. I know we haven't got long. Just talk us through that first lap, because when you started, it wasn't really that wet. Uh, yeah, it was, it was dry. Uh, I was pleased with the start. Uh, Lockie and uh, forward made contact at the first corner. I thought I was in there. Um, so got up into second, and as soon as the rain started, I thought, if we're only a little bit, we'll gap them. Um, tried to move down to Luffield, didn't quite stick, and then it was red flagged. But um, this place for us, they're 800 horsepower. We're only, I don't know, 270. So I'm pleased, but it's a bit of a faff. Dean was saying that his wet tyres aren't going to last the race. Will yours on this? I don't know. They're not brand new. The fronts are fairly new, but the three... Who knows? Don't know. Never driven this car. I've done nine laps in the car. Well, nine good laps. I've, you need to get going. We'll let you get on with Thank it. Thanks so much. Cheers. Lovely to hear from Ed there, isn't it? And uh, doing a great job. It, there's so little experience in the car and yet still delivering great performances. Just seeing number 114. That's the car of the Besleys, Charlie and Hugo. That's a, a Tiger SC82. And that is another Sports 2000 car. That was a a good brand in the day, uh, winning many races in its time. Next to it is the number 12 car, John Thwaites. That's, a, that's slightly different. That's an earlier Chevron B19. Well, Jamie Thwaites in number 12 actually owns the car that Dean Forward's driving, uh, the uh, <laughs> McLaren M8F that was in the lead battle. Uh, uh, but he doesn't drive that car. I think he fancies the slightly less power of the Chevron. 
got the Acela PA2 of David Oliver there. So cars are being prepared, but we are just still a few moments away from the start of this race. We'll be back for more action in a moment. We're on the starting grid for what is set to be an incredible day. It's lights out, and away we go. He's taken an early lead. There's never been a better crew. Behind every great driver, there are brilliant engineers. It's going to be hard to pick a winner here. They're on the final lap. A day they'll never forget. We're getting ready for a restart of the HSCC Thundersports race, uh, which was red flagged due to a pouring rain just at the start when everybody was on slick tyres. So they had to bring them all in. And it looks like everybody has switched on to wets now. <laughs> Ironically, it has stopped raining. Uh, but the track is going to be slippery and the wets are going to be the safer option. There's no doubt whether anybody will actually risk going back onto slicks. I think that's a difficult one. We've just been told the restart will be over the full distance and there will be two warm-up laps, two pace laps as they call them, uh, so that they get a chance to feel for the uh, track conditions. So this was the original start. On the left, number three, Callum Lockie. On the right, number 18 forward. You'll see as they go into the Abbey corner, they're absolutely side by side. There's almost contact because Callum has a little wobbly moment and Dean's trying to go around the outside. They both have a bit of a wobble. They survive. Dean's in second place as they go through the left-hander at farm, but then as they approach the right-hander uh, at village corner, you can see Dean forward going in on the outside, turns in, loses the back end, round it goes, spins it over, make sure he slides to the inside, that's pretty good, he keeps out of the way of everybody else, and then carefully turns the correct way to the right to make sure he doesn't just barge back into the track, finds his route onto circuit and rejoined the fray so that dropped him a lot of places but we are believing that they will simply line up in the original grid positions because that happened also early and the red flag came out early i think we'll go back to the original grid positions which will mean those two can-am cars will be on the front row there is dean and the mclaren uh, can-am car which is uh, an amazing machine it has an eight liter engine built in 1972 that car and there is the Callum Lockie machine that is the March 717 a slightly earlier car but that's got an 8.8 .8 litre engine believe it or not well the McLaren was really dominant in the Canadian American Challenge Cup known as Can-Am uh, and uh, it was uh, Peter Revson and Denny Holm took first and second in the championship uh, in the McLaren M8F rather similar to the one that Dean Forward is driving today uh, so that was the uh, uh, really dominant car for that season uh, sadly, the, uh, the Bruce McLaren, who ran the team and designed the cars, uh, was actually killed in 1970, testing one of his earlier McLaren M8s. Just looking at the track, um, you've still got that little bit of uh, dust on the right where the oil was laid down earlier. But looking at the surface itself, you can see there's a little sheen across the track now. Uh, that is from the dampness of the rain that we saw early on. Now, it's going to be when we see the cars back out on track, I think they will be drying the track fairly quickly on their wet tyres. 
uh, and they're going into a 40 minute race by which time by the time we get to the end of it if the weather stays as it is now those wet tires are going to get start getting shredded particularly on the more powerful heavier vehicles maybe the lighter cars the sports 2000s etc they may have a bit of an advantage by the time we get to the end because they won't be so abrasive on the tires i wonder how much these can-am cars you know they're going to take a lot out of their wets uh, they may well be struggling by the end of the race let's wait and see it does depend on whether we get another shower yeah the, the sky is certainly brightened now hasn't it but those dark clouds are all around us which was the forecast showers rather than continuous rain uh, but it would be uh, will be interesting to see the strategies of the cars they're, they're committed now because they're at the end of the pit lane they can't uh, go back and change them Another driver we've mentioned, and I must uh, give a mention to again, John Burton, Alistair. He's starting in 12th place, been racing for a very, very long time. Lots of success with Chevron in the European 2-litre championship in the 1970s, and he's still racing here yeah. in 2021. He's 78 years old now, John Brilliant. Burton, and uh, a jeweller from the Midlands. And he, I remember John Burton racing in period in these cars, the very same sort of car. I think, I'm not even sure this isn't his car that he's kept. Uh, and uh, he was always very, very quick indeed and still out there racing. Great to see. Yeah, lovely. So uh, watch out for car number 60. There it is on the left-hand side. That is John Burton, uh, 78 years old and still very, very competitive. Uh, sort of driver who will may well adjust to this change in grip levels quite well, I would think. Uh, the breeze is, is still quite strong. I'm looking at that flag. It's not looking too windy, but I was looking across from our commentary position towards the area where they're doing some of the uh, skid demonstrations and Terry Grant's doing his stuff and the wind is certainly showing to be quite strong over there um, but at the moment reasonable brightness you look at that skyline that's what we're looking at as well pretty much from our commentary box um, and so far it looks as though it's going to stay dry but who knows we could get another shower or two as we go through the afternoon so this has put a little bit of a delay on things but we are going to see a full uh, distance race it's, it's going to go to the full 40 minutes means they might have to cut back later on I would think on some of the races because remember we're we're due to be racing right up till nine o'clock this evening with some of the uh, longer endurance races there is another break um, built in to the schedule it may be that they just have to shorten that break a little bit later and get the cars back out on track as quickly as possible a few little bits of puddles as you can see down towards club corner so that area is going to be quite slippery we haven't seen track conditions up at the top end I wonder how uh, wet or dry it's going to be up at Luffield and Brooklands certainly there was some rain not quite as much rain I don't think as we had down at this end so we'll have to wait and see when the cars are allowed on circuit so th there have been all sorts of fun and games in this meeting so far it is uh, the second day of the classic at Silverson but the first day of racing let's look back over some of the highlights that we've been watching so far
Right, looks like we're getting ready for the cars heading back out. Now, they are going to get two pace laps. So they'll come out uh, around for the first lap and then they'll do a full pace lap from the start finish line back round again and then into a rolling start once more on a track with a slightly different track conditions. So it'll be interesting for us to follow them around, in fact, on these outlaps just to see what the track is looking like in its various different areas. This is down at Abbey. Uh, we're looking straight down to Hamilton Strait. This is the starting area with the wing on the left. That's the uh, international pits area where Formula One is based or was based here a couple of weeks ago. New hotel up on the right hand side as well. It's been built over the last year or so. And uh, here we are. The marshals getting ready to get the signal from race control to send the cars out on track. They will be following the safety car, which will act as a pace car for these uh, opening laps just to see what it feels like lights on that means they've got to have uh, wet lights on the rear lights are have to be on when the track is wet like this and they are heading out onto the circuit and we think they are going to be lining up in the original order looks like that's the way it's going to be they may uh, have to sort of sort themselves out a little bit presumably as they come out because i don't think they're all quite in the order they started originally yet Hard to make that happen in the pit lane. There isn't a lot of space down there. A lot of cars to get out. We've got a total of 37 cars in this race. The HSCC Thundersport says a very uh, beautiful number 27, the uh, John Sheldon Chevron B16 that was just heading out. And a lovely view again of some of the different formats and shapes and sizes of cars that are going back on the track. So. All on wet tyres, we believe. As far as we know, they've all gone on to wet tyres sensibly. And now we're going to get a little look, Alistair, at just how the track is, what kind of shape it's in. Yes, uh, there is a fair bit of spray being thrown up, isn't there, even at low speed. And uh, the, I think the safety car is giving them one relatively slow lap just to be able to pick out the spots that might be wetter than others. And then I suspect the second lap, they'll just pick up the pace a little bit. I think the marshals did manage to get them into grid order in the pit lane. That was something we were watching as they were being flagged out. The marshal running down with the, the clipboard, just checking the numbers going through. So I think the marshals have worked very hard to get the cars out of the pits in the correct order. And certainly the front few cars are in the correct order so that we should then come round on the second time before the rolling start. There's the yellow flashes on the front. That's John Burton's car. We were talking about John earlier with car number 60, a 78-year-old who raced in the two-litre, international two-litre sports car championship in period and was very, very competitive. Called Thunder Sports. It's, uh, I remember when Thunder Sports was first created by John Webb uh, back in the 1980s. They created this sort of uh, sports car category. It was then, it, it died away, but it was recreated only a few years ago for this current version, wasn't it? Yes, it's, it's something that's been added to the HSCC portfolio fairly recently, and it, it's been uh, expanded to include a whole range of uh, period sports cars, right through to the Sports 2000 cars, which we, we still have races for those, uh, de dedicated races for Sports 2000, but they can also take part as a class within the Thunder Sport. So we get these nice full grids. But it's great to see the, the variety. As you say, we've got that weird uh, Pontiac uh, Trans Am that uh, Michael Lyons hauled up to fourth on the grid. We've also got the Lotus Esprit as well, but then we've got the more traditional Chevrons and Lolas that we would expect to see in this type of race. Definitely. So uh, looking forward to this as the, they will do another formation lap, but as you can see, it's quite a lot of spray down the hangar straight, so it is quite wet down there. Uh, clearly being on wet tyres is the right thing. It's just that by the end of the 40 minutes, with all these cars on track, and remember the more cars you've got out there, the more quickly the track dries up. You've got fairly big, some heavy cars, not all, I have to say, but that again helps the track dry out quite quickly. We've got a breeze blowing across the circuit. So these wet tyres are going to be taking a pounding. There is no doubt about it. By the end of the race, the wet tyres will be worn out. So it's a question of whether you can keep them running all the way to the end and not be sliding around too much if the track dries up. You can see it is quite wet there. And as they come out of the last corner, they're definitely throwing up a lot of spray around that section. It's going to be another battle between Callum Lockie and Dean Forward when we come around next time. But they've got another lap just to get an idea of where there's some grip and where things are a little bit more challenging for them. And we saw enough shots from our K1 
camera in the pit lane uh, to, to know that the pit uh, stop to change tyres is not really an option. Uh, the cars are not designed for quick wheel changes. So I don't think, uh, I mean, some people might come in and change tyres, but it's not something that's going to be done in two seconds, such as Red Bull do. <laughs> no, quite. Uh, that is not going to be the case in this form of motorsport. Up towards the tighter area, I, I think we're going to get a dry line developing yeah. quite fast up there, yeah. because you, even now you can see just a tiny bit of dryness. Yeah, there's a lot less spray on the, uh, the woodcut side of the circuit, isn't there? There is. Than the, uh, the stove. Club stow end of the circuit where we're looking out on where it was really hammering down. You can see the sunshine bright down on that area of the track as well, glowing off the cars as they weave around quite cautiously. So, looking forward to what is going to be a, an entertaining race. There are some slightly heavier looking clouds down at that bottom end again. Um, yeah, there is one cloud down there that looks a little bit rain filled, but it may be passing by without actually getting to the circuit at all. We shall see if that is the case. So we've got, uh, let's quickly run you through the order that they will be starting the race in, as it was, by the way. It's car number three, Callum Lockie on pole position. Then number eight, Dean Forward in his McLaren. That's the front row. Number 19, Edward Thurston starts third. Fourth place, number 82. We think it's Alistair Fasikas. It certainly was a moment ago starting the race. Michael Lyons sharing the car with him. Fifth on the grid, number 85, Tony Sinclair. Sixth, number 22, Rob Wainwright. And then seventh, number 12, James Thwaites in the Chevron B19. And then eighth on the grid, number 21, Robert Parker. Uh, ninth on the grid, number 119, James Claridge. Tenth place, just give you the top ten for now, uh, Robert Shaw. Number 67, Robert Shaw. Actually, just, just quickly mention, 11th Greg Caton, number 36, and John Burton, number 60, starting in 12th, as we mentioned, the 78-year-old who's been racing uh, through most of his life uh, very successfully in sports cars, and he's still at it here in 2021 at the Silverstone Classic, which is lovely to see. He is starting in 12th place in car number 60, with 50 years of racing under his belt. So, uh, heading around, and we're seeing that spray already reduced, I have to say, after one formation lap. Uh, there was a lot more spray when they came down the hangar straight last time than there is now. I know they're going a bit slower this time, so that is part of the effect on that. But I do think the track is going to dry out quite quickly. The safety car lights are out, but there's still a little bit of distance to do before they will be ready to go racing again. You notice the Pontiac Trans Am car, the uh, red car to the right, with a very distinctive livery on it, very famous branding on it. Um, windscreen wiper operating, as it is on a couple of other cars down there, in fact. On the open top cars, it's just a question of smearing your visor with your crash helmet. But uh, a few cars in the background with their wipers clearing the screens. We are getting ready for a complete restart and effectively an all-new race in the HSCC Thunder Sports here at the Classic at Silverstone. And we've got another head-to-head -head battle between Callum Lockie in the blue number three car and Dean Ford in the orange McLaren car number eight. They are going to be side by side as the race gets underway. Ed Thurston in the Chevron right behind them, the little baby Chevron. The race is about to start and Callum Lockie takes it from pole position, but Dean Forward's going to attack again, I'm sure, as they head up towards Abbey Corner. Once again, Callum Lockie's got the advantage. Dean Forward tries to cut in. Oh, and Dean runs a bit wide, had to back out of it. And again, that's given Callum the advantage. And this time, Ed Thurston doesn't get away quite as well. Callum Lockie definitely doing well. I think Ed's got himself back into third place, but he's got a bit of a fight on his hands. He has indeed, yes. Uh, he's being challenged on the inside by the Royal, I think it is, of uh, Rob Wainwright, who's come up from the third row. And uh, the uh, Pontiac has dropped back uh, from the, its position on the second row. But it's uh, Callum Lockie who leads down the Wellington Strait for the first time. In second place in the background, we'll see shortly, I think, the orange McLaren of Dean Forward. But there's a lovely shot. Oh, it's of, Tony uh, Sinclair who's popped up. So Tony, who started oh. in fifth place. Yeah, I was wondering which... Uh, car it was that had started so well it's Tony Sinclair according to the yes timings. yeah it is the black car yeah absolutely Tony Sinclair has come through uh, but it's Dean Forward in second place then uh, Ed Thurston then Tony Sinclair well that's a good start there is Tony in car number 85 he was uh, an additional entry actually great to see him racing again I've seen him a race over many years uh, knew him a long time ago and he's attacking trying to get past the Chevron and I think he's through on the inside 
So, yeah, Tony Sinclair really doing a good job up into that uh, third position now, and uh, chasing after the two mighty Can-Am cars of Callum Lockie and Dean Ford. All of them, of course, trying to get used to the track conditions because they're now on wet tyres. Originally, they were on slick tyres, and now they're getting a feel for just how slippery the surface is. But, as you can see, it's not as wet as it was earlier. A bit of spray coming up off the back of Callum Lockie's car, but nothing like as much as we saw during qualifying from several races yesterday. And it, it looks fairly dry at the section between Woodcut and Beckett's uh, because uh, there was no spray being thrown up at all there. Uh, and uh, we're told that Greg Thornton had a spin at Village as well, so uh, okay. it's still slippery in that section of the circuit. John Burton's dropped back as well. He's suddenly going down the order. I think there must have been a mistake from him as well. He's dropped down to 15th position, according to the graphics there. Uh, Callum Lockie is our race leader with a gap of one and a half seconds over Dean Forward with Tony Sinclair in third place, then Ed Thurston in fourth. The rest of the goals, somebody heading into the pits. Now, that's interesting. I wonder if there's somebody going to be switching on to slicks. Uh, so if you're going to do it, I suppose, you've got to do it early. Otherwise, it ain't going to work. Um, I didn't quite see who that was. Uh, it may be a problem with the car. Oh, it is John Burton. And actually, there was a problem, I think, for John. So it's more likely that there's a, that's an issue for John that he's come back into the pits. Right, back to the battles that are going on. And uh, it's all proving to be pretty exciting. The number 21 car coming under a bit of pressure from James Claridge. James going around the outside there in the Chevron B23. And that's uh, a bit of time loss. But uh, Robert Parker in the number 21 of Sella, they're a very distinctive looking car, losing a position, but still in the battle, still in the race. Callum Lockie trying to open up the gap up front. The gap is up to 2.2 seconds. This bunch of cars very, very close though, as you can see, and trying to fight for every position that they can. Mark Richardson, actually that's David in the car at the moment, uh, I think, who uh, made the start of the race making up a few places and the track definitely getting that little bit drier as the race continues and those wet tires are going to be taking quite a lot of strain in the latter part of the race still over half an hour to go number five that's martin don in the uh, coldwell rare car the coldwell c14 coming up uh, behind the white uh, with the yellow and blue stripe that's the number 88 car of kevin cook and uh, challenging as they go through that section. Kevin Cook in the uh, March 75S, which is a, a Sports 2000 car, uh, I think uh, that one is. And uh, uh, March didn't make many cars for that class of racing. So, yeah, let's see how they, they get on. Up front, Callum Lockie still got the advantage over Dean uh, Forward. The two Can-Am cars, uh, British built but with American engines. They're forging ahead, as you would expect. They're really opening up a big, big gap. It's a, it's a separate race, really, for those two up against all the others. So Tony Sinclair is then leading the, the next group of cars, and that is quite a good group. Uh, there's only a couple of seconds between each one. And uh, down to the lower end of the top 10, we have number 15, John Emerson, and his Chevron B19, and the top 10 completed at the moment by John Spears in his Ocella. We're looking back at this other middle group, car number 88, making its way around. That's Kevin Cook, as we saw earlier. You can just see the Lotus Esprit in the middle of that group as well. Windscreen wiper working effectively. Just got the one Lotus Esprit in this race and right in amongst these little sports racing cars. As we see the uh, De Silva car being shared by family members. Also in that group as well, number 96. So a little bit of a move on the Lotus down the inside, and it works effectively there for Martin Don, who takes the position away. And uh, the Lotus just seems to be struggling a little bit more in these conditions, perhaps, than it was yesterday. More threat coming its way. And the car going through on the inside there, the 88 car of Kevin Cook, the March 75S, actually running in the under two litre sports car class, not the sports 2000 that I thought it was. So uh, he's going well and chasing after Martin Don uh, as well, which uh, this is really classic sports car racing that we saw in period where uh, very close racing, these under two litre cars going through Luffield now. The Esprit having a, another little look on the inside, but he's now being chased by the, uh, the 96 of Tim De Silva, who started that, so uh, we'll hand over to Harindra. Tim's through, look, Tim's got through on the inside, so the Lotus has lost another position. So, just struggling a bit against these little light sports racing cars, 
uh, which are all going very well at this point. Callum Lockie, fastest lap so far, still uh, owning up a 1.9 second advantage. Just, I think he's just sort of managing his pace. In fact, he's just done a, another uh, good lap there and holding up the gap to Dean Forward in second position. Tony Sinclair then uh, a big gap back, but he's in a much smaller car, very different type of car. There are our two race leaders. There's Dean Forward, currently running in second place, both running on the wet tyres, remember. You might start to see them going offline down the straights just to try and keep those wet tyres cooled off a bit. Yes, absolutely, and it, it's significantly wetter down there at Club Corner, isn't it? Now this, this section of the track through up to Village and then into the loop, there's no spray at all as they turn through there, and then I think the Wellington Straight's pretty dry, and then it's certainly dry from, or dry-ish, from Woodcut round to Beckett's, and then back into the wet track again as they go down the Hangar Straight. So really, really tricky conditions, a, a real half and half. You can see there the track is relatively dry as they turn through the left-hander at Aintree, down onto the Wellington Strait now, a very fast part of the circuit, no spray being thrown up, so that shows us that that section of the track is reasonably dry. Yeah, no doubt about it. Dean Ford doing that slightly quicker lap on the uh, last by a tiny fraction. I mean, it was a minor, minor margin faster than Callum Lockie. There's very little to choose between them uh, in this race so far, and they are pulling away more and more from the rest of the opposition but uh, delivering some wonderful noise. Uh, for those of you out there watching in the grandstands, it is lovely to hear these big Chevy V8 uh, huge capacity motors grumbling past you, isn't it? Uh, really is quite uh, special. And uh, we get a little bit of that all through the coverage and online, but when you, when you actually by the side of the track, you not only hear it, you get the vibration almost coming through the, through the floor, don't you? Oh, 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 bit of a mistake there, wasn't that all went a bit, little bit wrong for Tim De Silva. And he's lost that place again to the Lotus Esprit, hasn't he? Greg Caton, who's nipped back through after her, uh, Tim De Silva went wide. Uh, but that uh, the battle ahead of them is uh, really good. That's uh, These are all the two-litre uh, sports cars that are racing together. And uh, great battle going on as they go down the old pit straight into the right-hander at Cops Corner. And a, a move there on the inside for 21, Robert Parker. Uh, so he gets through, I think he moved up a place there, that'll put him up to 11th. Okay, so we're seeing a few changes here and there, and generally a pretty well-behaved racing, considering it's pretty damp out there. And uh, although the track is drying up, just up that uh, section of Beckett's is looking the more gloomy, actually, at, the, at this stage. Hopefully it's uh, gonna stay dry for them. You can see running a little bit wide Lotus Esprit, Greg just running a slightly different line to some of the others. Bit of spray still being kicked up down one side of the hangar straight. Uh, and we've got a good little battle going on here. Look, uh, two abreast, nearly three abreast, nearly four abreast as they head down towards Stowe Corner. And then everybody slotting into position, but it's it's close. And sometimes the wider line, when it's got this dampness, actually gives you a, a touch more grip. So people are playing around with slightly different lines through the corners at the moment. Up front, the gap is still just two seconds between our main contenders in the Can-Am cars. Remember, there will be pit stops coming up in this race. Ooh, people running a touch wide. Pit stops and handovers uh, to some other pretty rapid drivers uh, who will be coming back out. Michael Lyons will be coming back out in the Pontiac Trans Am at some point, but his car has dropped away quite a lot now, I think. Uh, down the order. Yeah, it's down in 28th place, so that's going to give Michael a bit of work to do. And uh, still this two-litre battle goes on into the loop, and uh, just ahead of it here are three cars also battling in the same group of cars, so we've got a really cracking midfield battle here. This is for around uh, 11th, 12th, 13th and onwards as they come down the Wellington Strait. Oh, 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 and, oh. oh a car off, that's the 112 Peter Holford. Peter Holford Chevrolet Corvette. Now, he had problems in qualifying, didn't he? I think yeah. then he pulled off in qualifying as well. That does look more like it's gone off rather than pulled off. Let's have a look. Oh, there was a wobble there. Uh, and then what happened? Oh, that's a bit strange. There was definitely, there was, I, it looked like a brake failure or something to me there. Ooh. That, ooh. Ouch. Oh, it's done a fair bit of damage. What a shame. That's uh, painful, isn't it, to see in the beautiful Chevrolet Corvette. I think something, it looked like something broke to me because it, yeah. there was that big, it was a big twitch under braking. 
whether brakes failed or something broke when he, when he actually hit the brakes, I don't know, but poor chap um, ended up hitting the barrier. There is the Pontiac Trans Am actually being lapped. So that car started in fourth place, the, uh, the red Pontiac, just been lapped by Callum Lockie. And it looks like we do have a bit more rain around, I think. Uh, I can see some more windscreen wipers going. Where we are, it's not looking that wet, but I think there are some areas where we might yeah it is it is just looking out of the window we've definitely got a, some rain in the puddles around as you can see it on the lenses now yeah. of the cameras as well so staying on wet has, has proven to be the right thing yeah it's very difficult to choose isn't it in these conditions is it going to stay dry is it going to rain again and, the, and you said earlier the safer option is to go for wets and and try and get them to last for the whole race distance as they go through uh, Brooklands into Luffield. Some traffic now for Callum Lockie to deal with. He's very capable of doing that. He's got the power as well to do it. Makes his way past uh, one of the Chevrons and out onto the pit, the old pit straight. And uh, shortly we'll see the orange McLaren in the background, that of Dean Forward. He's now got to deal with the Chevron, which he does, and uh, makes his way into the right hander at Cops Corner. Well, Dean Forward still very much in touch, isn't he? And yeah. you have to wonder, I mean, Callum Lockie is super experienced and so is Dean, but how much are they saving in those tyres as we come into the area of the track that looks as though it might get a little wet? Yeah, it's very dark over at that section of the track, isn't it, over at Beckett? So, yeah, you've got to keep the control, you've got to keep the balance and know when to push, when to ease off. So this is still an open race, there's no doubt about it. They're coming up to lap Mike Fry now in the Lola T8690 that we saw in the pits earlier with the rear bodywork off and when they were changing onto the wet tyres. And um, Kevin Cook's just gained another place in car number 88. Oh, it's very close between the leaders suddenly. They're going side by side. Oh, and Callum Lockie misses out and Dean Forward goes ahead. Now, was there a problem for Callum? Suddenly, when he was behind the other car, he slowed down. I'm not quite sure what happened there. Dean Forward suddenly took advantage. No, we we'll perhaps need to see a replay of that to try and work out whether Callum had a problem. So that, uh, suddenly he seemed to slow and uh, maybe he was just being very cautious because the track is quite wet and he thought he saw water on the track and it perhaps wasn't as bad as he thought and he goes the into lead. the lead. Yeah, this is uh, another good battle between the two of them. Uh, I wonder quite what went on there because it always looked like he had a problem and then you know, he's braking nice and late, nice and hard. Oh, too late, too late. He's got a bit wide. Oh, that's a chance for Dean to get back in front. Yes, Callum, you were overly brave on the brakes on that one. And Dean now takes control. So you can see how the track conditions have changed again. It's got even more slippery. And in these big, powerful cars, I tell you what, this is not easy to cope with. With, with this sort of power, you can only go to full throttle when the car is absolutely straight and you've got confidence that you've got a little bit of grip around you, but he's still brave. He's still going for a late break into Brooklands. And he runs wide as a result. Dean cuts back. Yeah. Oh, no, Dean's lost it. Oh, not again. Stay out of the barrier, Dean. Dean, please fall. Oh bit of contact but he may have got away with it and that, that is a snappy car you know you, it's a short wheelbase car and that is when you have a short wheelbase car with a big engine in the back of it that's typical once it starts to swing that mid-engine car with so much weight you just can't hold it i mean it, it snaps on you so quickly you, yeah you're, you're just a passenger round it goes bosh yeah, it has damaged the right rear. I think it's damaged the rear wheel. It's not uh, going to drive very smoothly. And I think, sadly, that's the end of the race for Dean. That's a real shame, isn't it? He was just trying to get through on the inside and get the advantage on uh, the march as he went into Luffield. And just a little bit of extra application of the throttle was enough to spin him round. I mean, these drivers must be virtually just breathing on the throttles yeah. to, to, to put the power on. They've got so much power. Yeah. Uh, and oh, there yeah, we can look. see the back wheel is, is very bent, isn't it? Yeah, the suspension is bent, basically. It has put the wheel at a very strange angle. Damage to the bodywork as well. Always sad to see on such a beautiful classic car. Uh, but uh, Dean's OK. It's just one that uh, he's going to have to remember as uh, getting a little wrong. But it's obviously a very sensitive car. The way it spins, it's happened to him a couple of times now. When it starts to go, it goes quick. We've got safety car again. Um, now, whether I'm not quite sure whether anyone else has got off because Dean's in a safe place now. So whether we've gone to safety car, there's another car or somewhere, I'm not sure. It does imply there's a car in a dangerous place. We'll have to wait and see if there are any images coming up. Uh, by the way, uh, I, was, I was just about to mention Kevin Cook having moved up the order slightly. 
Uh, down there in the pits, car that we were watching earlier, that's the, uh, the silver car, presumably making their driver change. Um, but Kevin Cook, as I mentioned, in the March 75S, a genuine Group 6 car of its time. John Lepp and, and Schiffen both raced them. And he's now put that car up into ninth place. So you can do your driver change, despite the fact that safety car is out on circuit. Uh, for those of you, those drivers who are sticking with their car, they still have to come in the pits for a certain amount of time before they can come back out. Uh, for those sharing their cars, obviously, it's a quick driver change in that same time and send them back out. And we will get to see Michael Lyons coming out in the Pontiac, I believe, which will be nice, but they are quite a long way down, uh, 28th position at the moment. It is in the pits, by the way, that car, so Michael Lyons will be getting a good run when he comes back out on track, and he may well be able to pick up quite a few places. And I noticed there we got a shot of the De Silva car in the pits uh, and it didn't look like Tim was getting out, did it? It looked like he was being told just to stop for the time that he needed right. to, to do the pit stop. So I wonder whether Harindra will not be getting in that car as we see the car that now, if we can see the helmet, is it Michael Lyons? Yes, it is. So Michael Lyons is now aboard the Pontiac Trans Am. Just you can see there, tightening his seat belts up, checking that his helmet is uh, comfortable. It's almost, like a, it's almost like a NASCAR, isn't it, the way this yeah. car is set up yeah. and, and built, um, you know, with that cage inside. And yeah, lovely to see. Great shots inside with Michael. He's giving us a little thumbs up. And after his brilliant display in the historic Formula One race earlier, let's see what he can do. But he has got to come from a long, long way back, I'm afraid. But Callum Rocky uh, hasn't come into the pits yet. He's following the safety car at this stage. 18 minutes to go. We're not quite sure why the safety car is out there. We haven't actually seen an incident as such, but there must be some reason that they have decided... Ah, here we go. Oh, it is the Corvette. Sorry. Yeah, it was the Corvette that had... We did see that incident. I hadn't realised it hadn't uh, been moved, but that's obviously why... It took a little while to bring the safety car out. I'm surprised it didn't come out a little earlier, but um, anyway, maybe they waited until the the rescue truck was there, yeah. and then they decided yeah. to bring the safety car out. They may have chosen to do it when the fit window was open as well just to uh, yep. make that part of the race a little bit easier for the drivers in these very tricky conditions we've seen on the cameras that we've got a lot more rain coming uh, on parts of the circuit that was slightly strange watching that there's certainly a, an issue there because it looked like the front brakes were locked on as well because the front wheels weren't turning that was, it was dragging it um, so i don't quite know what's going on well, it's turning now slightly better so um yeah something went wrong with that car i'm sure that led to the spin it, it looked almost like brake failure, didn't yeah. it? Because he, he wiggled the wheel to, to almost as though he was trying to spin the car to slow it down, but then ended up going across the gravel trap. But just only just glancing the wall, it, he almost got away with it, didn't he? Yeah, but look at the damage to yeah. the bodywork, sadly. Yeah. This is another look at that. Ah, oh, he did get ah. a wheel on the grass. Ah. I hadn't seen that last time. No. So that might have been part of it as well, because, yeah, that might have, I'm afraid that might have been part of it, actually, because the wobble was partly getting a wheel on the grass, and uh, then he lost it. So it's just one of those situations. He may have hit the brake, the car wobbled on the grass, come off the brake, and then, of course, you're going too fast. You can't make the corner, and off you go. So a race leader is coming in, Callum Lockie, for the pit stop that he has to make. He is staying in the car. There will be no driver change. And we shall see how this works out. He should still be the race leader. But as we saw earlier today, the timing of your pit stop under safety car, whether you come in at the beginning or at the end, can often make quite a difference to your position, actually. Made a big difference earlier on in one of the other races. So let's just wait and see if he remains in front. I would imagine he will, uh, because he had a big advantage over everybody else before this safety car period came out, and especially and we lost Dean Howard as a result of his minor accident that he had on the exit of Brooklyn's corner. You can see quite a number of cars have come into the pits now, that lead group, a lot of them coming in. And so this is going to change the order around a little bit, but I do think that Callum will still be leading once it all gets reset and they've done another flying lap. Yeah, looking on our timing screens, uh, everybody has done one pit stop, all the drivers in the pits, and I think the ones that are still on track have did their stop a lap earlier when the uh, pit window opened. Uh, we're looking there at uh, Martin Don, number five, in the Coldwell, uh, a British-built car, the Coldwell, by uh, uh, Bill Needham, who also drove it in period as well. 
Khan waiting for that clock to tick away. Uh, watching it himself, it uh, makes life a bit easier when you can see it. So there's Tony Sinclair. He pitted earlier, and Tony, yeah, everybody else uh, is in the pit. So Tony made the earlier pit stop. Let's just see where he's going to be because he's coming around the latter part of the lap now. I think Khan's still going to come out in front of him but let's just let's just see this could be a good opportunity for tony sinclair it does work to do the stop early doesn't it yeah he was the first car in uh, of the lead group uh, a lap earlier than the uh, callum locky so uh, if he's going yeah look callum's through, just yeah. getting going you can yeah. see on the right so actually so, i think tony yeah, he's taking the lead will he yeah. emerge in front for now and uh, that'll be a good position to be in. So whether Callum's going to be able to close him up. Of course, they'll, it should be closed up under safety car. They should all be uh, bottled up together, in which case you would imagine that Callum Lockie's car is going to have the pace to uh, overtake. But nonetheless, this is going to put Tony Sinclair in a well, lovely position for now. Well, well, Tony Sinclair is going through the loop, as we can see on our pictures, and looking out of our window, Callum Lockie has just come out of the pit lane. So okay. he's, uh, he's a couple of corners behind. Um, but uh, they will close up, but there will be slower cars between them. Yeah, that's so Callum's point. got some work to do to get to, up to Tony Sinclair. Now, let's just see. Is that... Uh, now, looking at the, the order, so the, aren't some others did stop early? Do you think some of them are now actually leading this race? So that could be that we've got the number 22 car leading. That's uh, now Gwyn Pollard in that car. That's the Royale. Or did that stop, did that stop earlier? It, well, it's done the same number of laps yeah. as uh, all of the others, so that could well be right. Yes. I think maybe it's that one that's yeah. now leading the race, number 22, then number 19, and then, yeah, there we are. Look, it's his group. In yeah. fact, his number, yeah. for some reason, yeah, you can see it's tucking down. But that's the race car that's now leading this race. So Tony Sinclair is actually in third place. So this safety car has made a difference. There's no doubt about it. Uh, Gwyn Pollard is now in the Royale RP6-17, RP is now leading this race. Uh, second position for the number 19 machine, Chris Porritt now at the wheel. It was Ed Thurston, remember, earlier on uh, when he was challenging, particularly on the initial start. He was very rapid in the dry, but uh, it's now his teammate, Chris, who's driving. Then it's Tony Sinclair, who is uh, behind them. And then, in fourth place now, is number 88 car of Kevin Cook, that March 75S that we mentioned. And uh, I think he is in that little group. So we've got quite a different turnaround here as we will wait to see how Callum Lockie is able to fight his way back through the order. Pit window closed and the safety car coming in at the end of this lap. So we'll be going back to racing pace. Callum Lockie is quite a long way behind, isn't he? Because you saw him when he came out of the pit, so he's got a lot of work to do here. Yeah, he has. It could be up yeah. for a very different result. Right, here we go. Ready for the restart. Safety car is coming in. And this time, we've got a bit of a turnaround, no doubt about it. Gwyn Pollard is now leading the HSCC Thunder Sports race with 11 and a half minutes to go, being chased by the Chevron B19 of Chris Porritt, then Tony Sinclair in the Lola T292 in third position. These three are up front, and Alistair, I know you're looking out the window to see where Callum Lockie is. Have you seen him come past yet? No, he hasn't appeared, and uh, the whole of the Hamilton Strait is clear now. No oh, cars change, on it. Change up front, and it is the number 19 that goes ahead. So uh, a change as Chris Porritt takes the lead. And Callum Lockie has just come out of club corner. Wow. He can only start overtaking now, of course, because he was still under the yellow flag until the start line. Lockie comes charging up on the inside of uh, Chevron and just uh, squeezes through. Meanwhile, Meantime, Tony Sinclair is going to take the lead. So Tony is going to get back in front here in the number 85 car. It is now Tony Sinclair who leads this race. And he's got to keep on pushing because we'll see Callum Lockie charging up through the order in that mighty powerful march. But with only 10 and a half minutes to go, he's going to have his work cut out, even so, on a tricky, slippery surface. Well, Lockie had got past all of the slower cars that he was stuck behind under the safety car, and uh, so he has a completely clear track in front of him. However, he's a long way behind the leaders, and he's got to make up all that time before he can challenge. So we've got a great battle going on for the lead with Tony Sinclair, as you described, coming through to take the lead from Chris Porritt and then Kevin Cook and Gwyn Pollard in fourth place. 
Yeah, so it has a bit of a complete turnaround in this race. Uh, we are seeing some fun and games and uh, waiting now to watch Callum Lockie. And that's, that's going to be fun to see if he's going to fight his way through the order. Uh, first, we'll keep an eye on the sector times as well. He's a little quicker in the first sector, but not much. Of course, he only just got up to speed. And the other problem is that... Uh, He's got to get through these slower cars and carefully make his way. Do see that uh, car number 10, which is not actually one of the cars up at the top end of the order. Well, actually, reasonably, uh, he's in sixth place, car number 10. That's Nick Pink. He's got a penalty for a too short a pit stop. So he's got a drive-through penalty. If you don't execute the full length on your pit stop, it's a big penalty. It's a drive-through, which pushes you right back. And we can see now the uh, very obvious numbers of Callum Lockie. Number three comes down in the march into Stowe Corner. And uh, <laughs> he's, he's having to control that car on the throttle and the steering and probably the brakes as well because the car is dancing around all over the place in these wet conditions. These wet tyres will be starting to cry enough now after uh, nearly 40 minutes of racing as we come through Club Corner and he's just drifting the car through on the power and then he'll be on to the Hamilton straight and uh, we've got the leaders already past us so uh, Callum Lockie's still got a lot of work to do here he comes out of the Merck uh, up towards Abbey but look at the gap in lap time uh, between Sinclair and Lockie seven seconds on that lap yeah so you know in theory he's going to be able to close up that gap mind you when he when he crossed the line he was 24 seconds behind so what's that three and a bit laps to oh. be able to overtake yeah and what are we doing uh, the lap times are two minutes 20 or so and we've got eight minutes left so about three, three, laps. three laps so we should get a silverstone type finish we should we should get a last lap for lunge i would think maybe from callum Lockie. let's wait and see uh, because he's balancing everything to try and get that very powerful machine moved up the order Nick Pink's moved up, but unfortunately he does have a penalty. Uh, and also I noticed that another penalty has been announced uh, for car number 44. That's quite a long way down the order. That's Steve Hodges. He also made a pit stop that was too short and uh, has been penalised accordingly. Well, he's been told to do a drive-through. So that's a, a little bit unfortunate. Meanwhile, Tony Sinclair with an advantage of 1.8 seconds at this stage and 20 seconds over Callum Lockie. Callum is about to gain a position he's going to pass the Lotus Esprit I think he's just done it there uh, of Greg Caton um, yeah is he there no no that isn't no, Greg. I, I think he's already passed oh, I he's think already the, got through yeah, is the, he? The, the times on the screen are slightly behind yeah uh, and uh, he's already got through such is his speed he's uh, charging through the field but uh, it I'm interested to see the gap between the leader and Lockie at the end of this lap because that will tell us whether he's made up another seven seconds as he did on the previous lap. <laughs> yeah, well, at the moment, the graphics are showing... Uh, yeah, that's still a little bit delayed. We haven't got the fully up-to-date graphics just yet to show us exactly where he is. Just going past the number 51 car, Julian Maynard, but that's a, a lapped car. Uh, but he is moving up, isn't he? 18 seconds is being shown now as the gap. Still going to be tough to, to close up 18 seconds in only six and a half minutes. And the uh, conditions really deteriorating with lots and lots of spray. It's not quite as bad from inside the car because we've got a long camera shot there, but uh, it isn't greatly better than that, is it, Ben? You've done a bit of racing, I'm sure, in the rain, uh, and it's not wonderful, is it? It's always a bit of a challenge trying to work out where you're going and what you can see, uh, but these guys are doing a great job. As you say, that uh, we've got a bit of brightness outside, which is nice. Callum comes through. So the gap this time was 17 seconds. Uh, he gained about six seconds on the entire lap, as you see actually from the graphics, 6.9 seconds it was, so it was nearly seven again. Uh, meanwhile, by the way, uh, Michael Lyons in the Pontiac Trans Am is moving up a bit through the order. He's now in 17th place, uh, 16th place in fact, just gained another position. So I think we're going to see Michael gain a few more places before the end of the race in that uh, rather fancy Pontiac. But let's see whether Callum Lockie, how far up he can get. The man who had the, the race lead comfortably, who's totally on for race victory earlier on, uh, now in third place, 15 seconds behind. <laughs> but what, with that length of time, we've only got about two laps, two and a half laps to go. It's going to be very tight to see whether he can actually catch Tony Sinclair before the end of this race. Well, he, he made up two seconds on Sinclair between the timing line at, uh, at the Hamilton Straight and at uh, uh, Luffield. So uh, he's probably on for another seven-second gain or six-second gain on this lap. 
uh, if he can get through the traffic. That's yeah. the only thing, isn't it? Yeah, and that's going to cost him more in a way than it is Tony, because getting through the traffic in these difficult conditions, not at all easy. But I have to say he's doing a fabulous job of it so far, choosing his areas in which to... Uh, this is a bit of a tricky one. He's got a car in front of him at just the wrong time, really, here. This is going to cost him. This is going to cost him dear. And, of course, as the track is drying up, you want to be on the dry line, not on the wet bit. And, and, and yeah, look, he's lost a lot of time here. I think this is going to be one of the uh, key moments in this race. If he doesn't quickly get past the number 14, he's going to be able to do it now down the hangar straight. Gets past the seller of John Spears. But I think that will have cost him a little bit. Yes, indeed, it will, all the way through the Beckett's complex. But uh, typical Callum Lockie, he didn't force the issue. Nope. He just uh, followed John Spears through, didn't want to cause any problems for the other driver uh, and may well have given up a potential win there, although he could still get on the podium, of course. That's the other thing to look out for. Uh, he's up into... Well, he's already on the podium. He's up to third. I think there'll only be this, that, uh, and one more to go, probably, when uh, they come over the line next time. So we shall wait and see. So running out of time, but Callum Lockie, there he is in the background, making up a few more positions in terms of lapped cars, but how much closer is he? Well, the gap when they came across the line was 11 and a half seconds. 11 and a half seconds. He's still on target to catch the race leader. Uh, he's, he's, of course, he's got to get past Kevin Cook, who's in second place initially, uh, but the two top drivers are pretty close to one another, Sinclair and Cook. And Callum is busy trying to catch them up. Now he's got more traffic to deal with as he heads through the left-hander at Aintree, down the hangar straight. Tony Sinclair's got a bit of traffic as well. Actually, funnily enough, I think he's up behind Michael Lyons, isn't he, in, uh, in the uh, Pontiac? Yeah, he is. There is Michael, who's been making up some places himself, but uh, not quite as much as he would have liked to have done. Michael has got up to 15th. That car was way, way down earlier on in the race. Tony Sinclair, I think, will be able to overtake him as they head down towards Cops Corner here. And but it, it, Kevin Cook isn't far behind in second place. You can see him in the white car with the blue and yellow stripes behind. So uh, Tony Sinclair certainly can't relax. No, it's a very tight battle, isn't it, between the two of them. So uh, Callum Lockie still trying to close that gap up, still putting fast lap together. Tony Sinclair and Kevin Cook, the top two, number 85. That is our race leader in the Lola. And Tony putting it all together for now. Let's see whether he can keep it there. Well, the gap between uh, Lockie and Tony Sinclair last time around at the timing line was about 11 seconds. So Lockie has continued to shave lumps off the lead. But uh, difficult to pick out. Uh, there's Lockie at the top of the picture. So now we've got both first, second, or all three, first, second, and third in the same shot with Lockie coming down into Stowe Corner through the gloom. <laughs> Look, the gap's come down to 4.2 seconds. We're going to get one more lap. Uh, looking at the way the clock's ticking away here, they will definitely be on a final lap uh, after this one. It will go to zero, and then uh, that is the end of the race when they get to the chequered flag. So just one more lap for Callum Lockie to try and close up that gap. Let's see what the gap is as they come over the line. Uh, last time around, as we saw, it was uh, a bit of a gap. Now it's down to six seconds. Oh. Still a chance for Callum Lockie, but he's got to get on with it here because we are, I think, on the final lap. Yes, indeed, and he's got so many cars to pass. He's just about to come behind Michael Lyons in the Pontiac. Then he's got uh, the unusual car of uh, Greg Thornton, the McKee, uh, and then he's got another. He's got uh, Lyons. He's got the McKee, but he's got still got two more cars to get past in the next section uh, before they go down onto the Wellington Straight, where he can really open up the taps on the march. There's Tony Sinclair, he's down the other end of the Wellington Strait. Callum Lockie has been gaining seven seconds, six seconds, but this last couple of laps, too much traffic, it's been less, but there he is in the background. He can see the race leader now. He can also see the second place car, which actually he will be on terms with any moment. Kevin Cook in the white machine, he will actually be on to him almost immediately, won't he? Yes, he will, as they come round Luffield. Tricky section of the circuit, Callum going very wide on that wet line. Uh, and uh, now out across the uh, the old start finish line on the old pit straight and we can see there the leader then we can see the second place car in the background in the Merc and then we can see Callum Lockie almost caught now and will he go through no he doesn't go through at Cops corner but he's going to have a go as they go up the hill towards Maggots and Beckett's
It's going to be close in the finale here. We are on the last lap. Look at the clock ticking her down. We're almost at zero. This is definitely the last lap. And Callum Lockie's got himself into second place. Right, Tony Sinclair. But there's only about two thirds of a lap to do, maybe less, of this Silverstone track. And Tony Sinclair may be able to hold on for victory. Let's find out. The black car, Tony Sinclair, number 85, is the race leader. It's the big number three car that's on the chase with huge amounts of horsepower in that march 717 he's catching and catching as they come down the hangar straight in towards stowe corner and callum Lockie it's really going to go on the charge here to try and take the lead but tony smooth and controlled through stowe just the last corner to go into club tony sinclair has the advantage can he hold on on the exit though that that car number three's got so much power they're coming up to the check and flag Tony Sinclair, I think he's going to do it. Across the line they come, and Tony Sinclair wins by three tenths of a second from Callum Lockie. What a dramatic finish to this race. The HSCC Thundersports, we've seen everything in this race today. Wet conditions, dry conditions, race stop, changing tyres, chaos up front and behind, and Tony Sinclair has delivered a brilliant performance to win by three tenths of a second Alistair if the finish line had been at the other end of the Hamilton straight it would have been a change of lead wouldn't it because uh, Callum Lockie was on a charge and he was going faster than Sinclair but he just couldn't catch him before the line three tenths of a second it was wow well done to both drivers that was magic and it gave us such uh, entertainment to watch uh, I've known both of them for many many years they were both around when I was racing myself in different ways Tony used to help me prepare my race car and Callum I instructed with uh, many years ago and it's lovely to see two guys I know so well uh, driving so beautifully there and delivering us with a an end result there separated by three tenths in very different types of car as well and of course you've got a feel for Callum he was unlucky uh, because the safety car was really what cost him this victory but it made it exciting for us uh, absolutely it did yes and uh, Tony Sinclair's Lola uh, is actually the engine is less than a quarter the size of Callum Lockie's engine Amazing. But uh, a lot lighter, a lot nimbler, and probably more suited to the conditions. But Callum Lockie's skill in that uh, monster of a march, just able to take him right up onto the tail. He's so tidy, wasn't he, all the way. You didn't really see it slithering around. He, he was just controlled all the time. And as you say, he doesn't take silly risks, but he still gets great performance out of it. But uh, Tony has been so successful. He, he built his own sports cars at one time for quite a while, and, but he's also been very successful in... Uh, other historic sports cars and uh, he he got the victory good timing on his pit stop that really helped and uh, by the way it was uh, kevin cook who finished in third place well done to kevin as well because that was a good performance he uh, qualified a little further down the order uh, kevin cook but he's ended up with a very very solid performance to finish in third get a podium finish here in the hscc thunder sports race uh, michael lyons by the way in that pontiac he did work his way up to 14th position at the end so he made a good bit of ground and he's been having fun out in different types of machinery here at Silverstone today. Well, what a dramatic race that was, um, with all sorts of changes going on throughout. Lasted quite a long time, didn't it? But it was fun. Let's take a look at the result of the HSCC Thundersports with so Tony Sinclair taking victory in the Lola by 0.3 of a second after that long, long race. Callum Lockie fought his way back after missing out on the safety car, had to settle for second. Kevin Cook in third. The Thurston Porrett Chevron finished in fourth ahead of Caton in the Esprit, Nick Pink in the Lola, uh, and then John Emerson in the Chevron B19. I wonder if Nick actually had his drive-through uh, penalty, though. That may change when we see the final result. Uh, Jamie Thwaites was in ninth place, and uh, Richardson was 10th in his Lola. Outside the top 10, we saw Robert Parker, and we saw the likes of Ross Hyatt, Paul Allen in their Lola T212s, and Julian Maynard finished in 20th place in another of the Lolas. So, fun and games throughout. Uh, it started in different conditions when they were on slicks, and it started raining. Then we saw a restart on wets in the rain, and drama throughout.
the road. To freedom. Japan quality. Yokohama. Your tire. Well, I check the oil and the water and the tire pressures regularly. Give it a polish, make sure it's all shiny. I service the car once a year and I always do it myself. I enjoy the, the mixture of exercise. I think some of the things I eat help to keep myself healthy and my brain healthy. Or even just meeting up with a friend and having a chat. Podium for the HSCC Thundersports, and what a race it was! In first position, just Tony Sinclair. In second position, and closing very, very quickly, Callum Lockie. And in third, a brilliant drive from Kevin Cook. You're second. <laughs> Bit of confusion there. Right, I'm going to squeeze in. Tony, I'm going to come straight to you. Did you have any idea how quickly Callum was closing? No idea at all. When, when I, it was, I just got my head down and I thought, whoever's in front, I'm going to pass. Just because it's so, when you're out there, I mean, you can see a lot bit more than what we can, and all these guys are to you. I, I just had a mirror full of spray. I didn't know he was there. I honestly didn't. And I just thought, keep your head down, just keep going, and you're heading in the right direction. <laughs> that was a brilliant drive, Callum. I could actually see the water dripping off all of you. We're going to move on to Callum. What a comeback drive. What happened during the pit stop? I have absolutely no idea. Um, I will have to find out. But uh, someone said we were 30 seconds ahead at the beginning of the pit stop and then miles behind after it. So I have no idea. Um, and then I was stuck in fifth gear for the rest of the race. So <laughs> it didn't make for good progress. Well, it was an absolutely fantastic comeback drive. Kevin Cook. 17th to the podium, you'll take that, won't you? I'll take that, yeah, any day of the week. Um, but first, 9W, uh, Thursday night, we had no gearbox. Friday morning, they sent it to Hampshire, got it rebuilt, got it back. An hour and a half to rebuild the back of the car so I could get out for qualifying. Those guys, brilliant. Thank you. Well, thank you to you three. What a fantastic race it was. Well, a fabulous uh, race there, uh, a thoroughly enjoyable HSCC Thundersports race and good to see those guys on the podium after a tremendous end that was separated by 0.3 of a second. Up next, the classic mini challenge. There are lots of minis and they're going to be racing very, very hard indeed. It's going to be highly entertaining in a, on a track of slightly changeable conditions. Let's take a look at the grid lineup for the Classic Mini Challenge. Bill Solis will line up on pole position uh, alongside him, Nathan Heathcote. Then it's Ian Curley in third place and Michael Cullen starting in fourth. Chris Middlehurst back in the Mini. Uh, he starts in fifth place and David Ogden is next in sixth. Chris Morgan and Aaron Smith share the fourth row ahead of Jeff Smith, uh, the former uh, touring car man, Enduff Owens, who's very quick in Minis as well. William Drydell and Roy Aldersley completing the top 12 on the grid. So we're all set for the start uh, of the minis getting underway shortly. We've got some 25 
cars, uh, as you can see, heading out onto the circuit uh, with a bit of brightness in some places and a bit of cloud in others, but hopefully it's going to make for a pretty entertaining race. So just quickly to run through those again, those top cars, it's number 80, Bill Solis, who is starting from pole position. Another man I know well, uh, we used to instruct together at Brands Hatch. Uh, Nathan Heathcote is alongside him in car number 155. And then for number 46, Ian Curley, uh, a, a massively fast mini racer for many, many years. Number 46, he starts third. Number 67 is Michael Cullen, starting fourth. Uh, 104 is Chris Middlehurst. Chris was one of the additional entries, actually. He's starting in fifth place. And the top six completed by number 45, David uh, Odd. Ogden, he is starting in sixth place. Just behind them, number 42, Chris Morgan. Number 18, Aaron Smith starts in eighth place. And the top 10 completed by number 10, uh, sorry, number 55, Jeff Smith. And number 20, Enda Owen. So that's our, our top 10. And I think it, we're on for a pretty close battle here uh, between these front running mini drivers. Um, Bill Solis is in the red number 80 car. Uh, many times a, a mini champion. Uh, he's been successful in historic racing as well across the board. But minis have been his thing for so many years. He introduced me to, to minis back in the day, and he has so much skill on board. A former fireman as well. And uh, let's see how he gets on as he is going to try and take the win from up front. We're getting all set for the start of the Classic Mini Challenge at the Silverstone Classic. Identical minis will all be fighting for the opportunity to get a podium finish. And it is number 80, Bill Solis on pole position. It's actually the green car on the left there of Bill Solis that is on pole position. Nathan Heathcote alongside him. Watch out for the red car of Ian Curley. He's always a, a feisty racer right behind number 46 as we get ready for the start. Michael Cullen in the blue, number 67. We're all set to go racing here in the mini challenge and we are underway and it's going to be Bill Solis and Nathan Heathcote charging up towards Abbey Corner, lights ablaze and Ian Curley up on the inside trying to go through around the outside, Lathwaite's got a really good start there, Nathan Lathwaite grabs the initial advantage, Ian Curley, oh Ian Curley hits the back of, of uh, Michael Cullen's car, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, what a shame. And that's got caused a big gap now between the top two and Leith, uh, Heathcote getting a bit sideways as they went through Village Corner. Bill Solis is there right with him. Well, we saw that little bit of an accident behind Alistair and that has opened up a gap. A great start from Nathan Heathcote from the outside of the front row and was able to hold on all the way around the outside of Abbey and then into Farm. But uh, it's Bill Solis, as you say, the, uh, the old man of mini racing, really. He's been around so long, he knows everything. And uh, he's just behind coming down the Wellington Strait, so uh, we'll see whether he can challenge as they go into the left-hander at Brooklands. They're almost side by side, but then they fall into line and into third place. Is that the green and white car of Chris Middlehurst, perhaps? Uh, we'd expect Chris to pull another car going very wide. Is the 45 of David Ogden, who went very wide at Brooklands, but the rest of them streaming through Luffield, uh, two, three, even four abreast, and there's the mini traveller towards the back there as well. <laughs> Indeed, we've got the battle up front between Heathcote and Connor Solis. They are side by side once again. Ian Gurley did survive the uh, incident, but he is quite a long way down the order now in the red number 46 car. So still a big attack going on up front. Bill Solis now having the slight advantage, but only just. And it's close behind as well. Uh, the number 42 car of Chris Morgan running in third place. David Ogden up there as well the rest of the field coming through uh, number 885 Dominic Holland coming from the back of the grid a lot of difference in experience of course between many of these drivers and tricky conditions out there as well but it's the Heathcote Solis battle that we're really focusing on and it's Bill Solis at the moment who's got the slight advantage over Nathan Heathcote I'm wondering if Ian Curley's going to be able to come back up through the field uh, he's stuck in the next little group at this stage and not making much progress so far as they slip and slide around. I think I saw Michael Cullen at the back of the picture there as well, the darker blue mini, uh, the one that was uh, spun around. So hopefully he got going again without any further damage. Uh, the leader's now turning into Stowe Corner and uh, then the short run towards Club and they're coming through Stowe. They're going a bit wide there and that gives... Uh, Chris Middlehurst. Uh, yeah, is it? Chris, in fact, Chris Middlehurst has come through, has he? Yeah, he's second, in second place. place. Yeah, yeah. So Chris is going really well here. Chris Middlehurst, number 104, has joined in the battle up front. Bill is still leading. Bill Solis leading in number 80, but number 104. That is Chris Middlehurst. He started fifth on the grid. He's now got himself into second. And Nathan Heathcote trying to chase after him. 
Um, and of Owens, uh, I thought he might have got through briefly, but no, Chris Morgan, I think, just crossed the line in fourth. End of Owens right behind him. And then behind you, them, you've got Jeff Smith, Aaron Smith, and then uh, Ogden not far behind. Uh, Ian Curley has dropped back. Oh, he's coming to the pits. So there must have been damage in the end, I think, on Ian Curley's car. That's a great shame. We did see the incident only in the background, really, at the start uh, as they came through this section. But unfortunately, it looks as though we've lost a potential race winner already. But we've got a, a great run still going on up front, and there's, it's very hard to make a break, isn't it? Bill Solis is not getting away from Chris Middlehurst nor from Nathan Heathcote. And all three are still close together, whilst behind, Chris Morgan is leading up that next little group of cars. Yes, and uh, what might happen now is they'll all close up again because minis aren't exactly the most aerodynamic vehicles and uh, give a good slipstream, so it often is the case that the cars bunch back up again as they turn into Brooklands, and it looked like a challenge there on Chris Middlehurst from Nathan Heathcote. Did that come off? No, it didn't. Uh, Chris managed to get back through, and they are taking a very wide line, which is trying to keep onto the uh, grippier part of the track as they go through Luffield out towards Woodcote Corner now. And, uh, as you say, Chris Morgan hanging on to the back of that leading route. Yeah, and uh, end up Owens, actually, yes, he has moved up. He's in fourth place, isn't he? So uh, he's done well in car number 20. Morgan then in fifth place. Then the Jeff Smith and uh, Aaron Smith following up. This is still tight up front. There is Nathan. He's qualified. He qualified second yesterday. At the moment, he's sitting there in third, but it could be a good place to sit and watch the lead battle uh, as they head on around the Silverson circuit. Chris Middlehurst in second place. Quick in all sorts of cars over the years, Chris, uh, son of Andy Middlehurst. That's right, yes. Chris Middlehurst often seen out in Formula uh, Junior and in the uh, historic Grand Prix cars as well. And very sideways there for car number 18, which is uh, Aaron Smith, who uh, is in that battle. Uh, but uh, we said this yesterday, didn't we? As long as you keep the front wheels pointing in the direction you want to go and keep the power on, you can often bring yourself out of those sides. And he doesn't seem to have lost any ground. No, he's holding on in there. That's uh, car control in the Mini is a very special thing. Flashing the lights there <laughs> from uh, the blue Mini in about fourth place. That's uh, End Up Owens, is it? Uh, flashing yeah. his lights as they come down into Stoke Corner. There's the number 18 car. We're wondering if there was a loose bonnet on one of the cars. That one? Yes, there is. It's OK at the moment, although he's just lost a position. Uh, meanwhile, up front, it is still Bill Solis just about controlling things. Look at that speed through club corner. Oh, he goes a bit wide. That might give uh, Middlehurst a bit of a run on the exit, although he kept his foot hard down on the throttle, so he didn't actually lift, but it was a little bit more out of shape than he would have wanted. End of Owens, actually, alongside Heathcote, and actually, when they crossed the line, a fraction ahead, but I think Heathcote's got back in front of Owens. So Heathcote's got back into third in the background. The blue car of Owens drops back to fourth, but Owens had fastest lap, so that put him just across the line. He, he nipped a, ahead of Heathcote briefly. Now he's dropped back behind him once more. Top two, making a little bit of a break, and again, Owens and, and Heathcote are still fighting, and this could cost them uh, the opportunity to keep fighting for the lead, because they're now so busy fighting for third. Yes, uh, uh, they, it, that's certainly the case, and often the drivers will work together to keep up with the leaders and to get themselves back onto the uh, the back of the group of lead cars uh, rather than lose touch by fighting each other. The rest of the field streaming through and uh, down now the Wellington Strait and it's still Bill Solis leading Chris Middlehurst as they turn into the left-hander at Brooklands and uh, no doubt they'll slide their way through here and then they have to go through a double apex right-hander so they need to get over to the left-hand side of the track and then back across but they're using that very wide wet line but look at Endav Owens now challenging Nathan Heathcote again as they come through Luffield yeah indeed it's uh, still fight for a lead fight for third place currently and then another group of cars that are not far behind can't quite keep up with the race leading pace for now we've got just over 12 and a half minutes remaining in this mini classic challenge at Silverstone. Solis leads from Chris Middlehurst, uh, from a uh, racing family of the Middlehursts, and he's just keeping on terms with Bill Solis, very controlled so far. Aha, says the registration number. Is it going to be enough to get into the lead? That's the question mark. Uh, Bill Solis is still controlling things for now. End up Owens, then in third place, with Nathan Heathcote in fourth, and the rest of the field a bit strung out now, not quite as close as we saw earlier on. Lovely car control of balance from Middlehurst there. Each of them looking for that tiny bit more grip. Heathcote actually, I think, is back ahead of Owens. 
for that third place battle yes he is the blue cars drop back down and suddenly Heathcote finding a bit of pace actually on this lap so whether he's found a bit more grip somewhere maybe a special line through one or two corners where there is a little more grip down towards Stowe they come wide line is it on entry yep that seems to be the way to go apex or not no let's stay out wide let's stay right around the edge and see if there's a bit more grip there seems to be working down into the veil they go and then the uh, much faster club corner than we see on uh, in Grand Prix racing and uh, over to the right hander element of club the long right hander all oh, very very wide for Nathan Heathcote and uh, NDF Owens almost spins in sympathy there as they come out of club and that's uh, lost them a bit of time to the two leaders but great battle going on in the background as well cars starting to bunch up again you said only half a lap ago that they were getting strung out not anymore no, one, one of the cars ran out very wide there into the gravel trap, managed to still get back on. I didn't quite see who it was, but uh, lost a couple of places as a result. But thankfully, they still pulled themselves out of the gravel. Um, so, great action, great fun and game still going on here. Um, but it can go anyway between these four, really, I think. Especially the way that Heathcote suddenly called back up and has set fast his lap. Uh, Chris Middlehurst trying quite hard now, but... Um, just losing out a little bit as the track dries up. Bill using a lot of curb there, cutting across the curbs. And that clearly works in a mini when you're really on a charge. As long as there's enough dry surface, when it was wetter, they were avoiding that. Now Heathcote's got a bit of a run on Middlehurst. Yeah, look, Heathcote trying down the inside into the left-hander at Brooklands. Late, late breaks. Can he still maintain the speed? I think so. He's going very deep, very wide. Oh, right out to the white line, but he takes second place. And now Chris Middlehurst trying to get a challenge around the outside of Luffield and maybe get a quicker run down the old pit straight into Cops Corner and uh, see the different lines they're taking there. Middlehurst trying a much wider line, then end of Owens just in the background. So now it's Heathcote up into second, Middlehurst down to third, Owens still in fourth. And of course, leading all of them is Bill Solis up front. And uh, the two behind are slowing each other down, and Bill Solis is making a break, isn't he? He is beginning to make a break, yeah, and a beautiful mini. The Alec is going this wonderful design with its little transverse engine sitting over the front wheels, front wheel drive, of course, which has a big uh, character part to the driving skills. But if you can stay on that throttle, as we were saying in the wet, it will normally pull you out of any angle that you can get to. If you get it completely sideways but keep your foot hard on the throttle, those front wheels will pull you out of drama. Uh, but if you do it too much, of course, you can lose time by doing it. That lovely little slide in the background there from End Up Owens in the number 20 car. I love the, the blue colour on that, uh, that machine. Uh, meanwhile, Bill Solis has still got the edge in the background. We can see uh, Morgan is still running in fifth place. Then Jeff and Aaron Smith, they're running sixth and seventh at this point. And then in the next little section, we've got the number 100 car of Ollie Streak. Oh, again, Middlehurst and Heathcote are going together for this second place battle. The gap to the leader, though, now 1.6 seconds. And Aaron Smith managed to nip through past Jeff Smith there on that lap. So uh, right. one place up and uh, one place down for Jeff Smith into seventh. But they're still running nose to tail as uh, this battle for second place. <laughs> Look at Endaf Owens. It's so sideways, but uh, controls it, keeps it just about within track limits. And uh, now making their way up the Hamilton Strait. There's the leader, Bill Solis, at the front of your picture. But it's the great battle between Nathan Heathcote and... Chris Middlehurst and then end up Owens is starting to get back on on terms with those two as he makes his way through the right hander at Abbey then the left hander at farm and then up to the tight right at village and through that right hander again Chris Middlehurst looks for the much wider line as we see a whole gaggle of cars coming up the main Hamilton Strait. Nick Paddy car number 88 there and uh, he's running down in 14th place but part of a quite a big group as you say of cars that are that are doing their thing and wherever you are in this grid really you're going to have fun and games because there's always going to be another uh, competitor with you who's, who's got a similar kind of pace and it's up to you to try and either fend them off or find a way through number 31 uh, Jonathan Page is the car he's racing against Jonathan going one way then the other looking for a wide line then the tight line but as I say, that's what's so wonderful about a, a single make series like this. You're always going to find someone to race against, whatever level you're at, whether you're at the front level, the, the Solis, Heathcote and Middlehurst bunch up front, or whether you're at a, a slightly different level further down the order. Number 100 car that we're looking at, Ollie Streak. He's in that top 10 battle as well. Fastest lap from Nathan Heathcote. 
on this uh, last lap, but he's still involved in the fight for second with Chris Middlehurst at this stage. Phil Solis in control, just under seven minutes to go. Is he going to be able to hold on to the checker flag? We might see a sudden change at the end. But for now, he has got command of this race over this tight battle behind. Coming through uh, Maggots up towards Beckett's, and still Bill, Hol uh, Bill Solis leads from Nathan Heathcote, but look at Chris Middlehurst right on the boot lid now of Nathan Heathcote through Beckett's, uh, and uh, quite a bit of sideways motoring there for Chris Middlehurst runs the car out wide through the exit of Beckett's, now through Chapel onto the hangar straight once again. The four cars still very much in the lead battle, but Bill Solis has just got that bit of a gap. He's just managed to break away enough to uh, perhaps uh, uh, defeat the toe from the car behind, which is uh, at the moment Nathan Heathcote, followed by Chris Middlehurst, and then we'll see the sideways motoring Endap Owens coming to picture very shortly. There he is sliding across the picture. Now Middlehurst is having another go as they go down into the veil. Now into the left-hander. Will he go up the inside? No, he stays behind. And uh, maybe he'll have a go up the Hamilton straight. He's trying to take a tighter line, but the car doesn't want to go oh. tighter. Endap Owens going into the next county and uh, out onto the Hamilton straight. Yeah, wonderful. He has this style in. If he's got such good car control, he actually overdoes it because he's, he's losing a little bit of time. But it's almost as if he's just, oh, I'm just out to enjoy myself. Actually, I have to say, hey, Heathcote's done another really good lap because he's caught the gap up a little bit to Bill Solis. The gap when they went across the line that time was only 0.5 of a second. It had been over a second. Um, and sometimes when you're the one chasing, you're in a better position because you're watching that car up ahead. Bill goes quite deep there. That was a little error. We haven't seen him go quite that deep until now. And sometimes you could be an advantage being the one following, just seeing what the guy in front's doing, where he's getting it right, where he's getting it wrong, and then putting it all together in your own car. And I think uh, Nathan is, is doing that well at this stage. This race is not over. Absolutely not, no. And it's such a critical exit from that tight left-hander at the loop through Aintree because that leads on to this long, long Brooklyn uh, uh, wood. Wellington straight into Brooklands, and uh, if you don't get the line right up there, then you're slow all the way down the straight. But Bill Solis managed to get that right because he stayed ahead of Nathan Heathcote. But uh, Heathcote looking to challenge as they come up towards Luffield. Through the right hander they go. Right there as well is Chris Middlehurst. And I wonder whether Middlehurst. Oh, just... Solis a bit wide there. Yes, again. But that's that line yeah. he likes to take, isn't it? He's very wide. Did uh, work. And uh, Middlehurst hasn't really been challenging for that second place. I wonder if he's just letting Nathan Heathcote close up on the leader. They could still change around. Well, we shall wait and see. There's still a little way to go before we know who's going to win the classic mini challenge at Silverstone. Very much a sprint race in these tricky weather conditions. Uh, we've got a little bit more cloud around. Potential rain coming up. Uh, not just yet. I think we're going to end this, this race OK. I am looking uh, further away and there is potential rain coming up later on. Some of the other races that we've got heading our way soon. But for now, it's Bill Solis who is leading. Nathan Heathcote uh, in second position. Then Chris Middlehurst still in third. And then the rather wild end up Levin. Oh, sorry. Owen's doing his wonderful job in fourth place of throwing that little blue car all over the road and still maintaining control. And these four have definitely made quite a breakaway from the rest of the opposition. Uh, they will be coming around. I am sure it'll be going on to their final lap when they do cross the line next time. But they're doing a lap time of around two minutes 50. And I think we'll be just under that uh, when we come, uh, uh, see them come across the line. Only just, it's gonna be a bit marginal. Let's just see as they come over the line. Uh, coming into club corner now. <laughs> Bill Solis uh, just taking a huge chunk of curb there and almost on the grass on the inside of club corner and Endaf Owens just getting wilder and wilder isn't he <laughs> he just loves to fling that car around uh, it was pretty marginal but I think you're right this probably is the last lap isn't it it is going to be close I think it's only yeah. going to go to zero just as they get to the last part of the lap so yeah I think it will be the last lap we'll have to wait and see Solis has the edge still over Nathan Heathcote in second place and then Chris Middlehurst in third Chris has been a very smooth controlled race but he knows that he's beginning to run out of time now. They, they will have seen the clock ticking away. They know this could well be the last lap, likely to be the last lap. And so you've got to make your challenge now. You've got to go for it. Really worth taking a little gamble or two without getting too carried away. You don't want to take yourself out. Heathcote 
with the fastest lap in this race so far. And it was that last lap, 2 minute 50.4. Bill Solis did a 2 minute 50.6, as did uh, Middlehurst. He did a 2.50.6, and Owens did a 2.50.5. Amazingly close in terms of lap time. Really, there is nothing between these guys and they are all still putting on a show. Yeah, and, and Nathan Heathcote, I think he's wound himself up for a challenge now, hasn't he? he? It could well be the last lap, or then again, it could be the penultimate lap, depending how quickly they get round. But he's going to go for it on this section now. He's close to Bill Solis as they come through. He's just a little bit wide there onto the curve. Uh, the back flicks out, but Chris Middlehurst in third place, end of Owens in fourth place. But uh, Bill Solis it is who still leads chance here into Cops Corner for Nathan Heathcote perhaps as he comes up behind Bill Solis they make their way through there Middlehurst there flinging his car through as well so we do think we're into the last elements of this race and Bill Solis thought he's been in control from the beginning but not by much um, it's still a question mark as to who's going to end up taking the top step uh, could be any one of these three. Oh, bit of a mistake there from Heathcote. Got a little too sideways. Now Solis gets a bit sideways, but sort of carries the speed with him. There was just a little error, and fair enough to Nathan. It was worth a bit of a gamble. He had to find a bit more pace. If anything, it just cost him about half a second, I would say. Has opened up the gap a little bit. Solis feels confident that he can move right out to the edge of the track, coming down towards Stowe Corner. The clock is ticking away. 25 seconds to go it's likely to get to zero before they cross the line which means this will be the last lap and Solis has just got enough of an advantage at the moment clock ticking away is the checker flag going to be out it's going to be pretty marginal will they have to do another lap we'll wait and see I think it's just going to go to zero before they get to the line three two one zero uh, so I believe we're going to see the checker flag coming out there it is and Bill Solis takes victory in the classic mini challenge here at Silverstone, beating Nathan Heathcote by 0.7 at nine of a second. A wonderful fight, and Bill controlled it, but my word, it could have gone anyway. Uh, Heathcote second then, Middlehurst third, and Enduff Owens in fourth place. One of the most entertaining performances of all, and a great final lap, actually. Owens got the fastest lap right at the end, a two minutes 50. Point one. Well done, guys. That that really was highly entertaining and thoroughly enjoyable. It certainly was, yes. All of them had uh, their moments, didn't they, as we see the remaining cars come over the finish line. Uh, all of them had moments at different points, going wide, sliding, particularly end up Owens. Um, but uh, in the end, it finished in the order that we'd been watching for a couple of laps. The rest of the field coming through, uh, all pretty close together in these uh, little minis. There's a bit of wheel to, uh, to side trim coming off. That's very common. We've seen that before, haven't we, over the years? And in fact, Chris Middlehurst, I think you told me, had to stop a couple of years ago. He was told uh, he had to make a pit stop, wasn't he, with a similar trim problem? Yeah, 2019, he was leading the race and uh, unfortunately he was called in because of uh, trim falling off. It's very common on the minis. But uh, thankfully, it didn't affect Chris this time. And Chris has ended up with uh, a third place finish. And I think they all thoroughly enjoyed themselves there. Nathan Heathcote, number 155, looking quite chilled and relaxed. The little sliding windows have been opened up on the minis and a lovely wave to all the fans and to the marshals as well. And a big thank you for everyone who has turned up today to be at Silverstone to enjoy the show. And I tell you what, what's so lovely about this event is seeing the, the contrast. You know, one moment you're watching a, a Formula One car from the 70s or 80s flashing down the straights with its Cosworth DFE engine powering it down the road. And then the next thing you see is a bunch of minis, but it's just as entertaining. The result of the classic mini challenge in Sil at Silverstone, Bill Solis, the winner, uh, by three quarters of a second from Nathan Heathcote and Chris Middlehurst holding on to third. End of L Owens, though, was probably the most entertaining in many ways, finishing in fourth. Chris Morgan was next up. The two Smiths, Aaron and Jeff, were following in sixth and seventh. Ogden, Streak and Wheeler completed the top ten. Outside the top ten, we saw the likes of Jonathan Page and Michael Cullen. But throughout that whole grid of cars, we saw some tremendous battles, very, very close lap times. The Austin Mini Countryman of Mark Burnett finished in 17th place in the end, and Joe Polly took 20th. So more entertainment sent our way by the Mini Challenge. Let's look back over some of the highlights of a highly entertaining race.
thoroughly enjoyable mini race there, won by Bill Solis, and we've got plenty more action to come. But the action here at Silverstone is not just on the track, it's around and about all the area here at Silverstone. Let's go and find out a little bit more with Nikki Shields. I think there must have been a slight problem with the car. So down here on the Village Green, and of course, whilst there are quite a few people here shopping for their next classic car, they're also shopping for the right insurance for that car. So I'm down here at Adrian Flux, the specialist insurance broker, and joining me now is Steve Pearson. And Steve, just talk us through, what have you got going on on your stand here? You've got a couple of lovely classics down here, and tell us the story behind them. Yeah, for sure. So um, it's a forever car, so it's a couple of guys that have won a competition. They've all owned their cars for over 30 years, so they've brought those down. They're on the stand. Uh, I've also got little Q R codes where you can get all the information and the story behind them owning it, what sort of rallies and what sort of competitions they've used them in, uh, stuff like that. So, yeah, really cool and some really nice cars, as you say, as well. So it's lovely. And you've also got a great stand with actual walls. It's not just a tent, ladies and gentlemen. You guys knew the British weather was yeah. going to uh, not be on our side this weekend. Um, and what have you got going on? You've been doing some interviews and Q&As with some of the drivers? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so we've got drivers throughout the day. So uh, 10.45, 11.45 and then some later in the day just up on the top as you say it's inside which is good for yesterday but up on the top some live interviews that will be on the screen as well um, some questions that you guys in the crowd will be able to get up to those as well so make sure you're down and get those in um, and yeah plenty of uh, exposure to what the drivers and that are up to so cool Annie you love it your weekend what's been the sort of the highlight so far yeah well, obviously the weather yesterday wasn't too great but with the stand we had it was still brilliant um, and yeah you know we still got out we're here all insurance inquiries and needs and obviously we do a lot of specialist stuff so we're still been speaking to many of the, the owners of different cars and got all their questions answered and stuff and obviously with uh, the view up there on the track as well we've been to see a lot of the racing as well so yeah really good can't complain. And, and very quickly you've got a bit of a competition running. Haven't yeah you? we have yeah so uh, each day um, at four o'clock we're doing a draw uh, free lap in the pace car so around the track um, I know a lot of people have been queuing to get in their own cars and stuff so uh, there's a, an M2 and an Aston Martin so both of those will be really cool. Um, if you come over and see us, we'll get you entered in that draw. We'll make sure you're in a mix, and yeah, whoever wins that each day is in for a treat, so that'll be Lovely. good for them. Can I enter? By all means, yeah, can't guarantee you'll win, but please try. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Thanks very much, Steve. No, you're probably. Gonna enter the competition. <laughs> now, the podium for the mini challenge race, and what a race it was. And the winner just was Bill Solis. Bill, do come up onto the podium. In second place, Nathan Heathcote. And in third, Chris Middlehurst. Bill Solis, I'm going to come to you. The results will show that you're in the lead for pretty much all of the race, but it wasn't that easy, was it? No, no, it wasn't. Um, to be honest, I, I, the car was just easy to drive, really. You know, although the track's wet, there's plenty of grip, actually. And I was afforded the luxury of just being able to look at the track and try and study the grip. And, uh, yeah, just, you know, there was no dramas to deal with, really. Obviously, I had a variety of challenges behind me. They were all playing it fair, and that's brilliant. So it was just a, a race all the way, you know. I thought there was another lap to go, so I can't tell you how thrilled I was when that was the end. It was brilliant. No one's ever been happier to see the chequered flag. No. Nathan, we'll come to you next. You must have used all of your rallycross experience in, the, in those few laps. Yeah, it was, it was brilliant fun. And you know, I, I went back a few places at the start and I thought, I've got to get my head, head down and try and catch back up with Bill. And I nearly well, I caught back up with him towards the end and then made a mistake. But it was, yeah, it's brilliant fun. And um, I'm enjoying the, driving these minis like it's, it's mega. <laughs> More than any other grid, you drivers always have a huge smile on your faces when you finish. Chris, they were difficult conditions though, weren't they? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, the first lap, first corner was just mayhem, you know, there was minis flying everywhere. I managed to keep going, um, got past Nathan and then I was catching uh, Bill, but couldn't quite get on the back of him really uh, in, the, in the toe. But I missed a, a gear coming out of uh, the third corner and then Nathan just sort of uh, came past me. And I was trying to catch back up again, but it's just so hard out there. But big thanks to uh, Owens Fabrication giving me a great car, in particular and Duff, and uh, of course Swift Tune as well, the engine. Well done to all of you.
so podium for the minis is over but look we've got problems for the next race and this is a great shame because this number 30 scarab uh, a front engined uh, machine uh, we're looking at the pre-66 grand prix cars which are due to come out and this actually had qualified really really well fourth on the grid but clearly there is a problem a lot of steam pouring out so it does look as though part of the cooling system is in trouble and that is a great shame because uh, we believe it's Andrew Haddon in the car actually uh, there was a change yeah Andrew Haddon coming up on the graphic there uh, and he qualified really well in a front engine car he qualified fourth would have been lovely to see him starting from there but it's not looking very promising I have to say it looks like there's an overheating problem or a, or a cooling problem or a leak somewhere maybe they can repair it in time who knows because the car will have only just been warmed up I would think and yet it's clearly causing trouble uh, maybe a few people can have a look and try and solve the issue that's the lovely thing about historic racing actually is that um, if you have a problem quite often you can go to one of your fellow competitors or the guys that work on a competitor's car and say oh I've got any answers and everybody helps everybody else that's absolutely what happens yes and um, and some of the teams prepare cars for a number of different drivers and uh, they will always pitch in and help out but uh, that as you say that looks like a, either a hose come loose or some sort of split in the cooling system somewhere as we see uh, car number 20 go through the picture there that's the car that uh, sterling moss used to win monaco in 1961. it's amazing isn't it the very car yeah. the history of some of these machines uh, ben edwards and alistair douglas here ready to commentate on the 366 grand prix free car race looking forward to some great action from these magic little machines and uh well we are seeing how it all goes um, a hello to Adrian Pye has just sent us a, a lovely message. Uh, marshalling out at Luffield, well, actually Luffield out as he is. So well done for being there, Adrian, enjoying the marshalling. I hope you are. And uh, for any of you either here at Silverstone or watching online with our live online streaming, do get in touch at Ben Edwards TV if uh, you want to make any comments about what we are watching, what you're seeing about some of the cars. If you know uh, a little special bit of knowledge about the history of a particular car, happy to have a look. It will look as though uh, they are trying to solve these problems. Let's see whether they can actually get the car up and running. That would be lovely to see if <laughs> the water bottles are being used to top up the cooling system. And as we wondered, it could just be a loose uh, cooling pipe. It looks as though, yeah, it may just have been a couple of Jubilee clips there that needed tightening. Um, so they are refilling and it's possible they may be able to send him out. Let's take a look at the grid lineup for the pre-66 Grand Prix car race. And on pole position, car number 18, Sam Wilson in the Lotus 18, alongside number 10, Will Knuckle in a Cooper. And then third on the grid is Rudiger Friedrichs in another Cooper. Car number 30 should be starting in fourth, but we've just seen it's got a problem down in the assembly area. Starting fifth on the grid, number three, Barry, Barry Cannell in the Brabham BT 11. Sixth is number 53, Justin Mayers in another Cooper. Seventh is John Spears, number 34. Eighth place for number 91, Chris Drake. Ninth position, number 24, Lee Mole. And in 10th place, it is number 14, Richard Wilson. And the top 12 competed by 77, Geraint Owen, and 59, Paul Wayne. And those cars are mostly out on circuit, except for this number 30 car of Andrew Haddon, still being worked on. Um, and uh, whether they're going to be able to get it up and running. Now, if they do get him out, it may be that he has to start down at the back of the grid rather than take his position, which should have been on the second row. Mind you, it would give us something to watch, wouldn't it? Because we know this is a very rapid car. Um, the Scarab, in its day, was actually slightly out, slightly out of date. It was a time when Formula One was going mid-engine rather than front-engine, but this was a very beautifully built car. It was actually very well made. Uh, it just was slightly out of time. And actually, this car is proving to be competitive, especially when it's been damp, as we saw yesterday in qualifying. They're struggling to get it started now. Listening in. Come on, come on. This is where you're wondering, how much throttle should we be giving it? Has it flooded? <laughs> always the challenge, always the frustration. Nearly there. 
big air intakes. Oh, not looking good. I wonder it might be one of those situations you might want to give it a bump start. Right, we are ready for the start. A sprint race, 20 minutes for the pre-1966 Grand Prix car. Sam Wilson in car number 18 on the left as you look at it there. Will Nuttall on the right in the Cooper. The second row, we've got uh, Rudiger Fredericks. We are missing Andrew Haddon, sadly, because he's still struggling with the car to get it started. We're getting all set for the race to get underway. And it's going to be Sam Wilson who launches from pole position to try and take the initial lead up towards Abbey Corner. And he's got a good run going here, but it's also a very good start from the number 12 car, Rudiger Friedrichs. He is uh, at, on the attack. Sam is trying to protect, but Rudiger, I think, has gone round. Uh, that's an impressive start indeed from him. And Sam Wilson will try and come back now as we get into the tighter, more twisty section. Clean behind, everyone's gone through Abbey Corner safely, through Farm and into Village. And I gather that Andrew Haddon has just left the pits, so they have fired up that Scarab despite the problems they had. He will be right down at the back of the field, but it's a relatively quick car, so could be making up some ground throughout the course of this race. Exciting start for the number, seven, uh, number 12 car of Rudiger Friedrichs. Really excellent start from Rudy there as he comes down into uh, Brooklands and it looks like Sam Wilson might have slipped up the inside to take the lead back as we look at the long shot down the Wellington Strait and uh, yeah, Sam Wilson has taken the lead. Rudy Friedrichs down into second place but coming around the outside is Will Nuttall in the similar Cooper and uh, he's looking for the wide wet line as we've been calling it uh, out onto the section towards Woodcut and they're really sliding around aren't they the back end's twitching but Will Nuttall couldn't get through so he's still in third place so the order across the old start finish line this is where we used to start Grand Prix from uh, and it's uh, Sam Wilson from Rudy Friedrichs from Will Nuttall yeah great battle between the top three they are pulling away from everyone else so far and we'll see how the others get on just a relatively short race this one and 18 18 to 18 minutes to go in what is a 20 minute sprint race in total and the top two are just beginning to pull away very slightly wonderful cars these pre-66 which means it's before the three liter era so we're looking at one and a half and two and a half liter engine cars it's also pre-aerodynamic era so no wings front and rear it's all about uh, road holding getting the best out of the tires Mid-engine cars at this time, of course, were mostly successful, but we have got quite a few front-engine cars uh, in this field as well. And as we've seen, some of them can be pretty competitive, particularly in the, the wetter conditions. But it is the Lotus 18 of Sam Wilson that is in front of the Cooper of Rudy Friedrichs, holding on well in second place. Big wide line from Will Nuttall in third position as uh, he tries to make up the most of that on this lap. But let's see how Sam gets on here because he put together a very good pole lap yesterday and he's already beginning to open up the gap just a little bit more over Rudy in second place and Will Nuttall in third. And this will give us an idea of the lap times and the gaps between them. Wilson certainly quicker than the other two. He had gained about a second on that lap compared to his opposition. And we're also going to be going to tr try and keep an eye on Andrew Haddon in that scarab that ended up starting from the uh, the pit lane not quite spot where he is yet but uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that and see if he's able to make up some ground good shot there of uh, Garen Towins Curtis which is an Indy car a uh, car that raced in the, in the Indianapolis 500 in period which was part of the world championship for some years but never really took off in terms of uh, Grand Prix drivers going over to Indianapolis to compete uh, but that car, uh, Garrett's brought over here to race in the Historic Grand Prix Cars Association races. We now see car number 53, which is Justin Mayer's Cooper T53, but back with the leaders again. Even on the uh, straights and under braking, the drivers twitching as they go uh, deal with these really difficult conditions. And it's uh, Sam Wilson who leads in John Chisholm's car, it's uh, actually owned by John Chisholm, Sam driving it this weekend for him. Here's the, uh, the rest of the cars streaming down, what a great sight that is. And in the background there, uh, there's the Curtis again of Garrett Owen, huge car compared to the other big front engine car. Uh, but we also saw a quick shot of the Maserati 250F as well, which I'm sure is probably one of Ben's favourite cars along with mine. Yeah, it is a wonderful car and has so much great history. Uh, by the way, Haddon is running down in 31st position at the moment and he's going quite quickly um, so I think we will see him make a bit of progress as uh, there's a little bit of a change 
in that area, and you've got this such a big contrast in Titan your mid engine car versus this big front engine Curtis uh, that Geraint Owen is, is hauling around. But it is wonderful to see. Oh, we've got a little bit of a spin there for the number 92 car. That's Chris, uh, sorry, Stephen Jobstall in the Lotus 24. That's in a slightly tricky position. If he can't get that running, this could well lead to a um, safety car. It'll be yellow flags up there at the moment. There's our race leader who is beginning to ease away just a little bit. This uh, Lotus 18, the number 18 car, is an ex-John Surtees car, finished second at the British Grand Prix in 1960. So it's good heritage to it, and it's leading well at the moment too, isn't it? As Wilson opens up a gap, nearly two seconds over Friedrichs and Nuttall. Mayers in fourth place, and the rest of them just a little bit further back. There is a bit of a gap from the top three back to our, our next group, but these three are holding each other together for now. Fun to see. Great battle for second place here. Still, Rudy Friedrichs just ahead of Will Nuttall, but there's the leader coming across the line, sliding under power, just going up the, uh, the straight there. Very, yeah. very slippy. Uh, but uh, the second place, uh, Will Nutt uh, third place, Will Nuttall, just pulling out of the spray there, just to keep his visor clean as he comes up towards Abbey and uh, goes through the fast right into the left hander. Perhaps building up here for a challenge into Village onto Rudy Friedrichs. He's closing up. Is he going to be a bit later on the brakes? Yes, he's going to go for the wide line and then cut back and try and uh, get alongside, but just can't get the traction. The car just moving around as he tries to feed in the power. But Friedrichs goes wide. Nuttall goes tight through the loop. They're side by side on the run to Aintree. Uh, still don't know which way this one's going to go, but in <laughs> fact it goes to Rudy Friedrichs as he takes the line through Aintree onto the Wellington Strait. Uh, but Will Nuttall will have another go going down into Brooklands, I'm sure, as they come down towards the left-hander. Nuttall's got the inside line. That's the favoured position if the track's not too wet, but actually Whoa. he can't do it. That was a big deep uh, line from Nuttall. I know he's going for those quite wide lines, and he cuts back again, as you said. He's using that as a bit of an experiment. But, of course, you take the wide line, you've got further to go uh, than the tight line. But it's interesting watching this variety, and it might work here. Yeah, he's swept round the outside. It really did work. So Will Nuttall has now taken second position, and uh, Friedrichs drops back down to third. I also noticed that on that graphics board on the left of your screens, if you're looking at the screens around the Silverson circuit or watching online, Andrew Haddon's got himself into 20th place now in that scarab that started with problems. There it is, number 30. So they've, they've cured the leak. They're like, oh, he's locking up, locking up, gets it around just about. <laughs> you can see he's trying pretty hard. He was willing the car, wasn't he? Turn, turn. He goes into the right-hander at Luffield, and uh, so already got that car into the top 20, and sliding the back end uh, of the, that front-engined car, the car that was built, it was very competitive, but just too late, really. It was uh, came on the scene uh, at the time when the rear-engined cars had already uh, started to take over, and uh, the leading car we're seeing now of Sam Wilson turning into Stowe Corner and second place now, new second place for Will Nuttall having got past Rudy Friedrichs for that great outside move at Luffield. The pace that, um, that Haddon is doing is very similar to the leaders actually, he did a 2 minute 48, so it's a similar sort of pace to the top three, whereas everybody else is a few seconds away from that, so he's pretty sort of demonstrating what he did in qualifying, which is being pretty much third, fourth fastest, it's just that that problem they had in the assembly area means he, he's coming from such a long way back. Just looking there at the, another beautiful car, number three, the Barry Cannell Brabham BT11, but also just uh, up ahead of him. We've got uh, a battle for fifth place going on here, and it's uh, another entertaining one. The number 34 car, John Spears, the Maserati 250F, gorgeous Maserati, the ex Jean Berra car, that particular one, uh, John Spears has won at Brands Hatchery not so long ago in this Maserati 250F. A, a period of the 1950s that the, the, the 250F was such a successful car and some of the all-time greats, Sterling Moss, Absolutely. Juan Manuel Fangio, drove the, that, the Maserati 250F and had tremendous results in it. Well, Fangio was well known for picking a team that was likely to win the World Championship. He, uh, and, and he did, did so five times, of course, but uh, he picked the 250F for his final year of racing, 1957, and he won his final race at the Nürburgring, the German Grand Prix, in a Maserati 250F 
one of his greatest drives. Well, absolutely one of his greatest drives. I think he set a fastest lap for the final 12 laps of the race or something like that. And it's a 14 mile lap uh, and took took the win. Oh. Sterling Moss also chose this car to prove his worth to the Grand Prix teams by his father, Alfred, bought one for Sterling to drive in Grand Prix, a private entry to show how good he was. And then he got picked up eventually by the Mercedes team and he drove alongside Fangio. Uh, never won the world championship, but uh, won the British Grand Prix in a Mercedes. The, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Often described as the greatest driver never to win the world championship, Indeed. but that rather ignores all his other successes, which were tremendous. British Grand Prix back at Aintree in those days, and of course it's nice that we have a corner named after the entry circuit here at Silverstone. Yes, nowadays. yes. Barry Cannell in a very different car, uh, Alistair. When we're looking at the sort of types of car, you couldn't really be much more different could you and it's much later in this era this pre-66 era but it's a very pretty Brabham it, it is the Brabham's were lovely cars weren't they uh, built by uh, Jack Brabham and Ron Taranak and that's why they have the number BT Brabham and Taranak and uh, they are very very pretty cars indeed and there's some very that's almost like a toothpaste tube that the driver sits in very low you see the wheels are much higher than the bodywork whereas some cars uh, they, they seem to sit much more upright in the even in the rear engine cars. Yeah, but particularly the Maserati, complete contrast. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. the, the Maserati, actually, funnily enough, it looks so high when you've got the mid-engine cars, but of its period, it was actually relatively yeah. low, wasn't yeah. it? Because they set up the drivetrain quite cleverly to make sure that it wasn't too high. But a car stopped. I'm afraid I can't identify which one it is at the moment. Uh, oh, number 29 is stopped. That looks oh, like a different one. That's Jim Clark's car, isn't it? Uh, the yeah. R5. You're right. Uh, that's being pushed out by the marshals. Not so heavy, these cars, as some of the others we saw, so they're managing to get that out. Uh, and that's, uh, I think that's Nick Fennell, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Let's uh, see what happened. I think we've got a replay. Oh, 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 a oh, oh, little bit of a one way than the other. And uh, just spun him into the gravel trap. Some other cars around. I think that was part of the reason. But he's got it going, uh, which is good news. Uh, is that the seatbelt? that's flapping around, yes. it might be. He may have to come back into the pits to refit that. By the way, Haddon uh, moving up well. He's up into eighth place now in the number 30 Scarab. Remember, that was the car that was struggling in the assembly area with a steamy leak. Uh, but they're going well. And uh, we watch our race leader, number 18, still with a good advantage. I take it you weren't referring to the vegetable when you were talking about a steamy leak. <laughs> uh, but, Not uh, on this occasion. <laughs> the uh, number 18 car, uh, which... Uh, Amongst others, the, the car we just saw spin was an ex-Jim Clark car. He actually won here at Silverstone in the British Grand Prix in that car. Uh, but that leading car is also an ex-Jim Clark car as well, as we quickly cut back to the scarab uh, of Andrew Haddon making his way up, uh, as you say, in ninth place, doing a really good job of recovering from that pit lane start. Yeah, making uh, for a fun event, isn't he? Let's just see if he can find his way past a few more cars. He's in the middle of a... A little group of mid-engine machines. That's actually another one there. There's another front-engine car. That's uh, Eddie McGuire in another of the Scarabs. Uh, it's actually a little bit further down. He's in 14th place. There we are. There is Andrew Hatton. So he's now chasing down car number 24. Um, and that is Lee Mole in the Lotus. Another Lotus 18, actually. So with the two and a half litre engine. But it's uh, Andrew Hatton in this Scarab Offenhauser that we are keeping a close eye on. That has a two and a half litre engine, 1960 uh, as well. Now, front engine cars do seem to work well in these rather more wet and slippery conditions, and he's making the most of it. He's going to have a good run out of Luffield. I think he's going to be able to draw past and take another position. Yes, he is. So that uh, brings him up into seventh place now. In fact, even further than that, isn't it? No, it is. Yeah, I think uh, a little bit further up the order, but he's certainly going very, very well at this stage. Yeah, that will move him up into eighth place and his next target will be Geraint Owen in the uh, other front engine car that's running near the front of the field that's the big Curtis as we look again at uh, Sam Wilson in the Lotus 18 coming through club corner to start another lap we've got uh, just over six minutes remaining in this race yeah, and he's built up a useful advantage his gap let's just see what it is to knuckle now uh, 2.4 seconds it was then as they came over the line so that's a useful advantage although Nuttall actually has just set fast his lap he did a 121.3 good lap Matt um, and actually it was quite a bit quicker than the race leader so I don't know whether Will is just really finding a bit more grip now out there I'm not sure but that was a very good lap by him 
Yes, he, he looked a lot closer when we saw him in the back of the shop there coming out of club corner. So we'll keep an eye on the gap between them. A very good lap from him as we return to our picture of that beautiful Maserati 250F. Just an absolutely classic racing car shape in, from the front engine era, which ended with a win in 1960, uh, which was uh, the last uh, front engine Grand Prix car win at Monza. Yeah. Yeah, and then ever since then it's been mid-engined all the way but uh, let's see how this continues Andrew has been doing a, a good job further down he's still in eighth place at the moment we've got five minutes to go there is the race leader Sam Wilson holding it all together but on that last lap as I mentioned uh, Nuffle was faster the gap is still pretty open I would say and as they've gone through the first section of the track this time Wilson was slightly faster through the first sector going past the number 56 car there that's another Maserati 250F that's the Martin Halusa we've seen the Halusa family doing a good job so far uh, this weekend the Austrian family and it's Martin this time who's out to play in his Maserati and that car finished in white which is unusual for Maseratis but that was a car run uh, in uh, Monaco colors for Louis Chiron in period, so it uh, remains in white to this day as Sam Wilson makes his way round Luffield. In the classic Lotus colours of the day, Absolutely. the green yeah. with the yellow the yellow wheels. Yeah, the wobbly web wheels they're known as. Yeah, so spe specifically designed, weren't they, yeah. by Lotus? By yeah. another, another Colin Chapman angle. Yes, probably for lightness, knowing Colin Chapman. Indeed. <laughs> uh, down to Stoke Corner for Sam Wilson Lotus 18 with uh, what, three and three quarter minutes to go so probably going on to his penultimate lap we'll get another one in after this one these days of Formula One uh, the Lotus were always technically advanced but they were still on the space frame at this point they hadn't quite got to the, the monocom chassis they were about to come along there were significant changes to uh, uh, to the whole of Formula One through this period when we went front engine then the rear engine cars started to come in or mid engines as you more correctly call them uh, and, uh, and then we had the difference in the construction of the chassis as well so uh, a very very important time and Connor Chapman was one of the key parts of bringing in uh, new additions another good lap by Nuttall on that yeah last another lap. fastest lap right. on that last lap actually I was just about to say he's closed the gap to 1.3 seconds okay so it's worth keeping an eye on Will Nuttall at the end of this race. And uh, the Andrew Haddon car is going really well. He's, uh, I think he might have passed he has. Geraint, hasn't he? Now? Yeah. yeah. He's just got up into seventh place, gone past that huge number 77 machine and uh, well, sweeps around the outside. I'm not sure that's actually a position gain because uh, I don't think that that was John Spears. No, it wasn't. No, I um, think that's his next target, isn't yeah, it? So yeah, John Spears in the Maserati is his next target. And there is a bit of a gap. Um, they are heading up towards Abbey Corner. I'm just looking out of our window and the Maserati is just going through the corner and there's Andrew following. It's a gap of about four seconds, I would say. Um, so there's still a bit of work to be done if he's to gain any more places. Yes, and, and that's actually for the front engine lead, isn't it? The Maserati is leading the front engine cars uh, and then the Scarab is second and Geraint Owen is third. As we look now at the leaders, and it's closed right up, hasn't it? Look, Will wow. Nuttall, uh, as we said, done the fastest lap last time around. Is he going around the outside? No, nope, that's just the foreshortening of the camera. Sam Wilson still leads, but he's quite wide through Cops. Yeah, he's trying a bit too hard, and that could have cost him a little bit of lap time. Sam Wilson coming under increasing pressure. I wonder why. Maybe the track is changing slightly and suiting Nuttall better than Wilson. I'm not quite sure the reasons for that, but uh, this is a really good performance by Will. He's not giving up in the Cooper. It's Lotus versus Cooper, two of the great classic names from British motorsport in Formula One in the 1960s. And which of these is going to come out on top? We're not sure yet. And they're having to deal with some back markers as well, find a bit of space and get through nice and cleanly. No problems. They get past quite clearly there. Tony Didridge in the Cooper T45, an earlier car. And down towards Stowe, still the advantage in the hands of Sam Wilson. Still very tricky conditions, and Will still playing with those very wide lines. It seems to suit him very effectively, and in some places, there's no doubt it's working. He's gaining time by using those very, very wide lines. They're coming up on the number 33 car. That's a Cooper Bristol, 
uh, a very different type of machine. Earlier, uh, that's a 1953 car, and you can see the difference in style and look between the early 50s and the early 60s, but boy, we've got a race on our hands. We are on to the last lap here. It is not a certainty for Sam Wilson. Absolutely not. Uh, over the last three or maybe even four laps, uh, gradually Will Nuttall has closed up. You can see there on the graphic how much quicker he was per lap over the last few laps, and uh, it's really, really close now as they come up towards the tight right at Village. Who will have the advantage through the tighter section of the circuit? Will it be the Lotus or will it be the Cooper as they come up towards the left-hander at the loop? They've got past that slower car, so they're both uh, running in uh, in the clear as they go now out through Aintree. It's so important, this exit from this corner, as they go down onto the Wellington Strait once again. Lots of traffic ahead of them, Ben. This could well affect the result. It could. Uh, we are into the last lap, and there's about a half a lap to go now, just over half a lap to go, as they, as you say, come amongst some traffic. Always a little bit of a challenge to make sure you get through cleanly and don't get held up. By, by the way, Andrew Haddon, has got past Spears now. So Andrew has brought himself from a, a late start from the assembly area. He's now got himself up in the sixth place, but we really have still got a race on our hands up front. Sam Wilson only just fending off Will Nuttall, both of them getting through the traffic. And if anything, Will gained out of that a little bit in the number 10 car. So the gap is minimal between the two of them. Down towards Cops Corner they come. We did see Sam run a little bit wide last time. He's got to try and keep it under control as well add some more pressure looks very controlled look at the car control the little flick of oversteer corrected beautifully the car remains pointing forwards and these two are really pushing the cars to the limit now they're catching some cars in a tricky area uh, very tricky and uh, sam wilson manages to force the issue through on the inside of the first part of beckett's and again on the second part and that was really important that he did that because uh, he's got through that traffic before the hangar straight and uh, as they come out through Chapel Curve, down onto the Hangar Strait, this is the, the really the last couple of overtaking opportunities. We've got a car stopped on the Hamilton Strait, but uh, it's pulled well off to the side, so I think that will be held under a yellow flag, so we won't have any issues up to the end of this race as they come into Stowe Corner. And it looks good for Sam Wilson. Will Nuttall doing his usual trick of going wide into Stowe Corner. High, wide and handsome, as uh, the great Brian Jones would have said. Much missed man, the man who uh, used to commentate at Brands Hatch. Uh, but it is Sam Wilson, I think, who is going to hold on. He's just got to get the exit of club. It's going to be very close across the line because it, it's going to be tight. But it is just going to be Sam Wilson. Will Nuttall had a fantastic exit there out of club corner. And he very nearly got the win. But in the end, Sam Wilson did just enough to hold on. What a great performance by these two in these wonderful 1960s Formula One cars and uh, pretty giving us some great entertainment there and Sam just only just holding on. Now then, where's Andrew Haddon going to finish? He's done well, isn't he? Uh, crossed the line yet. Um, he's running in sixth place. And I think, yeah, he's uh, going to hang on to that sixth place. I don't think he's going to make any more progress than that. But a great effort from him. Still sliding around, look at that car control. Great stuff. And uh, actually, yeah, we are still waiting for them to come across the line. Uh, so let's just see whether it is sixth position. They had that problem in the assembly area. They had to tighten up the cooling system somewhat. Uh, Friedrichs has crossed the line in third place. Whoa, big sideways slide. And he's actually got, there. Yeah, he's come through in fourth. So he's only just missed out on the podium. I know there was quite a gap between him and Friedrichs, but well done. To Andrew Haddon. I think that uh, puts him in the shortlist for the driver of the day if we had one because yeah. that, that was an amazing drive from the pit lane start uh, in a car that you wouldn't think would be totally suited to this track and against these uh, rear engine cars but uh, great drivers. We look at Sam Wilson in that very distinctive crash helmet a copy of a Porsche 917 color scheme from the early 70s those of you who remember that far back may remember the Willy Cowson 917 Porsche, which was finished in purple and green. That was the psychedelic Porsche. And Sam loves it so much, he's done his helmet in that colour. Great drive, great drive from Sam Wilson. Yeah, and a key car, the Lotus 18, Chapman's first mid-engine single-seater, uh, delivering yet another great victory here today, this time at the Classic at Silverstone.
do have that car that has stopped, and in fact, I do believe it is the uh, the Curtis, isn't it? That is on the side of the road. Yeah, it is the big Curtis that we were looking at earlier on, the American uh, Indianapolis car. Um, unfortunately, uh, pulled over to the side of the road, thankfully in a safe place, so they didn't have to bring out the safety car or anything, but a bit of a disappointment because Geraint Owen had been putting on a very good display in that car, uh, showing us what it could do, and it's great to see the variety. So let's check out the results of the HB H. Let's check out the results of the pre-66 Grand Prix cars. Sam Wilson, the winner, by just under three tenths of a second from Will Nuttall. Uh, Rudy Friedrichs was third. And then Andrew Haddon, who started way, way back from the pit lane after problems in the assembly area, fought his way back to fourth. Justin Mayers, uh, just behind then, Barry Cannell, John Spears. Top ten completed by Rod Jolly in another of the Coopers. Richard Wilson in the Cooper T60 was 11th. Another Scarab, Eddie McGuire, up there in that top 20 as well. And um, top Maserati there was Klaus Lehr in 15th position, with Paul Wayne finishing in 20th in his Cooper T53. So more entertainment once again. It did look at one stage as though it was going to be a fairly easy win for Sam Wilson, but at the end of the day, he had to fight hard. Adrian Flux are proud to be the Classics' official insurance partner for another year. Why not visit our stand in Purple 10 next to the Village Green today to find out how we could save you money on your insurance. We've also got all sorts of things to keep you entertained, including a Forever Cars display, Ian Cook's Pop Bang Colour masterpieces, and the chance to win a passenger lap around the track in the course car. So what are you waiting for? Adrian Flux, insurance for the individual. The road to freedom. Japan quality. Yokohama. Your tire.
brains are responsible for every thought, every memory, every word, in fact, everything we ever experience. Dementia can take all that away. But looking after our brain health can reduce the risk of this happening. It's time we started to think brain health, and we can show you how. Now the HGPCA pre-1966 Grand Prix car grid and what a race it was. Just in the end, the winner, Sam Wilson. In second, Will Nuttall, just. And then in third, Rudy Friedrichs. Please come on to the podium. Sam Wilson, I'm going to jump in. That was the nervous last few laps, wasn't it? Yeah, I thought, I thought on the first few laps, I thought, I've got this one. I'm, uh, I'm pulling away. And then uh, Cooper kept getting bigger in the mirrors. Uh, I, Will's just so good in these conditions. And yeah, I, I thought the penultimate lap was the last lap. And I thought, well, here we go, the flag's here. And then I thought, Christ, another lap. But no, I just managed to hang it together. I don't know how, but we did. It's a fantastic drive. Will has come to you. You seem to suddenly find a bit more pace a few laps from the end. Where did that come from? Uh, it was probably there all the time. I just didn't, didn't push it too hard. I was actually a bit too tentative at the start, and Rudy and Sam went past. At the end, I thought I'd see what he, would had, what he was made of. I thought I'd at least make him try for it. Well, it was a fantastic job. Rudy, coming to you last. An excellent podium. It's tough to hold on to these two, isn't it? Well, yeah, but I've been lucky to, to get pulled by the professionals. So, uh, I'm really enjoying this uh, <coughs> standing here on the podium. Absolutely. It was a great drive. We've got another podium. Okay, now the second podium for the front engine cars. The winner, Andrew Haddon. In second, John Spears. And in third, Klaus Lair. Andrew, what a drive. What a comeback drive. Your car seems to work better on the track than it did in the assembly area. Yeah, we had a bit of a problem. It just decided to get a bit... Uh, Bit overheated, but um, sadly the driver kept his cool and off we went. You know, it's good, good fun. John, we'll come to you next. Second on the podium, but seventh overall. That's a fantastic effort with a front wheel drive car. Well, I'd say it's the best fun I've had so far this weekend, and uh, yeah, I could sort of occasionally see where I was going, which made a nice change. And Klaus, third, a Maserati 250F in these conditions at Silverstone must be a real pleasure. Yeah, I think it's a little bit better than the rear engine cars. You feel a little bit more safe when it's wet. When it's dry, you have lost against them, the rear engine It was a great cars. drive. Well Thank done. You. Thank you. So, another podium and another race to look forward to coming up in just a short space of time we've got the transatlantic trophy for pre-1966 touring cars this time so we had the pre-66 grand prix cars and coming up shortly we've got the uh, the pre-66 touring cars so same era but very different style of machinery and again a, a lovely mix and a big big grid of cars it's going to be a, a a longer race 45 minutes with a pit stop most of the majority of the cars are two driver uh, entries not all of them but uh, we do have a, a fantastic mixture. Number 18, Aaron Smith, uh, back out. We saw him in a different Mini earlier on. Uh, this time he's in this one. Uh, different colour, different uh, age, no doubt. This is actually a 1963 uh, Mini, but we've seen Aaron delivering some good laps already here today. Let's see how he gets on 
in the next race that is coming up. And, uh, as I say, it's a real mixture of machinery. We've got Ford Lotus Cortinas, we've got Ford Mustangs, Falcons, uh, quite a few minis entered into this race as well. Uh, a couple of interesting beasts like the Studebaker uh, Lark Daytona as well as, uh, as I say, Mustangs, the odd BMW 1800, plenty more minis as you can see, <laughs> but a, a variety of machinery. And uh, we've got two absolute giants of touring car racing, actually starting one behind the other in, on the grid as well uh, after a troubled session. We've got Steve Soper, who has often been said to be the best touring car driver in the world, and Andy Prio, three-time world, uh, well, was it sort of world champion three times, certainly twice, uh, and uh, he, he's uh, sharing uh, a Mustang, as is Steve Soper. Yeah, that's lovely to see Prio and so forth. The only thing is it doesn't look like they're going to be on driving the cars at exactly the same time. From the information we've been given, I think Andy Prio starting his car, uh, which is right behind the Soper car, yeah. but it's uh, uh, Henry Mann who's going to be starting the Steve Soper car, so we'll see them out at different times on track, which is a bit of a shame. I'd love to see them actually going yes. wheel to wheel. Yes. But there are some other good drivers. Nigel Greensall is up near the front, actually, and he's going to be starting one of the cars, number 179, and he's going to be taking over another one later in the race. So he's a busy boy um, as he's going to be doubling up in this one. We've got Ian Curley again back out. Uh, Richard Dutton's qualified really well, the uh, uh, boss of Fultec Motorsport. Uh, he's well up on the grid. And Second a, row. A, another driver of note uh, sharing with his father is Guy Smith, who's yes. a winner of Le Mans uh, with Bentley in 2003. Yes, uh, indeed. And uh, also uh, raced regularly in uh, uh, more recently, but uh, now taking up historic racing with his father. Uh, we're looking just down the area. Graham Langford's Ford Mustang there. Lovely to see as well. Part of the touring cars of uh, this era, pre-66. So you had such a mixture. They would all run in slightly different classes. So uh, you could easily win the championship, even if you were, well not easily, but you could win the championship in a mini if you won your class throughout the course of the season. And if there were different winners in the big class, for example, that won the race outright, well, obviously the, if the points were being shared between too many winners, they wouldn't end up with a champion from that class. Number 266 there, uh, James Thorpe and Phil Quay for sharing that Ford Mustang. But then you've got the contrast to a mini right behind it. And that's that's part of the fun of British Saloon Car Championship, as it used to be, was having this variety of cars. In some ways, yes, it works now to have just a single uh, regulation, if you like, for the cars. So they are all the same in terms of performance. But back in the day, you had very different performance levels and potential to win the championship in very different cars. Number 126, just having a look at uh, another of the Mustangs. That's uh, the Colin Souter and Gary Culver car. As you can see, very beautifully presented as well. And on the rather damp circuit, I think the Mustangs might struggle. It's going to give the Minis a bit more opportunity, I think, on, these, on this damp circuit. It, it is drying out. We've got a little bit of blue sky above us right now. Um, a breeze is blowing across. But it, we're finding with the relatively cool temperatures that we're have seeing here at the beginning of August uh, that the track is taking a while to dry out this is a longer race as I mentioned so we may well see uh, fairly dry lines developing as we go through this but as I look out of our commentary box window down at Abbey Corner there isn't a dry line as such it's it's drying up but there isn't a pure dry line through there yes I wouldn't have said another mini number 50 that's uh, William dry William and Paul Drydell sharing the car always nice to see a bit of family action fathers and sons and brothers and sisters joining in we get quite a lot of that at the classic here at silverstone looking around the circuit and people are enjoying so many different aspects whether it's out on circuit or in the paddock area with lots going on behind the scenes as well um, we're looking forward to this pre-66 touring cars uh, dj sterling moss it's uh, spelt slightly differently on stage uh, coming up in a little while uh, at 6 p.m there's going to be live music from Legal Jam coming up later on today as well. And um, there's also the, the drifting area, which uh, you get some fun and games from uh, the likes of Terry Grant and others, where they do some demonstrations of some very impressive forms of driving. So there's plenty to watch and to look out for. The Ineos Grenadiers fun rides are going on later on this evening as well. There'll be more live music coming up from uh, Britpop Reunion. Uh, here you are, he's down at that uh, sliding around area. <laughs> and uh, 
the shift and drift, as they call it, which is actually just over from where our commentary position is. We get an occasional glance of cars sliding around there, but it's, our focus is generally on the track. But it is nice to see cars being whizzed around and uh, seeing how they can behave. As you can see, it, it is quite entertaining, and people getting a ride around as well. So, so many different forms of car enjoyment here this weekend. So many motor clubs gather at Silverstone, uh, setting up collections of cars. And, well, we're going to see another collection of cars out on track now, as I say, as we prepare for the start of another mini endurance race for the Transatlantic Trophy for pre-1966 touring cars. We are heading out of the assembly area right now. Big uh, number 77 Ford Falcon of Adam Brindle, you just saw going out, the white and red car. One of the Alphas, there aren't many Alphas. It's a shame we don't see a few more of them out there um, this weekend. But plenty of minis, plenty of Lotus Cortinas, and there's some very rapid Lotus Cortinas amongst them, I have to say with several up near the front end of the grid, which we will be looking at in just a moment. They are heading down towards the exit of the pits. Yeah, they're actually coming out on track now. So they're going to get a chance to get a feel for the track conditions, which we are seeing beginning to dry up just bit by bit, which is going to help the race, I'm sure, open up. It was uh, Dave Coyne who took pole position. Uh, we're going to have a, a look at a good fun race. So let's take a look at the lineup for the Transatlantic Trophy for pre-66 touring cars. And it is David Coyne who is starting from pole position in car number 74. Number nine, Craig Davis alongside in another Ford Mustang. And in fact, Nigel Greensill will be starting in the number 179 car from third, another Mustang. Next up, it's Richard Dutton, car number three, Ford Lotus Cortina. Fifth on the grid is Enduff Owens in a mini. We've seen him going well already. He's in car number 20. Then it's car number 192. Julian Thomas will be starting that Ford Falcon. Uh, Callum Lockie will be taking it over later on. Behind them, we've got uh, more battles going on. Andrew Banks, number 89, starting seventh. Ian Curley is in that group as well in his Austin Mini. Let's hope he has a better run than earlier on. And the top 12 is completed by Hans Beckart and car number 181, another of the Mini Coopers. So they're making their way round and uh, we'll be getting ready for the start of the race in just a few seconds. Um, 49 cars, actually no, 50 cars I should say, 50 cars in this race. So it's a very impressive entry indeed into the pre-66 touring cars with this vast variety of machinery. And the um, safety car taking them around at a, a fairly gentle pace right now. Uh, Jim Clark, Formula One drivers of the day, raced in touring cars as well. Jim Clark dominated the 1964 season in a Lotus Cortina. The Ford Galaxies in that period won lots of races with different F1 drivers as well. Um, the likes of John Fitzpatrick, very quick in, in the minis. And they raced all over the UK, of course, all the current tracks, but also tracks like Crystal Palace. They ran in separate races with their different classes there because it's a much tighter circuit. Jim Clark took a victory there on that occasion. And uh, John Hanley was a was a mini winner back in the day as well. Jack Sears, a, a touring car champion, or I say a touring car, it was called the British Saloon Car Championship champion. He was the first one back in 1958, but he was still a front runner uh, in 1964, still winning races in that uh, time. He was driving a Galaxy, in fact, at that point. And John Rhodes was uh, a very rapid driver in one of the minis as well. Following year, 1965, Warwick Banks almost won the title for BMC in a Mini 970 in Class A. Uh, the Coopers actually ran in Class B. So we've seen a lot of variety over the years. We're going to see plenty of action as the cars get ready to go racing in what should be a, an entertaining race, Alistair. Absolutely fascinating, yes. Uh, with uh, such a mixed-up grid after the session yesterday, effectively ran behind the safety car for most of the time. Uh, just to let the drivers do their qualification laps and uh, Dave Coyne actually parked up quite early on in the session didn't he once he got pole position so uh, we've got minis there on the uh, third and fourth rows uh, which and on the sixth row as well they might get gobbled up by the faster cars as the track is now a little bit drier but uh, we'll see what happens we know how quick those minis are don't we from the mini race earlier as they come in now to club corner we're getting all set for the start of the Transatlantic Trophy for pre-66 touring cars. We've got two Mustangs up front, Dave Coyne 
and Craig Davis are the two up front. Nigel Greensall is the third, the blue Mustang, and then Richard Dutton in the first of the Lotus Cortinas. That's our top four, with a mini tucked in behind us, Enduff Owens, who we've seen is highly entertaining to watch. They set around, coming towards the start line, and the pre-66 touring cars are up and running with a good start from Dave Coyne from pole position, but he will be under attack from Craig Davis up towards the first corner at Abbey, and Nigel Greensall just slipping up the inside. No, it didn't work for him. He's actually dropped a place to Richard Dutton. Dutton's gone up into third place. Nigel Greensall has dropped to fifth, in fact. I think he's almost behind the, the mini of Owens as well, so it didn't quite work out for him, but it was a good start for the pole man. Dave Coyne. Oh, Dutton's run wide in the Lotus Corsina, but it, he gets it back on again. And still then, he's actually fought his way back into second. So, oh no, Spins, Spins, that's Greensill. No, oh, Nigel, I think he's ended up half spun. He might get going again. Did he get hit? I'm not sure. And that's a great shame because we we're expecting him to be right up there with the front runners in the background. Oh, there it is. Oh no, look, damage to the left front. So sad to see. Oh, that's a shame. Just uh, caught him out on the uh, left-handed loop corner. Uh, but the leaders are down into Brooklands now, and it looks as though it is still Dave Coyne leading as we see the rest of the cars streaming through. And uh, still they come down the Wellington Strait. There we're back with the leaders again, and indeed it's Richard Dutton who's chasing the leader. He's In got fact, him. Richard Dutton's got the lead from oh. uh, Dave Coyne. Third place is Craig Davis. Fourth looks to be the pink car of Endav Owens. Then it's the Max. Uh, is it uh, Andrew Banks actually started the Banks family, Alfa Romeo, and then behind them is the next mini, which is Aaron Smith. As they come into Cops Corner, the power of the Mustang takes him back into the lead. Dave Coyne goes through on the inside of Richard Dutton, but uh, don't count Richard Dutton out because he'll be snapping at the heels of the Mustang as Craig Davis comes charging up behind as well. Wonderful to see this, isn't it? And, uh, you know, there is the Mustang, yes, of Davis getting past. So the Mustangs have that straight line performance over the Lotus Cortina, but the Lotus Cortina dances through the twisty sections and Richard drives it absolutely superbly. He is a team boss. He's run many cars over the years um, and Dave Coyne is now his rival once again as they come out of Beckett's. Look, he's managed to get right alongside, not quite. Coyne now gets on the power with the big V8 engine and he's able to accelerate away. And that's where the Lotus Cortina begins to, to lose out. Richard Dutton now coming under a bit of pressure from behind, but we've got a battle for the lead between the two Mustangs as Davis goes up the inside into Stowe Corner. Coyne takes the big wide line around the outside and just about holds on. He does, yes, as uh, Craig Davis drops in behind. Richard Dutton's caught them up again because they're coming into the tighter section. But look at Julian Thomas coming through in the big Falcon. Comes through on the inside. Not a great uh, qualifying session for them. Uh, just about three or four rows behind, but he's already made his way up. And uh, Dutton behind now in fourth place. Uh, then we've got uh, the Banks Alpha, oh. and, and don't count that Alpha out because uh, Max Banks, who will take that over from his brother Andrew, very quick indeed. Yeah, look at Julian Thomas in third place at the moment, uh, doing an absolutely stunning job of trying to come through in the massive Ford Falcon. It's a car that he'll be sharing with Callum Lockie. We've seen Callum delivering some great performances already today. Dave Coyne's just opened up a little again. No, there is Julian Thomas into second now in the Falcon. If he can hold on, he's gone deep into the corner, but I think he's just about got the line right. Yeah, nicely done, gets ahead of Davis. And into second place, the, the back end of that car sort of swings around, but it's a long wheelbase car, and you can sort of let it swing around there's plenty of time to control it. Uh, Dave is getting a bit more twitchy with the Mustang, but Dave Coyne taking full advantage of this with the blue, white and red stripes on his Mustang heading down towards Brooklyn. This is working well, but he's going to come under threat from Julian Thomas. So it's the, the American uh, cars that are dominating the scene at the moment. The Lotus Cortina next up with Richard Dutton in fourth. And Ian Curley's moved up well in the, his Mini now. He was at a disappointing time. He went out early in the classic mini race earlier, so he'll be wanting to make up for that. He is uh, very much a front runner in a mini, and he's part of the group that are chasing down uh, Richard Dutton right now. And it's a great leveller, isn't it? The slippy conditions that we've got, this sort of half wet, half dry. The minis are still in there in the mix, and, and also the Cortina of uh, Richard Dutton. But it's the big V8 American cars that are up front at the moment with the Mustang of Dave Coyne uh, 
uh, an absolutely expert driver over many years in Formula Ford, but I think the lead is about to change, or will Dave Coyne? <laughs> no, Dave Coyne's got too much experience to let Julian Thomas slide through there. Uh, maggots into Beckett, so Coyne still leads, multiple Formula Ford champion in the 80s, and uh, comes through the right-hander, goes a little bit wide, Julian Thomas goes for the tighter line, as, as does Craig Davis as they come out through Chapel Curve onto the hangar straight once Whoa. again. Now Thomas is sliding that car through Chapel onto the hangar straight, looks like he might be ahead, uh, and Craig Davis coming on the outside, it's almost three abreast as they come down into Stowe Corner. This is wonderful racing, isn't it, between all three of these uh, American supercars, if you like, and Sam Tordoff is also moving up in car number 600, uh, just behind the Ford Falcon Sprint, all the top three managed to slide their way through Stowe Corner, so Sam's come up to fourth ahead of Richard Dutton now, and then we've got that Alfa Romeo, uh, the Alfa Julia Sprint of Andrew Banks is still in the mix, which is nice to see, but look how close Julian Thomas is to the back of Dave Coyne, barely a hair's breadth between them, and well, we shall see as they come across the line, the gap recorded at 0.152 of a second on the attack, but not into Abbey Corner. Dave Coyne takes the line. Fastest lap does go to Sam Tordoff in that Ford Falcon. He's moved up to fourth, and he's another top, top driver, of course, who can deliver in tricky conditions like this. He's pulled away a bit from Andrew Banks, but it's the battle between the top two. Dave Coyne versus Julian Thomas, who will be handing over to Callum Lockie later on in this race. Dave is doing it all his own. He will have to make a pit stop and a pause, but he is driving the second stint as well. Um, and the top three still holding on together with Sam Tordoff trying to close that gap up just a little bit more. Richard Dutton in the Lotus Cortina in sixth. End of Owens in the Mini, still running well in seventh position. And then we've got another very interesting car, not far behind, the Studebaker Lark Daytona of Adrian Wilmot. In, right in the background, you can't quite see it in the shot yet, but he's running in eighth position you see it actually on the outside coming down towards brooklands with a mini next to it uh, funny beast it is <laughs> and there is the the competition that's going on with enduff owens uh, so you've got the little mini but then you've got the the big studebaker there it is interesting machine uh, following in behind 4.3 liter engine and battling with a little mini and uh, the mini has an advantage through the tighter corners you can see the back end of that uh, studebaker really is pretty unstable but Enduff Owens, who was so dramatic earlier on in the classic mini race, ended up finishing in fourth place. He's coming under a bit of threat. Yeah, straight line speed, and the Studebaker's through. And that Studebaker is going to be handed over to former British GT driver Lee Mole, who owns the car. Uh, but uh, Enduff Owens is giving it a good run for its money. It's going to lose out on the run up to Beckett's, but I think once they get into the sweepers at Beckett's, the Mini might close up again as uh, there's a Cortina in there as well behind, and that is, uh, I think that might be Peter Smith, is it? Uh, number eight, no, Aaron Smith. Uh, Aaron Smith is in behind there as well in the Mini. Yeah, he had a good performance earlier on today, yeah. didn't he? So. Yeah. And the Minis are sticking with the bigger cars, aren't they? It's they amazing. Are. There's yeah. three of them actually up there, aren't there? Three in the shot now. Always wonderful to see as they have that little bit of edge through the uh, through the corners. But once you're in a straight line, look, a Lotus Cortina has the performance and drives through. But then the Mini comes back into the next corner. And that's what we always love to see. Back to the battle between the race leaders. And Dave Coyne hanging on in there for the moment. He's certainly been a Ford man for so many years. But a Formula Ford is a very different machine to drive to the, the Mustang. But his car control and his, his skills... Uh, are the same, whatever you put him into. Uh, lovely to see Dave with a lead of just 0.3 of a second over Julian Thomas. Craig Davis still there within a second. And then Sam Tordoff, who has closed up again, he's got fastest laps. So Sam is putting in some very impressive laps. Richard Dutton just hanging on in fifth place in the Lotus Cortina. The Alpha of Andrew Banks is not far behind him, but they are in a separate little group, effectively. Andy Prio, by the way, is running in 16th place at at the moment i think they may have just made up a little bit of uh, lost ground they're in another ford mustang oh another slide from davis but i think he held it yep still in third craig davis loves sliding his cars whatever he's driving he's got all sorts of powerful cars that he races and uh, very often he's the most sideways of the group and they're coming down the wellington straight now and just a little bit of a gap now for dave Coyne over julian thomas in the falcon as they turn into the left-hander at Brooklands. And then behind Thomas is Davis. Behind Davis is Sam Tordoff. Uh, Sam Tordoff has come all the way up from mid-grid. So he's done a, had a really good start to the race in the Big Falcon as they go through 
Luffield and then it'll be the fast right at Woodcut that leads on to the old pit straight. There is Sam Tordoff, number 600, as he goes down the pit straight, chasing after. That's a very, very wide line from Sam uh, as he is chasing after Craig Davis in the red and gold Mustang in the colours of Alan Mann Racing as they go through Cops Corner up towards Maggots once again. The big V8s still ruling the roost. Yeah, well, it's great fun to watch, isn't it? But uh, we know that some of the lesser power cars are also having their own intricate battles. A little flame uh, coming out of the exhaust of the Davis Mustang there or as he came off the power, which is also fun to see. And they, they sound wonderful, these machines. And if you're standing alongside the track or watching from some of the grandstands, you'll be picking up that wonderful noise. Big, big slide from Julian Thomas then, but he gathered it together beautifully well. Plenty of time to go, 35 minutes still to go in this uh, classic race. And Tordoff beginning to attack a little bit more. Having a look down the inside into Stowe, I expect Craig will be happy to go around the outside because there's still plenty of grip on the outside there. You can see uh, it's slippery on that inside line. Normal dry line, of course, but you get the rubber laid down there. And when you've got this dampness, it makes it far more slippery. And uh, you could really get an example, but lovely car control. In the background, Richard Dutton's coming under pressure again from the Alpha of Andrew Banks. So the white Lotus Cortina, uh, definitely not comfortably in fifth place. It's a tiny, tiny gap to Banks. And then Wilmot as well. And uh, behind them, we've got Mark Jewell, who's also... Uh, doing a good job in the number 170 car. Marcus Jewell it is in another of the Lotus Cortinas that he'll be handing over to Ben Klukas, who's very rapid later in the race. And another fastest lap for Sam Tordoff at the back of this group, but can't find a way past Craig Davis at the moment. Goes wide into Village. Now he'll cut back and try and get a wide line into the loop. Meantime, Julian Thomas is having another go at uh, the leader as they come into the loop. And now you can see Sam Tordoff in the back of the picture there, and he'll come back into shot. He's got oh. the inside line for Aintree. A lovely move there. That started at Village, and he gradually made his way up alongside Craig Davis and got through. But Davis is coming back at him on the straight, but the Falcons got similar power so they're coming down into Brooklands Davis is going to have another go on the brakes no no room there big cars these and uh, through goes Sam Tordoff you see him working away at the big big steering wheel there and uh, into Luffield they come so the order now is uh, leading is Dave Coyne then it's Julian Thomas but now it's Sam Tordoff in third and Craig Davis in fourth yeah this is highly entertaining don't forget we are going to see Callum Lockie take over from Julian Thomas uh, later on in this race uh, but Julian is very rapid himself so uh, we'll see how it all goes beginning to lap some of the other cars now there's a Lotus Cortina that they're coming up behind I believe and uh, we're going to keep an eye on those battles Andy Prio down in 13th place the car that Steve Soper will be driving later on is currently in 16th place he'll be taking over after the pit stop so there may still be a chance for that to move up the order somewhat but it's still very close third place at the moment between Sam Tordoff in that massive number 600 machine but it's also close in the top two as well Julian Thomas in the number 192 chasing down Dave Coyne who so far has just about maintained control of this race a brief moment he lost the lead but got it straight back again and uh, Julian moving one way and then the other and look at the way the car moves around even in a straight line it seems to be sliding around doesn't it incredible never going in a straight line always some steering input as they come through and Dave Coyne goes for that wide line such as we saw in the pre-66 Grand Prix race earlier on so so good for Will Nuttall but uh, Dave Coyne's so experienced and uh, he won't be rattled by Julian Thomas moving his car around with the headlights on <laughs> and uh, look at Sam Tordoff just oh. drifting through and Craig Davis just got a little bit wide there a little bit out of shape but uh, that'll have lost him some time but Sam Tordoff just drifting the car through. So it's Mustang, Falcon, Falcon, Mustang. And then in the background, we've got uh, the Lotus Cortina of Richard Dutton. He had and a great the, slide out of class. Uh, always, always sideways, Richard. And, uh, and then the Studebaker Lark Daytona, which is coming through of Adrian Wilmot. I can just imagine, Richard, you know, when he, he, run, he runs a race team for so many years for, for young drivers trying to become professionals. Oh, and there's a change. It's uh, second place. There goes Tordoff. He's managed to get past Julian Thomas. 
Uh, so he really is Sam Tordos setting the outright pace. He's moved into second place. Uh, Thomas back down into third position. But yeah, Richard Dutton, I can imagine him telling all his drivers, uh, don't go sideways. It's much quicker to just go forwards. And yet he is Mr. Sideways himself. Absolutely, yes. Really enjoys his racing. And down into Brooklands they come. And now Julian Thomas trying to have a go back at Sam Tordoff, who managed to get by up at uh, Village in the Loop. And in they come to Luffield now. But it's Tordoff that's putting the pressure on the leader, Dave Coyne. And uh, Tordoff goes tight, Dave Coyne goes slightly wide oh. out and through Woodcut corner, side by side through Woodcut, but Dave Coyne's got the advantage at the moment, but can Sam Tordoff stay alongside as they go into Cops corner? And then he'll have the advantage as they go into the right-hander. But I think Dave Coyne's far enough ahead, just... It's a bit like watching uh, Hamilton and Verstappen, isn't it? Yeah. Going into Cops corner, thankfully these two did not make contact, uh, but it was all pretty tight. It was very tight indeed and uh, great awareness, but now uh, Tordoff is trying to go for the inside into the first element of Beckett's, but that's not really an overtaking place. Now he's going alongside as they go through the middle element of Beckett's, trying to get the inside for the last element, and the whole lot are closing up as they pass a slower car, and uh, out of Beckett's oh. they go, and how can you get so many of these big American cars side by side through Beckett's? Amazing how they've all managed to get together like that, and it is absolutely tight between the top four now. It is brought them all even closer together. Dave Coyne is still just about in control in the Mustang, trying to see where there's a little bit more grip, a bit more traction that he can find on different areas. Oh, he's gone very, very wide. That's too wide, Dave. Oh, he's lost the lead. And he might lose more than well, first place. No, he's pop, popped back into second. But the lead has now gone to Sam Tordoff. Well done to Sam. Dave just braked a little bit too late. And Sam Tordoff has now taken the lead of this race. He's been battling his way forwards for lap after lap. He started in 13th position on the grid, but he now leads. And it's a good effort that with under half an hour to go, a pit stop due to be uh, made fairly soon. Chased by Coyne, Julian Thomas in third place, Craig Davis in fourth and all four of these cars could end up winning this race i'm absolutely sure i think sam's got a little bit of a pace advantage but it's not huge it is just a, a small amount that he can try and get ahead and now julian thomas is trying to take second i think he's through yes he, he break very late into village there yep we've got the shot now where uh, we've got julian thomas in second place so dave coin dropped down to third craig davis in fourth and uh, my question now is, is Dave Coyne having brake problems? These big, heavy cars, they do suffer with the brakes overheating. And I wonder whether Dave's brakes are just saying, give me a bit of time to cool off. Uh, and he's, because uh, uh, twice now, he's effectively uh, gone too deep into the corners. He's looking for a way through on the inside. Oh, oh, oh and... contact between Coyne and Thomas. Thomas wheels round. Oh, Craig Davies only just misses him. What a shame. It all been so clean up to that point but it just got a bit tight on the entry into Brooklyn's corner. And unfortunately, round goes Julian Thomas. So that's a car he's sharing with Callum Lockie. We are looking forward to the changeover. Let's hope he can get going again, but he will have lost some at the, he is going, but he's obviously lost some crucial time there. Let's have another look, Alison. Yeah, that was really unfortunate. Dave Coyne, I think, just missed his breaking point and had nowhere to go. He just slithered into the side of Julian Thomas, who was turning into the corner. Uh, quite rightly, it was his corner, but uh, just one of those unfortunate incidents which can occur when the, uh, the track is so slippery. And uh, there we can see now we held the shot for a bit longer. We could see that Julian Thomas really only waited for the traffic to come through. Uh, so he kept the engine running, uh, did lose a bit of time. Uh, that's very unfortunate. But we've seen earlier on some big gaps being closed up after the pit stops. We have indeed. So let's wait and see. But I think Sam Tordoff's in a good position here out in front. And that battle that went slightly wrong has certainly opened up the gap. There is a bit of damage to the right front on um, the bumper of Dave Coyne's car. Hopefully it's not going to rub onto the right front tyre. Uh, there's certainly no evidence of that that I can see. Craig Davis in third. So now up into fourth place has uh, come the Wilmot car. So that's gone well. It's gained some positions as a result of all that. The Studebaker uh, Lark Daytona. We've got some minis still battling their way further down the order. Aaron Smith. Uh, Enduff Owens has dropped back a little bit. That's a shame. Um, he's now down into 12th position. Neil Brown, the famous engine builder in motor racing. He's running in 13th place as we see a few changes going on. Uh, yeah, we've got a beginning to see some pit stops now, aren't we? And I saw the yellow Mustang coming through shot there. It's Andy Prio. He's up ah, to 10th. Right. And he, he's in amongst the minis now. 
Okay, so that's good to say. See Andy Frio uh, up into 10th position. We'll keep an eye out for him there in the background. That is Andy in the yellow Mustang coming up on the Mini, as you say. Uh, could be gaining another position fairly soon. He's chasing after Aaron Smith. Number 18 car, there is Andy Prio, multiple touring car champion. Uh, a brilliant driver, started his career in hill climbs and sprints and then developed it into circuit racing. Very, very successful, a real thinker, a real uh, focused, concentrated man. Oh, we got damaged so sad on the number 46 mini of Ian Curley. Oh, he's having a bad day, isn't he, Ian? Because he, he suffered, he got, uh, there was an incident in the classic mini race earlier on, and now a rather sad looking mini with its eye popped out on the right-hand side. And we think uh, Craig Davis has come into the pit lane, uh, and that'll be to hand over to Steve Soper. There are quite a few in the pits now, yeah, yeah. as you say. So um, it's, it's all going to get uh, quite interesting with the pit stops being made. From this uh, distance, difficult to tell the difference between the Soper car and the, um, the Craig Davis car. Uh, sorry, Craig Davis not handing over to Steve Sofa. He's driving solo. Steve Sofa taking over from Henry Mann. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's the one that's in the pits. Uh, so uh, Henry Mann has come in quite early, as early as he could, to hand over to the brilliant Steve Sofa. Chris Baton in the number 81 Ford Mustang. Interestingly, um, Nigel Greensall's due to be driving that. Here we are. We've got the battle between Craig Davis and Dave Coyne in the two Mustangs. Davis is trying to get alongside once again and take that second place dave coin's not giving up just yet and he's coming back at him <laughs> uh, so the two mustangs going side by side is it going to be door handle to door handle not quite uh, but it looks as though craig davis could have the advantage coin did go too wide into stowe corner a few laps ago where he lost a bit of time is he going to go quite as wide this time no he holds it in a bit tighter they're still side by side i think craig oh i don't know Hard to say, no one's got the advantage. It's still side by side all the way through. And indeed, uh, Coyne is just ahead and into the pits comes Craig Davis. So he's decided to make his pit stop. It is uh, him who will come back out again, as it is Dave Coyne. He will be staying in his car, but he managed to just hold on to the position. Sam is in the pits now. So this actually means that uh, Dave Coyne sort of takes the lead for now. Um, but of course, he will have to make his pit stop shortly. Yes, the order will get uh, very mixed up for a few laps now until everybody's done their pit stops and then it's settled back down again. Um, but uh, we should see Sam Tordoff perhaps take the lead back, but that's not always been the case over this uh, race day. We've had changes of position uh, with the pit stops and uh, up into the pits has come Julian Thomas. So we've got Callum Lockie going out in Julian Thomas's Falcon uh, very shortly. Uh, it's a bit of work going on here. Uh, now, it, which car is that? Is that the, is that the 600? It is. Yes. So that was oh. the car that was leading. Uh, Sam Tordoff car. Now, is this... They're still on the standard stop, I think. So they may just be checking something. They're still looking... What they're doing in there is looking at the, the timing clock. So he's still in a position, I think, to be the leader. Well, well Sam still got his racing head on because he's had his drink and he's just passed the bottle back to his uh, team member so yeah you're right they are working on the bonnet you wouldn't normally expect them to open the bonnet at a, a mandatory stop but if they've got time then they might as well check something that Sam may have reported as being potentially a problem see him just getting himself ready in the cockpit there it's interesting to watch drivers isn't it as they it get is. ready to go back out on track and just lovely seeing inside the cockpit that big long gear lever typical of these big american cars it's not a little short tidy gear change it's a big long lever you've got a, a lot of throw in it to uh, change from one ratio to another dave coin is leading this race because he's not pitted yet and also we've got uh, adrian wilmot right with him actually this is a genuine battle between the uh, Ford Mustang and the Studebaker. And in fact, the Studebaker's going really well as the track dries up. It's a, it a, looks like a handful, that car, but if it's driven well, it's got good performance. Coyne is going to struggle to fend it off, I think, as they head on down. Adrian Wilmot's been driving beautifully. He's going to hand over to Mark Farmer fairly soon. But this is, right now, the battle for the lead because neither of them have made a pit stop as yet. But we do expect the advantage to go back to Sam Tordoff when he comes out, as long as there isn't a key problem that they were looking at under the bonnet. Richard Dutton is back out on track, by the way. Oh, there's a chance here to move ahead of Coyne. Yeah, I think he's done it. I think Coyne might be coming in. Let's have a look. 
Yeah, Coyne is coming into the pits. Wilmot decides to stay out for a little longer. Yeah, Wilmot uh, carrying on Mark Farmer to take over that car. And that's, uh, that's a lot of metal being pushed around the track there, isn't it, by uh, that big V8 engine. But uh, here's Craig Davis in the red and gold Mustang. Uh, and uh, he was in the lead group early on, but uh, obviously after the pit stops uh, and Craig Davis it has done his stop. He's on his outlap now. Uh, so he's dropped down a few places. Sam Tordoff still in the pits. This oh. is much, much longer. Yeah, no, this, this is definitely yeah. a problem, isn't yeah. it? Because the, the, the clock has been taken away. He should have been out ages before this. Oh, Sam, I feel so sorry for you. Very experienced driver. Of course, he's dealt with ups and downs throughout his career, but he was going so well. He was. Very exciting driver as well, uh, drifting the car, but uh, clearly some problem with that as we look at uh, Craig Davis once again. Is that? No, it's not Craig Davis. That's the uh, 35. Mark Burton, Graham Pattle Mustang. Uh, so it's three Mustangs in very, very similar colours uh, on the track at the moment as uh, one of the minis comes into the pit lane. That's a good shot of uh, the activity in the pit lane there with uh, the number 99 car in the pits, which is the uh, Andy Prio car handing over to Alex Taylor. Andy Prio getting out of the car. Oh, I'm afraid Sam, Sam Tordoff still in the pit lane. Oh. No, bitterly disappointing, I have to say. Um, we're going to have to see how this all works out after the pit stops are complete and everybody has uh, run around. Uh, the Dave Coyne car is heading back out now. So that's still going to have a good chance because with the problems that we are seeing uh, for Sam Tordoff, Dave Coyne is still going to be a, a factor in this race, I believe. Right now, uh, we'll wait to see how it all starts to settle down. But Craig Davis, too, is definitely going to be a factor in his Ford Mustang, car number nine. And in fact, look, they are pretty much together again, aren't they, on track. So this is good to see. It's the Dave Coyne and Craig Davis battle rejoined as we have been watching throughout much of this event. Through the left-hander at uh, Aintree, down onto the Wellington Strait. And at the moment, uh, we've got... Uh, a couple of cars not yet done there, pit stops, but uh, that damage on the front of Dave Coyne's car from the incident with Julian Thomas. Uh, Julian's been in now and handed over to Callum Lockie, but uh, as you say, battle rejoined, isn't it? Is, is that Richard Dutton behind them, actually? Uh, it's uh, certainly one of the many white Lotus Cortinas. So, uh, Richard normally runs with a red flash down the side, so I think that's probably him in behind there as they go out through Woodcut Corner and uh, Craig Davis very, very wide out of Woodcut up towards Cops, another Mustang in front of them. And uh, it's uh, uh, the Dave Coyne car still ahead as uh, a, a new fastest lap of the race. And Steve Soper has only been in that car for one flying lap, so his very first flying lap it's the fastest lap of the race. That just shows the measure of uh, Steve Soper's driving. Adrian Wilmot has brought uh, that car into the pits now, so Mark Farmer will be taking over in the Studebaker, the car that was right up front, um, uh, making a later pit stop than the others. So this is going to be very interesting when it comes back out to see exactly where it comes out in relation to uh, Dave Coyne in particular um, and to see just what goes on here. So Coyne and Davis are still battling away. Richard Dutton, as you say, is not far away, I believe, in that group battle as well. And uh, Yes, I think that's Richard's Cortina behind yeah. that we can see. Uh, oh, and uh, a mistake from Craig. Oh, almost Definitely. lost it. Yeah, almost lost it. Dave Coyne gets a bit of an advantage out of that. Uh, but this car is still going to be a factor when it gets going after the pit stop. So we'll see where it comes out. Lights are still on. Here come the group just fighting their way round club corner at the moment. Let's wait to see. Yeah, and being released right now is Mark Farmer. Uh, as he comes out of the pits, the others are going, they're almost parallel to him, uh, heading into Abbey Corner. So this really is the battle for the lead, and you will see the Studebaker coming out. It's going to come out just behind them. Look to the left. There it is, rejoining with this lead group battle. He's going to come out with just behind Richard Dutton. Absolutely brilliant, yes. Couldn't have timed that better, could we? As they come into Village now, it's uh, Dave Coyne leading from Craig Davis in second place. Then it's Richard Dutton just behind, and then the rejoining new driver, Mark Farmer, in the big Studebaker Lark. Daytona as they come out through Aintree 
and uh, that's in fourth place. Always tough when you're the driver who's taken over from another. I mean, for Dave Coyne, for Craig Davis, they've been driving all race. Uh, for Richard Dutton, they know how the track is feeling, they know how the car is feeling. For Mark uh, Farmer, who's just taken over from Adrian Wilmot, he's got to get himself in into the rhythm quite quickly now in this number 132 yeah. car. Yeah, absolutely. He doesn't know the braking points, he doesn't know how much grip there is in the corners, uh, but uh, no doubt Adrian Wilmot will have given him a few pointers, but uh, already he's just losing time there because he just got a bit too sideways in uh, Luffield and he's been caught and uh, that's the number 170 Marcus Jewell Ben Klukas yeah with Ben uh, in the car I think now yeah Ben Klukas has taken over quick driver uh, and that car is uh, just behind so that's a battle for position as well with the uh, the Studebaker and also we need to just be a little bit aware of uh, Callum Lockie who has taken over from Julian Thomas in the car that was spun earlier it is still a little further back I uh, haven't quite seen it in the shot yet, but it is running, I believe, in sixth place. Uh, or no, a bit further down, sorry. Um, but it could still become a factor as we go through. This is a great... Yeah, you can just see it in the background. Yeah, absolutely, yes, you can uh, see it. Oh. Uh, as uh, we've got a car pulled off there, that's the Mini of Hans Beckert. Uh, sadly, had to retire the car. So this is the lead group. Um, with a whole bunch of cars. We've got the two Mustangs. It's Craig Davis in front of Dave Coyne at the moment. Then the Lotus Cortina of Richard Dutton. Ben Klukas up into fourth. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. That goes wrong for Dave Coyne. Even wider this time into Stoke Corner than we saw earlier on. And is he going to be passed by Dutton? Not quite. Uh, Richard Dutton could almost take advantage, but it's given Craig Davis a bit more of an advantage for now. He's got himself a bit of clear running for a change. But he's oh, he now, look at him. way too fast into the... You could see the front wheels losing traction there and uh, understeering away. Ben Klukas yeah. coming up on the wings, he's isn't he? Flying. He's flying. He's absolutely flying, yeah. And Richard Dutton in there as well. And uh, I wonder whether this is just the, the big heavy cars, the brakes are just starting to cry enough and the much lighter Lotus Cortinas of Dutton and Klukas are able to still brake very late for the corners. Superb handling from these cars as well. Yeah, very consistent, aren't they, all the way through. Oh, we've got another Lotus Cortina that's pulled off. I'm not sure which one that is. Um, so we shall have a look and see in just a second. That's a bit of a show. Let's have a look. We might get a replay of what happened here down at Brooklands. Oh, and the car just suddenly has a problem. So he's pulled over. Uh, and that is a great shame. That's the 777 of Ollie Streak. So that was a bit further down the order. Craig Davis is still our race leader in the Mustang from Dave Coyne in second place. Richard Dutton in the Lotus Cortina in third. Chased by Ben Klukas in another Lotus Cortina. But look at the background. That's Callum Lockie. Uh, Callum, who's delivered some great performances in various different cars here today. That car got spun by Julian Thomas earlier on, remember, when there was contact with Dave Coyne. But they're not out of it completely because Callum is not far behind this lead group. Whether he's got the pace in it, we'll, we'll have a look at the lap times over the next couple of laps and just see whether he's able to close up. The first sector is about the same. He's not actually any quicker. They are all doing about the same first sector times. 48 seconds seems to be the mark at the moment. And we noticed that Mark Farmer is dropping down the order in the big uh, Studebaker, I'm afraid. It was one that we were certainly uh, thinking might be in this lead group, but he's dropped away. So some problems for Mark Farmer. Oh, oh, wide goes Dave Coyne and wide goes Richard Dutton. And that's going to give Ben Klukas a bit of an opportunity, although he'll be a bit frustrated because they've all just rejoined in front of him still. Uh, so Klukas in number 170 there. He's going to have to push a bit on. Uh, meanwhile, Steve Soper has just set another new fastest lap again in 10th position at the moment and a fraction behind Endaf. Oh, and off has gone Mark Farmer in the Studebaker that was running so well in the hands of Adrian Wilmot. I think Mark is struggling a little bit more to get to grips with it in these rather tricky conditions. Just under 12 minutes to go in the Transatlantic Trophy for pre-66 touring cars. Our race leader is Craig Davis. Oh, we've got a safety car because of cars off. What a shame uh, because We've got a couple of, at least one car in a dangerous position. So, well, it's going to regroup everybody. Mind you, the leaders are all pretty close together already. I was about to say that Steve Soper is setting times three seconds a lap quicker than the leaders wow. and was, was going to say that he may well catch them. <laughs> he will uh, now. He, he will now <laughs> with a safety car. Absolutely. It'll bring Steve Soper right back. Oh, and dear. there's one of the cars that we've lost. He, uh, That's the car of Billy and Carl Nairn uh, there 
little mini that's gone off into the gravel and yes I can understand why we're under safety car Sofa has moved up to seventh with those quick laps that you were talking about as you say could well be a factor in the closing stages with such rapid lap times that Steve is delivering um, wonderful to see him back out isn't it Steve Sofa one of the all-time super touring car drivers absolutely yes he took a big break from racing after a nasty accident which damaged a bone in his neck but uh, he then had some uh, repairs done and was actually told he could race again and so since then we've seen him out racing regularly and it's always great to see sofa man out on track mark farmer will be waved past the safety car there he is he's just being waved past now because it's the leader they want to have behind the safety car and that is craig davis in car number nine now i would think that uh, he will stay there now dave coin following with richard dutton ben Klukas, and then it's going to be callum locky uh, Meanwhile, yeah, we're just looking at Sofa there. So it's the second of these cars in this line there, the red Mustang. That and is the, the Steve Sofa car. And just ahead is the uh, the Banks Brothers Alpha, uh, which uh, is uh, ahead on in the, in the uh, order of from uh, Steve Sofa. So Sofa's got to pass him, but they will all close up. So uh, the interesting thing is there are no slower cars mixed in with the leading group. So True. when we come to the restart, we won't yep. have anybody held back. Well, let's hope they can move the Mini pretty quickly out of the way so that the safety car's not out there for too long. And we are on for a, another thrilling uh, finale here, I believe, with some top, top drivers in uh, some cars. Some of them are working better than others. I wonder if doing a bit behind the safety car is going to look after the brakes in these big, heavy yeah. cars, allow them to cool them down a touch, because it did look as though they were beginning to overheat. And another car which is uh, worth watching as well is the car that was started by Andy Prio, who brought it through into this top 10 group, handed over to Alex Taylor. Uh, but looking at Alex Ta Taylor's lap times prior to the safety car, he was quicker than anybody except Steve Sofa. And he's in the yellow Mustang with the black stripes immediately behind right. uh, Sofa. So uh, he's going to be a factor as well. And then we've got the minis. Yeah, there's lots to look forward to. But it is great to see Steve Sofer in this group and potentially with a, a chance of challenging to get a podium finish out of all this. Uh, we've seen Craig Davis and Dave Coyne battling hard throughout the race. Richard Dutton doing well in the Lotus Cortina. Ben Klukas has been pushing on really well. Callum Lockie in the big black machine. But now Steve Sofer is going to be a part of that. And he has been setting the outright pace. The little alpha is in there, the Banks' car. Number 89, lovely to see that in the mix as well. Um, and then, as you say, the Prio Taylor car. And then a couple of minis are still up there in the top 10 uh, with Aaron Smith and then Duff Owens. And of course, they'll all be closed up as the safety car leads them around. Doesn't look like it's going to be coming in this lap. So it's going to be at least uh, around three minutes, I would think, to do another lap at this sort of pace. Um, so we might be in for a fairly short last section to this race. But Steve Soper could be a key player and that is the car he is in right now further down neil brown is still in the 11th place and uh, 14th position the number 81 car which i think nigel greensall has taken over poor old nigel he uh, was involved in a little incident in the first car he was driving earlier on um, that was the david gooding car 179 uh, in the meantime though hopefully he made it he rushed back to the pit so that he was able to take over the other car because he was due to drive two cars and he's now in 14th position and the cars will all be gathering up together behind the safety car i uh, haven't seen a shot yet of whether they've managed to move that mini out of the way that was in the gravel trap that was the cause of this current safety car period um, and hopefully we will see that we think it has been cleared so we could well see the lights going out on the safety car fairly soon uh, although they've got a bit more of a lap to do before we see that uh, but it will be fun if we can go back to racing when they next come across the line. So we've got uh, just under seven minutes remaining and a real fight to the flag between the likes of Craig Davis, Dave Coyne, Richard Dutton, Ben Klukas, Callum Lockie, uh, the Bankses. Uh, it was Andrew who's driving earlier. It's Max who's in the car now, Steve Soper. And then also the, uh, the number 99 car, Alex Taylor now at the wheel of that Ford Mustang but it's been driving it's been going well it has and I think any of those cars that you've mentioned just there could be a winner of this race it's going to be so tight assuming we get some uh, an opportunity to go back racing again uh, the uh, safety car just going through woodcut so we've got uh, just under half a lap back to the main 
Hamilton straight start line, so that should be the point at which we get racing again. Uh, safety car in this lap, Ben. It's right. just come up on the screen, so that's good news. So when they get back round <laughs> to Club Corner, we'll be racing again. Yeah, I think we could be in for an entertaining uh, last few laps here. There's only going to be a couple of laps, of course. Uh, the lap times they've been doing uh, two and a half minutes, basically, and as you can see, it's going to be under, well under five minutes by the time they get back. So we're not going to get a lot of laps, but we are, I think, going to get quite a lot of action in the meantime. Uh, the minis are still fighting their own battles in that group, still inside the top ten for a few of them. And opportunities will exist. So you've got to pick up the places wherever possible. Uh, how much risk do you take? Well, that's the decision that's always part and parcel of being a racing driver. And particularly when you're racing the classics, you want to keep the car in one piece. But you also want to do the best you can. You'll see the lights, the flashing lights on the top of that safety car going out any moment. And then it will start to accelerate away from the, uh, the grid leader. Craig Davis to be able to give Craig his opportunity to uh, control the pace of the field. It's now down to Craig to uh, decide how fast he goes, whether he bunches everybody up. Actually, he's, he's keeping a bit of pace going here, following the safety car. He seems to be quite happy to just keep the pace running reasonably fast. Dave Coyne needs to catch up, otherwise they're all going to be a bit behind because Craig Davis has really gone for it right from the outset and Dave's got a bit left behind. That wasn't a very good restart by Dave. Craig Davis just went for it as soon as the safety car started to move off. Richard Dutton, now is he allowed to overtake before they cross the line? I don't think he is, but he was almost along. He's gone in front. Um, I don't know whether that's going to work. Well, we'll have to wait and see whether he gets penalised for that because he crossed before and he's dropped back behind again. Maybe they will allow that now because he dropped back behind. But it's all very close, but it's a fight for second rather than a fight for the lead because Craig Davis made perfect work of the restart and Dave Coyne, surprisingly, got a bit left behind. And in fact, it's allowed Richard Dutton there, now into second base. Ben Kluker's up into third position and a big change around. It was indeed, yes, the two uh, Cortinas and then it's the uh, Dave Coyne car and it looked like... Um, Callum Lockie was going for the outside of Dave Coyne at Village, but he went a little bit deep and dropped back behind again. That's the big black falcon. And uh, as they come down the Wellington Strait, it's, uh, as you say, Craig Davis has made the jump, but the power of the Mustang pulls it through. And Steve Soper is at the back there in the red and gold oh, car. Look at all those guys going side by side. That is Steve Soper in car number six. He is right on the back of this little group, which is this particular group is being led by Richard Dutton. Callum Lockie in the black machine, now under pressure from Steve Soper. Soper trying to go around the outside on the exit of Luffield as Lockie gets sideways and Soper has to cut back in. Both of them hounding Dave Coyne as they come through Woodcut and down towards Cops Corner. No battling up front because Craig Davis has got a clear lead. Ben Klukas now attacking Richard Dutton on the inside. Little lock up from somebody there. It's tight, tight, tight through Cops Corner. Oh, Soper gets a bit sideways as he cuts to the inside, trying to find an advantage to get past Callum Lockie. It's almost three abreast into Maggots and then into Beckett's. And for now, Richard Dutton has got back ahead of Ben Klukas in the fight for second. This is wonderful stuff. And Steve Sofa went all the way around the outside of Dave Coyne there at the first element of Beckett's, and now he's on the tail of Callum Lockie as they go out through uh, uh, Chapel Curve onto the Hangar Straight. Those two big V8 cars, the red and gold car of Steve Sofa and the black car of Callum Lockie, will have more power, and they are squeezing. Oh, oh. no! Oh, Callum Lockie uh, get a, gets a bit of a hit. It's the second time we've seen that car spin and uh, damage done to the, the side. Oh, what a shame. And there's damage to Dave Coyne's car as well. I didn't quite see how that all came about. It all got very bunched up. Oh, look at the mess on the front of Dave Coyne's car. Steve Soper has gained as a result of that into fourth place. Ben Klukas is running second. Uh, Craig Davis is still the race leader. There's your leader, Craig Davis. Second place now, Ben Klukas. Third, Richard Dutton, Steve Sober for, Oh, and Callum's ended up in the gravel. Oh, look at the damage to two ends and on the front of Dave Coyne's car. That's so sad to see with these wonderful machines being damaged when they were all racing so well and so hard for so many laps. We are into the closing stages. Dave's still going. I'd be a little bit concerned that he might get that car overheating because there might have been some radiator damage done. Yeah, the, the only thing that's certain is that wasn't Callum Lockie's fault. Uh, he was squeezed and uh, was tipped into a spin, it looked to me. Uh, but uh, Steve Sofer now is putting the pressure on the 
Richard Dutton uh, Cortina. Ben Klukas got past Richard Dutton on that lap, so it's it's now Craig Davis, Ben Klukas, Richard Dutton, and not Richard Dutton. It's Steve Sofa now. The power of the Mustang comes through. Now Richard is focusing. Uh, sorry, Steve Sofa is focusing on Ben Klukas ahead as they go through the left-hander at Brooklands up to Luffield. Lots and lots of understeer there yeah. from the red and gold Mustang. Um, Steve Sofa really hanging on to that car as they come out onto the old pit straight once again. Uh, just a quick note, Neil Brown's moved up quite well. He's up into eighth place, but we've still got a, a mini in seventh. That's uh, Aaron Smith. They're running a bit further back, of course, but uh, still showing some good performance. So Steve Soper on for a podium finish here. The, the car was quite a long way down the field earlier on, but it is doing well now. And in the in the battle, trying to steal second place from Ben Klukas. But I tell you what, Ben Klukas is driving beautifully in that Lotus Cortini. He's very neat, very tidy. He got past Richard Dutton. Look at the drift through Beckett's and that uh, Lotus Cortina works beautifully well. The clock is ticking away. We are definitely on the final lap of the race here and the pre-66 touring cars have shown us some good combat. So unfortunately it hasn't all gone clean, but for Craig Davis, it is looking very promising. But here comes Steve Soper. He could still take second place. He's got the power on hanger straight. Defensive work from Ben Klukas. Can he hold off? There's a yellow flag still down there, of course, so he can't actually overtake. And that was a key area to try. So I'm not sure they will get a green as they come out of this section and a last chance down into the last couple of corners. Craig Davis is going to take victory here in this race. And I think it's going to be Ben Klukas who will hold on for second. Um, Craig loves going a bit wide. And look how close Klukas is as they come through the last corner. I don't think he's going to quite get there across the line. Very sideways from Davis. He takes the victory. Klukas finishes in second and Steve Sopa finishes in third place. Richard Dutton just misses out on a podium after a wonderful drive in his Lotus Cortina. Then we've got the uh, Prio Taylor car. Taylor finishing in fifth place and Aaron Smith winning the mini battle. He took sixth ahead of Ender Owens with Neil Brown finishing in eighth place in the end and a very sad looking Mustang of Dave Coyne. And there is steam pouring out of it now. And it worries me that uh, there may well be damage with an overheating engine there as a result of all of that accident and damage. There was Callum Lockie's car. And Alistair, I think we're going to get a chance to have a look at that once again, the incident. So let's see exactly what happens. It was all a bit bunched up. Soper on the outside. Callum comes across. Oh, Soper comes back and touches the back. Oh, and then Coyne's got nowhere to go, but into the side of the car of Callum Lockie, which ends up in the gravel trap. It was just... It was a bit of bunching, really, and a bit unfortunate movement. I don't think it was anybody's fault as such. It was just all a bit compressed. I think that the, the main issue was that the Cortinas weren't as quick on the straight as the big V8 engine cars, and they were trying to get past on power, um, and the Cortinas were also battling amongst themselves, and as you say, it was just a bit of bunching, but uh, I still say it wasn't Callum Lockie's fault. I don't think he did anything wrong. Um, and it was just unfortunate that uh, he was caught up in that and, and actually had the worst damage. Yeah, a lot of damage to the car. Oh, shame. Uh, and then that car had a spin earlier on, and now it ended up damaged in the gravel trap. But victory has gone to Craig Davis. He drove a, a really wonderful race throughout. So the final result of the Transatlantic Trophy for pre-66 touring cars sees Craig Davis winning by only just under half a second from Ben Klukas in that Ford Lotus Cortina. Steve Soper fought his way through to finish in third place. Richard Dutton ended up fourth. And the Andy Prio Taylor car oh, finished in fifth place. Ahead of Aaron Smith, who got the top notch result in a mini uh, in sixth place. End up Owens was seventh. Neil Brown eighth. Dave Coyne, with the damage on the front of his Mustang, ended up in ninth position. And uh, the Nigel Greensall car number 81 with Chris Baton finished in tenth position. Further down the order, we saw a, another mix of Mustangs and Lotus Cortinas. The Bankses have missed out a bit towards the end because they were running very strongly earlier on, but the Alpha dropped down to 16th place, I'm afraid. Uh, 17th, the BMW 1800 of Tom Sharp. Ian Curley, despite uh, having a bit of a tough time, ended up finishing in 20th. Well, a remarkable time there. Once again, I, I feel a little bit downhearted after seeing some damage on some of the cars. But nonetheless, it was a very, very exciting race. Let's look back at some of the highlights.
the road. To freedom. Japan quality. Yokohama. Your tire. Well, I check the oil and the water and the tire pressures regularly. Give it a polish, make sure it's all shiny. I service the car once a year and I always do it myself. I enjoy the, the mixture of exercise. I think some of the things I eat help to keep myself healthy and my brain healthy. Or even just meeting up with a friend and having a chat. Now the podium for the Transatlantic Trophy for pre-1966 touring cars and what a race it was. Overall winner and winner of the over two litre class, Craig Davis. In second, after a very eventful race, Steve Soper and Henry Mann. And in third, Alex Taylor and Andy Prio. And presenting the trophies, we have Tim Clark from My C. Craig, I'm going to jump in. Craig, what a race. So you had your hands full, but <laughs> it looked like your brilliant restart at, just for those last two laps was what made the difference. Yeah, really. It, yeah, it was um, just what a great Masters event, you know, is, uh, is what you have there. But I had a great race with Dave Coyne and, uh, and then Julian. It's, his car looks pretty sad, which is a shame. But um, 
it was very, very, very slippery. Stowe and, and Abbey in particular was just, just, just dancing on ice through there. It was amazing. But good, clean racing and really enjoyed it. Well done. Well driven. Thanks, Ed. Going to come Steve Soper, Henry Mann. From a broken throttle cable yesterday, starting 21st in the grid. This is a pretty good outcome, isn't it, Steve? Yeah. A win would have been better, but uh, it wasn't to be. I think the safety car helped me in my stint, and then the yellow flags at the end handicapped us. But no, it's good. We're on the podium. <laughs> Fantastic drive. Well done. Alex, Andy, Craig was talking about it a bit there earlier. Very difficult conditions. It was tricky. I mean, handed over to uh, Alex, and the tra track was drying slightly, but it was really good fun. Great to be racing out there, and a fantastic event. Um, some really good driving standards. This well, guy did a great job as well, so had a great time. And we're really pleased. We found this young guy from Guernsey. He's a hill climb lad. I think he's going to go a long way. We're going we're to go somewhere in historic racing, hopefully. <laughs> There's life in the old dog yet. Well done. Good job. Now the podium for the under two litre class and the winners of the under two litre class were Marcus Jewell and Ben Klukas. In second, Richard Dutton and in third, Aaron Smith. Marcus and Ben, what a race. I, I, I'm just catching my breath. I don't know how you guys do it. That was a very busy last few laps, wasn't it? Yeah, it was brilliant. Um, obviously, Marcus did a fantastic job in the first stint, and then we, by the time we came out of the pits, I think we were fourth or fifth. Um, and then it was just a really close racing. And obviously, with the nature of the circuit and the different speeds of the cars, it it's lends itself to great racing because you're kind of, Cortina is obviously very quick around the corners and quick out the corners, but then a little bit slower down the straight. So it was nail biting right up until the last corner. So it was great fun to be involved with. Very well driven. Going to come to you, Richard. What a race. So close to third overall. How did it go? It was very exciting. The, uh, it was great racing with the Mustangs, but they do try and sort of slow open the corners a bit and then disappear down the straight. So it was hard, but it was a great race. So much fun. Shame was a bit we had some damage, but uh, other than that, it was fantastic. Really good. Aaron Smith. The Mini must have been sort of quite advantageous at the beginning, but as the track dried, it probably got more and more difficult to hold on to the bigger engines. That's right. At the beginning, it was easy just to muscle our way through the big cars. They just, they're big and heavy, and the little Mini there just makes light work of it. So uh, it's a great, it was great fun driving. We was having an epic battle, me and Daphne, and, and uh, yeah, like, couldn't ask for more. Well driven, all of you. Thank you.
So I'm with Richard, the BMW O2 chairman. Richard, you're celebrating an anniversary today? Yes, uh, this year we're celebrating 50 years of the model, the TII, the fuel injected, mechanical injection, uh, 130 brake horsepower, pocket rocket, if you like, of the 2002 range. And so how many have you got going out on track today? We've got 12 cars here today, 12 O2s, mixture of all different models of the O2 range. And yeah, looking forward to doing a parade lap to celebrate the 50 years of a significant model. So it, it, it was like, you know, a GTI 50 years ago and 130 brake horsepower, rear wheel drive. They're still fast even in today's world. You know, great fun to drive, rear wheel drive. And uh, yeah, they're the one that people want. Have you got one? Of course. What colour? Yeah, I've got the paler Colorado orange. Uh, and if you're here today, you'll see there's also a brighter, darker Inca orange. Uh, there's golf yellow cars that look like fluorescent pens. So great leery colours, and that's what we should be doing. What made you want one? Fun with a capital F. Um, well built and dare I say it way ahead of the competition back in the day build quality was up there seriously the quality of the builds you go back and compare it to rival cars of that period you know BMW were way ahead you know let hardened valve seats already where we you know we didn't have to go and get that hardened valve seats when they did away with the unleaded petrol so they were way ahead in the engineering stakes and that reflected in the car and the model yes they can be rusty and rotten now but you know they're old but you got to you know you've got to look after them and if you get a very good salted one they're great fun to drive and are they hard to come by yes uh, rust is the biggest problem the TII models yes they're hard to source they are in demand across the world, um, fetching good money in the US, strong money in Europe, left-hand drive obviously. Uh, we're always a little bit behind the curve here in the UK with the right-hand drives. Um, but yeah, as I said recently uh, for another interview, don't be too fussy about the colour. You know, if you find a good TII, buy it. Don't argue over £500 because you could go for years without finding another one for sale. Interestingly, we've got two up for sale here at the show this weekend, would you? So, so if you want one, do come along and uh, have a little word with you and you'll sort them out. Well, we'll try. And, you know, we do, at the club, we offer valuations, inspections, meets, and we're down to earth. And we try and help people, even if they don't join the club, but, you know, to steer them in the right direction and make the right, right choices. I mean, Richard, I've known you for a long time. You've been involved with the car club. You've obviously owned BMWs for a very long time. 25 years this year as chairman of the O2 Register, member for 30 years. I've owned BMWs probably in excess of 30 years. I've had them all. I think the local count, last count, is 52 BMWs to date I've owned. Some good, some not so good. Some I wish I still had, but we won't talk about that. So you're going to be out on track later, so look forward to seeing you. Um, are you going to lead the pack out? We've got the race car we're going to have at the front the new class saloon which was the forerunner for the O2s uh, and then yeah we'll all be in convoy going out on the track and waving and celebrating the 50 years of the TII. Perfect lovely thank you. Cars then on the track now are uh, Porsches as you can see and uh, we've been out and about as well talking to the Porsche Owners Club. So I'm joined by Mark, the chairman of Porsche Club Great Britain. Now, Porsche has a history in motorsport, in beautiful cars for the consumer. Mark, how did the Porsche Car Club start? It, it started um, back in 1961. Um, I wasn't there myself because I am born in 1961, but uh, there were a, a, a nice group of about uh, 20 or 30 founder members, uh, all driving 356s at the time because that was the, the current Porsche at the time. And um, they met uh, in the Midlands, Chateau Impney, um, with their inaugural meeting this September in 61. So um, it's going to be our 60th anniversary this year uh, um, uh, on the 20th, I think, of September. So, uh, yes. Yeah. Now, clearly, over the years, it's grown exponentially. H how's that come about? How many members have you got now? So we've uh, reached about 22,000 members now. Um, we've grown pretty much um, from about 5,000 5, members in 2010. And um, it, we continue to grow. We've basically got uh, a new Taycan register, which is the new electric car from Porsche. Um, Porsche themselves have sold over you know, several thousand cars, I believe, in the UK now. Uh, and we've got uh, hundreds in the register. So um, the, the, the whole of the club is growing and will continue to grow that way. 
And why do you think Porsche, what's unique about it? Why, why is it done so well in, in its history? Um, I think it's the combination of um, superbly reliable cars, superbly well engineered. I think um, Porsche has a... a um, uh, a history of uh, re really engineering cars to the nth degree uh, as, and obviously the 911 is one of those things um, you know the 911 is something which has been evolved over th you know, 30, 40, 40 years so um, I would say it's precision engineering and build quality is what, what holds together and it's a testament to the fact that pretty much most of the cars that Porsche has made are on road still today Perfect. Now, you're due out on track later on this evening, 5 o'clock, I think. What cars can we expect to see? Um, well, we hopefully we'll be able to get the full gamut of um, from the 60s right through to um, the, the latest generation. Uh, I myself are driving a 356, the Club 356, which is um, um, born, shall we say, in 1961 as well. So that's really a uh, really nice thing to do. Um, so I'll be leading that out. Um, we have a few race cars as well. We have a 924 uh, race car from the 78 uh, race season, uh, AFN built. So between all of that and everything in between, from the 356 to the, uh, the 911 32s, the 64s, the 993s, and then the later generation water-cooled cars, we, we're going to have everything on track. So we're going to have one for everybody. <laughs> and we've seen plenty of them as well out on track, haven't we? Well, the MG Midgets, uh, the cars that we're looking at at the moment, a lot of them, uh, the 60th anniversary of the Midget being celebrated by the MG Car Club, the MG Owners Club and the Midget and Sprite Club. Well, the uh, car, you may recall, was uh, first introduced by the MG Car Company uh, way back in 1961. It was June of that year. And uh, I made some notes on this earlier that actually you could buy one. I had to look it up. But uh, you could buy one for the price tag of £669, 15 shillings and 10 pence. And that included the purchase tax. Uh, the last car uh, actually rolled off the production line in 1979 uh, when the company was under the ownership of British Leyland. And uh, the, the name Midget in the MG context was first used in the 1930s uh, to describe the C-type midget, uh, which was then, of course, followed by uh, the D-type, you may recall as well the uh, J-type, and so on, until we got to a TF midget in the 1950s, although today uh, those earlier midgets are no longer referred to as midgets because they're known as their respective types rather than uh, being known as... Um, as midgets. Now, some of the other cars that you'll see on track, for example, there, the uh, the Vauxhall uh, that you're seeing going round, uh, Vauxhall Vivas, a couple of those. We've got a Renault 4 out there as well. Uh, I think that might be the uh, little Simca that's out there, Citroen, and so on. We've got a Ford Escort, a variety of cars from uh, various clubs that are out there as well. We've got the Motul uh, 300Vs. And we've got uh, the UK's rarest cars as well, uh, presented by the Telegraph that are out there as well. Uh, but with the uh, midgets that we've just seen, again, Tanya Baker, our reporter, has been out and about and talking to the guys from the midget car club, well, the representatives from the uh, those for the midget, the MG Car Owners, the MG Owners Club and the Midget and Sprite Club. Car Club. Now the midget is celebrating the 60th anniversary today. That's quite a long time, isn't it? There's a lot of midgets out there. It's one of my favourite cars. Yeah, there were um, a lot. The original frog-eyed Sprite, there were about 49,000 built and they kept building them up to 1980 something. So yeah, there are a lot. A lot got exported and um, they're good, fun cars. I think people don't realise till they drive one how like a go-kart they are. <laughs> They're still quite hard to get, though, aren't they? Um, well, good ones are hard to get. We're lucky because they share a lot of spare parts with other cars like Minis and Morris Miners and stuff, so there's a lot of interchangeable parts. Um, so the spares situation isn't too bad. It's beginning to get more difficult to get stuff like engines and stuff, but um, no, they're, they're, they're fairly easy to work on and um, a good, basic, classic car. Still a big demand for them? There seems to be, yes, and, and um, we seem to be having more people join the club every year, so we're in the lucky position that we're expanding as a club. How many members have you got now? Um, I think it's about 1,500, something like that. I remember when I joined the club about 20 years ago, there were about 300. So it's, uh, it's going from strength to strength. And is that just UK or Europe, worldwide? We're basically UK, but we do have members in Japan, Malta, Greece quite a few in the United States but it is predominantly a UK based club for owners of mini midgets 
MG Midgets, Austin Healy Sprites and derivatives because there's a lot of uh, little kit cars that were based on um, Midgets and Sprites. Um, if you look in where we got the car there, there's something that looks like a Lotus 11, which is a Westfield 11 or actually a Caterham 11, um, which um, would have had MG Midget running gear. Well, there we are talking about the MG Midgets. Now, uh, some of the cars you can just see leaving the track now, uh, the BMW uh, 2 002s. It is their 55th anniversary being celebrated by the BMW Car Club GB. And you can find uh, a whole load of BMWs, to be honest, in the car park, uh, which is next to the diner, although sadly the diner is uh, closed this weekend uh, because of uh, staff shortages due to people keep <laughs> being pinged. But uh, you can see a variety of cars uh, that are on track. Again, some of those uh, Porsche 911s coming towards us. I think they've uh, sneaked past the marshal that's directing them off the track and uh, seem to have found their own way uh, home, so to speak, uh, as they head off. And uh, some of the others that we've also got out, the Allard Owners Club. Uh, this was founded in 1951. And actually, it was founded as a response to uh, a request from the buyers of Allards who were competing with them in trials and sprints as members of other clubs in the uh, first meeting. I love this. Was it, with the, it was at the Old Red Cow Pub at Hammersmith in southwest London back in 1951. I'd love to know if the old Red Cow pub is still in Hammersmith in south-west London, if I'm honest. It's probably been knocked down and it's probably now flats, I should think. Uh, the club currently has a total of 275 members worldwide. Approximately half of them are located in the USA and also in the EU. Uh, we'll be back in just a moment after this ad. We're super excited to announce that Silverstone's award-winning winter attraction, Lap of Lights, is back for 2021 and tickets will be on sale at our box office very soon. This year it's bigger and brighter, the iconic wing transformed into an alpine lodge with fun family activities like skating on the ice, curling and a food hall that serves Christmas market fare like Bratwurst and of course the obligatory hot chocolate. You'll brighten up your Christmas and add even more cheer. So click silverstone.co.uk. So some of the other cars that we've seen out on track then, the uh, Aston Martin DB2, I don't know that we saw any of those, but it is the DB2 70th anniversary, again deferred from 2020. Uh, it's also uh, the... Uh, um, anniversary as well of the uh, DeLorean. Uh, we'll see that tomorrow on track. So the lunchtime parades that we get tomorrow are the DeLoreans, uh, 40 years of those. Uh, the Triumph Stags as well, it's their 50th anniversary and we've also got the Lotus Elise celebrating 25 years on the track. So those are our uh, parades then here. We've got uh, plenty of action of course still to come uh, on track. Races as per usual in the evening. Don't forget the uh, music tonight is the brand new heavies. Midnight at the Oasis and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but we have got races uh, to come. Ben will be talking us through those races uh, shortly as we get into our uh, usual uh, evening session here at uh, Silverstone. Uh, the uh, races that we have to come up for you a little bit later on include, of course, the uh, race 10 today, the Masters Endurance Legends. Uh, we've also got the Yokohama Trophy Masters Historic Sports Cars at uh, around about sort of five to seven. And then the one that uh, everyone is, I'm sure, looking forward to massively is the final race of the day. It starts at 10 past eight this evening. Uh, the Royal Automobile Club's Woodcut and Sterling Moss Trophies. And that will take us rather nicely to a wrap at around about 10 past nine this evening which gives you plenty of opportunity to get over to the music stage and enjoy the music from the brand new heavies well that's just about it from me gary champion for this evening uh, time for my dinner break now because the crew have obviously had theirs uh, ben edwards will be having tucked into his beef bourguignon or whatever he's had for dinner this evening we'll be back with uh, mr D douglas of course as well and uh, our uh, crew down in the pit lane, but from us here at the radio studio. Join us back here, if you will, a little bit later. Uh, Roger Scott, the uh, legend from Capital Radio. We uh, revive, for want of a better word, thanks to his son, uh, Jamie, who has got some of the old Roger Scott 
uh, tapes from his Capital Radio days and we'll be able to uh, join him at about uh, 10 o'clock this evening here on Radio Silverstone. And now let us go back to our television colleagues and have a little break before Ben Edwards. Adrian Flux are proud to be the Classics' official insurance partner for another year. Why not visit our stand in Purple 10 next to the Village Green today to find out how we could save you money on your insurance. We've also got all sorts of things to keep you entertained, including a Forever Cars display, Ian Cook's Hot Bang Colour masterpieces, and the chance to win a passenger lap around the track in the course car. So what are you waiting for? Adrian Flux, insurance for the individual. The road. To freedom. Japan quality. Yokohama. Your tire. brains are responsible for every thought, every memory, every word, in fact, everything we ever experience. Dementia can take all that away. But looking after our brain health can reduce the risk of this happening. It's time we started to think brain health, and we can show you how. have the Masters Endurance Legends and whilst we're celebrating all classic cars here these really aren't quite as classic we've got cars from 1995 all the way up to 2016 and these are proper Le Mans sports cars we've got the petrol ones we've even got a couple of Peugeot diesel cars and the incredible thing about them is what the, the effort it must take to get these on track and I was speaking to someone the other day and they were saying that actually because they were built to last for 24 hours you don't have to do too much repair work in between the races. But we'll just go and I can see James Cottingham, who's driving driving his car. We're just going to come and have a quick chat. James, just squeeze you in. I'm sorry, it's quite noisy. It's OK. Yes, you're quite used to this car now. It must be such a pleasure to drive somewhere like Silverstone, where you've got the open space. Absolutely. I mean, there's a hell of a lot to be learned from somewhere where you've got a bit of runoff and you know the circuit so well. Um, and you really explore the limits of the car through all the different corners. So it's great, you know, I really enjoy it here. And it's, it's so, so cool to see the grid finally so full of prototypes. You know, this, like today is gonna to be such a good race, I think. Yeah, it was, it was wet in qualifying yesterday. Do you think the order's quite shaken up or is it kind of as it should I be? I think it is a little bit, although towards the end of the session, it was definitely drying a lot. So you saw halfway through the session, a few people sort of towards the front end of the grid that were there because they were driving the car better in the wet. And then towards the end of the session, I think, you know, as it dried out, people got in the rhythm a bit more and found their time. So I think it's OK. Um, but, you know, of course, we're in a 2002 car and some of these cars are up to 2014 or 15, I think. So it's definitely a bit prehistoric, but we'll give it our best shot. Well, enjoy. I'm loving the sun spectacles, by the way. Right, we're going to crack on down here. And earlier, I did see Rob Weldon around and about. Now, Rob's actually got into his car. So we're going to just see if we can stick a microphone in there. Now, Rob is on the front row of the grid in his Lola next to Emanuele Collard, um, renowned Le Mans racer in the Porsche RS Spider, that LMP2 car that was so successful. Um, they are just putting the belts on, but we'll see if we can have a chat to Rob in a second. 
I know from experience that getting belts on in a car that confined is a complete nightmare. And you can see the mechanic here actually helping Rob get the belts done up. We'll give him another few seconds. It's just, <laughs> I don't know if you heard that. I just heard that he's had a big lunch. <laughs> right, we're nearly there. It's actually for such huge cars that it's so tight and confined inside the cockpit. And once the door shuts, it's quite a solitary place to be. Right, that looks like we're now in business. Hands device secured underneath, belts done up. Rob, I'm sorry to dive in just as you got your belts done up. You clearly need to stop eating so much. <laughs> um, you're on the front row. We've got a race on our hands, haven't we? Well, I really hope so, that's the plan. Um, you know, I've been given an amazing opportunity by Steve to have a go in this. It's obviously the first time in the car for myself. Uh, I had a dry session on Thursday to try and learn a little bit about it. Obviously done an all right job so far, so um, see if we can take uh, make, make a manual work for it today. Do you think there's more time to find, having uh, since you're so new to the car? Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> 100%, yeah. Um, I'd like to think there's a lot, a lot of time for this. Well, not too much, but um, yeah. There's definitely time for me to work on. So yeah, I think we can I think we can do something from here. Well, Rob, enjoy. Cheers, thank you. So we're getting ready for some more action on the circuit now. Ben Edwards with you. Uh, do get in touch via Twitter at Ben Edwards TV. Uh, we're looking forward to the Masters Endurance Legends race, and the cars are just heading out onto the circuit in a, a mode. Some fabulous machinery. It's really going to be very, very interesting to see how these cars compete against one another. Yeah, much more recent cars than we've seen in pretty much all of the other classic events here so far this weekend. Very rapid. You'll hear some fantastic engine noises and a lot of downforce. And the track is in good shape now. It's dry. We've got a bit of late sunshine coming up, which is good to see. And hopefully we're going to be in for some uh, pretty fast laps, I would think. Emmanuel Collard, the man on pole position in the Porsche RS Spider. The number 34 car, keep an eye out for that. He did a fantastic job in qualifying yesterday, taking pole in the end by a fairly tiny margin from Rob Weldon in the Lola, who we just heard from. But nonetheless, it's going to be uh, a good, close battle. So everybody taking to the circuit. take a look at the grid for the Masters Endurance Legends race. Number 34, Emmanuel Collard lining up on pole position in the Porsche RS Spider. Number 116, Rob Weldon alongside in the Lola, the second row, number 27, Matthew Wrigley, and alongside number 41, James Littlejohn in the Gibson. Fifth on the, the grid, starting this race is David Bryce in the number 165 Lola, and sixth on the grid, Number seven, Francois Perodo in the Peugeot 908. Seventh on the grid, number nine, Sean Lynn in the Peugeot 908. James Cossingham is starting in car number 15, uh, sorry, uh, in eighth place. Then we've got Max Lynn, car 36, followed by Crouton Lendudis, car number eight. And then completing the top 12, we have number 99, Jamie Constable, and number 12, uh, sorry, number six it is, I think, Lucas Halusa in 12th place. So cars are out on the uh, formation lap and getting ready, uh, getting a good feel for the track, which is pretty good now, I have to say. We've got some late sunshine in the day and it's looking pretty dry. Uh, car bobbling its way down the pit lane, not looking terribly happy. It might just be on a speed limit. It doesn't look as though it's running quite as smoothly as it should. And there's another car that's a little bit late to come out onto the circuit as well. Let's hope that we do get our full grid of 29 cars actually making it onto the circuit. But clearly there are one or two little problems going on with these complicated, more recent machines. Not all of them are that easy to run, but we'll be seeing them uh, in action any moment now. Following down behind the pace car, 
weaving around, getting a little bit of pace up and going. And watching out to see the first run going into the first corner is going to be a close, close battle between such fast, competitive machinery off the line. But uh, we've got another lap yet to do to just get a full feel for these cars get themselves into gear. So, uh, an interesting uh, series this with uh, fascinating machinery. I'm just trying to see where, yeah, is that Manuel Collard's car that they were trying to get ready to work? Because I can't see it out on track at the moment, which is a little bit bizarre. We're, we're seeing Rob Weldon's car leading the round at the moment. So where is Manuel Collard? Was that the car that we saw sitting in the assembly area? I think it might have been, to be honest. Uh, we couldn't see which number it was, but it may well have been that car that is now not out there. Over the line they come, they're going on to their final formation lap. And it's a great shame if we're not going to see Emmanuel Collard starting this race from pole position. The man with so much experience at Le Mans, the man who raced on 23 consecutive occasions in the Le Mans 24-hour race. He missed a couple and then went back and did a 24th race. Um, and all the experience, and it's not him, that car is not him. That is number 41. And uh, that is James Littlejohn in the Gibson. So where is Emmanuel Collard? I don't know, quite. Um, <laughs> something that we have still haven't quite worked out as yet. But the rest of the field is heading on around, lights ablaze. And we are still going to see some good, close action I'm sure once these cars get started into the race itself so still a few races to go this evening we've got uh, three races to go this is another one of the longer races 40 minutes that we are looking forward to here two groups in terms of age uh, between the 1995 and 2010 cars uh, and then 2011 to 2016 We've got a mixture of LMP1, LMP2, GT cars as well. Ah, there is Collard. Right, moving up through the field. He is there. Good, good, good. I just wonder why he wasn't leading the field around. But Collard is there. Right, good news. The number 34 car, Emmanuel Collard, has now taken in his top spot. That's a relief. We didn't think he was going to turn up. But suddenly, the Frenchman, 50 years old this year, um, born in 1971, and all this experience that he has at Le Mans, well, he's going to put into practice here at Silverstone. But the gap between himself and Rob Weldon in qualifying was pretty tiny yesterday, different conditions, of course. But let's see whether we get a good race between them. They're beginning to pick up a bit of pace now behind the pace car as we do get ready for a rolling start off the line. Right down at the back end of the field, the uh, number 55 car is the car that's bringing up the, uh, the tail that's Xavier Tancogne, and uh, he's down at the back of the grid. There it is in the rather pretty Ferrari. This, of course, much more of a GT car than an LMP car that we've got uh, up front. And we'll see how the Porsche RS Spider goes. The, uh, this car is actually owned by Francois Perodo, who is starting sixth himself in a Peugeot 908. So if you look down the field there, you'll see there are a couple of Peugeots, in fact, lining up uh, on the grid. One is in sixth place, Francois Perrault, the other, Sean Lynn, starting in uh, seventh position. But Francois does own the Porsche RS Spider that is actually on pole position and which is being driven by Emmanuel Collard. It's an amazingly wonderful noise from these machines. They are seriously rapid cars. We're going to see some fast lap times once they get up to full speed. It is actually, um, the clock is ticking away. Uh, the safety car will be coming in at the end of this lap. Yes, the clock normally starts at the beginning of the second green flag lap. So the, effectively the second green flag lap is part of the race uh, when they run two green flag laps like this. Emmanuel Collard leads them round. They all start to be bunching up a little bit more uh, now as they start to get ready for the start of this particular race. 
plenty more other cars to look out for in there. There's uh, we've got a couple of Moseleys in this one. We've got a beautiful Porsche 962, which is actually quite well up on the grid. It's Lucas Salusa. We've seen him a couple of times. That is in 12th position on the grid. Porsche 962. We've got a Ligier. We've got the MG Lola of Mike Newton. That's starting in uh, 15th place on the grid. A car that he raced when it was a current car with Tommy Erdos, actually, back in the day. Not that long ago. 2004, the car uh, was first created. But again, it adds to the mixture of machinery that we've got out there. We've got uh, other Porsches, GT Porsches as well, a Chevrolet Courgette. We've got a Pescarolo LMP1 car, um, Jamie Constable. We saw him out racing earlier on today. He lines up in 11th place on the grid. So a, a massive variety of cars, very, very quick machinery. And let's hope that they can deliver us with a, an entertaining race in the Masters Endurance Legends race. And talking about Endurance Legends, you've got to say Manuel Collard is definitely one of those. Two times winner of the Le Mans series and uh, all those Le Mans events that he's done. He's won LMP2 uh, before at Le Mans in, uh, in uh, the Porsche RS Spider Evolution in 2009. He's won, a G won the GT class at Le Mans back in 2003. We're getting ready for the start of the Masters Endurance Legends race. Emmanuel Collard, the pole man, leads them through the final corner. Rob Weldon trying to get alongside. It's a bit of an open grid as the race gets underway, properly under a green flag. But it's Emmanuel Collard who has the advantage from Rob Weldon as they flash through Abbey Corner at such high pace already and chase down the road into the right-hander at Village. But it is Emmanuel Collard with that immediate advantage Matthew Wrigley's up there as well and all of them now beginning to pick up the pace bit by bit as they head around onto the Wellington straight and we're going to see some pretty rapid straight line speeds down here Emmanuel Collard with so much experience to his name he leads from Rob Weldon Matt Wrigley in third place in the Dallara and then a rest of a group of cars heading down towards Brooklands trying to keep it as neat and as tidy as possible. But look at how Collard is already beginning to, to make the escape, Alistair. Looks as though he's got a very good getaway. Yes, as, as you say, so experienced, but uh, the cars are uh, so quick that they come through Cox Corner already. And uh, we haven't really had much of the race yet, and they're already making their way up to Beckett's Corner for the first time. Fabulous place to spectate for these cars here as they sweep it through the Beckett's right, left and right. Collard it is who still leads in the Porsche RS Spider. Second place is Rob Weldon in the Lola. And then in third place, the, the uh, open car, the red and white car of Matthew Wrigley, who we saw earlier, of course, win that fabulous Formula 2 race. Yeah, very rapid in that. And he's getting very close in the race for second place. Let's see whether he's going to be able to make any progress there. But Collard is definitely making the break bit by bit. Uh, fourth place, as you say, is the James Cottingham Delara. That's dropped back just a little bit, but is not out of the battle completely. There's no doubt. Sean Lynn in the Peugeot 908 is then tucked in behind, but Rob Weldon really putting a pressure on Collard and going through. Rob Weldon takes the lead in the Lola and takes command of the race. Now, is Collard just playing a game or is he uh, struggling for pace for some reason? Oh, a bit of a deep line there from Matt Wrigley. He went into village a bit too deep lost a bit of time as a result but is still holding on in there for now in third place but he hasn't got the pace of these two they are beginning to pull away Manuel Collard still tucked in behind Rob Weldon and uh, Collard had half a think there about uh, the inside at Brooklands but uh, no room through there and uh, they come now through Luffield and in third place, Matthew Wrigley, but here are the two leaders coming out through Woodcut Corner and Collard in behind in the open car with the closed Lola leading and they're already catching some tail enders as they go into Cox Corner, only for the second time. So there's that Lola in control at the moment, but Emmanuel Collard is uh, well tucked in behind and this Lola B1260 that is currently leading the race car rebuilt from the X-Factory Mazda prototype LMP2 car, an identical chassis to the Lola LMP1. Uh, it's prepared by Pete Chambers originally with a Judd 4.4 litre engine and uh, won many championships over the time of its life. Manuel Collard in second place, coming under a bit of pressure from uh, Matt Wrigley in his Dallara. 
Meanwhile, in the background, Francois Perodo has moved up in the Peugeot 908. He's now up into fourth place, but there is a bit of a gap back to him. The top three have made a bit of an escape, no doubt about it, as they head out of Club Corner with 33 minutes still to go. But putting in some quick lap times, we're down to 1 minute 49.1 on that last lap for Rob Weldon. So rapid lap times indeed from these cars. And Collard not quite got the same level of pace just yet, but I think he may well have it later on in the race. Let's wait and see. Meanwhile, David Bryce in the Lola LMP2 B0980. Goodwood instructor, David. And he's running strongly in seventh position under a little bit of pressure from the number 36 car of uh, Max Lynn. That's the BR01, the... Uh, LM prototype constructed by BR Engineering, the Russian businessman-owned outfit, and by Boris Romanovic Rotenberg, who created these uh, prototype cars, well, certainly funded these prototype cars, I should say. And, uh, getting into a little bit of a battle there, no doubt about it. That's the number uh, nine car of Sean Lin, one of the Peugeot 908s. So we've got some really recent top-class machinery here. The 908 was developed for 2011 season. We had uh, ran the diesel engines. Uh, we've got one of these with the diesel power. That's actually Francois Perodo's car. And meanwhile, the car that Sean is driving, yeah, one Petit Le Mans back in 2009, that particular car. So it's got a good history to it as well. And that is the number nine car, which is running around in sixth place. Back to uh, the, fr the front runners. Yes, uh, we've got here uh, Emmanuel Collard just ahead of the uh, red and white car. That's Matt Wrigley, very noticeable colours on that car. A lot of the cars seem to run sort of a dark blue and black colours, but uh, thankfully uh, for us, Matt Wrigley in red and white. There's the leader going through the sweepers up towards Village, and uh, that the leading car should be Rob Weldon. Yeah, it's uh, just yes, just corrected uh, again. Yeah, I was just going to say... Uh, looking at our graphics there. Uh, so Rob Weldon's transponder not tripping the beam as he crosses the line, but he is leading as he goes out onto the Wellington Strait. And you can see there the gap between him and second place to Emmanuel Collard in the Porsche Spider. And not far behind Collard, of course, is Matt Wrigley. But it's Peroda who's setting the fastest lap in the Peugeot there he uh, is. in fourth place. Yeah, going well now, Francois Perodo in that Porsche, uh, in the Peugeot, sorry, 908, uh, uh, the five and a half litre machine. And uh, there we can see, also going well, is Rob Weldon, our race leader, of course, doing a fantastic job so far. But Perodo setting fastest lap and very rapid times. One minute 47 around this uh, 3.7 mile Silverstone circuit, the full length track. Weldon in control at the moment with just over half an hour to go. Two cars are under investigation for contact that was made a little while ago. Uh, number eight, Criton. Then do this, uh, and also the 99 car of Jamie Constable. Jamie's currently running in eighth place, but clearly there was something between them early on, which is being investigated. Emmanuel Collard, though, there he is in the Porsche RS Spider, currently running in second place. And there is Perodo and catching. He yeah, and he's almost caught, hasn't he? He's almost caught Matt Wrigley in the uh, in the Dallara Orica as they come into the left-hander at Club Corner. And uh, the Peugeot has been really quick. Now, it was a wet session for qualifying yesterday, so we're seeing perhaps a slight change in the order in terms of the speeds these cars will do in the dry. And it's the Peugeot that's really making the waves at the moment as he comes up through farm into the right-hander at Village, a lot later on the brakes there in the Peugeot than Matt Wrigley in the Dallara as they go up now towards the loop. Uh, tight section here, and I think Perodo is going to go for the inside at Aintree, but uh, Matt Wrigley's too quick for him. He gets that car off the slow corner very well, but now they're coming onto the Wellington Strait and a change of position. Yeah, the Peugeot moves into third place. Francois Perodo doing a fantastic job. It's a very rapid machine, this, of course, and Peugeot had, uh, have had a lot of success with their LMP cars uh, over recent years, but we'll just have to see. They were beaten by Audi at Le Mans in 2011 by just 13 seconds. It was a bit of a, a close battle, that one, but uh, let's see how he goes here. He's into a potential podium finishing position. Emmanuel Collard is still second, 
but the gap that Rob Weldon has opened up now, uh, some 4.7 seconds, very, very impressive in the number 116 car, the two litre powered Lola B1260 really flying along and uh, Collard seeing that he might get caught by Perodo because Perodo has been lapping more quickly over those last couple of laps, got himself into third and Collard might be under a bit of pressure going forward. There is Francois delivering some great lap times. Well, Francois Perodo may have the fastest lap of the race, but it is literally only a fraction quicker than our leader, Rob Weldon. It's uh, three thousandths of a second difference, uh, so nothing really. Uh, and Perodo now has uh, passed and cleared uh, Matt Wrigley for that uh, third and fourth place battle and now heads off after Emmanuel Collard in the Porsche looking for second place. Lap times at the moment actually favour the leader, Rob Weldon. He's slightly quicker. So the lead car is an LMP1 car category. In Collard's car, in theory, is an LMP2 car. Uh, so it is in a different class. Um, uh, but the rest of the front runners, LMP1 cars. And then we go down the order a little bit um, to more of the LMP2 cars as well. And then we've got some GT cars. I think the leading GT car is down in 17th place at the moment. Um, that is car number 65, so that's actually Ollie Bryant going well in the Ford Mustang GT. So it's a different category that's out there racing, and Ollie Bryant doing well in that class at the moment, running in 17th position. But obviously the LMP, the prototype cars, are the ones who are commanding the front end, and per Perodo is gradually closing that gap to Emmanuel Collard. Let's see what he can get it down to. Collard's got a bit of traffic up ahead of him as well and it could well give Perota the chance to close the gap just a little bit more but Rob Weldon putting in these rapid laps up front but look yeah you can see how much closer the Peugeot is to the open top portion in fact the Peugeot is going to go down the inside clear down the inside into what I say clear no and you get sideways wasn't that clear uh, there was almost a touch between them and Perota had to back out at the last minute and then got really sideways at Stowe Corner, and Emmanuel Collard holds on to second. So, Francois has just realised he's going to have to fight a bit harder, make sure he gets fully alongside, or even ahead, uh, going into the next attempt to overtake. Collard holds on to second for now. Perodo in third, and Matt Wrigley a little further back in fourth position. Sean Lynn is in fifth, Jamie Constable in sixth, or oh, Carl trying to get out of the way, but also locking up there. In the lower end of the GT category, we've got a few of the Porsches having some good battles there in the GT class. As we mentioned, uh, Ollie Bryant still doing a good job. There's Collard trying to fight his way through. Uh, I think that's one of the Moslers. Yes, it is one of the Moslers that he's just overtaken. We've got a couple of Moslers in the race here today. We saw the Mosler competed with uh, by Roll Centre. Martin Short, of course, uh, got very involved in... in not only running them, but uh, promoting them as well. Sean Balf as well raced to Moslers in the UK. And uh, Martin took the car to a second place finish at Bathurst back in 2002, which was pretty impressive. But the Moslers are not at the same level as things like this Peugeot 908, which is holding up there in third and chasing after Collard. But actually Collard's fending him off better on this lap. Well, it was interesting to watch how Collard dealt with those slower cars uh, up through the section of uh, Village and the Loop. He just made his way through them uh, without really missing a beat. But uh, when the Peugeot of Perodo came up against them, he really got in a bit of a mess in the Loop. He went the wrong side of them, in my opinion, and then he got caught on the outside and lost a bit of time. But he's making that up again now, and that's perhaps just the difference between the massive experience of Emmanuel Collard and uh, the relative inexperience of the driver behind. Yeah, but uh, Francois is beginning to catch up once again. The speed that these things carry. When we've been watching so many other cars coming through that last segment, but these things just are flying through Abbey Corner. They carry so much speed through here. It's the sort of corner they can do probably flat out, I would think, with the level of downforce that these cars create. Whereas most of the cars that are racing here this weekend have to dab on the brakes going into the right-hander now we're into the tighter section again Perodo showing better pace generally over the last couple of laps but when he got alongside Collard it didn't quite come off first time around Rob Weldon is still opening that gap up in the lead he's got it up to nearly 10 seconds now 
so comfortably in front. I think uh, Francois Perodo has realised that you can't monster Emmanuel Collard, can you? Uh, he just carried on on his line. He wasn't going to be uh, diverted from that, and it was Perodo who had to back out of it in the end a lap or so ago at Stowe Corner. But now they're coming through along the old pit straight along towards Cotts Corner and uh, just jinking out there as they came along the straight, but uh, no room to move through at Cops, but closing, closing, closing all the time on Collard as they go up the hill and over the rise into Maggots. Now they turn right into Beckett's and then left and then right again. And it's the way that these cars change direction, which is absolutely amazing to me. There is no sliding in these, quite different from the older cars we've been watching up until now. Uh, the way to drive these cars quickly is absolutely straight. Here comes Barodo, he's going to have another go at the same place where he tried to overtake last time. This time he gets fully alongside and ahead before they get into the corner. This time he does not get sideways halfway around it. And I think he's got the move made, but they've got a bit of traffic to deal with. And that is where Collard is very strong, although in this case he gets held up ooh, and realises he might have to back out, does get back on the power. And uh, Perodo's got into safe second place. Wrigley's still in, third, in fourth place, rather, chasing after Emmanuel Collard. But Perodo, does he have the pace to go chasing after the leader? I don't think so, because they're actually lapping at a similar pace. We'll have to see. The leader is in the pits now, in fact. So uh, Rob Weldon has decided to make his pit stop at this stage in the race relatively early. Um, well, the pit window is open, and so it's good to get it done. He is not swapping over to anyone else. There are some drivers who are swapping over to partners, but in that case, uh, Rob Weldon is just sticking in the car and will sit in the pits for a, a few seconds before coming back out onto the track once again. The number 20 car just chasing down, that's Keith Fraser. As he goes past one of the GT cars. Sean Lynn's now moved up to fourth, but remember Rob Weldon in the pit. So that's the reason that you're seeing quite a lot of changes to the uh, current order. That will all settle back down again after they have all made their pit stops. So, good advantage for um, Weldon before he came into the pits. As long as the, everything goes according to plan, he should emerge with a pretty comfortable uh, lead still later on. That's David Bryce, still going well in the Lola LMP2. He's running in seventh place. He will be handing his car over when he makes the pit stop. And there is Emmanuel Collard now in second place, but really it's third because once he's made his pit stop, he will uh, drop back to third because this Peugeot is the one that got past him. It's currently leading the race, but I'm not sure it's going to be quick enough. Let's just see. Um, he's been doing 1 minute 47s. That was another 1 minute 47.4. I have to say he's pretty consistent on his lap times, Francois Perodo. But it's the same sort of lap time that Rob Weldon was doing before he made his pit stop and was doing very, very consistently indeed. The track pretty much bone dry. There's a few puddles on some of the runoff areas, but uh, a dry circuit to really push these cars on. And Rob Weldon back out of the pits again onto the track, so uh, not far behind the, uh, the, the cur current leaders. Uh, but uh, obviously they will have to do their stop. But uh, a very efficient stop for Rob Weldon, the minimum stop time, and back out on track again. As uh, we see the current leader, Francois Perodo, coming through uh, Luffield and then accelerating out through Woodcut Corner. Such an iconic name in motor racing, Woodcut Corner, they go through and onto the old pit straight down towards Cops. And then you can see in the background there the second place car of Emmanuel Collard in the Porsche Spider. As uh, Ben said, a different class, an LMP2 car, but uh, really very quick uh, in the hands of Collard. Yeah, so he's leading the uh, P2 class. The next up in that particular class is uh, the number 36 car, Sean Lynn. Um, so, actually, no, that's, uh, sorry, that's Max Lin in that, the, the 36 car. That's also an LMP2 car. So, uh, keeping an eye on that. But this man, Francois Perodo, trying to put some quick laps together before he makes his pit stop. But Rob Weldon, who's back out on track, I think will have the advantage. So, he now comes in to the pits, and then we'll get to see when he comes back out just where the gap is between himself and Rob Weldon would expect it to be still quite a big gap. It was around nine seconds before the pit stops began. And it will give us an idea of whether we're going to see a, a tussle to the end 
between the Lola and the Peugeot. See one of the Moslers is in the pits, you can see it in the background there. Celine also in the pits, just the one Celine, that's uh, Olivier Tancong, Tangogne, who's in that car. And it uh, looks like Collard in as well. Yes, Collard was in. We didn't see that uh, on the camera shot because uh, we followed the uh, Perodo car. But also in the pits is the second-placed car of Emmanuel Collard, who uh, happens to be pitted right behind the Peugeot. So they're sat there together. It's a busy pit lane at the moment, actually. Yeah, Max Lynn just heading in, wasn't he? As you say as well, um, as we look at one of the handsome GT cars, this is the number 70 machine of Marcus Jewell. This is a car that he's sharing with Ben Klukas. Uh, so we've seen Ben putting in some pretty rapid times already so far today. And uh, we could well see that making up some ground as the race continues. They have done the pit stop, so I think Ben's in the car now because it was Marcus who started the race. But yeah, Ben Klukas will have taken it on because it's made its pit stop. And I can see some uh, faster personal sector times coming up for them but they've got a bit of work to do that car of Ben Kluke is down in 24th position currently in fact moving up to 20th now you just see it at the bottom of the data list there on the left of the screen so we're looking at uh, the number 116 car of Rob Weldon this is the the car that we think will be back in front once everybody those leaders have done their pit stops this will be interesting now because here he comes through club corner onto the Hamilton straight. We can see the exit of the pit lane, uh, so we'll be able to see the difference between the car coming through Abbey now. And here we've got Emmanuel Collard in the pits and through has gone Rob Weldon and out onto track. That's, from, that's Perodo's car back on track again. So where's he at the moment? He's going through Village, I think that is. Is it up to the... No, that's actually coming through Luffield. OK, so, so. Uh, that's a long way ahead of Rob Weldon. Yeah, that's an interesting one. So has Perodo taken the advantage? Uh, so we will see in a moment when uh, they come around to complete the lap. It does look as though he's ahead, doesn't it? So what we don't know is whether Rob Weldon's pit stop was longer than it needed to be, perhaps yep. for an adjustment. Uh, we, we, we don't know that. So it could be that Rob Weldon lost time in the pits. He's put a fastest lap in. He knows he's uh, got a chase on now, doesn't he? Absolutely, yeah. Or, or was the pit stop for Perodo long enough? Well, <laughs> that's the yeah, other question. That, or will he end up with a penalty? I don't absolutely. know. Absolutely, that's the question we don't know the answer to. Sean Lynn in number nine, another of the uh, the Peugeots. That is the car that won the Petit Le Mans back in 2009. So it's a great history to it. But uh, yeah, let's keep an eye on Perodo because it does look as though he is now our race leader and he's got to keep these laps together. Certainly haven't seen any evidence of a problem for Weldon when he was in the pits. Well, the, the, the question will be answered when we see the relative position of uh, Collard, because uh, assuming he did the correct length pit stop, he will either come out near to Perodo or near to Weldon. Yeah, I think I think he's just on his way out of the pits now, actually, Collard. We'll, we'll see. Um, Weldon, I think, is just coming up. No, not yet. I thought I'd seen him come through. Um, no, I think he's just gone through Abbey now. Perodo is a long, long way ahead. I don't quite understand how this how this has turned around in, in such a way. And, uh, well, let's see how this works out. Perodo is leading the race. According to everything we're seeing, we've got 15 minutes to go for now. And uh, Sean Lin on his out lap. You'll see him drop down the order slightly. Uh, I noticed that Collard is relative to Weldon quite close and you know about 10 12 seconds which is what he was before the pit stops and that makes me lean towards Perodo stop being a bit short yeah that's a, a bit of an odd one going past the uh, or certainly challenging there to go past the Porsche 962 lovely to see that one out and about but uh, not able to compete with cars from a much later era so you really are seeing quite a big spread in terms of years between the cars engaged in this race. That's Lucas Salusa. We've seen him out in many different cars already today, Lucas. Um, he's out in that Porsche 962, a 1993 car. And a, a very, very classic sports racing car, of course, the Porsche 962, developed from the Porsche 956 in the 1980s. Oh, and the Moslers had a spin. Number two, that's uh, Aaron Scott, I believe. 
Uh, the leading GT car, there it is, Ollie Bryant. He's doing a good job in the Ford Mustang. We saw him earlier on that he was leading in the class and he is doing so at this stage. Perodo still being shown as our race leader. Jamie Constable being shown as uh, in second place now. It's a little bit difficult to understand this, where the, why the pit stops have changed the order so much. I don't really understand it. Yes, because Constable's done his stop, so it's not as though he's there because he hasn't done a stop yet. Uh, in fact, all the cars, the pit window's just closed, actually, as I'm saying that. All the cars have done their pit stops. Uh, the question is whether they were the right length, as uh, the leader overall passes the GT leader. Yeah, very different race, but that's all part and parcel, of course. It's the same at Le Mans. Uh, you get the different classes and winning your category is what it is all about. And, um, well, right now, <laughs> leading quite comfortably is the car of Francois Perodo. He started back down in sixth place on the grid. We don't quite understand why he's managed to make this big jump on Rob Weldon, who started from the front row, had a comfortable lead before the pit stops began, but is now struggling. But I tell you what, Weldon is going quicker than anybody out there. He is just on a 1 minute 45.9. Perodo is still doing 1 minute 47s. To be fair to Jamie Constable, he's doing consistent 147s as well in the number 99 car. So Constable is flying along in the Pescarolo. He's made up good ground because he qualified down in 11th. Clearly, it works well in the dry, that car. As we see, Lucas coming up behind Ollie Bryant and then back into the... Uh, Mosler battle, I think there's a Mosler side-by-side -side battle going on there pretty much. Weldon has come up into second place now, but he's a full 14 seconds off the lead. Uh, there is Perodo as he crosses the line once more. That's 14 laps completed. With 12 minutes remaining and an advantage apparently of, oh, 10 seconds. Suddenly that's come down a little bit. Another rapid lap by Rob Weldon there. So maybe he's going to make up the ground some time to go, and we shall see if he can do it. Collard finds himself down in fifth place now. The uh, the gap was reduced massively because uh, Weldon's lap was quick, but not the quickest he's done. But uh, Perodo had a very slow lap. He was about six seconds slower than his normal lap time. So uh, he maybe caught some traffic and was just very cautious lapping the traffic. Doesn't seem to have any problems in our picture now as he goes through Luffield. That lap that Rob Weldon has done is a new record at the Classic. It is the fastest lap ever seen at the Classic, apparently, I'm just hearing. 145.93. Um, so an XJR14 driven by Nicholas Minassian, the previous holder back in 2013, and uh, it has been beaten. So well done to Rob Weldon, who's taken a new lap record in this. Very, very impressive indeed. Ah, now, Graham Goodwin explaining to me what's been going on in this. Rob Weldon and Emmanuel get pit stop penalties rated as pro drivers. Right. So that's the understanding. Francois Perodo is rated as a gentleman driver, and therefore he gets a shorter pit stop. I hadn't realised that. My mistake, sorry. Should have picked up that on the rules. But thank you to Graham Goodwin, um, the editor of Daily Sports Car, and always has great information for us. So... Thank you, Graham. And that is the reason that uh, Francois Perodo is now leading the race. He, he was allowed a shorter pit stop. That's part of the rules. He's a gentleman driver. The others are seen as professionals, basically. And uh, that is why he has now taken the step ahead. Looking at the number 165 car there, still putting in some quick laps in uh, it was David Bryce but it's now uh, Alan Perbrick in the Lola and there the number 99 machine of Jamie Constable which has also been going well and, th and that's the reason I'm sure that Jamie's moved up too he didn't have to have the longer pit stop so that has worked extremely well and we're seeing here the uh the Peugeot that's leading, Francois Ferodo, and the gap between first and second on our graphic is 9.7 seconds as they come through Cops Corner. So uh, Rob Weldon gradually chipping away at the lead, but it's not the big chunks that he was taking a little earlier on, which, uh, as I mentioned, I think was partly due to Fran Francois Ferodo having a bad lap or a, a lap where he lost about six seconds, possibly through... Uh, having to lap slower cars. 
Yeah, it's going to be tough for Rob to come back, though, isn't it? Still, with uh, with that gap being nearly 10 seconds. The cloud above that section of track. I have to say where we are at the moment, the sky is looking relatively safe in terms of staying dry. So there is Rob Weldon having to run that longer pit stop through his uh, pro status and now trying to make the best of what he can here, trying to close up that gap to Francois Perodo. And you can see the car uh, jumping around, not across the track, but uh, it's so stiffly sprung and with all the downforce it's got as it hits the little undulations in the track, just the, the rear wing you can see shaking under the pressure as they come uh, up to village and he's going to go through oh and uh, the car behind uh, the car ahead sorry the slower car didn't see him coming and tried to turn in and uh, rob weldon gave him a little biff there uh, as they came in but i hopefully that didn't damage anything on either car it looks like they're okay but uh, unfortunately just a little bit of a misunderstanding there as rob weldon was flying through on the brakes into village now he's down into luffield and he's got a slower car ahead of him and that's just compromising his line a little bit into luffield but you see how he squirts by there the, the difference in pace from the gt cars to these full lmp1 cars uh, as they come out onto the uh, old pit straight uh, weldon is certainly a very professional driver uh, a radical uh, racer for many years finished second in the radical uk cup uh, 2010 and 2011 um, and in the Radical European Masters Series back in 2012. And more recently, he uh, raced in the European Masters and he won uh, LMP3 in the European Le Mans Series in 2020. So he really is a very experienced and highly professional driver, which is why he had to have the longer pit stop. And that's why Perodo has now got this advantage of some 7.3 seconds. Constable in third place. It's also the reason that Emmanuel Collard has dropped back. A very professional driver himself. With all those Le Mans entries over the years, 24 times raced at Le Mans. It's a pretty remarkable career, isn't it? Rob Weldon has just set a new fastest lap of the race, a 145.312, and that is a full four seconds. Uh, in fact, it's just been adjusted on my screen. Uh, a 147.552, still two seconds quicker than the leader, though. So we are seeing the gap coming down, uh, although uh, the lap time not quite as quick as originally thought. No, but as you say, there, there is still an opportunity. We've got six minutes to go. I don't think there's going to be quite enough time for Rob to really close up. But it just depends. If Francois makes any mistakes, then uh, there could be an opportunity for Rob to have a challenge we've got the timer ticking away let's see what the gap is is it still here yeah, step back down he's gained another eight tenths of a second yeah absolutely he's uh, chipping away at it isn't he with uh, how many minutes to go five nearly six minutes left in this race and the pace they're doing then they're actually getting a lot of laps in aren't they whereas in the earlier races it was uh, nearly three minute laps some of them yeah i mean they're going in the dry now they're lapping 15 seconds a lap faster than they were in the wet in qualifying yesterday so big, big margin, quick up. Perodo still with the advantage and uh, still with a comfortable lead. But look, you know, getting into amongst the traffic here, that's where the gentlemen drivers, as they're referred, perhaps may be a little more cautious or make a little mistake. And that's where the pros can definitely gain a bit more of an advantage. Uh, so you can beginning to see in the background there, Rob Weldon definitely closing up, moving to the inside of the other cars that are around. He's got the gap down to two point. 698 seconds so gained a lot there definitely Perodo lost more time going through the traffic than Weldon and we could still well have a race on our hands to the checkered flag absolutely yes as Weldon screams through club corner onto the Hamilton straight and there the car ahead is the leader so coming up towards Abbey and Farm uh, and this is a battle to the flag now which is still four and a half minutes away as they come up towards village hard on the brakes for the tight right hander there is rob weldon runs a little bit deep into village just a little bit late on the brakes and uh, through the left hander at the loop a very good line through there tight onto the apex now they're going through aintree out onto the fast oh. wellington straight i think we're going to have a change of lead very shortly we could well do this is a battle for the win in the masters endurance legends race uh, gentleman racer versus a professional two very different cars we've got the peugeot up front at the moment and the lola in second place they run both run as lmp1 cars they're in the same category 
And right now, there's a lot of work going on at the steering wheel. There it certainly is, yeah. Rob Weldon there had a bit of a moment and went across the kerbs, but uh, got it all collected back together again. That will have lost him a fraction of a second and a, in the run up to Cops Corner. Through Cops he goes, and the Peugeot staying tight on the inside to get past a couple of slower cars. Rob Weldon choosing to pass them as they run into uh, Beckett's, and he's right behind oh, him look now. Look at that, side by side, he takes the place. That's an unusual place, but. That was professional driving. The gentleman driver, Francois Perot, being a bit cautious with traffic around, and Rob just went for it. But actually, look, the straight line speed of that Peugeot has got it back. It's so quick down the hangar straight. So Rob's going to have to do it all over again. And uh, he takes a tighter line through Stowe up towards the veil. They go in and he's got the lead back again. Rob Weldon goes back into the lead, going up towards Club Corner. Can he get enough of a gap now before, to uh, not allow the uh, Perodo car to come up alongside him on power and I think he has as he comes up towards Abbey and uh, the lead has changed and it's now Rob Weldon back in the lead, Francois Perodo in second, Jamie Constable in third. Very, very impressive stuff this from Rob Weldon, really good stuff. The 39-year-old uh, born back in 1981, so he'll be celebrating his 40th birthday in a few months' time but uh, all that skill and ability has uh, helped him earn top spot here and with just two and a half minutes to go, I think he's going to be pretty safe up there, no doubt about it. And uh, did the Asian Le Mans series with United Autosports. Uh, he's been doing that this year with them, uh, scoring con uh, consistently well. Also doing the European Le Mans series with United Autosports. Uh, actually won the LMP3 class with United last year. So he has got so much professional knowledge and he's used it extremely well here. And a slight mistake there from Francois Perodo as he braked for Brooklands. You saw a little puff of smoke from the one of the tyres locking up and he ran slightly wide onto the apron on the outside of Brooklands. That lost him another second probably as they come into Beckett's uh, and through the left, right and left sweepers and out onto the hangar straight once again. And there is the second place, Perodo. We know he's quick down the hangar straight, but the gap's too great now, isn't it? Yeah, he's not going to make up that much ground, is he? Uh, we do think they'll be going on to their final lap when they come around, because the clock is gradually ticking away, less than a minute and a half. So it will go to zero during the next lap, and then the checker flag will be coming out. And Rob, who who's said he'd only done, I think, nine laps in this car before going into qualifying yesterday, and that was wet. So really, this race, he's just been learning, learning, learning how it works. That last lap wasn't his fastest, but it was only, what, a few thousands, three thousands of his fastest lap previously. So he's been very, very consistent, showing that professional talent that he has, and uh, it's delivering. Now, actually, he's coming up behind, I think, the car that's still leading the GT class. I think it's still Ollie Bryant. Um, let's have a look down the list. Actually, no, I think Ben Klukas has taken the lead in that category now in the number 70 car that's the Porsche 996 RSR I think Ben's got in front Ben Lucas is having a good day we saw him in the Lotus Cortina earlier having a good race and I think he's nipped to, to the lead in the GT class so the final half lap or so for Rob Wainwright coming uh, Rob Weldon sorry coming up towards Cops Corner now along the the old pit straight up towards Cops, we can see in the background the second-placed car, but uh, too far back now to mount a challenge as they come through Cops, up over the rise towards Maggots. Uh, he's choosing now whether he'll go left or right of this car to lap it. He goes on the inside and sighs through on the way through Beckett's, and uh, now out through Chapel Curve, onto the hangar straight for the last time. All looking good. Uh, it's still going to be Emmanuel Collard in fifth place who will win the P2 category, I believe. He is certainly the first of those. Uh, Atkinson down in 13th place, the P3 uh, class. He's leading that particular sector. As I mentioned, Klukas is leading GT2, although Bryant is still the first of the GT1 category. There are various different categories here. But the outright race win is about to go to Rob Weldon, who's driven superbly well in the Lola to fight back from what was a big disadvantage, a, a longer pit stop, which he had to do as a professional driver over Francois Perauda, who finishes second. He had the advantage, being a gentleman driver, of a shorter pit stop, but ultimately he couldn't quite hang on to the lead. What a good battle we saw between them. And Jamie Constable uh, coming home to finish in third position, crosses the line, 
to get a podium finish here today as well. Fourth place is going to go to Sean Lynn in the uh, other Peugeot 908. There it is, just crossing the line. And Emmanuel Collard will be in the background, I think, in uh, his car in the Porsche RS Spider. He took pole position in the wet, in the dry. The car didn't have quite the same level of performance. There it is, uh, no, just uh, waiting for it. There it is in the background, crossing the line. Emmanuel Collard wins the LMP2 class and finishes in uh, fifth place overall in the dry. The car doesn't have the straight line speed of those LMP1 cars, but nonetheless, he put on a great show. And uh, number 70, GT car, winner of the GT class. That's Ben Klukas driving the car at the moment, shared with Marcus Jewell. And they did a great job to take the victory in that category in their Porsche 996, a very successful car over the years in the GT class. And uh, well done to Ben Klukas. He's had a good afternoon, actually, I have to say, in a couple of very different cars. So, the Masters Endurance Legends race, some of the fastest cars of this entire weekend at Silverstone. They will get another race tomorrow afternoon. They are due to race at 4.30 again tomorrow afternoon. Another 40 minutes encounter, and we'll see whether, on that occasion, uh, we're going to see whether Rob Weldon's going to hang on for another victory, or will Francois Perodo this time be able to use that sli slightly shorter pit stop advantage that he has as a gentleman driver be able to go through well we'll find that out tomorrow but today celebrations are definitely for Rob Weldon A happy flash of the lights from Rob Weldon as he comes into the pits and celebrates victory here today Masters Endurance Legends race saw Rob Weldon win by 4.8 seconds over Francois Perodo with Jamie Constable in third. Sean Lynn and another Peugeot was fourth. Emmanuel Collard won his class, finished fifth overall in the end. Landudis, Frieser and Lynn were next up. The BR01s both going well. Lucas Halusa did a good job in the older Porsche 962, finishing in 10th position. Further down the order, you've got the winner of the GT class, the Porsche 996, Ben Klukas, Mark Jewell, Mark Jewell in 15th place. Ollie Bryant winning the GT1 uh, class in the Ford Mustang, had a good race as well. Colin Salter completing the top 20. Well, that was uh, entertaining stuff, wasn't it? Some very rapid machinery from the start. Let's take a look back at the Masters Endurance Legends encounter.
the starting grid for what is set to be an incredible day. It's lights out, and away we go. He's taken an early lead. There's never been a better crew. Behind every great driver, there are brilliant engineers. It's going to be hard to pick a winner here. They're on the final lap. A day they'll never forget. So we are calling all five to 15 year olds that, uh, well, maybe fancies their chance in the, what would it be, the Euro 2024? <laughs> quite, quite possibly, yes. Um, joining me now is James Brown, the other James Brown. Um, <laughs> James, talk to me about what's going on here. We've got some kids playing football, but there's more to it than just that. Uh, yeah, so uh, Yokohama ties, obviously we support Chelsea Football Club, and uh, part of that we get access to the Chelsea Foundation, um, which is the charity arm. We've uh, they've very kindly donated some coaches to come up here and help train the kids. Um, let's get themselves some future Chelsea and uh, England football stars. Yes, um, we need a few more of those. We, we've got all kinds of activities from spot drills to spot kicks and uh, shooting a few penalties because we might need a bit of help there. <laughs> but otherwise, no, all weekend uh, you guys can come along and make the most of it. It's amazing. It's great fun. And actually, I mean, you can sort of have a look around. I feel like, I wonder whether we should just go and quickly have a Should we go, should we go and sit, quickly see how the boys are doing? We're going to go and <laughs> gate crash their... Guys, I'm sorry. I'm gate crashing your session. Are you enjoying it? Yes, what have you learnt so far? <laughs> Are you doing good? some good kicks? Yeah, you're running some spot drills. Max? Yeah. Dribbling. We've learned some dribbling. Yeah. Shoot. Shot and we shoot, shooted the ball into the goal. Oh, and did you get it in the goal? Oh, Excellent. Well, there well we done. are. That's one up on the England team already, isn't it? <laughs> did, you enjoy, <laughs> did you enjoy watching the Euros? Well, we'll leave you to your training. Good luck. Keep at it. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's great to see them. Yeah. Uh, and also, it's just such a nice place to come down and uh, have a bit of a break from the racing, if you want Absolutely, to. Absolutely, well. yeah, yeah. So, obviously, the mums and dads, they're, uh, they've got brought their Winks along, and uh, we, you know, whilst they're looking at the cars, the guys can uh, look after, we can look after the kids for a little while. Brilliant. Longer. And your basic position, you're kind of just by the Village Green, aren't yep, we? Yep, so we're opposite the Village Green at the bottom of Zone 10, and, uh, yeah, come along, stop by, say hello. And, very, very quickly, there's a massive... Pretty epic prize at stake, isn't it? Absolutely, there? yes. So, uh, for the best kid of today and tomorrow and all weekend, we have some specially signed uh, by the European champions, Chelsea Football Club, their squad have signed a football, and ev the best performing kid that comes along is a chance to win that football. Wow. Along with some other Yokohama and Chelsea goodies. That is an epic prize. Absolutely. James, thank you so much. No problem. And uh, good luck kicking football around. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> The podium for the Masters Endurance Legends. What a race it was. First up, we've got Rob Weldon. Rob Weldon, you can make your way onto the podium. Second place, Francois Perodo. And in third, Jamie Constable. And presenting the prizes is Paul Denman of Close Brothers Asset Management. Rob, I hope you can hear me. A new classic lap record. You must be absolutely delighted. Uh, I've just had such a good time. So thankful for Steve Dandy for giving me the opportunity. Massive effort from Pete Chambers and the lads. It's just been a hell of an experience. And to come away with a trophy to reward them for the work that they've done is just phenomenal. I've enjoyed myself every lap of the way. Excellent. Francois, what a fantastic drive through the field, but you just didn't quite have enough there at the end. No, no, no. He was way too fast for me, and uh, I've really enjoyed it. It's a great event. It was my first race in the Peugeot, so I'm discovering the car and uh, I can say it's the only diesel that's worth driving. <laughs> now, Jamie, it's it's a tough job holding on to these two, isn't it? Yeah, they're very tough. I mean, I'm just tough to bits. We managed to finish. The, the car's been in a workshop for six months, first time out. 
So really, really happy. Well, it was a fantastic drive by all three of you. Well done. In first place, Ben McClickus, Ben Clickus and Marcus Jewell. In second, Michael McKinnery and Aaron Scott. And then in third, Ollie Bryant. Presenting the prizes, Paul Denman from Close Brothers Asset Management. Ben and Marcus, I'm seeing you up here quite a lot this afternoon. A slightly different machine to the Cortina this afternoon. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's nice to win a, in a GT car. It's, uh, we got straight out of Cortina GT, so everything works in the Porsche. It doesn't work in the Cortina. So it felt really good. I mean, we have a big disadvantage on top end speed, so to keep, you know, a Mosler behind us is, is amazing. So we drove pretty well. So yeah, it's all good. Well done. We're going to have to wrap it up because the cars are going out on track at the moment. Yeah, we are looking forward to the uh, Yokohama Trophy for Masters Historic Sports Cars. Um, coming out on the circuit right now, this is going to be a 50-minute race. The track is dry at the moment, there is a bit of cloud around though, so we are a little concerned we might see some rain uh, during this race, but we'll just have to wait and see. So this is the lineup for the Masters Historic Sports Car Race, and on the pole position, Watch out for Alex Brundle, who will be starting in that Lola T70 in car number 23. Ollie Bryant in another Lola T70 alongside car number 14. Then it's Tom Bradshaw, number 43, in the first of the Chevrons. Fourth place on the grid, Chris Bateman will be starting in number 81. And then fifth, another Chevron B8. This is uh, Christian Pittard. Uh, he starts in fifth place. Sixth place for Gary Culver, another Lola T70. Seventh on the grid is Andrew Haddon, he'll be starting that uh, Lola T70, car number 58, followed by the Lola T280, Chris Fox is starting. Then another Lola T70, that will be started by Steve Brooks, Martin O'Connell will be starting in the Chevron B8, Henry Fletcher is 11th, and starting in 12th place, Julian Thomas in the Chevron B8 himself. Those cars have just headed out onto the circuit, um, as I say, it is a, a dry track for now. Let's see if it stays that way with a bit of heavy-looking cloud around. But uh, they're warming up nicely, and we've got uh, potential good battles up front. And Alex Brundle, who has had a win in this car already this year, uh, earlier on at Brands Hatch on the Grand Prix circuit, uh, in this Lola T70, Mark III. He's going to be sharing it with Gary Pearson, who, as we've seen, a very regular historic racer, prepares the cars himself as well, and very rapid. But Ollie Bryant, he's a busy lad as well, isn't he? Because uh, he's, we've seen him out there a moment ago, and now here he is back out in the Lola T70. That's why we didn't see him on the podium just now, because he's been straight back out in a car. Tom Bradshaw was an impressive qualifier yesterday. Um, we're going to have to wait and see whether he's going to be able to deliver the same sort of performance again. Track conditions were somewhat different when these guys were out yesterday. So we could see a, a bit of a turnaround in the way this race. And several Chevron V8s further down the order, that very pretty little sports car down towards the back of the field. And uh, well, we're watching out for a number of quick machines to see what they can do. Another load of T70 towards the back, but most of the load of T70s are up quite near the front, I have to say. A very classic sports car, very successful. Quite a few different classes in the Masters His Historic Sports Car Series. And that cloud is looking a little bit threatening, there is no doubt about it. Let's see if we manage to get away with a dry race. It is a 50-minute race, this one, with a pit stop, for basically for Le Mans sports cars between 1962 and 1974. So quite a good range 
of cars. As I say, they run in different classes under the names of some famous motorsport people. And up front, Alex Brundle will have the advantage off the line. They've still got this lap to complete before the race will get underway. Let's just see whether they end up with a dry race or whether we're going to see a stoppage again. Who knows what quite is going to happen. It is dry for now. Looking out the window, seeing a few fans in open grandstands. I'm sure they'll run and hide if it starts to rain. We've still got this race and one more to go this evening here at the Classic at Silverstone. And the last race of the day is also going to be a very, very full-on grid. This is big. This is 37 cars. In fact, 38 cars entered into this one. So a big, big grid of cars. Not quite the maximum capacity. When we get into the final race today, we are pretty much at the maximum capacity. So that is going to be one to watch and some top, top drivers in that as well. But we've got these cars are being shared by a number of uh, different drivers who will be appearing after the pit stops. Tiffany Dell, for example, will be joining into this race. The car that he's driving uh, will be started by John Spears. They're actually starting quite a long way down. They're in 21st place on the grid. Uh, but when Tiff jumps aboard, maybe we'll see that car heading a little bit nearer the front. And uh, Callum Lockie again will be taking over from uh, Julian Thomas in their Chevron V8. They actually qualified in a pretty good position, they're 12th on the grid. The field for the Masters Historic Sports Car Race is gathering together, coming down into the last couple of corners, all ready to see the start of a 50-minute encounter for Le Mans sports cars of the 60s and 70s. Up front, it's Alex Brundle on the left, Martin Brundle's son, who will be starting from pole position. Ollie Bryant will be with him on the front row. Then it's Tom Bradshaw and Chris Baton right behind with Christian Pittard and Gary Colbert in another load of T70. Race gets underway. Good start from Alex Brundle. Gets a good clean getaway into Abbey Corner. Flat out through there. And oh, the chase begins now all the way down amongst these 38 cars that have entered this race. But it is a longer race. So you need to keep your head together in the early stages. Not make any mistakes. Get the feel of the car and be wary that we could, might get an odd shower of rain falling upon the cars at some point. But one of the Chevron V8s really well up, actually. I think it's the Christian Pittard car running in fifth place. Little car, but uh, with some great pace. Uh, it's going to get swallowed up, isn't yeah. it, now, by the uh, the bigger Lola T70s. But uh, one of the smaller engine cars, that's the Chevron V19 of Tom Bradshaw. Oh, oh and he spins. That's the commentator's curse, I'm afraid. I'm sorry, Tom. Uh, and another one takes avoiding action. That's Henry uh, Fletcher going Henry, round him. Yeah. Uh, so uh, just about to say that he was challenging. But uh, at the moment, it's Brundle leading uh, the second place car of Oliver Bryant, then it's Chris Baton, so it's all the Bs, Brundle, Bryant and Baton, and then next up is the uh, the green T70 with a red flash at the front, that's Gary Culver in fourth place, who's managed to get ahead of the all-green car, I think that's Andrew Hatton, we saw him driving so well earlier on, and uh, he started in uh, Sean Lynn's T70, that's yeah. the all-green car in fifth place. Yeah, let's see if uh, Hatton can move up, because as you say, did a great job in the Scarab earlier on today, didn't he? The front engine uh, car. Uh, we saw the older Formula One car. It's very different now, of course. They're beginning to space out quite quickly here as the advantage taken by Alex Brundle. He will be handing the car over at the pit stop, but he's got a good time to go yet before the pit window opens up. And uh, yeah, we've seen how Bradshaw has dropped back. Yeah, he's right down in the middle of the pack now after that spin at Brooklyn. He might be able to gain some of that lost ground back as we look further down the field and see some very different machines coming down into Stowe Corner. Number 96 there, that's a, a rather splendid car. That is the car that Tiffany Dell will be out in a little bit later. It's a, an early McLaren, it's the M1B. And uh, Brawl is going up, I'm afraid, here, Ben, so that rain, I think, is on its way. Uh with uh, the spectators out in the open just feeling the need to put the brollies up as the leading cars come through and up to village comes Alex Brundle turning left now at the loop and he's really stamped his authority on this race already ahead of the similar car of Oliver Bryant uh, and uh, the rest of the field streaming through past our commentary position that is at Abbey Corner and uh, as they come through there's the lovely Ford GT40, such a famous car after the recent film 
joke was made about the uh, the Le Mans win in 1966. That's midfield, not a car that's going to be competitive at the front of the field against this competition. Yeah, but as you say, wonderful car. Michael Birch is driving it at the moment. He's sharing it with uh, Andrew Newell uh, through the latter stages of this race. Julian Thomas uh, down in 12th place at the moment. Uh, they started actually in 12th place, so they're trying to make up a little bit of that lost ground. Meanwhile, the uh, battle further down the order still continuing as well. Uh, car number uh, eight in that little mix. And the number 19 machine, that's the uh, Mark Owen Chevron V8, another very little, pretty little Chevron. There's another one, the 24 car, that's uh, Till Becklesteiner. He's sharing that car with John Heindhoff, funnily enough. And uh, the Chevron V8, my personal favourite, I think it's just such a lovely, balanced-looking car. That's gorgeous, isn't it, in yellow, as Till Becklesteiner goes through uh, Cops corner and following a similar car, another Chevron B8, up into Maggots. They take that fast left-hander, which leads into the daunting Beckett's S's, the right, the left, and the right. Uh, and uh, we get another lovely shot. But there's another Chevron B8, which has actually spun, and that looks like the 32, is it, uh, of uh, Charles Allison, who has spun in the rain as well. There's definitely yeah. rain falling. Yes, you see it on that camera, can't you? That's uh, I think is that the loot that they're going through there. Uh, as uh, the rest of the field coming down into Stowe Corner. So this is going to be a bit hairy for them, isn't it? Because uh, they went out expecting this to be a dry race, and now suddenly it's going to start getting pretty slippery out there. Let's hope that everybody can hang on in there. You're beginning to see a bit of movement, a bit of sliding in the background as they come out of Club Corner. There's no doubt with a lack of grip, you'll see people running wide. Uh, watch out for the odd error now, because it's going to get very tricky. Tom Bradshaw making up a place there as they came through Abbey. So Tom, after that spin on the first lap, the wiper going on Alex Brundle's Lola T70. And uh, if we do get a significant amount of rain, look out for the Chevron B8s, the B uh, and also the B19, that, uh, such as Tom Bradshaw is driving, because uh, they will be able to be a little bit quicker in the wet conditions. Yes, it's going to make life difficult, though, because uh, they are set up for the dry and this is going to get very slippery. You've got a lot of cars out there, uh, but I tell you, the rain is really falling now where we are as well. Down here at Abbey, it's really coming down quite heavily. Uh, this is going to completely change the format here. And as you say, uh, we could see some people moving up, but I wonder if it might actually lead to a safety car period. Let's wait and see. Um, at the moment, Alex Brundle is dealing with these tricky conditions extremely well. He's opened up an eight second gap now over Ollie Bryant and then the next car on the list is the number 81 machine Chris Baton still at the wheel Simon Hadfield will be taking over a little later on uh, Simon one of the quickest drivers in Lola T well in anything really but Lola T70s particularly uh, so uh, it'll be good when uh, Simon takes over to see whether he can pull that car up we've got absolutely torrential yeah. rain here now at uh, Abbey Curve, and uh, there's Martin O'Connell in Sandy Watson's Chevron B8, the blue car with the orange nose, and I've actually seen Martin O'Connell win a race like this at Spa in that car. He's just absolutely dynamite in the wet. Well, it is fully wet now, and this is going to make life very difficult. Down into Stowe Corner they come, and the car's going to be slipping and sliding all over the place. They're dealing with it very well so far, I have to say. Not seeing too many incidents. But uh, the little Chevron going well, but being passed there up on the inside. And that's uh, another good move being made. Uh, John Spears, no, it isn't John Spears, sorry, just heading up. Uh, that was the, the Tay Deck, I yeah. think, uh, yes. Um, it certainly looked like the number of John Spears, but uh, through the gloom. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's the number two car. It's got 96 on it, yes. but it is actually the number, you can see it's got a number two on it as well. So you're right, that's it is the Tay Deck of Tim De Silva. And he's being chased by Tom Bradshaw, yeah. isn't he? And we know Tom's quick in the wet. He's got a, an almost perfect car for these conditions. So, oh. But he goes wide. There we are. I've said it again. <laughs> twice I've talked about Tom Bradshaw. Twice he's gone off the track. The commentator's curse. Yeah, very effective yeah. again there, Alison. Oh, and a spin uh, for one of the, uh, the two-litre cars. That's the 47 car. Chris has had Fox. A spin. Chris Fox there. Yeah, the Lola T280. Well, I'm not surprised. I mean, the amount of rain that is falling here now at, at absolutely changing the pace 
completely now. They are suddenly lapping about eight to ten seconds slower. I think it's going to be even more slow. I've just seen a car in the gravel at the exit of the club. I think we're going to see a, a, see a red flag. We're definitely going to see a safety car. There you are. That's the car I've just seen go off on the exit of club. Car number 99. That's Nicholas Chester in another Lola T70, deeply buried in the gravel. And this could lead to a red flag or certainly a, a safety car period, I would think, because it is dreadful out there right now. Full rain and uh, everybody hiding under huge umbrellas trying to stay dry. But uh, it's all right if you're in a Lola T70, I suppose. At least you've got cockpit over the top of you. Safety car is in action now. No great surprise. A bit hard on uh, Alex Brundle, who'd opened up a 15-second lead before this period happened. Very impressive few laps. Even in the wet, his lap times were blindingly quick, to be honest. But uh, he is Oh, now... he's gone off. Oh! Big, big slide for Alex Brundle. Just pure aquaplaning. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. what that is. At. That is what aquaplaning is when there is simply no grip at all. You are floating across the surface of the water. And that's going past the Lola that had presumably done much the same thing. Much the same, yeah. And that, that's why the officials have uh, decided to neutralise this race because it doesn't matter how good you are. And we know Alex Brundle is one of the best. Uh, when you hit uh, standing water like that, there's nothing you can do. And uh, we can see Alex going past our commentary box now. It's just a, a, a white dot in a very grey scene. And uh, another car off, uh, and another one going off, and I hope that can turn before. And it uh, looks like Gary Culver, that is, backwards off in the gravel. Oh, at, uh, red flag. And Yeah, that's unsurprising. No, I know. Well, they've got to go and pick all these cars up now. They've got to get them out the gravel traps. Another oh. one. Don't find another one had gone off as well. The Tay deck coming across the grass, and that was the... Uh, car we saw spin earlier actually having another spin just look at the amount of water over there i mean it's like a river again we saw this yesterday at one stage and it, it look floating around alex brundle's car even he's going so slowly but it's still aquaplaning at very slow speeds remember they went out on slicks uh, it was dry uh, so are they on slicks or are they on treaded tires these cars because they're on older cars aren't they so i think they may be on treaded tires but they weren't uh, they, they would have been theory thinking they were going in a dry setup so they could have been quite worn treaded tires not full grip tires necessarily uh, and that clearly is leading to a lot of aquaplaning as a result but uh, yeah he's actually being waved past i don't quite understand why because he is the race leader i think because it's a red flag oh, i see uh, then, now they don't uh, have to follow the safety car they're, yeah. they're just getting them back to the pit lane now uh, and uh, the safety car will continue around just to ensure that nobody is in any doubt that the race has been being stopped. Poor mechanics out in the rain there. <laughs> James Beckett has just messaged me, uh, thanks James, saying hardly any rain at Cops, really? <laughs> well, it says raining very hard down this side of the track. Um, and I have to say, it looks pretty awful in most places with a lot of rain all over the place. But uh, Motorsport Marshall texted me to say the same thing. Dry at Cops. Yeah. There is Cops. Well, there, yeah. Look at yeah. that. It is pretty much dry. You're right, James and uh, Motorsport Marshall. Thank you. How is that? You know, that is just strange. Look how dry it is there and how wet it is down at this section of the track. We're in two counties, I know, here at Silverstone, but nonetheless... That is pretty impressive, the difference between one part, one specific part of the lap and another, uh, where you're literally floating along. And you can see why, because you can see that almost a bow wave in front of the front wheel there as the camera panned right in close to, uh, to the front of that Chevron B8. And there is our leader, Alex Brundle, just tippy-toeing his way back to the pit lane. Our cameraman at Cox has just confirmed to our, our uh, production guys that it, they've had no rain there. The camera, the cameraman up at Cops, he's still got his sun cream on. <laughs> Fantastic. And it's just amazing that one particular corner, there has been no rain whatsoever, where we've got flooding going on to just about every other section of the circuit. Well, that's a, a shot of Gary Culver. Now, that's good news that he's got out of that gravel because he was backwards in the gravel. I think that was at the exit of Aintree, but uh, difficult to tell in the rain. But uh, he's back on track again, so... There's the dry bit. <laughs> yeah, at least some of our cars... I think the cars have brought the water up, actually. I think it's their tyres that are bringing some of the water up to that section. That's, yeah. the, that's the one that was well buried in the gravel. 
looking quite gloomy, isn't it, in some parts of the track, all the rain on the cameras as well. Um, I have to say that the rain has eased off a little bit where we are. It was battering down on our commentary box a moment ago. Now, at least I can hear myself speak. Um, it's not battering down quite as heavily, but it is still raining hard, as you can see, down at this section. And we've got rivers around. Uh, that's the Hamilton Strait, of course, the start-finish uh, area. You can see some little patches where it's not quite so wet, but standing water is really quite deep in other areas. So there's definitely going to be a bit of a pause. Remember, we've still got this race to complete and another tonight. <laughs> so uh, that could be a challenge. The, the sky bright in some areas, but still pretty gloomy in others. Oh, it's hard to predict. And not everybody's wearing waterproofs, I'm afraid. <laughs> Some people are looking rather damp down there in the pits as they try and decide whether to change tyres. Number 163 car there. That's uh, Roderick Jack, driven Chevron B8, another one of the pretty Chevrons. Well, he's staying dry, even if the guy's working on the car or not. Uh, arms folded in the sort of sign to the team that I am not getting out of this car. Absolutely. I'm staying in the dry. Although racing cars generally aren't terribly dry inside, are they, Ben? They, uh, they tend to no. leak terribly. That's the Sandy Watson-owned Chevron B8, driven by Martin O'Connell. I wouldn't be surprised if Sandy uh, asked Martin to do the whole <laughs> race. He's, uh, he's not one for going out in wet conditions. Uh, and Martin will obviously do that often do the whole race. As we see the 96... Uh, no, that, that's the that's number the two deck, car, isn't it? Yeah, yeah that's, that's the, the confusing yeah, one. They're obviously again. running the old, it probably yeah. ran with that number back in the day. Yeah. But he's actually entered as uh, car number two, so it is a slightly confusing one there. There's a 35 car still making its way back. That's a, a Chevron B8 boat. <laughs> Indeed. That's Chris Lillington Price making his way back rather slowly. And if you're in an open cockpit car, there's nothing worse than sitting in the pit lane in the pouring rain. When you're driving at speed, you don't kind of notice the rain in quite the same way. But um, I'm glad to say that they've managed to find an umbrella to protect our man there. And all the cars are making their way back into the pits as the rain does begin to ease off. I'm glad to say it is still raining where we are, but not as hard as it was a few minutes ago. So we're getting this very patchy rain here today. Um, we've been quite lucky through most of the afternoon, but now a real downpour has uh, brought in this red flag. So we will have to see what race control decide to do. They are going to have to pause for a little while. They've got a few cars to rescue from the gravel traps, first of all. Get them free, get them clear. In the meantime, if the rain eases off, hopefully that standing water will begin to drain. I have to say that the circuit does drain well. It's just the sheer amount of water when you get a heavy shower like that. Uh, it, it can't all go straight away. So this is how the race began. So it was pretty much dry. Well, it was dry when they started the race. And we saw a great getaway from Alex Brundle, who led away from that pole position with Ollie Bryant, not quite getting off the line as effectively. But watch Tom Bradshaw, the little car running third, as they went up uh, through Abbey, OK, but as they went through Farm and then towards the village, it went a bit wrong. Let's just watch that car in third place. Let's see what happens here. Oh, it was a bit further round, wasn't it? Sorry, yes, my mistake. Brooklyn's where it went wrong, wasn't it? He was attacking still uh, as they went through uh, the loop and up towards entry was the next section of track where it all went a little bit wrong uh, for Tom Bradshaw. And he's charging away. Alex Brundle certainly made a very good getaway, didn't he? Pulling away straight uh, down the Wellington straight towards Brooklyn's. Now watch out for Tom Bradshaw. Breaks late. Has a little look down the inside. Doesn't quite work for him. And then when the next shot is, we see him spinning backwards having not made the corner, thankfully avoided by everybody else and very quickly rejoining the fray, but that did drop him down a bit further than he had been hoping. And uh, he tried to fight his way back from that position. And certainly when it started raining, he did make up some ground, but we'll have to see what they decide to do with the grid. The grid will line up, no doubt, a lap or two, a lap before the red flag comes out, so there'll be some people who will miss out, some people who will gain as a result of that. But Alex Brundle, was in a class of his own to be honest and and when it started raining he was still in a class of his own he was still putting in some very impressive lap times indeed uh, but we've got a great spread of cars and um, we shall see how it all works now 
I notice the safety car is out on track at the moment, probably, probably doing a bit of an inspection, to be honest, as well as supporting the marshals who are trying to recover those lost cars that have ended up in the gravel. It's still pretty good up at Cops. Uh, that's the place to be. If you're spectating up there, you chose the right spot. No doubt about it. Um, <laughs> for those of you who chose a rather wet patch, well, I hope you managed to dry out this evening. A uh, long day here at Silverstone, but with some great entertainment and still some more entertainment, both uh, beside the track as well as on the track. We've still got another big race coming up later once this one is finished. And also live music playing this evening as well. Aswad uh, starting off their gig at 10 past 8. And uh, the brand new heavies as well. They've got a, a later gig going on. The old style of putting wheels on cars with the big hammer. Always fun to see. That looks to be uh, Ollie Bryant's team doing the work on that. And uh, just that great big tool that's been specially made for the job, which they then hit with a big hammer. It's a little bit agricultural, isn't it? And that's undoing the wheel, I think. or is, No, that's doing it up because it's the left-hand wheel. It uses a reverse thread on it. Uh, so just tightening the wheels. I think it uh, looks like the fully treaded tyres, which we were talking about earlier, that they're putting on. And uh, that's the 99 Lola T70 finally been recovered out of the gravel. Yeah, that's good news. I don't think there's any damage, as long as the, uh, the gravel hasn't hurt it. So while we're waiting for this race to get back underway, let's take you back through some of the highlights of today's great action at the Classic.
road to freedom. Japan quality. Yokohama. Check the oil and the water and the tyre pressures regularly. Give it a polish, make sure it's all shiny. I service the car once a year and I always do it myself. I enjoy the, the mixture of exercise. I think some of the things I eat help to keep myself healthy and my brain healthy. Or even just meeting up with a friend and having a chat. We're still waiting for the race to be restarted for the Masters Historic Sports Cars. Uh, heavy rain shower has certainly uh, put everybody on the back foot. But um, the cars that went off into the gravel, I think, have all now been rescued. I noticed there are marshals down on the Hamilton Strait. Safety car is down there. Uh, so they're doing a bit of inspection. It looks as though the track is drying up, it's draining quite quickly. There are a few areas where there are still some relatively deep, deep puddles, but it does it is draining pretty fast. And with a bit of luck, we might see the cars back out relatively soon. And we can see a few cars actually down at the end of the pit lane already. So clearly they must have been told to start getting ready. Engines are firing up, drivers are back in cars. And although we've not seen anything on our timing screens to indicate when the race is restarting, it does look quite promising, doesn't it? So hopefully we are going to see a bit more action soon. And uh, we're going to see some of these beautiful sports cars back out. Now the grid, I'm afraid I haven't got in front of me because it's going to be presumably worked out on uh, the positions of the cars before that red flag came out. We'll have a little look and see whether there is uh, something that's been set up. Uh, they may be told what to do. So we'll just have to see whether they uh, get a full distance back again. Yes, red flag normally means you go back a lap to the result of the previous lap in terms of setting the grid position. 
So we'll just have to see whether that is the case um, here for the, the grid lineup. It's unlikely to be the original grid position because they had done a, a decent stint um, in that first part before the rain started to fall heavily and everybody started getting into trouble. Uh, and of course, it's fair to go back a lap because several of them were spinning off on that key lap when the red flag came out. So it would be rather unfair on them to suddenly find themselves down at the back of the grid. Number 31 car of Rory and Patrick Jack. That's another of the Lola T70s uh, waiting to go back out on circuit. Rather pretty livery on that one, isn't it? And behind them is the yellow 24 Chevron that we were talking about earlier. And I wonder if quite a few of the teams have swapped their drivers around by now. They may well have done. They may have decided let's change drivers uh, for the second stint because it's likely the second stint will be a shortened version. Originally, this was due to be a 50-minute race. I think it's going to be shortened. I think drivers may well have been asked to swap uh, if that's what they're doing. Many drivers are staying in the cars, of course, but there are quite a few that are swapping with teammates. I think it's quite likely that swap will have been made now for the second part of this race. The number 58 machine there. Uh, that is the Sean Lynn Andrew Haddon Lola. T70. And it does sound as if everyone's getting ready, so I think they must have had a message to say that we are going to be restarting this race soon. Engines warming up. But I am seeing still a safety car out on the straight, not moving yet. So we're certainly not going to see them out immediately. Weather-wise, we've still got a fair bit of cloud around, but it has not been raining uh, hard for a while. There's the odd spit of rain still in the air. Uh, just looking out of our window now, there's just the odd drop. And still the umbrellas are still out there, but it's nothing like as heavy as it was earlier. we are going to see these cars onto the circuit once again very soon another race still to come up after this one a big race too which we are all looking forward to uh, with some more great classic cars entered into it and that is the Royal Automobile Club Woodcote and Sterling Moss Trophies race with a very big entry indeed which we'll be looking into shortly GT40 is heading the field at the exit of the pits. It might not have been heading the field when they were going around, but they are being told to go out. That's lovely to see, the green flag at the end of the pit lane. So they are being told to go out. They will head around, do a lap, presumably uh, meet the safety car at the line, and then probably do another lap. I imagine they may well be given two formation laps now to get a good feel for the wetter track. Well, it's not wetter than it was when they were given a red flag, but certainly wetter than it was when they started the original attempt. And we saw Alex Brundle with a very good margin of lead, but of course he's now had to throw that away as the, the grid will all come together once again. It's going to make life quite interesting. Good to see the cars heading out onto the track, though, and a chance for the drivers, particularly the second drivers, uh, many of them having swapped over, I'm sure, to get their opportunity. We should see, for example, Tiffany Dell, I think, will now be out in the number 96 McLaren M1B, for example. Um, he'll be one to keep an eye on. Keith Arlers will be out in his uh, Cooper Monaco King Cobra by now, because I think uh, his teammate Billy Bellinger was uh, doing the first stint. So a number of uh, quick drivers. Some drivers, of course, are just staying in their cars and not stopping at all. Lockie should be out, by the way, in the Chevron B8 that he's sharing with Julian Thomas. And uh, Callum's experienced quite a few different conditions and different cars here today already. So let's hope that he can make the most of this situation as well. Now, I would imagine they will have been informed on their grid positions. It's always a little bit difficult, particularly when you're sending the cars out of the pits, to get everybody into the correct order um, so that is something that is going to be a little bit of a challenge. I wonder how they're going to sort that exactly. I think that's still Alex Brundle in the 23. Oh, right. okay. uh, so I mean, they haven't swapped everybody then? I can't be sure, but it no. looked as though he had some uh, colours on the side of the helmet. And uh, Gary Pearson uh, uses a, an all-white helmet. I notice on the screens, it looks like it's a 20-minute stint. Um, it's being shown on our timing screens that it's going to be a 20-minute uh, stint 
for this second part of the race by the look of it. Uh, so I guess I, whether they have insisted that you've done that the pit stop has been made or not, we haven't had clarification just yet. But uh, it would have made sense to me that they would have said to everybody, right, well, this is effectively your pit stop. If you need to change drivers, this is... But, of course, you don't have to. You, it might be that his yeah. teammate said, no, you finish the That's race. That's right, absolutely. It's not, they're not obliged no. just because they say they're going to change. They don't have to. And I, I mentioned earlier that very often uh, Sandy Watson, who owns the car, will actually uh, say to Martin O'Connell, you just do the rest of the race. Yeah. What they're doing now is they're holding the cars at Club Corner and the marshals have got the quite tricky job of finding the right cars to put through to the head of the grid. They normally do this in the paddock and uh, pre-grid them, so they come out in the right order. Um, but uh, the marshals are really going to earn their money uh, doing this. Or no, um, earn their they're money? Not paid. What money? Yeah, they're <laughs> they're volunteers. Earn their sandwiches. Uh, because uh, it really is uh, quite tough to do this on the hoof out on the grid. But you can see there they've got the Brundle Pearson car up to the head, and it looks like we're going to have effectively a safety car start because yeah. they're going to run, they're putting them in line rather than left and right on the grid. Uh, but the rest of the field making their way round. Yeah, sometimes you've got to kind of guess roughly where you are. Uh, if you know you're in the middle, then you wait for quite a few cars to come past. If you know you're at the back, you just wait down there at the lower end. If you, you know you were somewhere near the front, you might as well go past and see what the marshals tell you to do. As you can see, it might, it's going to take a few minutes to get these cars into the correct order. Um, hopefully some of the drivers have a, a reasonable idea of where they should be. Are you next? Yes, you're next. So the marshals have certainly been given a, a line-up of the correct order and they are beginning to put them into position but it's a lot of cars remember we, we had 38 cars i'm not sure if all 38 will still be running bearing in mind we ended up with a few in the gravel trap etc but uh still got well over 30 cars to line up in a particular order and then they'll be going into a 20 minute race and we saw the uh, Chevron B8 there of Julian Thomas and Callum Lockie being lined up and uh, one being brought out of the line to be shuffled up a little bit uh, and there is the Martin O'Connell Sandy Watson car and uh, I was desperately trying to peer in on the camera shot in the pit lane to see whether it's still Martin in the car. There's the funny car that's num actually number two but it's got number 96 on the side of it as well that keeps confusing us that's the Taydeck Mark III in the Marco class it's Tim De Silva who is driving that and that's moving so into position so the, it's a bit, bit like parking at Tesco's, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> other supermarkets are available, but the, uh, the, the Lola T70 being asked to move into a sort of parallel parking situation, not something you do very often in those sorts of cars. The rear visibility is virtually nil. Uh, and uh, now we've got the Lenham coming around. That's the Jackson family car. Oh, we yes. mentioned uh, Cameron Jackson earlier. This is his brother, Dominic, and father, Simon, who are sharing the Lenham. Then we've got the Claridge Gomez car uh, coming up to the line that looks like James Claridge's helmet I think okay and one of the chevrons yeah another loader moving into position as well then the McLaren M1 and I think Tiff ah, is in the car yeah that that's is his definitely helmet, Tiff. isn't it yeah definitely Tiff and uh, John Spears started it didn't yeah, he? he did. so that that's definitely a driver change so Tiff Dell we're talking about uh, in that uh, McLaren down uh, in that group it's car number 96 so keep your eyes out for that one but you look at how some of the windscreens are steaming up we saw a driver just now trying to wipe his windscreen and oh, that makes life so so difficult and uh, when you're sitting still there's just no way it's going to clear up you hope once you get going a bit of airflow will help but it doesn't always work very well so that is not fun getting that misty windscreen uh, it might have stopped raining and I have to say the water is draining very quickly from that straight just looking out from our perspective now um, We haven't got that much standing water except on the very inside line by the pit wall But that's an area that they don't tend to to run down anyway And as we've seen they are going to be doing at least one lap behind the safety car Maybe a couple of laps to get a full picture on the state of the track Alex Brundle still De in the yeah. car definitely Alex Brundle Yes, yeah. we can see the, uh, the, the the Brundle colors on his helmet. So Gary Pearson has said you take the car for the second part as well. Makes sense. Alex, who's had a great deal of success in sports cars, uh, he won the European Le Mans Series LMP3 class uh, back in 2016. In 2020, he was second in the LMP2 class of the European Le Mans Series. So Alex 
you know, he's had a really good GT sports car career and he's showing his talent here today with that fantastic lead he built up early on. Um, now he's going to have to do it all over again. Um, the car behind him is that of Ollie Bryant, another very experienced driver who comes from a, a racing family, uh, driving all sorts of different cars that the family own. And, and then further down, the, there is, uh, that, that is the number 16 car uh, of Chris Jolly and Steve Farthing. That's a Cooper Monaco, a very pretty machine. 35, another of the uh, B8s, that's Chris Lillingston Price in the bright red machine. Marshals are gradually getting these cars into the correct positions. It is a tricky one, though, because um, do you have the engine running or not? Do you sometimes need some assistance to fire up from your support team in the paddock? Everybody taking their time. It's a very awkward situation, and uh, hopefully we'll get it sorted out pretty quickly, but it's not easy when you've got such a big grid. Well, we saw Graham Edelman uh, driving that car earlier on, the 57 car and uh, now it's Andy Willis so that's another car that's changed driver uh, and uh, I'm a bit worried well, I mean yeah. that steam probably is okay it's probably just the amount of uh, rainwater that's on the yeah. radiator that's yeah. actually steaming but the problem is if you leave the engines running because you're waiting 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 for everybody to catch up remember most uh, racing cars do not have cooling systems that work when it's sitting still uh, the fans are not usually in racing cars they cool when they're moving so it can be a bit of a worry if you're just sitting with the engine running for a long time it can end up overheating so many of these cars will be able to fire up on their own uh, so they can turn them off that's Faye Crook one of our senior marshals here at Silverstone working very hard yeah. and also uh, marshals the start line at Goodwood as well oh, it's doing a great job of getting people into their positions here and hopefully we will be seeing this race get underway soon. It is going to be a 20 minute second half, effectively, for the uh, Masters Historic Sports Cars. These Le Mans racers from the 1960s through to the 1970s on a track that has started off dry, got absolutely deluged by a very heavy rain shower. At the moment, the rain has eased off and uh, there's the odd spit of rain, but uh, nothing too serious. Cloud around us, so it's still a bit unpredictable. It doesn't look to me as though we've got a, a hefty rain cloud above us as we had um, when the race originally started. Still a few cars to get positioned, though. Yeah, it's a big field, isn't it? They're, they're uh, struggling with some of the ones towards the back. beginning to clear the area they're getting people fired up I think they're gonna start them running pretty soon get your doors closed guys yep there's a there's a, an open door and the Lola T70 gets closed back down and I think we're getting ready to go and so the, uh, the GT40 there the lights came on on the very outside of the circuit we uh, looks like we've got a little interesting uh, grid. Yeah, isn't a little it? punch there. Who <laughs> look like they're arguing? Well, I'm in front. No, I'm in front. No, I'm going to be in front. <laughs> it looks like they're all having a bit of an argument in the middle there, doesn't yeah. it? But uh, hopefully they will uh, sort themselves out once the safety car moves away. They just need a bit of space now. Yeah. That's uh, Tom Bradshaw in the maroon car, second left, the blue car on the left. Then Tom Bradshaw. Then and we know he's quick in the wet as we he was in qualifying. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'll repeat what I said earlier that Martin O'Connell, if he's still in the car, which I suspect he will be, uh, on the right hand side in the dark blue uh, Chevron V8 with the orange nose, Martin is very quick in the wet, despite that being a two litre car. Here we go then, the safety car sets off, and uh, we are going to see the guys uh, behind all managing to get. A lap or two, I wonder how long the safety car is. They'll do at least one lap behind the safety car, maybe two, to get a feel for track conditions. But as you can see, it has drained quite well on that section. You've got a bit of a, a drier line with still the odd little river stream running across. But fundamentally, the drainage works well. Over to the right there, as you look at it near the pit wall, there is quite uh, deep water to a certain extent, but that is not an area that you normally drive on. So hopefully, they can avoid that section. Let's have a look as they go around the lap then. We'll check out the track conditions as they head around. There is certainly a bit of spray being chucked up. So that is the entry into Abbey that we're seeing from our commentary box uh, window. Again, not too much standing water through the corner itself, but obviously the curves are all now very slippery again. So 
put a wheel over the white line onto a curve, you're going to end up with a real problem. Down the Wellington Strait, and again, not too much standing water. There is the odd puddle there. Um, but you can see how the, the light is gradually diminishing. I mean, we are still in uh, glorious British summertime, but the light will be beginning to dip away. We've still got another race to go after this one, quite a long race. Uh, they will be running into the dusk. I hope that they can run the full length. Uh, they're due to run till 9 o'clock, as long as it doesn't get too dark by that point. Everybody weaving around, getting a little bit of tyre temperature up now. And getting a feel for how much grip is available to them. Alex Brundle mastered the conditions, both dry and wet, earlier on. Even though the car then aquaplaned just as the red flag came out. Uh, but he did survive that aquaplaning moment. It ran in very, very wide indeed. Down towards Cops, which has actually been the driest bit. There is actually some water down there, a little bit on the track now, but nothing like as much water on this section as we saw everywhere else. The gravel around the outside that has been kicked up throughout the course of the various races so far today. Lovely to see some of you guys still in the grandstands. Give us a wave. <laughs> um, you're still there. You're still enjoying the show. You haven't given up, and it's lovely to see you uh, on the, in the grandstands on the outside of Woodcote and enjoying what we shall see is another uh, fantastic battle, I hope. Although Alex Brundle definitely had a big speed advantage when we saw this race get underway. Oliver Bryant, so Ollie Bryant also right up there as well. And uh, looks as though starting in third place is going to be the uh, number 81 car. Um, so it's likely to be Simon Hatchfield in that car now because I think they will have changed over. Uh, then it's Gary Culver in the number 95 car. Now, where is uh, Tiff Needell starting from? He's down in 20th place, according to the timing screen we've got in front of us now. So Tiff has got a fair bit of work to do. Keith Arlers will be starting down in 24th position. Plenty of work to do there as well. And actually, the clock was started. OK, thanks for pointing that out, Alistair. Yeah, it's on the screen as well. The clock started as soon as the safety car took them away. So although they're not racing yet, the 20 minutes um, is ticking away and it's taken them nearly well it's taken them three and a half minutes to get to get everybody going and come around and complete a lap and they've got at least one more lap behind the safety car this makes sense to me that they have got another lap behind the safety car i think they will then get released at the end of this lap uh, which will mean they've got about 13 minutes of racing i would think uh, to take us to the checkered flag so we're still going to get some entertaining stuff just a question of who's going to master these conditions better um, i'm definitely going to be keeping a bit of an eye on tom bradshaw he is actually due to start down in ninth place i think now that things have settled back you'll see that tom has dropped back a bit yeah he's going to be starting in ninth place it's the lolas that are uh, dominating up front at the moment the lola t70s a whole bunch of them as they head on around we've also got uh, the lola t280 is is quite well up that's the nick uh, pink car who I think has now taken over from Chris Fox. But as you can see, the, the closed coupe cars, those are the Lola T70s. Um, then you've got the open car of Nick Pink, just in behind them. He's running in a fifth place. And then in sixth place is the, uh, the number 115 uh, car. Uh, that is John Emberson in his Chevron B26. So he's a part of that group as well. Yep, so it's the orange colored car just in there. And then uh, we've got the Tadek of Tim De Silva. So he is in seventh place. Martin O'Connell next up. We think he's in the car now. And he will be a, a, a bit of a one to watch. And then it's Tom Bradshaw, the little red, sort of maroon red car with the white stripe. Keep an eye on Tom because we know he's very quick. He had that spin in the earlier stint of the race. But now the field is all closed up. I think he's going to have a good chance of potentially getting himself back to a podium finish. Let's see whether he can actually achieve that. Callum Lockie is starting in 12th place in the Chevron that he's sharing with uh, with Jamie, so with Julian rather. So uh, Julian ran it earlier on. It's in 12th place for the restart here. And then, as I mentioned, Tiffany Dell, he'll be starting down in 19th place in that McLaren M1B. That must be quite a, a tricky car to drive. Open top car, quite a powerful machine, but one of the early McLaren sports cars. And uh, we'll see how Tiff copes with that. But he has great car control, of course, and I'm sure he'll have a thoroughly enjoyable time. So we are hoping to see the lights go out on the safety car. It usually happens around this area if they're going to turn them off uh, on this lap. 
and then it will be down to Alex Brundle. Well, the lights are still on at the moment. I'm not seeing any sign of the safety car being released yet. So maybe race control is insisting on at least one more lap. And it does look that way to me. No, the clock is still ticking away. Yeah, safety car is still out there. Uh, we're going to see at least one more lap behind the safety car before we go to full race. So that's a bit of a shame, but I guess with the conditions as they are, race control taking a, a sensible approach here because the drivers need to get a real feel for the amount of grip that's available. Visibility as well is going to be demanding. Windscreen wipers are on, windscreens are misting up on the inside and that makes life pretty difficult. So at least one more lap behind safety car. We'll keep an eye on the timing screens. Hopefully we'll get a message to say safety car in at the end of this lap. And that will give us probably a 10 minute race, which will take us uh, through to about five past eight. It does mean that the final race of the day is likely to be a little bit shortened. It was due to start at 10 past eight. So hopefully it won't be too far behind. But that's also going to have some pretty challenging conditions, isn't it? The track will definitely be wet no matter what. Uh, it's not going to be fully dry after just 10 minutes of these guys heading around. Um, so we'll have to see how that does. Ah, right. Just had the message on our screens that the safety car in on this lap. So it will be coming in, but there's still a little way to go. There you are. Confirmation coming up. The safety car will be coming in and Alex Brundle will then be released um, and allowed to go for it with Ollie Bryant chasing him. Simon Hadfield right behind as well. And, uh, and then behind them, we've got Sean Lynn in another of the Lolas. So we'll see how uh, these guys respond to rather different conditions. Which cars are going to be quick in the wet? Which cars are going to be struggling somewhat? And we do think, once again, that Tom Bradshaw will be able to move up from ninth position, but whether he's going to have the pace to really catch up and get amongst the Lolas again is another question. There is the, uh, the number 115 car. That is John Emerson in his lovely Chevron B26 in the Stromelen Pass. Uh, the open sports prototypes under 2000cc, conforming to a specification between 1972 and 1974. We've got all these different categories, you see, in this uh, uh, race of the different sports cars, the open or sports prototypes, the GT cars, the, their engine capacities is a major part of the, each of those, and the age as well, whether it's an earlier car, 1966 to 69, for example, or some of the later cars, 72 to 74. That 74 is the end point. Um, the the, the uh, most recent cars in this category are 1974. So, lights out on the safety car. We will ge be getting some racing underway in just a few moments' time. Uh, and the safety car is disappearing into the distance. And Alex Brundle is sort of going with the safety car. Uh, I hope that Ollie Bryant catches up. I think he will do as they head down. They've still got a little bit of the lap to complete here. Down through Stowe, and then they've got a short straight. The dip at Vale into the final left, right, and we will go racing again. So Alex Brundle is setting the pace, and he's already picking up the speed, actually. He really has gone for the restart, sensibly enough, and immediately gets on the power, and the race restarts with 10 and a half minutes to go. Alex Brundle leads the way is as the Masters Historic Sports Car get back into race action. Chased by Ollie Bryant, Hadfield in third place, Lynn in fourth, and then the rest of them filing through. Now, you can see the amount of spray does make visibility tricky indeed. Tom Bradshaw coming through next. He's still in ninth place. Couldn't overtake, of course, until he went over the line. And it's through this tight and twisty section that he might have a bit of an edge. So we'll see whether he closes up. But the Lolas up front are pulling away. Alex on the wide line, trying to find a little bit more grip. But I have to say, Ollie Bryant staying with him so far. Yes, Ollie Bryant made a very good start. He was quite a way behind Alex at the, at the start at the bottom end of the circuit. But now they're coming in towards the Brooklands and uh, Luffield section. He's closed up a little bit. Then it's uh, the Baton car with uh, we may be Simon Hadfield on board. We don't know, or it could be still Chris Baton. But uh, yeah, Ollie Bryant really going very well indeed in these tricky conditions. Now this side of the circuit, Ben, is not dry, but it's nowhere near as wet, is it? And then they turn through Cops Corner and start to move up towards the wetter part of the track. Yeah, they do. Um, so let's see how this goes. Yeah, they can run through Cops pretty quickly, can't they? Um, it's just definitely not too wet. And in fact, Alex makes full use of that by rushing through there and running a touch wide um, and setting some 
good set to times at this stage, although actually that first set to by Bryant was impressive as well. These two are pulling away from the remainder, um, and we'll see if there are any changes going on behind. No big leaps up as yet. I think everybody's still adapting to this slightly revised circuit, which uh, was so wet when the red flags came out. It has dried out a little bit, but it's still very, very slippery in potential. The gap between them, close, look at that, less than a second. 0.769 of a second, the gap between Brundle and Bryant at this moment. They are heading, oh, bit of a slide from Ollie there in second place. Back end of the Lola, got away from him just a touch. He controlled it well, but it cost him a little bit. I think the gap may have gone up a touch. These guys are putting on a wonderful display. Over the curbs goes Alex. Don't get too carried away. Uh, he was pushing on hard, and it's best to stay off the curbs in the wet like this. But Ollie Bryant's giving him a bit of pressure. There's no doubt about it. In the dry earlier, Alex had quite a big advantage with his car. But in the wet, he hasn't quite got the same level of advantage, although he is now beginning to open that gap up. Ollie Bryant was the faster of the pair, though, on the whole lap by about four tenths of a second. Fastest lap, therefore, for him at this stage. Now, Bradshaw's moving up. He's got up into sixth place. Tom Bradshaw, we, we reckon he might be going well in these conditions. And sure enough, uh, although he's away back from the leaders, Bradshaw will now be chasing after the car of um, the number 47 car of, of Nick Pink, who is now in the car that Chris Fox drove earlier. There, there is Tom Bradshaw just going through the loop and through entry. And he's now also, yeah, he's chasing uh, down number 58 now, so he's gaining more time. He's going after Sean Lynn. So actually, uh, he is making great progress. He has actually got into fifth place, so the classification will be updated in a moment. This is where he had to spin earlier, but this time he's dealing with it very well. Yes, he needed to do a bit of a correction there as he came into Brooklands, but look at the gap. He's closing in on the Sean Lynn green Lola T70. They're both taking that wide line out through Woodcut now and along the pit straight, the, uh, the heritage pits, and uh, Bradshaw's going to get this, I think, at Cops Corner, although he's going to lose out on top speed down the straight, but I think he'll be able to break later into Cops, and he does, and he slides through on the inside. So that's another place taken for Tom Bradshaw. That takes him up to fourth place uh, behind the three leading Lola T70s of, we know it's Alex Brundle, we know it's Ollie Bryant, we don't know who's driving the orange uh, Lola T70, it was certainly Chris Baton to start, but uh, whether Simon Hadfield has taken over or left it with the owner of the car, we don't know. Well, whatever it is, I do think we need to keep watching Tom because he's flying along. Look at this, great performance in the number 43 car. This is uh, the Chevron B19. Uh, it's not as powerful as some, it's a lightweight car as well, but it's going well in these tricky conditions. There's our race leader, that is Alex Brundle, who still leads, but there's not much between him and Ollie Bryant. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Brundle is a fraction quicker on that lap. Uh, actually, that was a decent lap. He did a 218.0 as opposed to a 219.4 for Ollie Bryant. So that has allowed Brundle a gap of 2.3 seconds as his advantage. Uh, these two well clear of the third place car, which we believe is Simon Hadfield driving. Tom Bradshaw now in fourth, but he's got eight seconds uh, to make up between himself and Hadfield. So whether he can get a podium out of this, Five minutes and 20 seconds to go. I still think Tom could well uh, put some pressure on it, but he was only about two seconds faster on that last lap. Mind you, he was doing some overtaking. So we'll get a clearer picture, I think, on this next lap as to the outright pace that Tom has got. And in the meantime, we're seeing a few changes further down the order as well. So that's the third place car. We believe it's Simon Hadfield in it now. It, it does look like Simon's helmet, but uh, it's, uh, we haven't really seen a close-up of him yet, but uh, white with red and blue flashes. Uh, here's Tom Bradshaw, we know it's him in the 43 Chevron, and he comes into the left-hander at Brooklands, closing up all the time. Uh, it's, uh, showing on our graphic there, 8.8 .8 seconds between the two of them. I like his helmet design too, very distinctive uh, helmet design for Tom Bradshaw the old style in a way but also with a modern touch so uh, yeah lovely to see and he's really putting down some great laps here at the moment let's see whether he can close that gap up enough though to, to put some pressure on the Simon Hadfield hasn't got the straight line speed but he's certainly got the ordinary speed at this stage further down the order um, Tiffany Dollar I think has been able to make much progress he's still in 90 uh, position 
but uh, actually going quite quick through the first sector compared to the car he's following, so he may well be able to close that gap quite quickly. That is a much earlier car, though, isn't it, Ben? Uh, it is, he's yes. in, so it's not really competitive, certainly not with these front runners anyway, but uh, Tiff's uh, skills... The 1965 car, yeah. and he's up against, you know, there are cars here from 1974, so, yeah. as you yeah. say, it's a big, big difference, almost a decade. Absolutely. As, uh, Tom Bradshaw comes down into Stoke Corner and they're uh, trying to close the gap on this car which is just going into club and uh, through the left now into the right nice line there just uh, not too wide and out onto the Hamilton straight we should see Bradshaw appear at the back of our shot now coming out of club there he is coming onto the straight goes across the timing line the gap between Bradshaw and Hadfield is now 5.8 that's about three seconds yeah. quicker on that lap uh, and thank you for the graphic that confirms <laughs> what I've just said you're only what uh, 34,000 oh, out okay very good well oh. done Alistair. yeah the gap is coming down and Bradshaw is definitely on the chase but out in front Alex Brundle is uh, the man in command as he was in the early stages this uh, super GT driver, and it doesn't matter whether it's modern cars or historic cars. He, he just looks so at home in machinery like this, and he has pulled out that gap of 3.1 seconds over Ollie Bryant in second position. But it's the battle for third that we're really keeping an eye on here. This man is fourth, currently chasing this car here, which is currently in third place. And the gap is gradually being uh, whittled down, but not by huge margin. I think he's taken uh, a little bit more. He's taken about six tenths out of the first sector. Is that going to be enough, though? Because when they come around next time, they will be going on to a final lap. Yeah, it's not long, really, for Tom Bradshaw to close this gap. But the, the middle sector is very long, isn't it? So we'll see at the end of this one whether he's managed to take a few more seconds out of the orange Lola T70 as it goes up. Uh, that could be a beautiful summer's evening, couldn't it? You wouldn't know that it had rained, except there's a little bit of spray coming off the back of the car as he goes through the left-hander at Maggots into Beckett's now, just clips the kerb there. Doesn't want to take too much kerb because it'll be very slippy with the rain that's fallen. And uh, through Beckett's and Bradshaw taking that wide, wide wet oh, line that he lovely. uses right to the edge of the track. Now out onto the hangar straight and uh, we've got the Hadfield T70 leading the Chevron B19 of Bradshaw coming down into Stowe Corner and uh, a gap of now four seconds, pretty much. Chipping away, chipping away, but is there going to be enough time? They are on to the last lap now. Uh, Alex Brundle with that decent advantage of 3.3 seconds now. His last lap was a 2 minute 19. It wasn't quite as quick as the previous lap. Um, maybe he's just settling into the rhythm. He knows he's got a decent advantage over the second place car of Ollie Bryant. But it is that gap for third that we are watching. Ooh, Brundle runs a bit deep there, a bit wide, but he gets away with it. Didn't want to go quite so deep. Shows he's still playing around with the grip levels. Uh, the gap down to 2.5 seconds. But we are on the last lap, and we know that the Lola is still quicker in a straight line than Tom Bradshaw's car. Brundle in control. Looks as though he's on target for victory here in this Masters Historic Sports Car Race and he's been putting on such a great display, whether it's dry or wet. In the teeming rain, he's survived a nasty aquaplating moment, and he's generally been right on top of the game. So the gap was 2.5 when we last saw. It's definitely coming back down again. The gap will be measured once more on the timer in just a moment. Across the, and yeah, it's come down to 1.7. Each sector, uh, he's chipping away. He is indeed as they go through Brooklands up towards Luffield. Bradshaw again taking that very wide line, goes wide again at Luffield, just looking for that extra bit of grip from the tarmac on the outside of the circuit. Comes out of Luffield up towards Woodcut. They go through the right-hander. Just about half a lap to go now for Bradshaw to catch Hadfield up towards Cops Corner now. The leaders, of course, will be already running up towards Beckett's. Uh, but these two having a great battle for third place. Tiffany Dell has moved up a little bit. He's up to 17th place now. Uh, so he has gained a position or two. But uh, they, the older McLaren is not working quite so well as uh, some of the more modern cars. But, well, we've really got a chance here for Tom Bradshaw. Can he snatch a podium in the closing moments of this race? Final lap. Alex Brundle up ahead. will be heading for the line pretty soon. Tom Bradshaw still got a few corners in which he can make up some time on Simon Hadfield. Here is our leader, though, coming into Club Corner. 
and right out onto the kerb again. He's always pushing hard, isn't he? But after a fairly dramatic race with a long red flag interval, it's Alex Brundle who wins the Masters Historic Sports Car Race. Ollie Bryant finishes a strong second, and who's going to get third? It's going to be mighty close. It's all about the last corner. Is it going to be Bradshaw? Is it going to be the Lola of Simon Hatfield? It's all about the exit. Get on the power. I think the Lola's going to do it. Yeah, a great effort by Tom there to try and put the pressure on, but ultimately Simon did just enough. We think it's Simon in the car at the moment, the car that he is sharing at number 81 with Chris Baton. But uh, well done to Tom, who nearly, nearly, nearly uh, got the podium. He certainly gave us uh, some entertaining racing there uh, at the end. But also, many congratulations to Alex Brundle, who has delivered an absolutely superb performance today. Uh, all the different conditions, the sitting in the pit lane, everything uh, is put to the back of his head. He's dealt with it. We've got a couple of chevrons having a, a lovely little tussle here. The Christian Pittard, Darren Burke, car number 51, about to cross the line. And the number 192, that is the Callum Lockie car, the so Callum coming across the line in 10th position, just beaten by a similar machine but they had a nice little play across the line there. So well done to them. Uh, and um, that was for the lead in their class ah, as well. Really, so that was, that was why uh, Christian Pittard was so happy and put his hand out of the window, uh, because it was uh, for the lead of the Bonnier class. Lovely. And another winner of a class, actually, by the way, the James Carriage Gonzalo Gomez, uh, Chevron B23. That's won the Stommelen class. That finished in sixth place. So well done to them as well. Um, few other classes as well that have been won but the the outright the Rodriguez class is the one that uh, Alex Brundle has won and he won the race outright in the Lola T70 Mark III uh, as he did at Brands Hatch earlier on this year when he took a victory by some 17 seconds in May and he's uh, converted this one into another good victory 2.8 seconds the gap at the end he didn't have quite the same level of performance in the wet that he had in the dry versus Ollie uh, Ollie Bryant certainly had that car working well but Alex did enough uh, to hang on to the win, and he did the whole race himself at the end. He was due to share with Gary Pearson, but as it turned out, Alex did the whole thing himself. So the result of the Masters Historic Sports Car Race sees Alex Brundle taking victory uh, after a great battle and a difficult situation. Alex Brundle winning the Masters Historic Sports Car Race by some 2.8 seconds over Ollie Bryant. Simon Hatfield finishing in third place in the other Lola. So a Lola 1-2-3 with the Chevron Tom Bradshaw almost getting into the podium spot, but it didn't quite happen in the end. The Tadek of Tim De Silva finished fifth. And then working down our list, John Emerson did a good job in his Chevron B19. Callum Lockie just missed out uh, on winning that particular class in the Chevron uh, B8. Uh, so just in 10th position at the end of the day. Further down the list, we saw some other great performances. The Lenham of the Jackson family finished in 14th position. Uh, Tiffany Dell managed to move the McLaren M1 up to 18th place by the end. And uh, Martin O'Connell finished in 20th in that Chevron. So uh, it was a bit of a long day off, a uh, long race, wasn't it? Because it got interrupted so much. Uh, it started in very different conditions. A red flag affected things. Let's have a look at some of the highlights.
Adrian Flux are proud to be the Classic's official insurance partner for another year. Why not visit our stand in Purple 10 next to the Village Green today to find out how we could save you money on your insurance. We've also got all sorts of things to keep you entertained, including a Forever Cars display, Ian Cook's Pop Bang Colour masterpieces, and the chance to win a passenger lap around the track in the course car. So what are you waiting for? Adrian Flux, insurance for the individual. What is time well spent? Well, that's your business. That's why Genesis... We're in the assembly area for the Royal Automobile Club Woodcut Trophy and Sterling Moss Trophy. There's two classes in this race. The Sterling Moss Trophy is up to 1961, and then the Woodcut Trophy is for cars up to 1956. You can see all the cars lining up behind me, and really, it's it's a bit of a David and Goliath battle because you've got big engine monsters, you've got the Listers, and then you've got the smaller things like the Lotus 11s, the Lotus 15s. And I can guarantee you that all the smaller cars have been praying for rain because they just can't match those bigger cars on the straights. But for me, this has to be one of the most beautiful grids of the weekend. D-types, C-types, XGO 120s, and that's just the Jaguars. But let's take a wander up, see who we can find. Because I think we've got our front row. The cars aren't quite here yet, but certainly I can see Roger Wills there. Sam Hancock's helmet is over, sitting on his lister ready to go. I think what we'll do, is we'll just jump in and we'll just grab Roger. Roger, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, you're in your little Lotus 15 today, praying for rain all day, your wish has been granted. Absolutely, I've been doing a rain dance all day and um, yeah, it came, tr came true, it came good. These, these longer races, how important is it to get a good start? Because surely there's time to kind of make amends, or is that not the case in this? Well, I think, you know, if it were dry, the, the, li the listers are so quick in a straight line, and, and we've got the advantage on handling. So, But I think in the wet, it, it, it won't be quite as important. And I'm just, because it seems like it's pretty changeable depending where you are on the circuit. So we'll have to, um, you know, take it pretty easy on the outlap and, and find where the grip is. I don't know, it's going to be a bit interesting. I can't help you there, but best of luck. Yeah, thanks. Cheers. So we are getting ready for the final race of Saturday. A long, long day, but we've got a wonderful event to come up. It is the Royal Automobile Club Woodcote and Sterling Moss Trophy race. So two combined races, but some uh, interesting cars. The grid for the RAC Woodcote and Sterling Moss Trophy race looks like this. Sam Hancock starting from pole position in the Lister Nobly with Roger Wills alongside in the Lotus 15. Then Alex Brundle, who's just been so busy out there and taking a victory, uh, we've seen earlier, he is going to be appearing once again in the car, shared with Gary Pearson, the Lister Jaguar on this occasion. And then starting in fourth place on the grid, we've got another Lotus 15. That is car number 21, um, which we'll see how that gets on. Michael Birch with Richard Bradley actually starting in that race. Looking down, at the top 12, we've got Tiffany Dell uh, back out once again. He's starting in 11th place. Martin O'Connell, another one to watch. He starts in 8th. So it looks as though we're going to get these cars are running fairly soon now. So the organisers have done a great job here. Uh, they have shortened the race from the original length, which was going to be 50 minutes. It's going to be a 40-minute race. 
they need to get it done by nine o'clock which is the sort of cut-off time here at Silverstone uh, the pit stop window is between 15 and 30 minutes and the race is getting underway straight away we're into the action and Sam Hancock from pole position in car number 66 is leading the way but he's under a bit of threat there's no doubt about it into the first corner and Abby oh it's all getting a bit tight through there then we've got a complete turnaround as they all head back out he lost out quite considerably it's the number one two four Roger Wills who was on the outside of the front row who has actually taken the advantage and uh, proved were very very effective through the first couple of corners these conditions are tricky and as it, you can see and it's Richard Bradley in second place in the other Lotus 15 uh, they're such nimble cars and the bigger Lister Jaguar is not really able to get the power down and up towards the tighter section of the track as the cars stream through what a great start as well no uh, problems at all for anyone as they head down the Wellington straight for the first time and it's still Roger Wills leading and yeah in that second place the other Lotus 15 then it's the uh, two of the listers D-type Jaguar there we can see as well so Sam Hancock I think is uh, in second place the man who started from pole position or is it actually no I don't think it is he, he dropped back he did drop back a little bit more than that didn't he so uh, it's still Roger Wills who's got the advantage cars are running out a little bit wide as they come out of Luffield uh, number six there coming through and uh, that is the car of James Cottingham and Harvey Stanley but our race leader has made a little bit of a getaway no doubt about it Richard Bradley right in behind him in a similar car, the Lotus 15, as they... As oh, the, and a, a spin spinner. for Fred Wakeman. Uh, now, he's a potential winner of his section of the race, the, uh, the um, Woodcut Trophy, so uh, that'll be really putting a dent in his hopes. But uh, back with the leaders again up at uh, Beckett's, and it's still Roger Wills leading, but now we've got a change for second place with the Lister getting through ahead of Richard Bradley. Yeah. So uh, we are on for a, a pretty exciting encounter here, I think, once more as they head down the long, long straight. And, and down it's towards actually, stay. It's actually Chris Ward yeah. who's come up into second place all the way up from row three. So a great drive from Chris. And then it's the 66 Sam Hancock car in fourth place. Yeah, Sam Hancock's making good progress as well, isn't he, in these very tricky, wet conditions. But I have to say, I'm impressed with what Roger Wills is doing maintaining his advantage out in front at this point and seeing if he can't uh, add a little bit more to the advantage he has gained. The number six car, the uh, James Cottingham machine, is part of this group as well. Uh, number two, trying to get involved. No, sorry, it wasn't the number two car, yeah, was it? it Martin O'Connell, yes. Oh, right, yeah, Martin O'Connell, yeah. yeah. Up there in uh, another of Sandy Watson's cars. And just ahead, actually, is the uh, Alex Brundle car, number 58. Uh, we'll, actually, we'll check which helmet's in that car, because Alex has only just got out of the T70. I wonder whether Gary might have taken the first stint, because yeah. he should have been in the second stint in the previous race. Yeah, quite likely that Gary, I would think, might be out in this stint. Um, a few changes further down the order as well. The conditions getting a bit gloomy out there as we look out of our commentary box window and seeing the lights uh, headlights flashing away they really are showing up as the evening gets a little bit darker I hope the rain holds off there are still some fairly big clouds around big big slide just about held under control by Chris Ward in second position there the lights ablaze and uh, putting on a, a wonderful show we gather it's not Brundle in the car at the moment, which is no great surprise. It's Gary Pearson, just been told, uh, because Brundle was rather busy in the last one. So look how close it's getting up front now. Uh, it could be a change around coming here as Chris Ward puts the pressure on Roger Wills. And, and Chris Ward, the only driver of one of the bigger engine cars who's been able to get the car. Big, big slide there for Chris Ward. Another big slide as he goes out of Woodcut Corner, but he's the only one of the bigger engine cars that's managed the only driver who's managed to get up near the front to challenge the little Lotus uh, 20 uh, Lotus um, 15s uh, just ahead of them Roger Wills and Richard Bradley yeah there's no doubt the list is are tricky cars to drive in the wet but you've got to say that Chris is doing a fantastic job in second place of just about holding on to the balance of it Jaguar powered machine and uh, in amongst the Lotuses the Lotus is taking full advantage of this rather slippery surface the nimbleness of the Lotus and the controllability really helping in these wet conditions 
and the Listers are fighting it a little harder. Uh, lots of car control required, and Chris is managing it so far. Lights ablaze, chasing down in second place. Bit of sideways action up behind them as well. We saw the uh, Jamie James Cottingham car getting a bit out of shape, running down in uh, fourth place at the moment. Martin O'Connell, the Gary Pearson car shared with Alex Brundle. Brundle will be taking over later. That's now in sixth place. Sam Hancock down to seventh position. And a few other people to keep an eye on as well. Oh, yeah, we've got a car off over there. Just uh, you, you spotted that one, Alistair. Well done. Just touched into the barrier. Uh, it was a D-type. Uh, didn't catch the, the number, but one of the D-types in the barrier there on the approach to Club Corner. That's the uh, HWM Jaguar. Uh, looks like that's being driven... I think Martin Stretton. Martin Stretton, yes, with the, the green helmet. Um, the class leader at the moment uh, in their particular category. So that's working well for 545, running 11th overall, but leading their particular category, apparently. Oh, uh -huh. big spin just up ahead of them in the 45 car, Mark Cole in the Lotus 11, but thankfully everyone was able to avoid him. And our race leader, Roger, is uh, setting the pace out in front. That is a beautiful car, though, isn't it? That 545 machine with Martin Stretton at the wheel. That actually overtook me on the way into the circuit on Thursday. Uh, it was being driven on the road. <laughs> uh, howled past me on the dual carriageway as battle we've got a battle lead. for the lead. Yes, we've got Chris Ward going through into the lead under braking for Brooklands with uh, Roger Wills dropped down into second place in the Lotus, so Lister leads Locus, Lotus leads Lotus now with Chris Ward, Roger Wills, then Richard Bradley next up, and then it's uh, James Cottingham in the Tajiro Jaguar. Yeah, and uh, followed up by the number two car of um, Cottingham and Stanley, but they go side by side and he retakes the lead once again. So once again, Roger Wills manages to get back in front somewhere. The Lotus works, somewhere the Lister works, the Lister's coming back in a straight line, that's where it's got the horsepower, but you get to the corner and the Lotus has the advantage, it's lovely to see. Really good battle, head to head, between two quite different cars in terms of their style, um, not dissimilar in terms of their age, they're both cars from the late 1950s, but uh, one's light and lesser powered down to second place now and actually coming under pressure from the other Lotus directly behind. Absolutely, yeah, Richard Bradley seems to have caught up with uh, Roger Wills and Richard Bradley taking that slightly wider wet line as we've been calling it and he comes up half alongside Roger Wills. Oh, oh, Ro oh Roger Wills is in trouble, I think. Uh, he's got his hand up, but he seems to be staying ahead. So that, that usually means that he's yeah. got a mechanical problem. Lights went out and then came back on again. Yeah. Yes, I don't quite know what was going on. He has given up a place, I think, now, but the car still seems to be running at a, a decent pace. So I don't, he obviously had a bit of a scare at some moment. Maybe there was a sudden cutout and then it came back on. Yeah, he's, he's, well, he's going well, look. Yeah, gone side by side with Richard Bradley all the way around Stowe, now into Club Corner. And uh, so oh, yellows, uh, safety, safety car. car, right, OK. Yeah. Uh, whether they had already had the message. Uh, yes, uh, I wonder whether Roger saw a yellow flag. Yeah, yeah, that's that's look uh, as though he may well have done. We can actually see the... Uh, can the signal come up on our screen straight away? But he may well have seen the yellow flags being handed out, and that was what he was indicating to. Number 66 car just heading around there. Uh, Sam Hancock in another of the listers. But um, we shall see what they managed to do with the safety car. Clearly, I think there must be... We do know there was a car off um, on the approach to club. It was sort of on the Vale uh, end. I don't quite know, may well have been a car that lost it out of Stowe and then had a big, big moment that took it a long way along. Whether that's the car that they want to recover, I'm not sure, but clearly there is some work to be done, and that's why they... Have, oh, yeah, that is the car you saw, Alistair. It is car number 12. It's the Steve Brooks Martin O'Connell car. So Martin is due to drive two cars in this race. Steve Brooks started out in this D-type, 1955 car. We didn't see exactly what happened. I think that probably would have started at Stowe, don't yeah. you? Yeah, I, I do, yes, and... Uh, uh, he's, he's spun coming out of Stowe and then it's ended up on the uh, inside. all the way over there. I've seen that before, yeah. You run wide out of Stowe, you sort of half correct it, slide, and then it hits back onto the inside quite a lot further down the, yeah. down the road. Yeah. Uh, we're uh, the safety car telling the Maserati to pass. Yeah. Uh, because uh, that's a car that's not in the lead battle, so he's allowed to 
go ahead and that puts the leading car immediately behind the safety car now which is what they want and I think the pit lane is about to open um, we shall see um, and that will be a, an opportunity for some people then to come in maybe there's a few minutes more before the pit lane opens it um, was uh, 15 yeah. minutes wasn't okay, it we've from only the start and we've okay, only, only had 10, 10 minutes yeah, so yeah, far yeah, yeah. Sometimes we've seen today already with the safety cars out and the pit lane opens, it really can be an advantage to some and a disadvantage to others. But you're right, it's not open yet. We've got a few minutes more um, for those. If the timing works for them, if we're still behind safety car, there could be a gain to be made to do the pit stop under safety car conditions. But it is the uh, lister that is now following the safety car, the car that is leading this race. Chris Ward, very good first opening laps there, dealing with Roger Wills, who had the initial advantage off the start. Now let's take a look at the start again, Asda, because this was all quite exciting, wasn't it? Wasn't it great? Uh, Sam Hancock, I thought, got away well initially in his list, but it didn't quite work for him. And round the outside went Roger. We had a three abreast going through Abbey. Roger did a fantastic job there and uh, emerged in front of that little group, didn't he? And the listers were clearly struggling more on the slippery surface as the Lotuses uh, showed that they had the, the dexterity to nip round these corners so quickly and Richard Bradley tried to go around the outside and now he's trying to go up the inside of Roger Wills but uh, that didn't work, Roger just kept his car exactly where he wanted it to uh, and uh, one or two losing out at the loop there, just so much traffic going through that they can't take the line they want to but uh, as I said at the time, that really was excellent driving from, from these uh, drivers because uh, so difficult, uh, yeah. no contact at all uh, Roger Wills there making his way down into Brooklands leading the race on this replay. Yeah, the listers were definitely a handful on that opening lap. You could see several of them struggling. Martin Stretton went a bit deep into Brooklands as well. Uh, but the Lotuses were working superbly well and uh, making the most of that initial advantage. Um, and then it was just a, a, a little bit later that we saw Chris Ward really getting it together with his lister and beginning to put a bit more pressure on again. The Jaguars also having some fun and games. We've got both C-types and D-types in this race. Some of the most classic Jaguar sports racing cars of all time. Safety car out, though, at the moment, and leading this field around, glowing uh, in the darkening light of this Saturday evening of the Classic. Leading into the final day tomorrow, where we're going to see another huge number of uh, very dramatic races, I am sure knows what the weather's going to bring us tomorrow. Today's been a very changeable day. Alex Brundle getting ready. There he is with his dad, Martin, checking out some timings and waiting to see when the uh, pit lane will be open. We're about two minutes away, I think, from the pit lane being released. A little bit of uh, fatherly guidance there, a nice smile from Martin to Alex. Uh, probably just saying, uh, take it easy out there. It's a bit slippy. And uh, Martin's done a few races in the rain, hasn't he? <laughs> Yeah, it was very, uh, very quick in the wet, actually, wasn't it? Uh, of course, a Le Mans winner as well, uh, yeah. Martin Brundle. And uh, some demonstrative movements of his arm. Both of them are both great racers and great commentators, of course, as well. Alex Brundle does a lot of uh, commentary nowadays as well on uh, Formula 2 and Formula 3, as well as being a very effective man behind the steering wheel. So, a good combination. And we'll see him out in a little while. Gary Pearson is currently driving the car that they share. It is the number 58 car. It is running in sixth place. So, yeah, got another chance of getting a, a decent performance here today. And the car running in uh, second place. So, well, we're just looking now at uh, one of the cars midfield. That's the uh, 38 car, uh, which is in the Sterling Moss Trophy. That's Anthony Ditheridge. Uh, we'll hand over to Nick Topless, the Cooper Monaco. That's the car at the back of these two. And the one ahead is uh, actually in the other race, the Woodcut Trophy. And that's uh, Carlos Miguens in the Cooper Jaguar T38. Yeah, we were just that's looking at that, weren't we? We were, yeah. This is the uh, uh, Maserati, isn't it? Yeah, a lovely car. So it's very different, obviously, to some of the others out there. But these are the much earlier uh, cars, very sort of delicate machines. The Cooper Jag, as you say. Um, and the Maserati as well. Um, so we'll see how they get on the latter stages. They're not going to be as quick as some of these more feisty monsters, particularly the Listers. But as we've seen, it's the Lotus 15s that are going so well in these conditions. It looks like they've got that car out of the way. It has got a bit of damage to the right front, I'm afraid. 
but they've and the marshals doing another superb job and, and hands up to the marshals today a very very long day oh we've got somebody else pulling off that's the lotus 10 oh. uh, number 10 uh, always runs as number 10 that's malcolm paul and rick born uh, that's now that's going to have to be rescued yeah. which is going to mean the safety car is going to be out for longer than we were thinking the time is ticking by the pit window is open now has just opened a few seconds ago um, i've not seen many people in the pits yet it's probably because they're not at that part of the track of yeah. course they're on another part of the track that's why so i, I think at the end of this lap you'll certainly see quite a few start to come into the pits and we've lost our leader haven't uh yeah, where uh, oh, uh, have we had some come in the pits? Oh. Yes. Uh, oh, so, uh, yeah, we're getting yes. the, the, so up on the screen. There, okay. Yeah, yeah. Some have gone in. Some haven't. There is the uh, car that Alex Bundle's going to take over from Gary Pearson. Busy couple of hours for Alex Brundle. Amazing, isn't it, to do all these laps, different cars, see how they get on with this. Number 20 car is also pulled in. That's. Uh, Rudy Friedrichs, he's not swapping with anybody in the Jaguar C-Type. Bonnet up on the... Yeah, I wonder what that's car. about. Maybe Gary experienced a bit of a problem. They've got a misfire or a... They are making a bit of an adjustment, or perhaps yeah. it's just a settings adjustment, yeah. change of roll bar setting or something, I don't know. Uh, there, there isn't anything about these engines that uh, Gary Pearson doesn't know, so he, yeah. he will have known in the car if he wanted to make an adjustment that would improve it for... Alex, uh, mechanic there. Are they just taping up the brake ducts? Perhaps just giving him a bit more brake temperature. You can see the mechanic on the far side with some tape. Getting ready to go again. Getting the bodywork attached. And away he goes. Yeah. And in fact, the two cars are coming out at the same time. They obviously all came in at the same time now they're being released so is it the advantage to make the earlier pit stop we'll find out no doubt pretty soon and, uh, was that stop for gary pearson and alex brundle longer than it needed to be for i wonder adjustments yeah we'll find out when they start to settle into their positions on track again another d-type there that's the number four car of chris and nick ball d-type short nose is that what is known that's the 3.4 litre engine straight six that Jaguar straight six engine that was so successful in so many different cars over the years and uh, still behind safety car we had that other machine that pulled off to the track the Lotus 10 so this has changed the positions of course because several people have stopped but not everybody so that does change the order now it means that number 21 is now the leader of this race but is due to make a pit stop so the Richard Bradley Lotus 15 green car is now leading this race and Sam Hancock's moved up to second moving up into third place has, has come the number 170 car of Peter Ratcliffe another of the listers and also up there is the number of 144 Paul Fostigil and James Hansen Jaguar D-type and uh, one of the two Martins racing in this race that was going to do a, a double stint. Martin O'Connell won't now be taking over that D-type that hit the wall. Yeah. Uh, but Martin Stretton is due to, to race two cars. Uh, he'll be in oh, the really? Maserati, <laughs> which uh, we saw in the shot there. It is just going through shot now, the red car. Uh, he was out early on in the HWM Jaguar. Well, it's a busy, busy day for a number of drivers, there's no doubt about it. Um, so safety car still out there. We haven't seen whether the other car got removed. We've still got 21 minutes to go. Safety car will be in at the end of the lap. And so we will see that light stop flashing on the uh, top of the safety car shortly, although so you've got a little bit of the lap to do. I, I don't understand the tactics of not going in under the safety car because no, the, Richard, Richard Bradley has to make his stop yet. Uh, and so does uh, the second place car as well. That sort of, uh, it's far Sam better, Hancock. isn't it, to do it yeah. under safety, Absolutely, under yeah. safety yeah. car? Yeah. Because remember, you do the same stop time, but the cars are either going fast around you or they're going slowly around you. Now, they're, they're heading into the pits, this next group. Will they get their stop done? Because there's still quite a lot of the lap to do before they come back out. I think they will miss out a bit, though those yeah. who made their stops later on we shall see but a, a lot dived in then which was the uh, the last opportunity before the safety car goes in because it's in at the end of this lap 
so uh, that's uh, that's definitely compromised Richard Bradley's race for staying out. And, uh, <laughs> well, we'll see how it all pans out. But it could make for an interesting end, as we've seen a couple of times already today, where the safety car has affected the outright order. And then we get some pretty dramatic finishes sometimes because some of the front runners have been pushed back down and have to fight their way back up again. So we shall see. We'll find out soon. They've still got to come through the Beckett's section. Then uh, as they come down the long straight, the lights will go out on the safety car and they will begin to pick up some pace. Yes, uh, Peter Snowden at the back of this group in, in a car that's not competitive at the front of the field, the Aston Martin, but uh, he's also stayed out uh, for this extra lap but the safety car lights are out Ben so uh, we are as uh, our graphic tells us the safety car is in this lap so it's into Stowe Corner now it'll keep to the right hand side then at the veil and then pull into the pit lane and that will hand control to Richard Bradley who we suspect will maybe maybe he'll follow the safety car in but uh, well, let's we'll see he, he's not right up behind the safety car is he no and, and of course they're they're going to the other pits aren't they it's the other pits that they're oh of course they're, they're, they're running into. in the old pits yes yes so course, yes let's see the race does get underway and richard bradley is picking up the pace as they come through club quarter being chased now by the number 144 jaguar d type of james hansen and opening up a little bit of a gap as they come across the line but this could this situation could well change once the uh, pit stops have been made. We are waiting for this little lead group to do their pit stops. They haven't done them yet. Uh, whereas the, the group that has made their pit stops did so under full safety car period. So they should still have a little bit more of an advantage. We'll find out. But he's certainly pushing on quite deep there is Richard Bradley. We know this Lotus 15 is a suitable car in conditions like this. Whether he's going to be able to make up enough time when he then has to make the pit stop we shall wait and see last lap in this race still belonging at the moment to roger wills who was leading in the early stages he has made his pit stop and roger could still be in a, a pretty good spot he is the first of those that have made a pit stop so far i believe so roger could find himself perhaps back in front in the yeah, Lotus. absolutely yes he is the first of the stoppers as uh, Richard Bradley will expect to peel in now and hand over to Michael Birch, another quick driver, so it was a good team. Uh, and there's the uh, 82 car, That's, that was started by Chris Ward, now should be in the hands of Rob Smith. Through the long right-hander, yep. to Luffield. It does look like these are the ones that uh, will be battling for uh, race victory because they have made their pit stops. Now we're going to see a few more, I think, coming into the pits. Pit window is still open. Um, I'm not sure if Bradley come in. I haven't seen yet whether he's actually pitted or not. I think he's still out there. Yeah, it doesn't show on our screens as coming into the pits. We haven't got him on, on camera, but uh, it's not shown as coming in. Some of those lead cars have come in. In fact, all but the first two have now come in as far as we can see. Yeah, they're staying out there a little bit longer, aren't they? Um, but I think there's going to be a change around. Flashing lights and through the dusk here at Silverstone but what is going to happen to complete this race two different classes of course that we're got to keep an eye on as well and we'll once these extra pit stops have been made by those that have not yet come in we'll get a much clearer picture there is car number 18 into the pits now and uh, that is the John Chisholm Sam Wilson car so John is now taking over it's the Lola Mark 1 from 1960. This is in the Sterling Moss group of cars. Very pretty little machine. Uh, not one of the front runners as such, but uh, still lovely to see it out there. And now we've got this uh, gaggle of cars all fighting for positions. Number 82 car, that's definitely one to keep an eye on. Chris Ward was very quick in it earlier. Rob Smith is now behind the wheel. It looks as though Martin O'Connell has taken effectively the lead. Uh, he's he's the car number two, just coming out of the gloom. It's difficult to see uh, where the cars are with the headlights, but uh, this, this group of four cars are the ones that are all in the net lead after the Bradley car goes into the pits. 
Yeah, still waiting for it to go in the pits. There it is, Yeah. Uh, the Green Lotus. In theory, we would expect it to be coming in at the end of this lap, perhaps. Um, coming into the national pits. Look at that, sliding it out right over the curb. He's certainly pushing on pretty hard, isn't he? Um, but I do think that this car is going to drop right down the order once they've made the pit stop. Even though he's opened up a gap of some 10 seconds, it's a, been a really good restart for him. And there's the, uh, the car in second place. That's uh, Martin O'Connell still aboard. And they have made their stop, haven't they? They have, yes, yes. And I, I think um, I, I did suspect that Martin would do the whole race in Sandy's car in the previous race, but actually I think Sandy took it over. This one, Martin seems to have done the whole race. Uh, and that car looks to be in a very strong position. Yeah. Uh, do we see the pit stop board flash up for yes. Richard Bradley? Yes. So now it looks...